Section 1 of The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1, by Robert Burton. Section 1. Advertisement to the Last London Edition. The work now restored to public notice has had an extraordinary fate. At the time of its original publication, it obtained a great celebrity, which continued more than half a century. During that period, few books were more read, or more deservedly applauded. It was the delight of the learned, the solace of the indolent, and the refuge of the uninformed. It passed through at least eight editions, by which the bookseller, as Wood records, got an estate and, notwithstanding the objection sometimes opposed against it of a quaint style, and too great an accumulation of authorities, the fascination of its wit, fancy, and sterling sense have borne down all censures, and extorted praise from the first writers in the English language. The grave Johnson has praised it in the warmest terms, and the ludicrous Stern has interwoven many parts of it into his own popular performance. Milton did not disdain to build two of his finest poems on it, and a host of inferior writers have embellished their works with beauties not their own, culled from a performance which they had not the justice even to mention. Change of times and the frivolity of fashion suspended in some degree that fame which had lasted near a century, and the succeeding generation affected indifference towards an author who at length was only looked into by the plunderers of literature, the poachers in obscure volumes. The plagiarisms of Tristram Shandy, so successfully brought to light by Dr. Ferrier, at length drew the attention of the public towards a writer who, though then little known, might, without impeachment of modesty, lay claim to every mark of respect, and inquiry proved, beyond a doubt, that the calls of justice had been little attended to by others, as well as the facetious Yorick. Wood observed, more than a century ago, that several authors had unmercifully stolen matter from Burton without any acknowledgment. The time, however, at length arrived, when the merits of the anatomy of melancholy were to receive their due praise. The book was again sought for and read, and again it became an applauded performance its excellencies once more stood confessed in the increased price which every copy offered for sale produced, and the increased demand pointed out the necessity of a new edition. This is now presented to the public in a manner not disgraceful to the memory of the author, and the publisher relies with confidence that so valuable a repository of amusement and information will continue to hold the rank to which it has been restored, firmly supported by its own merit, and safe from the influence and blight of any future caprices of fashion. To open its valuable mysteries to those who have not had the advantage of a classical education, translations of the countless quotations from ancient writers which occur in the work are now for the first time given, and obsolete orthography is in all instances modernized. Account of the Author Robert Burton was the son of Ralph Burton, of an ancient and genteel family at Lindley, in Leicestershire, and was born there on the 8th of February, 1576. He received the first rudiments of learning at the free school of Sutton Coldfield, in Warwickshire, from whence he was, at the age of seventeen, in the long vacation, 1593, sent to Brazen Nose College, in the condition of a commoner, where he made considerable progress in logic and philosophy. In 1599 he was elected student of Christ Church, and, for form's sake, was put under the tuition of Dr. John Bancroft, afterwards Bishop of Oxford. In 1614 he was admitted to the reading of the sentences, and on the 29th of November, 1616, had the vicarage of St. Thomas, in the west suburb of Oxford, conferred to him by the dean and canons of Christ Church, which, with the rectory of Seagrave in Leicestershire, given to him in the year 1636, by George Lord Berkeley, he kept, to use the words of the Oxford antiquary, with much ado to his dying day. 
he seems to have been first beneficed at Walsby in Lincolnshire, through the munificence of his noble patroness, Frances, Countess Dowager of Exeter, but resigned the same, as he tells us, for some special reasons. At his vicarage he is remarked to have always given the sacrament in wafers. Wood's character of him is, that he was an exact mathematician, a curious calculator of nativities, a general red scholar, a thorough-paced philologist, and one that understood the surveying of lands well. As he was by many accounted a severe student, a devourer of authors, a melancholy and humorous person, so by others who knew him well, a person of great honesty, plain dealing and charity. I have heard some of the ancients of Christ's church often say, that his company was very merry, facete, and juvenile, and no man in his time did surpass him for his ready and dexterous interlarding his common discourses among them with verses from the poets, or sentences from classic authors, which being then all the fashion in the university, made his company the more acceptable. He appears to have been a universal reader of all kinds of books, and availed himself of his multifarious studies in a very extraordinary manner. From the information of Hearn, we learn that John Rouse, the Bodleian librarian, furnished him with choice books for the prosecution of his work. The subject of his labor and amusement seems to have been adopted from the infirmities of his own habit and constitution. Mr. Granger says, he composed this book with a view of relieving his own melancholy, but increased it to such a degree that nothing could make him laugh but going to the bridge foot and hearing the ribaldry of the bargemen, which rarely failed to throw him into a violent fit of laughter. Before he was overcome with this horrid disorder, he, in the intervals of his vapors, was esteemed one of the most facetious companions in the university. His residence was chiefly at Oxford, where, in his chamber in Christchurch College, he departed this life, at or very near the time which he had some years before foretold, from the calculation of his own nativity, and which, says Wood, being exact, several of the students did not forbear to whisper among themselves, that rather than there should be a mistake in the calculation, he sent up his soul to heaven through a slip about his neck. Whether this suggestion is founded in truth, we have no other evidence than an obscure hint in the epitaph hereafter inserted, which was written by the author himself a short time before his death. His body, with due solemnity, was buried near that of Dr. Robert Weston, in the north aisle which joins next to the choir of the Cathedral of Christ Church, on the 27th of January, 1639-40. to Over his grave was soon after erected a comely monument on the upper pillar of the said aisle, with his bust painted to the life. On the right hand is the following calculation of his nativity, and under the bust, this inscription of his own composition. Pausus notus, pausiorbis ignotus, hic jacet democritus junior, qui vitum dedit et mortum, melancholia, obiit octo, idus genuiris, A.C. 1639. Arms Azure on a bend O between three dogs' heads O, a crescent G. A few months before his death, he made his will, of which the following is a copy. Extracted from the registry of the prerogative court of Canterbury. In nomine de amen. August 15, 1639, because there be so many casualties to which our life is subject, besides quarreling and contention which happen to our successors after our death by reason of unsettled estates, I, Robert Burton, student of Christ Church Oxen, though my means be but small, have thought good by this my last will and testament, to dispose of that little which I have, and being at this present, I thank God in perfect health of body and mind, and if this testament be not so formal according to the nice and strict terms of law and other circumstances, peradventure required, of which I am ignorant, I desire, howsoever, this my will may be accepted, and stand good according to my true intent and meaning. First I bequeath, Amenem Deo Corpus Terre, whensoever it shall please God to call me. I give my land in Hyam, which my good father Ralph Burton of Lindley in the county of Leicester Esquire gave me by deed of gift, 
and that which I have annexed to that farm by purchase since, now leased for thirty-eight pounds per annum to mine elder brother, William Burton of Lindley, Esquire, during his life, and after him to his heirs, I make my said brother William likewise mine executor, as well as paying such annuities and legacies out of my lands and goods, as are hereafter specified, I give to my nephew Cassabillan Burton twenty pounds annuity per annum, out of my land in Hyam, during his life to be paid at two equal payments at Our Lady Day in Lent and Michaelmas, or if he be not paid within fourteen days after the said feasts, to distrain on any part of the ground or on any of my lands of inheritance. Item I give to my sister Catherine Jackson during her life eight pounds per annum annuity to be paid at the two feasts equally as above said, or else to distrain on the ground, if she be not paid after fourteen days at Lindley, as the other sum is out of the said land. Item, I give to my servant John Upton the annuity of forty shillings out of my said farm during his life, if till then my servant, to be paid on Michaelmas Day in Lindley each year, or else after fourteen days to distrain. Now for my goods. I thus dispose them. First, I give an hundredth pounds to Christ Church in Oxford, where I have so long lived to buy five pounds lands per annum, to be yearly bestowed on books for the library. Item, I give an hundredth pound to the University Library of Oxford to be bestowed to purchase five pound land per annum to be paid out yearly in books, as Mrs. Brooks formerly gave an hundred pounds to buy land to the same purpose, and the rent to the same use I give to my brother George Burton twenty pounds, and my watch I give to my brother Ralph Burton five pounds, Item, I give to the parish of Seagrave in Leicestershire, where I am now rector, ten pounds to be given to a certain Fayafes, to the perpetual good of the said parish oxen. Item, I give to my niece Eugenia Burton, one hundredth pounds. Item, I give to my nephew Richard Burton, now prisoner in London, an hundredth pound to redeem him. Item, I give to the poor of Hyam forty shillings, where my land is to the poor of Nuneaton, where I was once a grammar scholar, three pound to my cousin Perphy at Wadley, my cousin Perphy of Calcott, my cousin Hales of Coventry, my nephew Bradshaw of Orton, twenty shillings apiece, for a small remembrance, to Mr. Whitehall, rector of Chirkby, mine own chamber fellow, twenty shillings, I desire my brother George and my cousin Perphy of Calcott, to be the overseers of this part of my will. I give, moreover, five pounds to make a small monument for my mother, where she is buried in London, to my brother Jackson, forty shillings, to my servant John Upton, forty shillings, besides his former annuity, if he be my servant till I die, if he be till then my servant. Robert Burton, Charles Russell Witness, John Pepper Witness. An appendix to this my will, if I die at Oxford, or whilst I am of Christ Church, and with good Mr. Paines, August the 15th, 1639. I give to Mr. Dr. Fell, Dean of Christ Church, forty shillings to the eight canons, twenty shillings apiece, as a small remembrance to the poor of St. Thomas Parish, twenty shillings, to Brazenose Library, five pounds, to Mr. Rouse of Oriel College, twenty shillings, to Mr. Haywood XXS, to Dr. Metcalf XXS, to Mr. Shirley XXS. If I have any books the university library hath not, let them take them. If I have any books our own library have not, let them take them. I give to Mrs. Fell all my English books of husbandry, one accepted, to her daughter Mrs. Catherine Fell, my six pieces of silver plate and six silver spoons, to Mrs. Isles, my Gerard's herbal. To Mrs. Morris, my country farm translated out of French four. And all my English physic books, to Mr. Whistler, the recorder of Oxford. I give twenty shillings to all my fellow students, misters of arts, a book in folio or two, a piece as Master Morris treasurer, or Mr. Dean shall appoint, whom I request to be the overseer of this appendix, and give him for his pains Atlas Geographer, and Ortelius Theatro moaned. I give to John Fell, the dean's son student, my mathematical instruments, except my two cross staves, which I give to my lord of Donall, if he be then of the house. To Thomas Isles the doctor, Isles his son, student Stalnich on Poralia, and Lucian's works in four tomes. 
If any books be left, my executors dispose of them with all such books as are written with my own hands, and half my melancholy copy, for Cripps hath the other half, to Mr. Jones' chaplain and chanter, my surveying books and instruments, to the servants of the house, forty shillings. Robert Burton, Charles Russell Witness, John Pepper Witness. This will was showed to me by the testator, and acknowledged by him some few days before his death, to be his last will, Ida Tester, John Morris, S.T.H.D. Prebendari Ecol Pre Oxon, February 3, 1639. Probatum fuit testamentum suprascriptum, etc., 11th, 1640, Juramento Willimi Burton Pries, et executoris qui, etc., de bene et felicitor, a ministrand, etc., quorum magris Nathanaelae Stevens, rectore ecole de Drayton, et Eduardo Farmer, clericus, vigore commissionis, etc. The only work our author executed was that now reprinted, which probably was the principal employment of his life. Dr. Ferrier says, it was originally published in the year 1617, but this is evidently a mistake. The first edition was that printed in Quarto, 1621, a copy of which is at present in the collection of John Nichols, Esquire, the indefatigable illustrator of the history of Leicestershire, to whom, and to Isaac Reed, Esquire, of Staple Inn, this account is greatly indebted for its accuracy. The other impressions of it were in 1624, 1628, 1632, 1638, 1651 to 2, 1660, and 1676, which last in the title page is called the eighth edition. The copy from which the present is reprinted is that of 1651 to 2, at the conclusion of which is the following address. To the reader, to be pleased to know, courteous reader, that since the last impression of this book, the ingenious author of it is deceased, leaving a copy of it exactly corrected, with several considerable additions by his own hand. This copy he committed to my care and custody, with directions to have those additions inserted in the next edition, which, in order to his command, and the public good, is faithfully performed in this last impression." H. C. I. E. Henry Cripps. The following testimonies of various authors will serve to show the estimation in which this work has been held. The Anatomy of Melancholy, wherein the author hath piled up variety of much excellent learning. Scarce any book of philology in our land hath, in so short a time, passed so many editions. Fuller's Worthies, Folio 16. "'Tis a book so full of variety of reading "'that gentlemen who have lost their time "'and are put to a push for invention "'may furnish themselves with matter "'for common or scholastical discourse and writing. "'Woods Athene Oxoniensis, Volume 1, page 628, second edition. "'If you never saw Burton upon Melancholy, "'printed 1676, "'I pray look into it "'and read the ninth page of his preface, "'Democritus to the Reader.' There is something there which touches the point we are upon, but I mention the author to you as the pleasantest, the most learned, and the most full of sterling sense. The wits of Queen Anne's reign and the beginning of George I were not a little beholden to him. Archbishop Herring's Letters, 12 month, 1777, page 149. Burton's Anatomy of Melancholy, he, Dr. Johnson, said, was the only book that ever took him out of bed two hours sooner than he wished to rise. Boswell's Life of Johnson, Volume 1, page 580, 8th edition. Burton's Anatomy of Melancholy is a valuable book, said Dr. Johnson. It is, perhaps, overloaded with quotation, but there is a great spirit and great power in what Burton says when he writes from his own mind. Ibid, Volume 2, page 325. It will be no detraction from the powers of Milton's original genius and invention to remark that he seems to have borrowed the subject of L'Allegro and Il Penseroso, together with some particular thoughts, expressions, and rhymes, more especially the idea of a contrast between these two dispositions, from a forgotten poem prefixed to the first edition of Burton's Anatomy of Melancholy, entitled 
The Author's Abstract of Melancholy, or A Dialogue Between Pleasure and Pain. Here pain is melancholy. It is written, as I conjecture, about the year 1600. I will make no apology for abstracting and citing as much of this poem as will be sufficient to prove, to a discerning reader, how far it had taken possession of Milton's mind. The measure will appear to be the same, and that our author was at least an attentive reader of Burton's book, may be already concluded from the traces of resemblance which I have incidentally noted in passing through the L'Allegro and Il Penseroso. After extracting the lines, Mr. Wharton adds, as to the very elaborate work to which these visionary verses are no unsuitable introduction, the writer's variety of learning, his quotations from scarce and curious books, his pedantry sparkling with rude wit and shapeless elegance, miscellaneous matter, intermixture of agreeable tales and illustrations, and, perhaps above all, the singularities of his feelings, clothed in an uncommon quaintness of style, have contributed to render it, even to modern readers, a valuable repository of amusement and information. Wharton's Milton, 2nd edition, page 94. The Anatomy of Melancholy is a book which has been universally read and admired. This work is, for the most part, what the author himself styles it, a cento. But it is a very ingenious one. His quotations, which abound in every page, are pertinent but if he had made more use of his invention and less of his commonplace book, his work would perhaps have been more valuable than it is. He is generally free from the affected language and ridiculous metaphors which disgrace most of the books of his time. Granger's Biographical History Burton's Anatomy of Melancholy, a book once a favorite of the learned and the witty, and a source of surreptitious learning, though written on a regular plan, consists chiefly of quotations. The author has honestly termed it a cento. He collects, under every division, the opinions of a multitude of writers, without regard to chronological order, and has too often the modesty to decline the interposition of his own sentiments. Indeed, the bulk of his materials generally overwhelms him. In the course of his folio, he has contrived to treat a great variety of topics, that seem very loosely connected with the general subject, and, like Bale, when he starts a favorite train of quotations, he does not scruple to let the digression outrun the principal question. Thus, from the doctrines of religion to military discipline, from inland navigation to the morality of dancing schools, everything is discussed and determined. Ferriar's Illustrations of Stern, page 58. The archness which Burton displays occasionally, and his indulgence of playful digressions from the most serious discussions, often give his style an air of familiar conversation, notwithstanding the laborious collections which supply his text. He was capable of writing excellent poetry, but he seems to have cultivated this talent too little. The English verses prefixed to his book, which possess beautiful imagery and great sweetness of versification, have been frequently published. His Latin elegiac verses addressed to his book show a very agreeable turn for raillery. Ibid, page 58. When the force of the subject opens his own vein of prose, we discover valuable sense and brilliant expression. Such is his account of the first feelings of melancholy persons, written probably from his own experience. See page 154 of the present edition. Ibid, page 60. During a pedantic age, like that in which Burton's production appeared, it must have been eminently serviceable to writers of many descriptions. Hence the unlearned might furnish themselves with appropriate scraps of Greek and Latin, whilst men of letters would find their enquiries shortened by knowing where they might look for what both ancients and moderns had advanced on the subject of human passions. I confess my inability to point out any other English author who has so largely dealt in apt and original quotation. Manuscript note of the late George Stevens, Esquire, in his copy of The Anatomy of Melancholy. End of section 1
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1, by Robert Burton, Section 2. Democritus Jr. to his book. Go forth, my book, into the open day, Happy if made so by its garish eye. O'er earth's wide surface take thy vagrant way, To imitate thy master's genius try. The graces three, the muses nine salute, Should those who love them try to con thy lore. The country, city, seek, grand thrones to boot, With gentle courtesy humbly bow before. Should nobles gallant, soldiers frank and brave, Seek thy acquaintance, hail their first advance. From twitch of care thy pleasant vein may save, May laughter cause or wisdom give her chance. Some surly Cato, senator austere, Haply may wish to peep into thy book, Seem very nothing, tremble and revere, No forceful eagles, butterflies e'er look. They love not thee, of them then little seek, And wish for readers, triflers like thyself. Of lewdful matron watchful catch the beck, Or gorgeous countess full of pride and pelf. May they say pish and frown and yet read on, Cry odd and silly, coarse and yet amusing. Should dainty damsels seek thy page to con, Spread thy best stores, to them be ne'er refusing. Say, fair one, master loves thee dear as life, Would he were here to gaze on thy sweet look. Should known or unknown student, freed from strife, Of logic in the schools, explore my book, Cry mercy, critic, and thy book withhold, Be some few errors pardoned, though observed, And humble author to implore makes bold. Thy kind indulgence, even undeserved, should melancholy white or pensive lover, courtier, snug sit, or carpet night so trim, our blossoms call, he'll find himself in clover, gain sense from precept, laughter from our whim. Should learned leech with solemn air unfold thy leaves, beware, be civil, and be wise. Thy volume many precepts sage may hold, his well-fraught head may find no trifling prize. Should crafty lawyer trespass on our ground, Caitiffs avaunt, disturbing tribe away, Unless, white crow, an honest one be found, He'll better, wiser go for what we say. Should some ripe scholar, gentle and benign, With candor, care, and judgment thee peruse, Thy faults to kind oblivion he'll consign, Nor to thy merit will his praise refuse. Thou mayst be searched for polished words and verse By flippant spouter, emptiest of praters. Tell him to seek them in some mawkish verse. My periods all are rough as nutmeg graters. The doggerel poet, wishing thee to read, reject not. Let him glean thy jests and stories. His brother I, of lowly sembling breed, Apollo grants to few Parnassian glories. Menaced by critic with sour furrowed brow, Mamus or Troilus or Scotch reviewer, Ruffle your heckle, grin and growl and vow, Ill-natured foes you thus will find the fewer, When foul-mouthed senseless railers cry thee down, Reply not, fly and show the rogues thy stern, They are not worthy even of a frown, Good taste or breeding they can never learn, Or let them clamor, turn a callous ear, as though in dread of some harsh donkey's bray. If chid by censor, friendly though severe, to such explain and turn thee not away. Thy vein, says he perchance, is all too free, thy smutty language suits not learned pen. Reply, good sir, throughout, the context see. Thought chastens thought, so prithee judge again. Besides, although my master's pen may wander through devious paths by which it ought not stray, his life is pure beyond the breath of slander, so pardon grant, tis merely but his way. Some rugged ruffian makes a hideous rout, brandish thy cudgel, threaten him to baste, the filthy fungus far from thee cast out, such nauseous banquets never suit my taste. Yet, calm and cautious, moderate thy ire, 
Be ever courteous, should the case allow. Sweet malt is ever made by gentle fire. Warm to thy friends, give all a civil bow. Even censure sometimes teaches to improve. Slight frosts have often cured too rank a crop. So, candid blame, my spleen shall never move, For skillful gardeners wayward branches lop. Go then, my book, and bear my words in mind. Guides safe at once, and pleasant them you'll find. The Argument of the Frontispiece Ten distinct squares here seen apart Are joined in one by Cutter's art. 1. Old Democritus under a tree Sits on a stone with book on knee. About him hang there many features, Of cats, dogs, and such like creatures, Of which he makes anatomy, The seat of black collar to see. Over his head appears the sky, And Saturn, lord of melancholy. 2. To the left a landscape of jealousy Presents itself unto thine eye. A kingfisher, a swan, and hern, Two fighting cocks you may discern, Two roaring bulls each other high, to assault concerning venery. Symbols are these, I say no more, conceive the rest by that's afore. 3. The next of solitariness, a portraiture doth well express, by sleeping dog, cat, buck and doe, hares, conies in the desert go, bats, owls, the shady bowers over, in melancholy darkness hover. Mark well, if be not as should be, Blame the bad cutter, and not me. 4. Ith under column there doth stand, Inamorato with folded hand. Down hangs his head, terse and polite, Some ditty sure he doth indite. His lute and books about him lie, As symptoms of his vanity. If this do not enough disclose to paint him, Take thyself by the nose. 5. Hypochondriacus leans on his arm, Wind in his side doth him much harm, And troubles him full sore, God knows, Much pain he hath and many woes. About him pots and glasses lie, Newly bought from apothecary. This Saturn's aspects signify, You see them portrayed in the sky. 6. Beneath them, kneeling on his knee, A superstitious man you see, he fasts, prays, on his idol fixed, Tormented hope and fear betwixt. For hell perhaps he takes more pain Than thou dost heaven itself to gain. Alas, poor soul, I pity thee, What stars incline thee so to be? 7. But see the madman rage downright With furious looks, a ghastly sight. Naked in chains bound doth he lie, And roars amain he knows not why. Observe him, for, as in a glass, thine angry portraiture it was. His picture keeps still in thy presence, betwixt him and thee there's no difference. 8. 9. Borage and hellebore fill two scenes, sovereign plants to purge the veins of melancholy and cheer the heart of those black fumes which make it smart, to clear the brain of misty fogs, which dull our senses and soul clogs, the best medicine that e'er God made for this malady, if well assayed. 10. Now last of all to fill a place, presented is the author's face, and in that habit which he wears, his image to the world appears. His mind no art can well express, that by his writings you may guess. It was not pride, nor yet vain glory, though others do it commonly, made him do this. If you must know, the printer would needs have it so. Then do not frown or scoff at it, deride not or detract a wit, for surely as thou dost by him, he will do the same again. Then look upon, behold and see, as thou likest it, so it likes thee. And I for it shall stand in view, thine to command, reader, adieu. The Author's Abstract of Melancholy, Dialogos When I go musing all alone, Thinking of divers things foreknown, When I build castles in the air, Void of sorrow and void of fear, Pleasing myself with phantasms sweet, Methinks the time runs very fleet. 
All my joys to this are folly, Not so sweet as melancholy. When I lie waking all alone, Recounting what I have ill done, My thoughts on me then tyrannize, Fear and sorrow me surprise, Whether I tarry still or go, Methinks the time moves very slow. If all my griefs to this are jolly, Not so mad as melancholy. When to myself I act and smile, With pleasing thoughts the time beguile, By a brookside or wood so green, Unheard, unsought for, or unseen, A thousand pleasures do me bless, And crown my soul with happiness. All my joys besides are folly, None so sweet as melancholy. When I lie, sit, or walk alone, I sigh, I grieve, making great moan, In a dark grove or irksome den, With discontents and furies then, A thousand miseries at once, Mine heavy heart and soul ensconce, All my griefs to this are jolly, None so sour as melancholy. Methinks I hear, methinks I see, Sweet music, wondrous melody, Towns, palaces, and cities fine, Here now, then there, the world is mine, Rare beauties, gallant ladies shine, Whate'er is lovely or divine. All other joys to this are folly, None so sweet as melancholy. Methinks I hear, methinks I see, Ghosts, goblins, fiends, my fantasy, Presents a thousand ugly shapes, Headless bears, black men, and apes, Doleful outcries and fearful sights, My sad and dismal soul affrights. All my griefs to this are jolly, None so damned as melancholy. Methinks I court, methinks I kiss, Methinks I now embrace my mistress. O oh, blessed days, O oh, sweet content, In paradise my time is spent. Such thoughts may still my fancy move, So may I ever be in love. All my joys to this are folly, Not so sweet as melancholy. When I recount love's many frights, My sighs and tears, my waking nights, My jealous fits, O oh, mine hard fate, I now repent, but tis too late. No torment is so bad as love, So bitter to my soul can prove. All my griefs to this are jolly, Not so harsh as melancholy. Friends and companions, get you gone, Tis my desire to be alone, Ne'er well but when my thoughts and I Do domineer in privacy. No gem, no treasure like to this, Tis my delight, my crown, my bliss. All my joys to this are folly, Not so sweet as melancholy. Tis my sole plague to be alone, I am a beast, a monster grown, I will no light nor company, I find it now my misery. The scene is turned, my joys are gone, Fear, discontent, and sorrows come. All my griefs to this are jolly, Not so fierce as melancholy. I'll not change life with any king, I ravished am, can the world bring More joy than still to laugh and smile, In pleasant toys time to beguile? Do not, oh do not trouble me, So sweet content I feel and see. All my joys to this are folly, None so divine as melancholy. I'll change my state with any wretch Thou canst from jail or dunghill fetch. My pain's past cure, another hell, I may not in this torment dwell. Now desperate I hate my life, Lend me a halter or a knife. All my griefs to this are jolly, Not so damned as melancholy. End of section 2「Section 3 of the Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1, by Robert Burton, Section 3. Democritus Jr. to the Reader, Part 1. Gentle reader, I presume thou wilt be very inquisitive to know what antique or personate actor this is that so insolently intrudes upon this common theatre to the world's view, arrogating 
another man's name, whence he is, why he doth it, and what he has to say, although, as he said, primum si nul ero non responsedebo quis coacturus est. I am a free man born, and may choose whether I will tell. Who can compel me? If I be urged, I will as readily reply as that Egyptian in Plutarch, when a curious fellow would needs know what he had in his basket. Quum vides velatum, quid inquiris in rem absconditum. It was therefore covered, because he should not know what it was in it. Seek not after that which is hid. If the contents please thee, and be for thy use, suppose the man in the moon, or whom thou wilt to be the author. I would not willingly be known, yet in some sort to give thee satisfaction, which is more than I need, I will show a reason, both of this usurped name, title, and subject, and first of the name of Democritus, lest any man by reason of it should be deceived, expecting a pasquil, a satire, some ridiculous treatise, as I myself should have done, some prodigious tenet, or paradox of the earth's motion, of infinite worlds, in infinito vacuo, ex fortuita atomorum collisione, in an infinite waste, so caused by an accidental collision of motes in the sun, all which Democritus held, Epicurus and their master Lucippus of old maintained, and are lately revived by Copernicus, Brunus, and some others. Besides, it has been always an ordinary custom, as Gellius observes, for later writers and impostors, to broach many absurd and insolent fictions, under the name of so noble a philosopher as Democritus, to get themselves credit, and by that means the more to be respected, as artificers usually do. Novo qui marmori, ascribunt praxaltilem suo. Tis not so with me. Non hic centaurus non gorgonas harpiasque, in venis hominem pagine nostra sapit. Now centaurs here, or gorgons look to find, my subject is of man and humankind. Thou thyself art the subject of my discourse. Quiquid aquant homines, votum timor ira voluptas, gaudia discursus nostri farrago libelli. Whatever men do, woes, fears, in ire, in sport, joys, wanderings, are the sum of my report. My intent is no otherwise to use his name than Mercurius Gallobelgicus, Mercurius Britannicus, use the name of Mercury, Democritus Christianus, etc., although there be some other circumstances for which I have masked myself under this wizard, and some peculiar respect which I cannot so well express, until I have set down a brief character of this our Democritus, what he was, was an epitome of his life. Democritus, as he is described by Hippocrates and Laertius, was a little weirish old man, very melancholy by nature, averse from company in his latter days, and much given to solitariness, a famous philosopher in his age, coiavus with Socrates, wholly addicted to his studies at the last, and to a private life, wrote many excellent works, a great, divine, according to the divinity of those times, an expert physician, a politician, an excellent mathematician, as Diacosmus and the rest of his works do witness. He was much delighted with the studies of husbandry, says Columella, and often I find him cited by Constantinus and others treating of that subject. He knew the natures, differences of all beasts, plants, fishes, birds, and, as some say, could understand the tunes and voices of them. In a word, he was omnifarium doctus, a general scholar, a great student, and to the intent he might better contemplate, I find it related by some that he put out his eyes, and was in his old age voluntarily blind, yet saw more than all Greece besides, and write of every subject. Nihil in toto opificio naturae, de quo non scripsit. A man of an excellent wit, profound conceit, 
and to attain knowledge the better in his younger years, he travelled to Egypt and Athens, to confer with learned men, admired of some, despised of others. After a wandering life he settled at Abdera, a town in Thrace, and was sent for thither to be their lawmaker, recorder, or town clerk, as some will, or as others, he was there bred and born. Howsoever it was, there he lived, at last in a garden in the suburbs, wholly betaking himself to his studies, and a private life, saving that sometimes he would walk down to the haven, and laugh heartily at such variety of ridiculous objects which there he saw. Such a one was Democritus. But in the meantime, how does this concern me, or upon what reference do I usurp his habit? I confess indeed, that to compare myself unto him for aught I have yet said, were both impudency and arrogancy. I do not presume to make any parallel. Antestat mihi milibus trescentes, parvus sum, nullus sum, altum nec spiro, nec spero. Yet thus much I will say of myself, and that I hope without all suspicion of pride, or self-conceit, I have lived a silent, sedentary, solitary, private life. Mihi et Moses, in the university, as long almost as Senocrates in Athens, ad senectam fere, to learn wisdom as he did, penned up most part in my study. For I have been brought up a student in the most flourishing college of Europe, Augustissimo Collegio, and can brag with Jovius, almost in ea loce domicili vacicani, vac Totius orbis celeberimi, per trigintia septem, annos multa opportunaque didici. For thirty years I have continued, having the use of a good libraries as ever he had, a scholar, and would be therefore loath, either by living as a drone, to be an unprofitable or unworthy member of so learned and noble a society, or to write that which should be any way dishonorable to such a royal and ample foundation. Something I have done, though by my profession a divine, yet turbine raptus ingenii, as he said, out of a running wit, an unconstant and settled mind, I had a great desire, not able to attain to a superficial skill in any, to have some smothering in all, to be a liquis in omnibus, nullus in singulis, which Plato commands, out of him Lipsius approves and furthers, as fit to be imprinted in all curious wits, not to be a slave of one science, or dwell altogether in one subject, as most do, but to row abroad, centum puer artium, to have an oar in every man's boat, to taste of every dish and sip of every cup, which, says Montaigne, was well performed by Aristotle and his learned countryman Adrian Turnibus. This rowing humor, though not with like success, I have ever had, and like a ranging spaniel that barks at every bird he sees, leaving his game, I have followed all, saving that which I should, and may justly complain and truly, qui ubique est, nosquam est, which Jesner did in modesty, that I have read many books, but to little purpose, for want of good method. I have confusedly tumbled over diverse authors in our libraries, with small profit, for want of art, order, memory, judgment. I never travelled but in map or card, in which mine con unconfined thoughts have freely expatiated, as having ever been especially delighted with the study of cosmography. Saturn was lord of my genitor, culminating, etc., and Mars' principal significator of manners. In partial conjunction with my ascendant, both fortunate in their houses, etc. I am not poor, I am not rich. Nihil est, nihil de est. I have little, I want nothing. All my treasure is in Minerva's tower. Greater preferment as I could never get, so am I not in debt for it. I have a competence, laus deo, from my noble and munificent patrons, though I live still a collegiate stu student, as Democritus in his garden, and lead a monastic life, ipse mihi theatrum. 
sequestered from those tumults and troubles of the world, et tanquam in specula positus, as he said, in some high place above you all, like stoicus sapiens, omnia saecula, praeterita presentique videns, uno velut intuitu. I hear and see what is done abroad, how others run, ride, turmoil, and macerate themselves in court and country, far from those wrongling lawsuits, aulia vanitatem fori ambitionem radere mecum soleo. I laugh at all, only secure, lest my suit go amiss, my ships perish, corn and cattle miscarry, trade decay. I have no wife nor children, good nor bad, to provide for. A mere spectator of other men's fortunes and adventures, and how they act their parts, which methinks are diversely presented unto me, as from a common theatre or scene. I hear new news every day, and those ordinary rumours of war, plagues, fires, inundations, thefts, murders, massacres, meteors, comets, spectrums, prodigies, apparitions, of towns taken, cities besieged in France, Germany, Turkey, Persia, Poland, etc., daily musters and preparations and such like, which these tempestuous times afford, battles fought, so many men slain, monomachies, shipwrecks, piracies and sea fights, peace, leagues, stratagems and fresh alarms, a vast confusion of vows, wishes, actions, edicts, petitions, lawsuits, pleas, laws, proclamations, complaints, grievances, are daily brought to our ears. New books every day, pamphlets, corantos, stories, whole catalogues of volumes of all sorts, new paradoxes, opinions, schisms, heresies, controversies in philosophy, religion, etc. Now come tidings of weddings, maskings, nummeries, entertainments, jubilees, embassies, tilts and tournaments, trophies, triumphs, revels, sports, plays, then again, as in a new shifted scene, treasons, cheating tricks, robberies, enormous villainies in all kinds, funerals, burials, death of princes, new discoveries, expeditions, now comical, then tragical matters. Today we hear of new lords and officers created, tomorrow of some great man deposed, and then again of fresh honors conferred, one is let loose, another imprisoned, one purchased, another breaketh. He thrives, his neighbor turns bankrupt, now plenty, then again dearth and famine. One runs, another rides, wrangles, laughs, weeps, etc. This I daily hear, and such like, both private and public matters. Amidst the gallantry and misery of the world, jollity, pride, perplexities and cares, simplicity and villainy, subtlety, knavery, candor, and integrity, mutually mixed and offering themselves. I rub on privus privatus, as I have still lived, so I now continue, statu quo prius, left to a solitary life, and mine own domestic discontents, savings that sometimes, ne quit mentiar, as Diogenes went into the city, and Democritus to the haven to see fashions. I did for my recreation now and then walk abroad, look into the world, and could not choose but make some little observation. Non tam sagax observator ac simplex recitator. Not as they did to scoff or laugh at all, but with a mixed passion. Bilem saepe, jocum vestri movere tumultus. Ye wretched mimics, whose fond heats have been, how oft the objects of my mirth and spleen! I did sometimes laugh and scoff with Lucian, and satirically tax with Menenippus, lament with Heraclitus, sometimes again I was petulantis plene cachino, and then again urere bilis cecur. I was much moved to see that abuse which I could not mend, in which passion have soever, I may sympathize with him or them. Tis for no such respect I shroud myself under his name, but either in an unknown habit to assume a little more liberty and freedom of speech, 
or if you will needs know, for that reason and only respect, which Hippocrates relates at large in his epistle to Demegidus, wherein he does express, how coming to visit him one day, he found Democritus in his garden at, at Abdera, in the suburbs, under a shady bower, with a book on his knees, busy at his study, sometimes writing, sometimes walking. The subject of his book was melancholy and madness. About him lay the carcasses of many several beasts, newly by him cut up and anatomized. Not that he did contemn God's creatures, as he told Hippocrates, but to find out the seat of this atrabilis, or melancholy, whence it proceeds, and how it was engendered in men's bodies, to the intent he might better cure it in himself, and by his writings and observation teach others how to prevent and avoid it. Which good intent of his, Hippocrates highly commended. Democritus Jr. is therefore bold to imitate, and because he left it imperfect, and it is now lost, quasi succenturiator Democriti, to revive again, prosecute, and finish in this treatise. End of section 3《Section 4 of the Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1 by Robert Burton, Section 4. Democritus Jr. to the Reader, Part 2. You have had a reason of the name. If the title and inscription offend your gravity, were it a sufficient justification to accuse others, I could produce many sober treatises, even sermons themselves, which in their fronts carry more fantastical names. Howsoever, it is a kind of policy in these days to prefix a fantastical title to a book which is to be sold, for, as larks come down to a day-net, many vain readers will tarry and stand gazing like silly passengers at an antic picture in a painter's shop, that will not look at a judicious piece. And indeed, as Scaliger observes, nothing more invites a reader than an argument unlooked for, unthought of, and sells better than a scoal pamphlet. Tum maxime cum novitas excitat palatum. Many men, saith Gellius, are very conceited in their inscriptions and able, as Pliny quotes out of Seneca, to make him loiter by the way that went in haste to fetch a midwife for his daughter, now ready to lie down. For my part, I have honourable precedents for this which I have done. I will cite one for all. Antony Zara, his Anatomy of Wit, in four sections, members, subsections, etc., to be read in our libraries. If any man except against the matter or manner of treatising of this my subject, and will demand a reason of it, I can allege more than one. I write of melancholy, by being busy to avoid melancholy. There is no greater cause of melancholy than idleness, no better cure than business, as Rassus holds, and howbeit, stultus laba est ineptiarum. To be busy in toys is to small purpose, yet hear that divine Seneca, aliud agere quam nihil, better do to no end than nothing. I wrote, therefore, and busied myself in this playing labour, olio sacque diligentia ut vitarum torporum feriandi, with vectius in microbius, atque otium in utile vertere negatium. Simul et jucunda et idonea dicere vita, lectorum delectando simul atque monendo. Poets would profit or delight mankind, and with the pleasing have the instructive joined. Profit and pleasure, then, to mix with art, to inform the judgment, nor offend the heart, shall gain all votes. To this end I write, like them, saith Lucian, that recite to trees, and declaim to pillars for want of auditors, as Paulus Egineta ingenuously confesseth. Not that anything was unknown or omitted, but to exercise myself, which course, if some took, I think it would be good for their bodies, and much better for their souls, or peradventure as others do, for fame to show myself. Scire tuum nihil est, 
Nisi tescire hoc sciat alta. I might be your Thucydides opinion. To know a thing and not to express it is all one as if he knew it not. When I first took this task in hand, et quod ait ille, impellens genio negotium suscepi, this I aimed at, vel ut lunirum animum scribendo, to ease my mind by writing. For I had gravidum cor, fetum caput, a kind of impostome in my head, which I was very desirous to be unladen of, and could imagine no fitter evacuation than this. Besides, I might not well refrain, for ubi dollar ibi digitis, one must needs scratch where it itches. I was not a little offended with this malady, shall I say my mistress melancholy, my agaria, or my malus genius. And for that cause, as he that is stung with a scorpion, I would expel clavum clavo, comfort one sorrow with another, idleness with idleness ut ex vipera theriacum, make an antidote out of that which was the prime cause of my disease. Or as he did, of whom Felix Plater speaks, that thought he had some of Aristophanes' frogs in his belly, still crying, breek, orkex, cox, cox, oop, oop, and for that cause studied physics seven years, and travelled over most part of Europe to ease himself. To do myself good, I turned over such physicians as our libraries would afford, or my private friends in part, and have taken this pains. And why not? Cardan professeth, he wrote his book, De Consolatione, after his son's death, to comfort himself. So did Tully write of the same subject with like intent after his daughter's departure. If it be his at least, or some impostors put out in his name, which Lipsius probably suspects. Concerning myself... I can peradventure affirm with Marius in Sallust, that which others hear or read of, I felt and practised myself. They get their knowledge by books, I mine by melancholizing. Experto crede Roberto. Something I can speak out of experience. Erum novelis experientia medocuit, and with her in the poet, haud ignara mali miserius succurere disco. I would help others out of a fellow feeling. And as that virtuous lady did of old, being a leper herself, bestow all her portion to build an hospital for lepers, I will spend my time and knowledge, which are my greatest fortunes, for the common good of all. Yea, but you will infer that this is actum agere, an unnecessary work, cramban bis coctam aponere, the same again and again in other words. To what purpose? Nothing is omitted that may well be said, so thought Lucian in the like theme. How many excellent physicians have written just volumes and elaborate tracts of this subject? No news here. That which I have is stolen from others. Dicitre mihi mea pagina fur es. If that severe doom of Synesius be true, it is a greater offence to steal dead men's labours than their clothes. What shall become of most lighters? I hold up my hand at the bar, among others, and am guilty of felony in this kind, habes confitentum reum. I am content to be pressed with the rest. Tis most true, tenet insanabili multos scribende cacoethes. And there is no end of writing of books, as the wise men found of old, in this scribbling age, especially wherein the number of books is without number, as a worthy man saith. Presses be oppressed, and out of an itching humour that every man hath to show himself, desirous of fame and honour, Scribimus inducti doctique, he will write no matter what, and scrape together it boots not whence. Bewitched with this desire of fame, etiam medis in morbis, to the disparagement of their health, and scarce able to hold a pen, they must say something and get themselves a name, says Scaliger, though it be to the downfall and ruin of many others. To be counted writers, scriptores ut salutentur, to be thought and held polymaths and polyhistors. Apod imperitum vulgus ob ventosi nomen artis, to get a paper kingdom. Nulla spe Christus sed ampla famae, in this precipitate, ambitious age, nunc ut est saeculum, inter imatoram eruditionum, ambitiosum et praeceps, tis Scaliger's censure, and they that are scarce auditors, vix auditores, must be masters and teachers before they can be capable and fit hearers. They will rush into all learning, togatum armatum, 
divine human authors, rake over all indexes and pamphlets for notes, as our merchants do strange havens for traffic, write great tomes, cum non sint revera doctiores, sed loquaciores, whereas they are not thereby better scholars, but greater praetors. They commonly pretend public good, but as Gessner observes, tis pride and vanity that eggs them on, no news or aught worthy of note, but the same in other terms. Ne feria rentor fortasse typography vel idio scribendum est aliquid ut se vixisse testentor. As apothecaries we make new mixtures every day, pour out of one vessel into another, and as those old Romans robbed all the cities of the world to set out their bad-sighted Rome, we skim off the cream of other men's wits, pick the choice flowers of their tilled gardens to set out our own sterile plots. Castrant alios ut libros suos, per se gracules alieno adepe suffarciant, so Jovius inveys. They lard their lean books with the fat of others' works, in erudi fures, etc., a fault that every writer finds, as I do now, and yet faulty themselves, trium literarum homines, all thieves. They pilfer out of old writers to stuff up their new comments, scrape Aeneas's dunghills, and out of Democritus' pit, as I have done. By which means it comes to pass that not only libraries and shops are full of our putrid papers, but every clothes stool and jakes. Scribunt, carmina, quae leg and cacantes. They serve to put under pies, to lap spice in, and to keep roast meat from burning. With us in France, says Scaliger, every man hath liberty to write, but few ability. Heretofore learning was graced by judicious scholars, but now noble sciences are vilified by base and illiterate scribblers, that either write for vain glory, need to get money, or as parasites to flatter and collogue with some great men. They put cut burrs, quis quiliasque ineptiasque. Among so many thousand authors you shall scarce find one, by reading of whom you shall be any whit better, but rather much worse. Quibus inficitur potius, quam perficitur, by which he is rather infected than any way perfected. Quitalia legit, quid didicit tandem, quid scit nisi somnia, nugas? So that oftentimes it falls out, which Callimachus taxed of old, a great book is a great mischief. Cardan finds fault with Frenchmen and Germans for their scribbling to no purpose. Non inquit ab edendo deterio. Modo novum aliquid inveniant. He doth not bar them to write, so that it be some new invention of their own, but we weave the same web still, twist the same rope again and again, or if it be a new invention, tis but some bauble or toy which idle fellows write. For, as idle fellows to read, and whoso cannot invent, he must have a barren wit in this scribbling age can forge nothing. Princes show their armies, rich men vaunt their buildings. Soldiers their manhood, and scholars vent their toys. They must read, they must hear whether they will or no. Et quod cunque semel cartis eleverit, omnes gestiet a fono radiantes, scire la cuque, et puerus et anus. What once is said and writ, all men must know, old wives and children as they come and go. What a company of poets hath this year brought out, as Pliny complains to Sosius Tenesius. This April every day some or other have recited. What a catalogue of new books all this year, all this age, I say, have our Frankfurt marts, our domestic marts, brought out. Twice a year, profferent se nova ingenia et ostentant, we stretch our wits out and set them to sale. Magno conato nihil agimus. So that which Gessner much desires, if a speedy reformation be not had by some prince's edicts and grave supervisors to restrain this liberty, it will run on in infinitum. Quis tam avidus librorum helluo? Who can read them? As already we shall have a vast chaos and confusion of books. We are oppressed with them. Our eyes ache with reading, our fingers with turning. For my part, I am one of the number. Nos numerus sumus, we are mere ciphers. I do not deny it. I have only this of Macrobius to say for myself. Omne mehem, nihil mehem. Tis all mine and none mine. As a good housewife out of divers fleeces weaves one piece of cloth, a bee gathers wax and honey out of many flowers and makes a new bundle of all, floriferous ut apes in saltibus omnia libant. 
I have laboriously collected this kento out of diverse writers, and that sine injuria. I have wronged no authors, but given every man his own, which Hierom so much commends in Nepotian. He stole not whole verses, pages, tracts, as some do nowadays, concealing their authors' names, but still said this was Cyprian's, that Lactantius, that Hilarius. So said Minutius Felix, so Victorinus, thus far Arnobius. I cite and quote nine authors, which, howsoever some illiterate scribblers account pedantical, as a cloak of ignorance, and opposite to their affected fine style, I must and will use. Sumpsi, non suripui, and what Varro speaks of bees, minime maleficae nullius opus velicarites faciunt delirius, I can say of myself, whom have I injured? The matter is theirs most part, and yet mine, apparet unde sumptum sit, which Seneca approves, aliud tamen quam unde sumptum sit apparet, which nature doth with the ailment of our bodies incorporate, digest, assimilate, I do, concoquere quod hausi, dispose of what I take. I make them pay tribute, to set out this my macaronicon, the method only is mine own. I must usurp that of Wecker, nihil dictum quod non dictum prius, methodus sola artificum ostendit. We can say nothing but what hath been said. The composition and method is ours only, and shows a scholar. Oribasius, Asius, Avicenna, have all out of Galen, but to their own method. Diverso stilo, non diversa fide. Our poets steal from Homer. He spews, saith alien, they lick it up. Divines use Austin's word verbatim still, and our story dressers do as much. He that comes last is commonly best. Donec quid grandius aetus, postua sorsque ferret melior. Though there were many giants of old in physic and philosophy, yet I say with Didacus Stella, a dwarf standing on the shoulders of a giant may see farther than a giant himself. I may likely add, alter and see farther than my predecessors, and it is no greater prejudice for me to indict after others than for Aelianus Montaltus, that famous physician, to write De Morbis Capitis after Jason Pratensis, Hernius, Hildesheim, etc. Many horses to run in a race, one logician, one rhetorician after another. Oppose then what thou wilt. Alatres licet usque nos et usque, et ganitibus improbis lacessas. I solve it thus. And for those other faults of barbarism, Doric dialect, extemporanean style, tautologies, apish imitation, a rhapsody of rags gathered together from several dunghills, excrements of authors, toys and fopperies confusedly tumbled out, without art, invention, judgment, wit, learning, harsh, raw, rude, fantastical, Absurd, insolent, indiscreet, ill-composed, indigested, vain, scurrile, idle, dull, and dry. I confess all, tis partly affected, thou canst not think worse of me than I do of myself. Tis not worth the reading, I yield it. I desire thee not to lose time in perusing so vain a subject. I should be peradventure loath myself to read him or thee so writing. Tis not operai pretium, all I say is this that I have precedents for it, which Isocrates calls perfugium eis qui peccant, others as absurd, vain, idle, illiterate, etc., nonoli alii idem fecurant. Others have done as much. It may be more, and perhaps thou thyself, novimus et qui te, etc. We have all our faults, schemus et hunc, venium, etc. Thou censurest me, so have I done others, and may do thee. Oidimus in que vicum, etc. Tis lex talionis quid pro quo. Go now, censure, criticise, scoff, and rail. Nasutus sis usque licet, sis denique nasus, non potes in nugas dicere plura meas, ipse ego quam dixi, etc. Wert thou all scoffs and flouts a very momus than we ourselves, thou canst not say worse of us. Thus, as when women scold, have I cried whore first, and in some men's censures I am afraid I have overshot myself, laudare se vani, vituperare stultai. As I do not arrogate, I will not derogate. Primus vestrum non sum, nec imus, I am none of the best, I am none of the meanest of you. 
as I am an inch or so many feet, so many parasangs, after him or him, I may be peradventure an ace before thee. Be it therefore as it is, well or ill, I have essayed, put myself upon the stage. I must abide the censure, I may not escape it. It is most true, stealers virum arguit, our style bewrays us, and as hunters find their game by the trace, so is a man's genius described by his works. Multo milius ex sermone quam linea mentis, de moribus hominum judicamus. It was old Cato's rule. I have laid myself open, I know it, in this treatise, turned mine inside outward. I shall be censured, I doubt not, for to say truth with Erasmus, nihil morosius hominum judicius. There is naught so peevish as men's judgments. Yet this is some comfort, ut palata, sic judicia. Our censures are as various as our palates. Tres mihi conviviae prope dissentire videntur, poscentes vario multum diversa palato, etc. Three guests I have dissenting at my feast, requiring each to gratify his taste with different food. Our writings are as so many dishes, our readers' guests, our books like beauty, that which one admires, another rejects. So are we approved as men's fancies are inclined. Pro captu lectoris habent su fata libelli. That which is most pleasing to one is amaracum sui, most harsh to another. Quot homines tot sententiae, so many men, so many minds. That which thou condemnest, he commends. Quod petis it sane est invisum, acidumque duobus. He respects matter, thou art holy for words. He loves a loose and free style. Thou art all for neat composition, strong lines, hyperboles, allegories. He desires a fine frontispiece, enticing pictures, such as Hieron, Natali the Jesuit, hath cut to the Dominicals, to draw on the reader's attention, which thou rejectest. That which one admires, another explodes as most absurd and ridiculous. If it be not point-blank to his humour, his method, his conceit, si quid forsum omissum, quod is animo concepperit si quae dictio, etc. If aught be omitted or added, which he likes or dislikes, thou art mancipium paucae lectionis, an idiot, an ass, nullus est, or plagiaris, a trifler, a trivant, thou art an idle fellow, or else it is a thing of mere industry, a collection without wit or invention, a very toy. Facilia sic putant omnes quae jam facta, nec de salebris cogitant, ubi via strata, so men are valued, their labours vilified by fellows of no worth themselves, as things of naught, who could not have done as much. Unus quisque abundat senso suo. Every man abounds in his own sense, and whilst each particular party is so affected, how should one please all? Quid dem, quid non dem, renius tu quod jubet ille. What courses must I choose, what not? What both would order you refuse? How shall I hope to express myself to each man's humour and conceit, or to give satisfaction to all? Some understand too little, some too much. Qui similiter in legendos libros, atque in salutandos homines irruant, non cogitantes quales. Sed quibus vestibus indutae sint, as Austin observes, not regarding what, but who write. Orexin habit octoris celebritas not valuing the metal, but stamp that is upon it. Cantharum aspiciunt, non quid in eo. If he be not rich, in great place, polite and brave, a great doctor, or full fraught with grand titles, though never so well qualified, he is a dunce. But as Baronius hath it of Cardinal Carafa's works, he is a mere hog that rejects any man for his poverty. Some are too partial, as friends to overween, Others come with a prejudice to carp, vilify, detract, and scoff. Qui de me forsan, quid quid est, omni contemptu contemptius judicant. Some as bees for honey, some as spiders to gather poison. What shall I do in this case? As a Dutch host, if you come to an inn in Germany, and dislike your fare, diet, lodging, etc., apply, replies in a surly tone, aliud tibi quaris diversorium, if you like not this, get you to another inn. I resolve, if you like not my writing, go read something else. 
I do not much esteem thy censure. Take thy course. It is not as thou wilt, nor as I will. But when we have both done, that of Plinius Secundus to Trajan will prove true. Every man's witty labour takes not, except the matter, subject, occasion, and some commending favourite happen to it. If I be taxed, exploded by thee, and some such, I shall haply be approved and commended by others, and so have been, expertus loquor, and may truly say with Jovius in like case, absit verbo jactantia, herum quorandum, pontificum, et virorum nobilium, familiaritatum, et amicitiam, gratasque gratias, et multorum bene laudatorum laudes sum inde for meritus. As I have been honoured by some worthy men, so have I been vilified by others, and shall be. At the first publishing of this book, which Probus of Persia's satires, editum librum continuo mirare homines, atque avide deripere caeperunt. I may in some sort apply this to my work. The first, second, and third edition were suddenly gone, eagerly read and, as I have said, not so much approved by some as scornfully rejected by others. But it was Democritus his fortune, idem admiratione et irisione habitus. T'was Seneca's fate, that superintendent of wit, learning, judgment, and stuporum doctus, the best of Greek and Latin writers in Plutarch's opinion, that renowned corrector of vice, as Fabius terms him, and painful omniscious philosopher, that writ so excellently and admirably well, could not please all parties or escape censure. How is he vilified by Caligula, Agellius, Fabius, and Lipsius himself, his chief propuna? In eo pleraque pernitiosa, saith the same Fabius, many childish tracts and sentences he hath, somo elaboratus, too negligent often and remiss, as Agellius observes, oratio vulgaris et protrita, decaces et ineptae, sententiae, eruditio plebeia, an homely shallow writer as he is. In partiba spinas et fastidia habet, saith Lipsius, and, as in all his other works, so especially in his epistles, aliae in argutius et ineptis occupantor, intricatus alicubi, et parum compositus, sine copia rerum hoc fecit. He jumbles up many things together immethodically, after the Stoics' fashion, parum ordinavit, multa accumulavit, etc. If Seneca be thus lashed, and many famous men that I could name, what shall I expect? How shall I that am vix umbra tanti philosophi hope to please? No man so absolute, Erasmus holds, to satisfy all except antiquity, prescription, etc., set a bar. But as I have proved in Seneca, this will not always take place. How shall I evade? Tis the common doom of all writers. I must, I say, abide it. I seek not applause. Non ego ventosa vena suffragia plebis. Again, non sum adio informis, I would not be vilified. Laudatus abunde, non fastidius si tibi lector ero. I fear good men's censures, and to their favourable acceptance I submit my labours. Et linguis mancipiorum contemno. As the barking of a dog, I securely contemn those malicious and scurrile obloquies, flouts, calumnies of railers and detractors. I scorn the rest. What therefore I have said, pro tenuitate mea, I have said. End of section 4section 5 of the anatomy of melancholy volume 1 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for further information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the anatomy of melancholy volume 1 by robert burton section 5 democritus junior to the reader Part three. One or two things yet I was desirous to have amended, if I could, concerning the manner of handling this my subject, 
for which I must apologise, deprecari, and upon better advice give the friendly reader notice. It was not mine intent to prostitute my muse in English, or to divulge secreta minervae, but to have exposed this more contract in Latin, if I could have got it printed. Any scurril pamphlet is welcome to our mercenary stationers in English. They print all. Cudunt quae libellos in quorum foliis vix simia nuda cacaret. But in Latin they will not deal, which is one of the reasons Nicholas Carr, in his oration of the paucity of English writers, gives that so many flourishing wits are smothered in oblivion, lie dead and buried in this our nation. Another main fault is that I have not revised the copy and amended the style, which now flows remissly as it was first conceived. But my leisure would not permit. Feci nec quod potui, nec quod volui. I confess it is neither as I would, nor as it should be. Cum relego, scripsisse pudet, quia plurima cerno, me quoque quae fuerant judice digna lini. When I peruse this tract which I have writ, I am abashed, and much I hold unfit. Et quod gravissimum, in the matter itself, many things I disallow at this present, which when I writ, non eadem est aetas, non mens. I would willingly retract much, etc., but tis too late. I can only crave pardon now for what is amiss. I might indeed, had I wisely done, observed that precept of the poet, nonum que prematur in annum, and have taken more care, or, as Alexander the physician would have done, by lapis lazuli, fifty times washed before it be used, I should have revised, corrected, and amended this tract, but I had not, as I said, that happy leisure, no amanuenses or assistants. Pancrates in Lucian, wanting a servant, as he went from Memphis to Coptus in Egypt, took a door-bar, and after some superstitious words pronounced, Eucrates, the relator, was then present, made it stand up like a serving-man, fetch him water, turn the spit, serve in supper, and what work he would besides. And when he had done that service he desired, turned his man to a stick again. I have no such skill to make new men at my pleasure, or means to hire them, no whistle to call like the master of a ship, and bid them run, etc. I have no such authority, no such benefactors, as that noble Ambrosius was to Origen, allowing him six or seven amanuenses to write out his dictates. I must for that cause do my business myself, and was therefore enforced, as a bear doth her whelps, to bring forth this confused lump. I had not time to lick it into form, as she doth her young ones, but even so to publish it, as it was first written, quicquid in bucam venit, in an extemporean style as I do commonly all other exercises, effudi quicquid dictavit genius meus, out of a confused company of notes, and writ with as small deliberation as I do ordinarily speak, without all affectation of big words, fustian phrases, jingling terms, tropes, strong lines, that like a Kester's arrows caught fire as they flew, strains of wit, brave heats, elegies, hyperbolical exornations, elegancies, etc., which many so much affect. I am aquae potor, drink no wine at all, which so much improves our modern wits. A loose, plain, rude writer, fecum voco fecum, et ligonem ligonem, and as free, as loose, Idem calamo quod in mente, I call a spade a spade, animis haec scribo, non auribus. I respect matter, not words, remembering that of Cardan, verba procta res, non res procta verba, and seeking with Seneca, quid scribam non quem modem, rather what than how to write. For, as Philo thinks, he that is conversant about matter neglects words, and those that excel in this art of speaking have no profound learning. Verba nitent falaris, at nullas verba medullas intus habent. 
Besides, it was the observation of that wise Seneca, when you see a fellow careful about his words, and neat in his speech, know this for a certainty, that man's mind is busied about toys, there's no solidity in him, non est ornamentum virile concinitas, as he said of a nightingale, voxes, praeterea nihil, etc. I am therefore in this point a professed disciple of Apollonius, a scholar of Socrates. I neglect phrases, and labour wholly to inform my reader's understanding, not to please his ear. Tis not my study or intent to compose neatly, which an orator requires, but to express myself readily and plainly as it happens so that as a river runs sometimes precipitate and swift, then dull and slow, now direct, then perambages, now deep, then shallow, now muddy, then clear, now broad, then narrow, doth my style flow, now serious, then light, now comical, then satirical, now more elaborate, then remiss, as the present subject required, or as at that time I was affected. And if thou vouchsafe to read this treatise, it shall seem no otherwise to thee than the way to an ordinary traveller, sometimes fair, sometimes foul, here champagne, there enclosed, barren in one place, better soil in another, by woods, groves, hills, dales, plains, etc. I shall lead thee per ardua montium, et lubrica valium, et roscida cespitum, et glebosa camporum, through variety of objects, that which thou shalt like, and surely dislike. For the matter itself, or method, if it be faulty, consider, I pray you, that of Columella, nihil perfectum, auta singulari consumatum industria. No man can observe all. Much is defective, no doubt, may be justly taxed, altered, and avoided, in Galen, Aristotle, those great masters, Boni venatoris plures feras capere, non omnes. He is a good huntsman, can catch some, not all. I have done my endeavour. Besides, I dwell not in this study. Non hic sulcos ducimus, non hoc pulvere desudamus. I am but a smatterer, I confess, a stranger. Here and there I pull a flower. I do easily grant. If a rigid censurer should criticise on this which I have writ, he should not find three sole faults, as Scaliger in Terence, but three hundred. So many as he hath done in Cardan's subtleties, as many noble errors as Gul Larambergius, a late professor of Rostock, discovers in that anatomy of Laurentius, or Barocius the Venetian, in Sacro Boscus. And although this be a sixth edition, in which I should have been more accurate, corrected all those former escapes, yet it was magni laboris opus, so difficult and tedious, that, as carpenters do find out of experience, tis much better build a new sometimes, than repair an old house. I could as soon write as much more as alter that which is written. If aught therefore be amiss, as I grant there is, I require a friendly admonition, no bitter invective. Sint musis socii carites, furia omnis abesto. Otherwise, as in ordinary controversies, funem contentiones nectamus, sed qui bono. We may contend and likely misuse each other, but to what purpose? We are both scholars, say, arcaris ambo et cantare pares, et respondere parati. Both young Arcadians, both alike inspired to sing and answer as the song required. If we do wrangle, what shall we get by it? Trouble and wrong ourselves, make sport to others. If I be convict of an error, I will yield, I will amend. Si quid bonis moribus, si quid veritati dissentanium, in sacris vel humanis literis, a me dictum sit, id nec dictum esto. In the meantime, I require a favourable censure of all faults omitted, harsh compositions, pleonasms of words, tautological repetitions, though Seneca bear me out, nunquam nimis dicitur, quod nunquam satis dicitur. Perturbations of tenses, numbers, printer's faults, etc. My translations are sometimes rather paraphrases than interpretations, non ad verbum, but, as an author, I use more liberty, 
and that's only taken which was to my purpose. Quotations are often inserted in the text, which makes the style more harsh, or in the margin, as it happened. Greek authors, Plato, Plutarch, Athenaeus, etc., I have cited out of their interpreters, because the original was not so ready. I have mingled sacra profanis, but I hope not profaned, and in repetition of authors' names, ranked them per accidens, not according to chronology, sometimes neoterics before ancients, as my memory suggested. Some things are here altered, expunged in this sixth edition, others amended, much added, because many good authors in all kinds are come to my hands since, and tis no prejudice, no such indecorum or oversight, nunquam ita, quicquam bene subducta ratione ad vitam fuit, quin res aetas usus, semper aliquid ad potent novi, aliquid moniant, tot illa quae scire te credas nescias, et quae tibi putaris prima, in exercendo ut repudias. Ne'er was aught yet at first contrived so fit, but use, age, or something would alter it. Advise thee better, and upon peruse, make thee not say, and what thou takest refuse. But I am now resolved never to put this treatise out again, ne quid nimis, I will not hereafter add, alter, or retract, I have done. The last and greatest exception is that I, being a divine, have meddled with physic. Tantumne est ab re tua otii tibi aliena ut cures? Eaque nihil quae ad te attinent? Which Menedemus objected to Cremes? Have I so much leisure, or little business of mine own, as to look after other men's matters which concern me not? What have I to do with physic? Quod medicorum est promittant medici. The Lacedaemonians were once in council about state matters. A debauched fellow spake excellent well, and to the purpose. His speech was generally approved. A grave senator steps up, and by all means would have it repealed, though good, because de honesta batur pessimo auctore, it had no better an author. Let some good man relate the same, and then it should pass. This counsel was embraced, factum est, and it was registered forthwith, et sic bona sententia mansit, malus auctor mutatus est. Thou sayest as much of me, stomachosus as thou art, and grantest, peradventure, this which I have written in physic, not to be amiss, had another done it, a professed physician, or so, but why should I meddle with this tract? Hear me speak. There be many other subjects I do easily grant, both in humanity and divinity, fit to be treated of, of which, had I written ad ostentationem only, to show myself, I should have rather chosen and in which I have been more conversant, I could have more willingly luxuriated, and better satisfied myself and others, but that, at this time, I was fatally driven upon this rock of melancholy, and carried away by this by-stream, which, as a rillet, is deducted from the main channel of my studies, in which I have pleased and busied myself at idle hours, as a subject most necessary and commodious. Not that I prefer it before divinity, which I do acknowledge to be the queen of professions, and to which all the rest are as handmaids, but that in divinity I saw no such great need. For had I written positively, there be so many books in that kind, so many commentators, treatises, pamphlets, expositions, sermons, that whole teams of oxen cannot draw them. And had I been as forward and ambitious as some others, I might have haply printed a sermon at Paul's Cross, a sermon in St. Mary's, Oxon, a sermon in Christchurch, or a sermon before the right honourable, right reverent, a sermon before the right worshipful, a sermon in Latin, in English, a sermon with a name, a sermon without, a sermon, a sermon, etc., but I have been ever as desirous to suppress my labours in this kind, as others have been to press and publish theirs. To have written in controversy had been to cut off an hydra's head, lis litem generat, one begets another, so many duplications, triplications, and swarms of questions, 
in sacro bello hoc quod stili mucrone agitur, that having once begun I should never make an end. One had much better, as Alexander, the sixth pope, long since observed, provoke a great prince than a begging friar, a Jesuit, or a seminary priest, I will add, for inexpugnabile genus hoc hominum, they are an irrefragable society, they must and will have the last word, and that with such eagerness, impudence, abominable lying, falsifying and bitterness in their questions they proceed, that, as he said, furor ne caecus an rapit vis acrior, an culpa responsum date, blind fury or error or rashness, or what it is that eggs them, I know not. I am sure many times, which Austin perceived long since, tempestate contentiones, serenitas caritatis ob nubilatur. With this tempest of contention, the serenity of charity is overclouded, and there be too many spirits conjured up already in this kind in all sciences, and more than we can tell how to lay, which do so furiously rage and keep such a racket, that, as Fabius said, it had been much better for some of them to have been born dumb and altogether illiterate than so far to dote their own destruction. At melius fuerat non scribere namque tacere tutum semper erit. Tis a general fault, so Severinus the Dane complains in physic, unhappy men as we are, we spend our days in unprofitable questions and disputations, Intricate subtleties, de lana caprina, about moonshine in the water, leaving in the meantime those chiefest treasures of nature untouched, wherein the best medicines for all manner of diseases are to be found, and do not only neglect them ourselves, but hinder, condemn, forbid, and scoff at others that are willing to inquire after them. These motives at this present have induced me to make choice of this medicinal subject. If any physician in the meantime shall infer, ne sutor ultra crepidam, and find himself grieved that I have intruded into his profession, I will tell him in brief, I do not otherwise by them than they do by us. If it be for their advantage, I know many of their sect which have taken orders in hope of a benefice, tis a common transition, and why may not a melancholy divine, that can get nothing but by simony, profess physic? Drusianus, an Italian, Crucianus, but corruptly Trithemius calls him, because he was not fortunate in his practice, forsook his profession, and writ afterwards in divinity. Marcilius Ficinus was semel et simul, a priest and a physician at once, and T. Linica, in his old age, took orders. The Jesuits profess both at this time, diverse of them, permissu superiorum, chirurgeons, panders, boards, and midwives, etc. Many poor country vicars, for want of other means, are driven to their shifts, to turn mountebanks, quacksalvers, empirics, and if our greedy patrons hold us to such hard conditions, as commonly they do, they will make most of us work at some trade, as Paul did, at last turn taskers, maltsters, costermongers, graziers, sell ale as some have done, or worse, Howsoever, in undertaking this task, I hope I shall commit no great error or indecorum. If all be considered aright, I can vindicate myself with Georgius Brownus, and Hieronymus Hemingius, those two learned divines, who, to borrow a line or two of mine elder brother, drawn by natural love, the one of pictures and maps, perspectives and choreographical delights, writ that ample theatre of cities, the other to the study of genealogies, Pend theatrum genealogicum, or else I can excuse my studies with Lessius the Jesuit in like case. It is a disease of the soul on which I am to treat, and as much appertaining to a divine as to a physician, and who knows not what an agreement there is betwixt these two professions. A good divine either is or ought to be a good physician, a spiritual physician at least as our Saviour calls himself, and was indeed. Matthew 4, 23, Luke 5, 18, Luke 7, 8. They differ but in object, the one of the body, the other of the soul, and use diverse medicines to cure. 
one amends animam per corpus, the other corpus per animam. As our regius professor of physic well informed us in a learned lecture of his not long since, one helps the vices and passions of the soul, anger, lust, desperation, pride, presumption, etc., by applying that spiritual physic, as the other uses proper remedies in bodily diseases. Now this being a common infirmity of body and soul, and such a one that hath as much need of spiritual as a corporal cure, I could not find a fitter task to busy myself about, a more apposite theme, so necessary, so commodious, and generally concerning all sorts of men, that should so equally participate of both, and require a whole physician. A divine, in this compound mixed malady, can do little alone. A physician, in some kinds of melancholy, much less. Both make an absolute cure. Alterius sic altera poscit opem. When in friendship joined, a mutual succour in each find. And tis proper to them both, and I hope not unbeseeming me, who am by my profession a divine, and by mine inclination a physician. I had Jupiter in my sixth house. I say with Beroaldus, non sum medicus, nec medicinae prosus expers. In the theory of physic I have taken some pains, not with an intent to practice, but to satisfy myself, which was a cause, likewise, of the first undertaking of this project. End of section 5section six of the anatomy of melancholy volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for further information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the anatomy of melancholy volume one by robert burton section six democritus junior to the reader Part 4. If these reasons do not satisfy thee, good reader, as Alexander Munificus, that bountiful prelate, sometimes Bishop of Lincoln, when he had built six castles, ad invidiam operis eluendam, saith Mr. Camden, to take away the envy of his work, which very words Nubrigensis hath of Roger, the rich bishop of Salisbury, who in King Stephen's time built Sherburn Castle, and that of Devizes, to divert the scandal or imputation, which might be thence inferred, built so many religious houses. If this my discourse be over-medicinal, or savour too much of humanity, I promise thee that I will hereafter make the amends in some treatise of divinity, but this I hope shall suffice, when you have more fully considered of the matter of this my subject, rem substratam, melancholy, madness, and of the reasons following, which were my chief motives, the generality of the disease, the necessity of the cure, and the commodity or common good that will arise to all men by the knowledge of it, as shall at large appear in the ensuing preface. And I doubt not, but that in the end you will say to me, that to anatomize this humour aright, through all the members of this our microcosmos, is as great a task as to reconcile those chronological errors in the Assyrian monarchy, find out the quadrature of a circle, the creeks and sounds of the north-east or north-west passages, and all out as good a discovery as that hungry Spaniards of terra australis incognita, as great trouble as to perfect the motion of Mars and Mercury, which so crucifies our astronomers, or to rectify the Gregorian calendar. I am so affected for my part, and hope, as Theophrastus did by his characters, that our posterity, O friend Polycles, shall be the better for this which we have written, by correcting and rectifying what is amiss in themselves by our examples, and applying our precepts and cautions to their own use. 
and as that great Captain Zizka would have a drum made of his skin when he was dead, because he thought the very noise of it would put his enemies to flight, I doubt not but these following lines, when they shall be recited, or hereafter read, will drive away melancholy, though I be gone, as much as Zizka's drum could terrify his foes. Yet one caution let me give by the way to my present, or my future reader, who is actually melancholy, that he read not the symptoms or prognostics in this following tract, lest by applying that which he reads to himself, aggravating, appropriating things generally spoken to his own person, as melancholy men for the most part do, he trouble or hurt himself, and get in conclusion more harm than good. I advise them, therefore, warily to peruse that tract, Lapides loquitur, so said Agrippa, et caveant lectores ne cerebrum iis excutiat. The rest I doubt not they may securely read, and to their benefit. But I am over-tedious. I proceed. Of the necessity and generality of this which I have said, if any man doubt, I shall desire him to make a brief survey of the world, as Cyprian adviseth Donut, supposing himself to be transported to the top of some high mountain, and thence to behold the tumults and chances of this wavering world. He cannot choose but either laugh at or pity it. St. Hierom, out of a strong imagination, being in the wilderness, conceived with himself that he then saw them dancing in Rome. And if thou shalt either conceive, or climb to see, thou shalt soon perceive that all the world is mad, that it is melancholy, dotes, that it is, which Epicthonius Cosmopolites expressed not many years since in a map, made like a fool's head, with that motto, caput helleboro dignum, a crazed head, cavia stultorum, a fool's paradise, or, as Apollonius, a common prison of gulls, cheaters, flatterers, etc., and needs to be reformed. Strabo, in the ninth book of his geography, compares Greece to the picture of a man, which comparison of his, Nicolaus Gerbelius, in his exposition of Sophianus's map, approves. The breast lies open from those Acrocheraunian hills in Epirus to the Sunian promontory in Attica, Pagai and Megaira are the two shoulders, that Isthmus of Corinth, the neck, and Peloponnesus, the head. If this illusion hold, tis sure a mad head. Morea may be Moria, and to speak what I think, the inhabitants of modern Greece swerve as much from reason and true religion at this day as that Morea doth from the picture of a man. Examine the rest in like sort, and you shall find that kingdoms and provinces are melancholy, cities and families, all creatures, vegetal, sensible, and rational, that all sorts, sects, ages, conditions, are out of tune, as in Sibi's table, omnes errorum bibunt. Before they come into the world, they are intoxicated by error's cup, from the highest to the lowest have need of physic, and those particular actions in Seneca, where father and son prove one another mad, may be general. Porcius Latro shall plead against us all, for indeed who is not a fool, melancholy, mad? Qui nil molitur inepte, who is not brain-sick? Folly, melancholy, madness, are but one disease, delirium is a common name to all. Alexander, Gordonius, Jason Pratensis, Savanarola, Gianerius, Montaltus, confound them as differing secundum magis et minus, so doth David, Psalmus 37, 5. I said unto the fools, deal not so madly, and twas an old stoical paradox, omnes stultos insanire, all fools are mad, though some madder than others. And who is not a fool, who is free from melancholy, who is not touched more or less in habit or disposition? If in disposition, ill dispositions beget habits. If they persevere, saith Plutarch, habits either are or turn to diseases. 
Tis the same which Tully maintains in the second of his Tusculans, Omnium incipientum animi in morbo sunt, et perturbatorum. Fools are sick, and all that are troubled in mind, for what is sickness but, as Gregory Tholosanus defines it, a dissolution or perturbation of the bodily league which health combines, and who is not sick, or ill-disposed, in whom doth not passion, anger, envy, discontent, fear, and sorrow reign? Who labours not of this disease? Give me but a little leave, and you shall see by what testimonies, confessions, arguments, I will evince it, that most men are mad, that they had as much need to go a pilgrimage to the Antichairai, as in Strabo's time they did, as in our days they run to Compostella, Our Lady of Sicum, or Loretta, to seek for help, that it is like to be as prosperous a voyage as that of Guiana, and that there is much more need of hellebore than of tobacco. That men are so misaffected, melancholy, mad, giddy-headed, hear the testimony of Solomon, Ecclesiastes 2, 12, and I turn to behold wisdom, madness, and folly, etc. And verse 23, All his days are sorrow, his travel grief, and his heart taketh no rest in the night. So that take melancholy in what sense you will, properly or improperly, in disposition or habit, for pleasure or for pain, dotage, discontent, fear, sorrow, madness, for part or all, truly or metaphorically, tis all one. Laughter itself is madness, according to Solomon, and as St. Paul hath it, worldly sorrow brings death. The hearts of the son of men are evil, and madness is in their hearts while they live. Ecclesiastes 9, 3 Wise men themselves are no better. Ecclesiastes 1, 18 In the multitude of wisdom is much grief, and he that increaseth wisdom increaseth sorrow. Chapter 2, 17 He hated life itself, nothing pleased him. He hated his labour, all, as he concludes, is sorrow, grief, vanity, vexation of spirit. And though he were the wisest man in the world, sanctuarium sapientiae, and had wisdom in abundance, he will not vindicate himself, or justify his own actions. Surely I am more foolish than any man, and have not the understanding of a man in me. Proverbs 32 be they Solomon's words, or the words of Agur, the son of Jacke, they are canonical. David, a man after God's own heart, confesseth as much of himself. Psalm 37, 21, 22. So foolish was I, and ignorant, I was even as a beast before thee, and condemns all for fools. Psalm 93, 32, 9, 49, 20. He compares them to beasts, horses, and mules, in which there is no understanding. The Apostle Paul accuseth himself in like sort, 2 Corinthians 9.21. I would you would suffer a little my foolishness, I speak foolishly. The whole head is sick, saith Isaiah, and the heart is heavy, chapter 1, 5, and makes lighter of them than of oxen and asses. The ox knows his owner, etc. Read Deuteronomy 32, 6, Jeremiah 4, Amos 3, 1, Ephesians 5, 6. Be not mad, be not deceived, foolish Galatians. Who hath bewitched you? How often are they branded with this epithet of madness and folly? No word so frequent amongst the fathers of the church and divines. You may see what an opinion they had of the world and how they valued men's actions. I know that we think far otherwise, and hold them most part wise men that are in authority, princes, magistrates, rich men, they are wise men born, all politicians and statesmen must needs be so, for who dare speak against them? And on the other, so corrupt is our judgment, we esteem wise and honest men fools which Democritus well signified in an epistle of his to Hippocrates. The Abderites account virtue madness, and so do most men living. Shall I tell you the reason of it? Fortune and virtue, wisdom and folly, their seconds, 
upon a time contended in the Olympics. Every man thought that fortune and folly would have the worst, and pitied their cases. But it fell out otherwise. Fortune was blind, and cared not where she stroke, nor whom, without laws. Audabatarum instar, etc. Folly, rash and inconsiderate, esteemed as little what she said or did. Virtue and wisdom gave place, were hissed out, and exploded by the common people. Folly and fortune admired, and so are all their followers ever since. Knaves and fools commonly fare and deserve best in worldlings' eyes and opinions. Many good men have no better fate in their ages. Achish, 1 Samuel 21, 14, held David for a madman. Elisha and the rest were no otherwise esteemed. David was derided of the common people. Psalm 9, 7. I am become a monster to many, and generally we are accounted fools for Christ. 1 Corinthians 14. We fools thought his life madness, and his end without honour. Christ and his apostles were censured in like sort. John 10, Mark 3, Acts 26. And so were all Christians in Pliny's time. Fuerunt et alii, similis dementiae, etc and called, not long after, Vesaniae sectatores, Aversores hominum, Polluti novatores, Fanatici, Canes, Malefici, Venefici, Galileae homunciones, etc. Tis an ordinary thing with us to account honest, devout, orthodox, divine, religious, plain-dealing men, idiots, asses that cannot or will not lie and dissemble, shift, flatter, Ocomodare se ad eum locum ubi nati sunt. Make good bargains, supplant, thrive. Patronis inservire, solennes ascendendi modos apprehendere, leges, mores, consuetudines, recte observare, candide laudare, fortiter defendere, sententias amplecti, dubitare de nullus, credere omnia. A cipre omnia, nihil reprehendere, caeteraque quae promotionem ferunt et securitatem, quae sine ambage felicim, redunt hominem, et vere sapientem apunos. That cannot temporize, as other men do, hand and take bribes, etc., but fear God, and make a conscience of their doings. But the Holy Ghost, that knows better how to judge, he calls them fools. The fool hath said in his heart. Psalm 53, 1. And their ways utter their folly. Psalm 49, 14. For what can be more mad than for a little worldly pleasure to procure unto themselves eternal punishment, as Gregory and others inculcate unto us? Yea, even all those great philosophers the world hath ever had in admiration, whose works we do so much esteem, that gave precepts of wisdom to others, inventors of arts and sciences, Socrates, the wisest man of his time, by the oracle of Apollo, whom his two scholars, Plato and Xenophon, so much extol and magnify with those honourable titles, best and wisest of all mortal men, the happiest and most just, and as Alcibiades incomparably commends him. Achilles was a worthy man, but Brasides and others were as worthy as himself. Antina and Nestor were as good as Pericles, and so of the rest. But none present before or after Socrates, Nemo veterum, neque eorum qui nunc sunt, were ever such, will match or come near him. Those seven wise men of Greece, those Briton Druids, Indian Brachmani, Ethiopian Gymnosophist, Magi of the Persians, Apollonius, of whom Philostratus, non doctus, said natus sapiens, wise from his cradle, Epicurus, so much admired by his scholar Lucretius, qui genus humanum ingenio superavit et omnes pestrinxit stellas exortus ut aetherius sol, whose wits excelled the wits of men as far as the sun rising doth obscure a star, or that so much renowned Empedocles. 
ut vix humana videatur stirpe creatus. All those of whom we read such hyperbolical eulogiums, as of Aristotle, that he was wisdom itself in the abstract, a miracle of nature, breathing libraries, as Eunapius of Longinus, lights of nature, giants for wit, quintessence of wit, divine spirits, eagles in the clouds, fallen from heaven, gods, spirits, lamps of the world, dictators, nulla ferant talem saecla futura virum. Monarchs, miracles, superintendents of wit and learning, Oceanus, Phoenix, Atlas, Monstrum, Portentum hominis, Orbis universi mosaium, Ultimus humana naturae donatus, Naturae maritus, Merito qui doctior orbis, Submissis defert fascibus imperium. As Aelian writ of Protagoras and Gorgias, We may say of them all, Tantum a sapientibus abfuerunt, quantum a viris pueri. They were children in respect, infants, not eagles but kites, novices, illiterate, unuci sapientiae. And although they were the wisest and most admired in their age, as he censured Alexander, I do them. There were ten thousand in his army as worthy captains, had they been in place of command, as valiant as himself. There were myriads of men wiser in those days, and yet all short of what they ought to be. Lactantius, in his book of wisdom, proves them to be dizzards, fools, asses, madmen, so full of absurd and ridiculous tenets and brain-sick positions, that to his thinking never any old woman or sick person doted worse. Democritus took all from Leucippus, and left, saith he, the inheritance of his folly to Epicurus, insanienti dum sapientiae, etc. The like he holds of Plato, Aristippus, and the rest, making no difference betwixt them and beasts, saving that they could speak. Theodoret, in his tract De Curatione Graecarum Affectionum, manifestly evinces as much of Socrates, whom, though that oracle of Apollo confirmed to be the wisest man then living, and saved him from plague, whom two thousand years have admired, of whom some will as soon speak evil as of Christ, yet, Rewera, he was an illiterate idiot, as Aristophanes calls him, iriscor et ambitiosus, as his master Aristotle terms him, scura atticus, as Zeno, an enemy to all arts and sciences, as Athenius, to philosophers and travellers, an opiniative ass, a cavilla, a kind of pedant, for his manners, as Theodoret Cyrensis describes him, a sodomite, an atheist, so convict by Anitus, iracundus et ebrius, dicax, etc., a pot companion, by Plato's own confession, a sturdy drinker, and that of all others he was most sottish, a very madman in his actions and opinions. Pythagoras was part philosopher, part magician, or part witch. If you desire to hear more of Apollonius, a great wise man, sometime paralleled by Julian the apostate to Christ, I refer you to that learned tract of Eusebius against Heracles, and for them all to Lucian's Piscator, Icaromenippus, Neciomantia, their actions, opinions in general, were so prodigious, absurd, ridiculous, which they broached and maintained. Their books and elaborate treatises were full of dotage, which Tully ad Atticum long since observed, delirant plerunque scriptores in libri suis, their lives being opposite to their words. They commended poverty to others, and were most covetous themselves, extolled love and peace, and yet persecuted one another with virulent hate and malice. They could give precepts for verse and prose, but not a man of them, as Seneca tells them home, could moderate his affections. Their music did show us flabiles modos, etc., how to rise and fall, but they could not so contain themselves as in adversity not to make a lamentable tone. They will measure ground by geometry, set down limits, divide and subdivide, but yet cannot prescribe quantum homini satis, or keep within compass and reason and discretion. 
They can square circles, but understand not the state of their own souls, describe right lines and crooked, etc., but know not what is right in this life. Quid in vita rectum sit, ignorant. So that, as he said, Nescio an antikairam ratio ilis destinet omnem, I think all the Antichiri will not restore them to their wits, if these men now, that held Xenodotus's heart, Crates's liver, Epictetus's lantern, were so sottish, and had no more brains than so many beetles. What shall we think of the commonalty? What of the rest? Yea, but you will infer that is true of heathens, if they be conferred with Christians. 1 Corinthians 3.19 the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, earthly and devilish, as James calls it. 3.15. They were vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was full of darkness. Romans 1, 21, 22. When they professed themselves wise, became fools. Their witty works are admired here on earth, whilst their souls are tormented in hell fire. In some sense, Christiani, Crassiani, Christians are Crassians, and if compared to that wisdom, no better than fools. Quis est sapiens? Solus Deus, Pythagoras replies. God is only wise. Romans 16. Paul determines only good, as Austin well contends, and no man living can be justified in his sight. God looked down from heaven upon the children of men, to see if any did understand. Psalm 53, 2, 3. But all are corrupt, err. Uh, Romans 3, 12. None doeth good, no, not one. Job aggravates this, 4, 18. Behold, he found no steadfastness in his servants, and laid folly upon his angels. 19. How much more on them that dwell in houses of clay? In this sense we are all fools, and the scripture alone is arx minervae. We and our writings are shallow and imperfect. But I do not so mean. Even in our ordinary dealings we are no better than fools. All our actions, as Pliny told Trajan, upbraid us of folly. Our whole course of life is but matter of laughter. We are not soberly wise, and the world itself, which ought at least to be wise by reasons of his antiquity, as Hugo de Prato Florido will have it, semper stultizat, is every day more foolish than other. The more it is whipped, the worse it is, and as a child will still be crowned with roses and flowers. We are apish in it, asini bipedes, and every place is full, in versorum apuleorum, of metamorphosed and two-legged asses, in versorum silenorum, childish, pueri instarbimuli, tremula patris dormientis in ulna. Jovianus Pontanus, Antonio Dial, brings in some laughing at an old man, that by reason of his age was a little fond, but, as he admonisheth there, Ne mireres mi hospes de hoc sene. Marvel not at him only, for tota haec civitas delirium. All our town dotes in like sort. We are a company of fools. Ask not with him in the poet, Larvae hunc in temperiae insaniaeque agitant senem? What madness ghosts this old man, but what madness ghosts us all? For we are ad unum omnes, all mad, semel in sarnivimus omnes, not once, but always so, et semel, et simul, et semper, ever and altogether as bad as he, and not senex bis puer delira annus, but say it of us all, semper pueri, young and old, all dote, as Lactantius proves out of Seneca, and no difference betwixt us and children, saving that maiora ludimus et grandioribus pupis. They play with babies of clouts and such toys. We sport with greater baubles. We cannot accuse or condemn one another, being faulty ourselves. Deliramenta loqueris. You talk idly. Or as Mitio upbraided de mea, insanis, auferte. For we are as mad our own selves. 
and it is hard to say which is the worst. Nay, tis universally so, vitam regit fortuna, non sapientia. End of section 6section seven of the anatomy of melancholy volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for further information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the anatomy of melancholy volume one by robert burton section seven democritus junior to the reader part five when Socrates had taken great pains to find out a wise man, and to that purpose had consulted with philosophers, poets, artificers, he concludes all men were fools, and though it procured him both anger and much envy, yet in all companies he would openly profess it. When Suputius in Pontanus had travelled all over Europe to confer with a wise man, he returned at last without his errand, and could find none. Cardan concurs with him. Few there are, for aught I can perceive, well in their wits. So doth Tully. I see everything to be done foolishly and unadvisedly. Ille sinistrosum, hic dextrosum, unus utrique error, sed varii siludit partibus omnes. One reels to this, another to that wall. Tis the same error that deludes them all. They dote all, but not alike. Maniaga upas in homoia. Not in the same kind. One is covetous, a second lascivious, a third ambitious, a fourth envious, etc., as Damasippus the Stoic hath well illustrated in the poet. Decipiunt omnes, aeque ac tu. And they who call you fool, with equal claim, may plead an ample title to the name. Tis an inbred malady in every one of us. There is seminarium stultitiae, a seminary of folly, which, if it be stirred up or get ahead, will run in infinitum, and infinitely varies, as we ourselves are severally addicted, saith Balthasar Castilio, and cannot so easily be rooted out, it takes such fast hold, as Tully holds, altae radices stultitiae, so we are bred, and so we continue. Some say there be two main defects of wit, error and ignorance, to which all others are reduced. By ignorance we know not things necessary, by error we know them falsely. Ignorance is a privation, Error, a positive act. From ignorance comes vice, from error, heresy, etc. But make how many kinds you will, divide and subdivide, few men are free, or that do not impinge on some one kind or other. Seek plerumque agitat stultus in scitia, as he that examines his own and other men's actions shall find. Charon, in Lucian, as he wittily feigns, was conducted by Mercury to such a place, where he might see all the world at once. After he had sufficiently viewed and looked about, Mercury would needs know of him what he had observed. He told him that he saw a vast multitude and a promiscuous, their habitations like molehills, the men as emmets. He could discern cities like so many hives of bees, wherein every bee had a sting, and they did naught else but sting one another, some domineering like hornets bigger than the rest, some like filching wasps, others as drones. Over their heads were hovering a confused company of perturbations, hope, fear, anger, avarice, ignorance, etc., and a multitude of diseases hanging which they still pulled on their pates. Some were brawling, some fighting, riding, running, solicite ambientes, calide litigantes, for toys and trifles and such momentary things. 
their towns and provinces mere factions, rich against poor, poor against rich, nobles against artificers, they against nobles, and so the rest. In conclusion, he condemned them all for madmen, fools, idiots, asses. O oh, stulti quinam haec est amentia! O oh, fools, O oh, madmen! he exclaimed. Insana studia, insani labores, etc. Mad endeavours, mad actions, mad, mad, mad! O oh, cyclum incipiens et infacetum, a giddy-headed age! Heraclitus the philosopher, out of a serious meditation of men's lives, fell a-weeping, and with continual tears bewailed their misery, madness, and folly. Democritus, on the other side, burst out a-laughing. Their whole life seemed to him so ridiculous, and he was so far carried with this ironical passion, that the citizens of Abdera took him to be mad, and sent therefore ambassadors to Hippocrates, the physician, that he would exercise his skill upon him. But the story is set down at large by Hippocrates in his epistle to Damogetus, which, because it is not impertinent to this discourse, I will insert verbatim almost as it is delivered by Hippocrates himself, with all the circumstances belonging unto it. When Hippocrates was now come to Abdera, the people of the city came flocking about him, some weeping, some entreating of him, that he would do his best. After some little repast, he went to see Democritus, the people following him, whom he found, as before, in his garden in the suburbs all alone, sitting upon a stone under a plane tree, without hose or shoes, with a book on his knees, cutting up several beasts, and busy at his study. The multitude stood gazing round about to see the congress. Hippocrates, after a little pause, saluted him by his name, whom he re-saluted, ashamed almost that he could not call him likewise by his, or that he had forgot it. Hippocrates demanded of him what he was doing. He told him that he was busy in cutting up several beasts, to find out the cause of madness and melancholy. Hippocrates commended his work, admiring his happiness and leisure. And why, quoth Democritus, have not you that leisure? Because, replied Hippocrates, domestic affairs hinder, necessary to be done for ourselves, neighbours, friends, expenses, diseases, frailties, and mortalities which happen, wife, children, servants, and such business which deprive us of our time. At this speech Democritus profusely laughed, his friends and the people standing by, weeping in the meantime, and lamenting his madness. Hippocrates asked the reason why he laughed. He told him, at the vanities and the fopperies of the time, to see men so empty of all virtuous actions, to hunt so far after gold, having no end of ambition, to take such infinite pains for a little glory, and to be favoured of men, to make such deep mines into the earth for gold, and many times to find nothing, with loss of their lives and fortunes, some to love dogs, others horses, some to desire to be obeyed in many provinces, and yet themselves will know no obedience, some to love their wives dearly at first, and after a while to forsake and hate them, begetting children with much care and cost for their education, yet when they grow to man's estate, to despise, neglect, and leave them naked to the world's mercy. Do not these behaviours express their intolerable folly? When men live in peace, they covet war, detesting quietness, deposing kings and advancing others in their stead, murdering some men to beget children of their wives. How many strange humours are in men! When they are poor and needy, they seek riches, and when they have them, they do not enjoy them, but hide them underground, or else wastefully spend them. O oh, wise Hippocrates, I laugh at such things being done, but much more when no good comes of them, and when they are done to so ill purpose. There is no truth or justice found amongst them, for they daily plead one against another, the son against the father and the mother, 
brother against brother, kindred and friends of the same quality, and all this for riches, whereof after death they cannot be possessors. And yet, notwithstanding, they will defame and kill one another, commit all unlawful actions, contemning God and men, friends and country. They make great account of many senseless things, esteeming them as a great part of their treasure, statues, pictures, and such like movables, dear bought and so cunningly wrought, as nothing but speech wanteth in them, and yet they hate living persons speaking to them. Others affect difficult things. If they dwell on firm land, they will remove to an island, and thence to land again, being no way constant to their desires. They commend courage and strength in wars, and let themselves be conquered by lust and avarice. They are, in brief, as disordered in their minds as Thersites was in his body. And now, methinks, O most worthy Hippocrates, you should not reprehend my laughing, perceiving so many fooleries in men, for no man will mock his own folly, but that which he seeth in a second, and so they justly mock one another. The drunkard calls him a glutton, whom he knows to be sober. Many men love the sea, others husbandry. Briefly, they cannot agree in their own trades and professions, much less in their lives and actions. When Hippocrates heard these words so readily uttered, without premeditation, to declare the world's vanity, full of ridiculous contrariety, he made answer, that necessity compelled men to many such actions, and diverse wills ensuing from divine permission, that we might not be idle, being nothing is so odious to them as sloth and negligence. Besides, men cannot foresee future events in this uncertainty of human affairs. They would not so marry if they could foretell the causes of their dislike and separation, or parents if they knew the hour of their children's death so tenderly provide for them, or an husbandman so if he thought there would be no increase, or a merchant adventure to sea if he foresaw shipwreck or be a magistrate, if presently to be deposed. Alas, worthy Democritus, every man hopes the best, and to that end he doth it, and therefore no such cause or ridiculous occasion of laughter. Democritus, hearing this poor excuse, laughed again aloud, perceiving he wholly mistook him, and did not well understand what he had said concerning perturbations and tranquillity of the mind. Insomuch, that if men would govern their actions by discretion and providence, they would not declare themselves fools as now they do, and he should have no cause of laughter, but, quoth he, they swell in this life as if they were immortal and demigods, for want of understanding. It were enough to make them wise, if they would but consider the mutability of this world, and how it wheels about, nothing being firm and sure. He that is now above, to-morrow is beneath. He that sate on this side to-day, to-morrow is hurled on the other, and not considering these matters, they fall into many inconveniences and troubles, coveting things of no profit, and thirsting after them, tumbling headlong into many calamities. So that if men would attempt no more than what they can bear, they should lead contented lives and learning to know themselves, would limit their ambition. They would perceive then, that nature hath enough without seeking such superfluities, and unprofitable things, which bring nothing with them, but grief and molestation. As a fat body is more subject to diseases, so are rich men to absurdities and fooleries, to many casualties and cross inconveniences. There are many that take no heed what happeneth to others by bad conversation, and therefore overthrow themselves in the same manner through their own fault, not foreseeing dangers manifest. These are things, oh, more than mad, quoth he, that give me matter of laughter, by suffering the pains of your impieties, as your avarice, envy, malice, enormous villainies, mutinies, unsatiable desires, conspiracies, and other incurable vices, besides your dissimulation and hypocrisy, bearing deadly hatred one to the other, 
and yet shadowing it with a good face, flying out into all filthy lusts and transgressions of all laws, both of nature and civility. Many things which they have left off, after a while they fall to again, husbandry, navigation, and leave again, fickle and inconstant as they are. When they are young they would be old, and old young. Princes commend a private life, private men itch after honour. A magistrate commends a quiet life, a quiet man would be in his office, and obeyed as he is. And what is the cause of all this, but that they know not themselves? Some delight to destroy, one to build, another to spoil one country, to enrich another and himself. In all these things they are like children, in whom is no judgment or counsel, and resemble beasts, saving that beasts are better than they, as being contented with nature. When shall you see a lion hide gold in the ground, or a bull contend for better pasture? When a boar is thirsty, he drinks what will serve him, and no more, and when his belly is full, ceaseth to eat. But men are immoderate in both, as in lust. They covet carnal copulation at set times, men always, ruinating thereby the health of their bodies. And doth it not deserve laughter to see an amorous fool torment himself for a wench? Weep, howl for a misshapen slut, a dowdy sometimes, that might have his choice of the finest beauties. Is there any remedy for this in physic? I do anatomize and cut up these poor beasts, to see these distempers, vanities, and follies, yet such proof were better made on man's body, if my kind nature would endure it, who from the hour of his birth is most miserable, weak, and sickly, when he sucks he is guided by others, when he is grown great, practiseth unhappiness, and is sturdy, and when old, a child again, and repenteth him of his life past. And here, being interrupted by one that brought books, he fell to it again, that all were mad, careless, stupid. To prove my former speeches, look into courts or private houses. Judges give judgment according to their own advantage, doing manifest wrong to poor innocents to please others. Notaries alter sentences, and for money lose their deeds. Some make false monies, other counterfeit false weights. Some abuse their parents, yea, corrupt their own sisters. Others make long libels and pasquils, defaming men of good life, and extol such as are lewd and vicious. Some rob one, some another. Magistrates make laws against thieves, and are the veriest thieves themselves. Some kill themselves, others despair not obtaining their desires. Some dance, sing, laugh, feast, and banquet, whilst others sigh, languish, mourn, and lament, having neither meat, drink, nor clothes. Some prank up their bodies and have their minds full of execrable vices. Some trot about to bear false witness and say anything for money, and though judges know of it, yet for a bribe they wink at it, and suffer false contracts to prevail against equity. Women are all day addressing, to pleasure other men abroad, and go like sluts at home, not caring to please their own husbands, whom they should. Seeing men are so fickle, so sottish, so intemperate, why should not I laugh at those to whom folly seems wisdom, will not be cured, and perceive it not? It grew late. Hippocrates left him, and no sooner was he come away, but all the citizens came about flocking, to know how he liked him. He told them in brief, that notwithstanding those small neglects of his attire, body, diet, the world had not a wiser, a more learned, a more honest man, and they were much deceived to say that he was mad. Thus Democritus esteemed of the world in his time, and this was the cause of his laughter, and good cause he had. Olem jure quidem, nunc plus Democrite ride, quin rides, vita haec nunc mage ridiculast. Democritus did well to laugh of old, good cause he had, but now much more. This life of ours is more ridiculous than that of his 
or long before. End of section 7。section 8 of the anatomy of melancholy, volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1, by Robert Burton, Section 8. Democritus Junior to the Reader, Part 6. Never so much cause of laughter as now, never so many fools and madmen. Tis not one Democritus will serve turn to laugh in these days. We have now need of a Democritus to laugh at Democritus, one jester to flout at another, one fool to fleer at another, a great stentorian Democritus, as big as that Rhodian Colossus. For now, as Salisburiensis said in his time, totus mundus histrionem agit, the whole world plays the fool. We have a new theatre, a new scene, a new comedy of errors, a new company of personate actors, volupiae sacra, as Calcagninus willingly feigns in his apologues, are celebrated all the world over, where all the actors were madmen and fools, and every hour changed habits, or took that which came next. He that was a mariner to-day is an apothecary to-morrow, a smith one while, a philosopher another, in his volupiae ludis. A king now with his crown, robes, sceptre, attendants, by and by drove a loaded ass before him like a carter, etc. If Democritus were alive now, he should see strange alterations, a new company of counterfeit wizards, whifflers, cumane asses, maskers, mummers, painted puppets, outsides, fantastic shadows, gulls, monsters, giddy heads, butterflies. And so many of them are, indeed, if all be true that I have read. For when Jupiter and Juno's wedding was solemnized of old, the gods were all invited to the feast, and many noble men besides. Amongst the rest came Chrysalis, a Persian prince, bravely attended, rich in golden attires, in gay robes, with a majestical presence, but otherwise an ass. The gods, seeing him come in such pomp and state, rose up to give him place, ex habitu hominem metientes, but Jupiter, perceiving what he was, a light, fantastic, idle fellow, turned him and his proud followers into butterflies, and so they continue still, for aught I know to the contrary, roving about in pied coats, and are called chrysalides by the wiser sort of men, that is, golden outsides drones and flies, and things of no worth, multitudes of such, etc. Ubique invenies stultos avaros, sycophantas prodigos. Many additions, much increase of madness, folly, vanity, should Democritus observe, were he now to travel, or could get leave of Pluto, to come see fashions, as Charon did in Lucian, to visit our cities of Moronia Pia and Moronia Felix. Sure, I think he would break the rim of his belly with laughing. Si forat in terris, rideret Democritus, su, etc. A satirical Roman in his time thought all vice, folly, and madness were all at full sea, omne in praecipiti vitium statit. Josephus, the historian, taxeth his countrymen Jews for bragging of their vices, publishing their follies, and that they did contend among themselves who should be most notorious in villainies. But we flow higher in madness, far beyond them. Mox daturi progeniem vitiosorem, and yet with crimes to us unknown, our sons shall mark the coming age their own. And the latter end, you know whose oracle it is, is like to be worse. Tis not to be denied, the world alters every day. Ruunt urbes, regna transferuntur, etc. Variantur habitus, leges innovantur. 
as Petrarch observes, we change language, habits, laws, customs, manners, but not vices, not diseases, not the symptoms of folly and madness. They are still the same. And as a river, we see, keeps the like name and place, but not water, and yet ever runs, labitur et labetur in omne volubilis aevum, our times and persons alter, vices are the same, and ever will be. Look how nightingales sang of old, cocks crowed, kine lowed, sheep bleated, sparrows chirped, dogs barked, so they do still. We keep our madness still, play the fools still. Nec dum finitus orestes. We are of the same humours and inclinations as our predecessors were. You shall find us all alike, much at one, we and our sons, et nati natorum, et qui nascuntur abilis and so shall our posterity continue to the last. But to speak of times present. If Democritus were alive now, and should but see the superstition of our age, our religious madness, as Meteran calls it, religiosam insaniam, so many professed Christians, yet so few imitators of Christ, so much talk of religion, so much science, so little conscience, so much knowledge, so many preachers, so little practice, such variety of sects, such have and hold of all sides, obvia signi signa, etc., such absurd and ridiculous traditions and ceremonies. If he should meet a Capuchin, a Franciscan, a Pharisaical Jesuit, a man-servant, a shave-crowned monk in his robes, a begging friar, or see their three-crowned sovereign lord, the Pope, poor Peter's successor, servus servorum dei, to depose kings with his foot, to tread on emperors' necks, make them stand barefoot and bare-legged at his gates, hold his bridle and stirrup up, etc. Oh, that Peter and Paul were alive to see this! If he should observe a prince creep so devoutly to kiss his toe, and those red-capped cardinals, poor parish priests of old, now prince's companions, what would he say? Caelum ipsum petitur stultitia. Had he met some of our devout pilgrims going barefoot to Jerusalem, Our Lady of Loreto, Rome, Santiago, St. Thomas's shrine, to creep to those counterfeit and maggot-eaten relics, had he been present at Mass and seen such kissing of paxes, crucifixes, cringes, duckings, their several attires and ceremonies, pictures of saints, indulgences, pardons, vigils, fasting, feasts, crossing, knocking, kneeling at Ave Marias, bells with many such, Yucunda rudi spectacula plebi, praying in gibberish and mumbling of beads. Had he heard an old woman say her prayers in Latin, their sprinkling of holy water, and going a procession, Incedunt monacorum agmina mille, qui momerem vexilla cruces idolaque culta, etc. Their breviaries, bulls, hallowed beans, exorcisms, pictures, curious crosses, fables and baubles. Had he read the golden legend, the Turks al Koran, or Jews Talmud, the rabbins comments, what would he have thought? How dost thou think he might have been affected? Had he more particularly examined a Jesuit's life amongst the rest, he should have seen an hypocrite profess poverty, and yet possess more goods and lands than many princes, to have infinite treasures and revenues, teach others to fast, and play the gluttons themselves, like watermen that row one way and look another. Vow virginity, talk of holiness, and yet indeed a notorious bored and famous fornicator, Lascivum pecus, a very goat. Monks by profession, such as give over the world, and the vanities of it, and yet a Machiavellian rout, interested in all manner of state. Holy men, peacemakers, and yet composed of envy, lust, ambition, hatred, and malice. Firebrands, adulta patriae pestis, traitors, assassinats, harkitur ad astra, and this is to supererogate and merit heaven for themselves and others. Had he seen on the adverse side some of our nice and curious schismatics in another extreme abhor all ceremonies, and rather lose their lives and livings, 
than do or admit anything papists have formerly used, though in things indifferent. They alone are the true church, salterae, cum sint omnium insulsissimi. Formalists, out of fear and base flattery, like so many weathercocks, turn round, a rout of temporizers, ready to embrace and maintain all that is or shall be proposed in hope of preferment. Another Epicurean company, lying at lurch as so many vultures, watching for a prey of church goods, and ready to rise by the downfall of any. As Lucian said in like case, What dost thou think Democritus would have done, had he been spectator of these things? Or had he but observed the common people follow like so many sheep, one of their fellows drawn by the horns over a gap, some for zeal, some for fear, quo se cunque rapit tempestas, to credit all, examine nothing, and yet ready to die before they will adjure any of those ceremonies to which they have been accustomed. Others, out of hypocrisy, frequent sermons, knock their breasts, turn up their eyes, pretend zeal, desire reformation, and yet profess usurers, gripers, monsters of men, harpies, devils in their lives, to express nothing else. What would he have said to see, hear, and read so many bloody battles, so many thousands slain at once, such streams of blood able to turn mills, unius ob noxam furiasque, or to make sport for princes without any just cause, for vain titles, saith Austin, precedency, some wench, or such like toy, or out of desire of domineering, Vain glory, malice, revenge, folly, madness, goodly causes all, ob quas universus orbis bellis et caedibus misceatur, whilst statesmen themselves in the meantime are secure at home, pampered with all delights and pleasures, take their ease and follow their lusts, not considering what intolerable misery poor soldiers endure, their often wounds, hunger, thirst, etc., the lamentable cares, torments, calamities, and oppressions that accompany such proceedings, they feel not, take no notice of it. So wars are begun, by the persuasion of a few debauched, hare-brained, poor, dissolute, hungry captains, parasitical fauners, unquiet hotspurs, restless innovators, green heads, to satisfy one man's private spleen, lust, ambition, avarice, etc., Tales rapiunt scelerata in praelia causae, flos hominum. Proper men, well proportioned, carefully brought up, able both in body and mind, sound, led like so many beasts to the slaughter, in the flower of their years, pride and full strength, without all remorse and pity, sacrificed to Pluto, killed up as so many sheep, for devil's food, forty thousand at once. At once, said I, that were tolerable, but these wars last always, and for many ages. Nothing so familiar as this hacking and hewing, massacres, murders, desolations, ignoto caelum clangore remugit, they care not what mischief they procure, so that they may enrich themselves for the present. They will so long blow the coals of contention, till all the world be consumed with fire, the siege of Troy lasted ten years, eight months. There died 870,000 Grecians, 670,000 Trojans at the taking of the city, and after were slain 276,000 men, women, and children of all sorts. Caesar killed a million, Mohammed the second Turk, 300,000 persons, Sicinius Dentatus fought in a hundred battles, Eight times in single combat he overcame, had forty wounds before, was rewarded with one hundred and forty crowns, triumphed nine times for his good service. Marcus Sergius had thirty-two wounds. Skywa, the centurion, I know not how many. Every nation had their Hectors, Scipios, Caesars, and Alexanders. Our Edward the Fourth was in twenty-six battles afoot, and as they do all, he glories in it. Tis related to his honour. At the siege of Jerusalem, one million one hundred thousand died with sword and famine. At the battle of Canas, seventy thousand men were slain, as Polybius records, and as many at Battle Abbey with us. 
and tis no news to fight from sun to sun, as they did, as Constantine and Licinius, etc. At the siege of Ostend, the Devil's Academy, a poor town in respect, a small fort, but a great grave, one hundred and twenty thousand men lost their lives, besides whole towns, dorps, and hospitals, full of maimed soldiers. There were engines, fireworks, and whatsoever the devil could invent to do mischief with two million five hundred thousand iron bullets, shot of forty pounds weight, three or four millions of gold consumed. Who, saith mine author, can be sufficiently amazed at their flinty hearts, obstinacy, fury, blindness, who, without any likelihood of good success, hazard poor soldiers, and lead them without pity to the slaughter, which may justly be called the rage of furious beasts, that run without reason upon their own deaths. Quis malus genius, quae furia, quae pestis, etc. What plague, what fury brought so devilish, so brutish a thing as war first into men's minds? Who made so soft and peaceable a creature, born to love, mercy, meekness, so to rave, rage like beasts, and run on to their own destruction? How may nature expostulate with mankind? Ego te di vinum animal finxi, etc. I made thee an harmless, quiet, a divine creature. How may God expostulate, and all good men? Yet, horum facta, as one condoles, tantum admirantur, et heroum numero habent. These are the brave spirits, the gallants of the world. These admired alone, triumph alone have statues, crowns, pyramids, obelisks, to their eternal fame, but immortal genius attends on them, harkitur ad astra. When Rhodes was besieged, fossae urbis cadaveribus repletae sunt, the ditches were full of dead carcasses, and as when the said Suleiman, great Turk, beleaguered Vienna, they lay level with the top of the walls. This they make a sport of, and will do it to their friends and confederates, against oaths, vows, promises, by treachery or otherwise. Dolus an virtus, quis in hoste requirat, leagues and laws of arms, silent leges inter arma, for their advantage, omnia jura, divina, humana, proculcata plerunque sunt. Gods and men's laws are trampled under foot. The sword alone determines all. To satisfy their lust and spleen, they care not what they attempt, say or do. Rara fides, probitasque viris, qui castra sequuntur. Nothing so common as to have father fight against son, brother against brother, kinsman against kinsman, kingdom against kingdom, province against province, Christians against Christians. Ah, quibus nec unquam cogitatione fuerunt laesi, of whom they never had offence in thought, word, or deed. Infinite treasures consumed, towns burned, flourishing cities sacked and ruinated. Quodque animus meminisse horet, Goodly countries depopulated and left desolate, old inhabitants expelled, trade and traffic decayed, maids deflowered, virgines nondum thalamis jugatae, et comis nondum positis ephibi. Chaste matrons cry out with Andromache, concubitum mox cogar patieus, qui interemit hectorem. They shall be compelled peraventure to lie with them that erst killed their husbands, to see rich, poor, sick, sound, lords, servants, aeodem omnes incomodo macti, consumed all or maimed, etc. Et quicquid gaudens scelere animus audet, et perversa mens, saith Cyprian, and whatsoever torment, misery, mischief, hell itself, the devil, fury, and rage can invent to their own ruin and destruction. So abominable a thing is war, as Gerbelius concludes. Adeo foida et abominanda res est bellum, ex quo hominum caides vastationes, etc. The scourge of God, cause, effect, fruit, and punishment of sin, and not tonsura humani generis, as Tertullian calls it, but ruina. Had Democritus been present at the late civil wars in France, those abominable wars, bellaque matribus detestata, where in less than ten years ten thousand men were consumed, saith Coligneus, 
twenty thousand churches overthrown, nay, the whole kingdom subverted, as Richard Dinot adds. So many myriads of the commons were butchered up with sword, famine, war, tanto odio utrinque ut barbari ad abhorrendam lanienam obstupescerent. With such feral hatred the world was amazed at it. At our late Pharsalian fields, in the time of Henry the Sixth, betwixt the houses of Lancaster and York, a hundred thousand men slain, one writes. Another, ten thousand families were rooted out, that no man can but marvel, saith Comineus, at that barbarous immanity, feral madness, committed betwixt men of the same nation, language, and religion. Quis furor, o kiwes? Why do the Gentiles so furiously rage, saith the prophet David, Psalm 2, 1. But we may ask, why do the Christians so furiously rage? Arma volunt, quare poscunt, rapiuntque juventus, unfit for Gentiles, much less for us so to tyrannize, as the Spaniard in the West Indies, that killed up in forty-two years, if we may believe Bartholomeo Sarcasa, their own bishop, twelve millions of men, with stupend and exquisite torments. Neither should I lie, said he, if I said fifty millions. I omit those French massacres, Sicilian evensongs, the Duke of Alva's tyrannies, our gunpowder machinations, and that fourth fury, as one calls it, the Spanish Inquisition, which quite obscures those ten persecutions. Saevit toto mars impius orbe, is not this mundus furiosus, a mad world, as he terms it, insanum bellum? Are not these madmen, as Scaliger concludes, qui in praelio acerba morte, insaniae, suae memoriam pro perpetuo teste relinquunt posteritati, which leave so frequent battles as perpetual memorials of their madness to all succeeding ages? Would this, think you, have enforced our Democritus to laugh, or rather made him turn his tune, alter his tone, and weep with Heraclitus, or rather howl, roar, and tear his hair in commiseration, stand amazed, or, as the poets feign, that Niobe was for grief quite stupefied and turned to stone? I have not yet said the worst, that which is more absurd and mad in their tumults, seditions, civil and unjust wars, quod stulte suscipitur, impie geritur, misere finitur. Such wars I mean, for all are not to be condemned, as those fantastical Anabaptists vainly conceive. Our Christian tactics are all out as necessary as the Roman Achaeas or Grecian phalanx, to be a soldier is a most noble and honourable profession, as the world is, not to be spared. They are our best walls and bulwarks, and I do therefore acknowledge that of Tully to be most true. All our civil affairs, all our studies, all our pleading, industry, and commendation lies under the protection of warlike virtues, and whensoever there is any suspicion of tumult, all our arts cease. Wars are most behoveful, et bellatores agricoli scivitati sunt utiliores, as Tyrius defends, and valour is much to be commended in a wise man. But they mistake most part. Alfere, trucidare, rapere, falsis nominibus virtutem vocant, etc. Twas Galgarchus's observation in Tacitus. They term theft, murder, and rapine virtue by a wrong name, rapes, slaughters, massacres, etc., jocus et ludus, are pretty pastimes, as Ludovicus Wiwes notes. They commonly call the most hare-brained bloodsuckers, strongest thieves, the most desperate villains, treacherous rogues, inhuman murderers, rash, cruel, and dissolute caitiffs, courageous and generous spirits, heroical and worthy captains, Brave men-at-arms, valiant and renowned soldiers, possessed with a brute persuasion of false honour, as Pontus Huter in his Burgundian history complains. By means of which it comes to pass that daily so many voluntaries offer themselves, leaving their sweet wives, children, friends, for sixpence, if they can get it, a day. 
prostitute their lives and limbs, desire to enter upon breaches, lie sentinel, perdu, give the first onset, stand in the forefront of the battle, marching bravely on, with a cheerful noise of drums and trumpets, such vigour and alacrity, so many banners streaming in the air, glittering armours, motions of plumes, woods of pikes and swords, variety of colours, cost and magnificence, as if they went in triumph, now victors to the capital, and with such pomp as when Darius's army marched to meet Alexander at Issus. Void of all fear they run into imminent dangers, cannon's mouth, etc. Ut vulneribus suis ferum hostium hebetent, saith Barletius, to get a name of valour, humour, and applause, which lasts not either, for it is but a mere flash, this fame, and like a rose, intra diem unum extinguitur, tis gone in an instant. Of fifteen thousand proletaries slain in a battle, scarce fifteen are recorded in history, or one alone, the general perhaps, and after a while his and their names are likewise blotted out, the whole battle itself is forgotten. Those Grecian orators, summa we in genii et eloquentiae, set out the renowned overthrows at Thermopylae, Salamis, Marathon, Micali, Mantinea, Chaeronea, Plataea. The Romans record their battle at Canas and the Pharsalian fields, but they do but record, and we scarce hear of them. And yet this supposed honour, popular applause, desire of immortality by this means, pride and vain glory, spur them on many times, rashly and unadvisedly, to make away themselves and multitudes of others. Alexander was sorry because there were no more worlds for him to conquer. He is admired by some for it. Animosa vox videtur et regia, t'was spoken like a prince, but, as wise Seneca censures him, T'was vox inquissima et stultissima, t'was spoken like a bedlam fool, and that sentence which the same Seneca appropriates to his father Philip and him, I apply to them all. Non minores fuere pestes mortalium, quam inundatio, quam conflagratio, quibus, etc., they did as much mischief to mortal men as fire and water, those merciless elements when they rage which is yet more to be lamented, they persuade them this hellish course of life is holy, they promise heaven to such as venture their lives bello sacro, and that by these bloody wars, as Persians, Greeks, and Romans of old, as modern Turks do now their commons, to encourage them to fight, ut cadant infeliciter. If they die in the field, they go directly to heaven, and shall be canonized for saints. Oh, diabolical invention! Put in the chronicles, in perpetuam rei memoriam, to their eternal memory, when, as in truth, as some hold, it were much better, since wars are the scourge of God for sin, by which he punisheth mortal men's peevishness and folly, such brutish stories were suppressed, because ad morum institutionem nihil habent. They conduce not at all to manners or good life but they will have it thus nevertheless. And so they put note of divinity upon the most cruel and pernicious plague of humankind, adore such men with grand titles, degrees, statues, images, honour, applaud and highly reward them for their good service, no greater glory than to die in the field. So Africanus is extolled by Ennius. Mars and Hercules, and I know not how many besides of old, were deified, went this way to heaven, that were indeed bloody butchers, wicked destroyers and troublers of the world, prodigious monsters, hell-hounds, feral plagues, devourers, common executioners of humankind, as Lactantius truly proves, and Cyprian to Donat, such as were desperate in wars, and precipitately made away themselves. Like those Celts in Damasen, with ridiculous valour, ut de decorosum putarent muro ruenti se subducere, a disgrace to run away for a rotten wall, now ready to fall on their heads. 
such as will not rush on a sword's point, or seek to shun a cannon shot, are base cowards, and no valiant men, by which means, madet orbis mutuo sanguine, the earth wallows in her own blood, savit amor feri, et scelerati insania belli, and for that, which if it be done in private, a man shall be rigorously executed, and which is no less than murder itself, if the same fact be done in public in wars, it is called manhood, and the party is honoured for it. Prosperum et felix scelus, virtus vocatur. We measure all, as Turks do, by the event, and most part, as Cyprian notes, in all ages, countries, places, saevitiae magnitudo impunitatem sceleris acquirit, the foulness of the fact vindicates the offender. One is crowned for that which another is tormented. Ille crucem sceleris pretium tulit, hic diadema. Made a knight, a lord, an earl, a great duke, as Agrippa notes, for that which another should have hung in gibbets, as a terror to the rest. Et tamen alter, si fecisit idem, caderet sub morum. A poor sheep-stealer is hanged for stealing of victuals, compelled peradventure by necessity of that intolerable cold hunger and thirst to save himself from starving. But a great man in office may securely rob whole provinces, undo thousands, pill and poll, oppress ad libitum, flee, grind, tyrannise, enrich himself by spoils of the commons, be uncontrollable in his actions, and after all be recompensed with turgent titles, honoured for his good service, and no man may dare find fault or mutter at it. End of section 8。section 9 of the anatomy of melancholy volume 1 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for further information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1, by Robert Burton, Section 9, Democritus Junior to the Reader, Part 7. How would our Democritus have been affected to see a wicked caitiff or fool, a very idiot, a funge, a golden ass, a monster of men, to have many good men, wise men, learned men, to attend upon him with all submission, as an appendix to his riches, for that respect alone, because he hath more wealth and money, to honour him with divine titles, and bombast epithets, to smother him with fumes and eulogies, whom they know to be a dizzard, a fool, a covetous wretch, a beast, etc., because he is rich, to see sub exuiis leonis onagrum, a filthy loathsome carcass, a gorgon's head puffed up by parasites, assume this unto himself, glorious titles, in worth an infant, a cuman ass, a painted sepulchre, an Egyptian temple. To see a withered face, a diseased, deformed, cankered complexion, a rotten carcass, a viperous mind, and epicurean soul set out with orient pearls, jewels, diadems, perfumes, curious elaborate works, as proud of his clothes as a child of his new coats, and a goodly person, of an angel-like divine countenance, a saint, an humble mind, a meat spirit, clothed in rags, beg, and now ready to be starved, to see a contemptible sloven in apparel, ragged in his coat, polite in speech, of a divine spirit, wise, another neat in clothes, spruce, full of courtesy, empty of grace, wit, talk nonsense. To see so many lawyers, advocates, so many tribunals, so little justice, so many magistrates, so little care of common good, so many laws, yet never more disorders, tribunal litium segetem, the tribunal a labyrinth, so many thousand suits in one court sometimes, so violently followed, 
to see, in justissimum saepe jure praesidentem, impium religioni, imperitissimum eruditioni, otiosissimum labori, monstrosum humanitati, to see a lamb executed, a wolf pronounced sentence, latro arraigned, and four sit on the bench, the judge severely punish others, and do worse himself, eundem furtum facere et punire, rapinam plectere cum sit ipse raptor, laws altered, misconstrued, interpreted pro and con, as the judge is made by friends, bribed, or otherwise affected as a nose of wax, good to-day, none to-morrow, or firm in his opinion, cast in his, sentence prolonged, changed, ad arbitrium judicis, still the same case, one thrust out of his inheritance, another falsely put in by favour, false forged deeds or wills, in quisai leges negliguntur, laws are made and not kept, or if put in execution, they be some silly ones that are punished. As, put case it be fornication, the father will disinherit or abdicate his child, quite cashier him, out villain be gone, come no more in my sight. A poor man is miserably tormented, with loss of his estate perhaps, goods, fortunes, good name, for ever disgraced, forsaken, and must do penance to the utmost, a mortal sin, and yet make the worst of it, numquid alud fake it, saith Tranio in the poet, nisi quod faciunt sumis nati generibus. He hath done no more than what gentlemen usually do. Neque novum, neque mirum, neque secus quam alii solent. For in a great person, right worshipful sir, a right honourable grandee, tis not a venial sin, no, not a peccadillo, tis no offence at all, a common and ordinary thing, no man takes notice of it, he justifies it in public, and peradventure brags of it. Nam quod turpe bonis, titio, seoque, decebat crispinum. For what would be base in good men, Titius and Seus, became Crispinus. Many poor men, younger brothers, etc., by reason of bad policy and idle education, for they are likely brought up in no calling, are compelled to beg or steal, and then hanged for theft, than which what can be more ignominious, non minus enim turpe principi multa supplicia, quam medico multa funera, tis the governor's fault. Libentius verberant quam docent, as schoolmasters do rather correct their pupils than teach them when they do amiss. They had more need provide there should be no more thieves and beggars, as they ought with good policy, and take away the occasions, than let them run on, as they do to their own destruction. Root out likewise those causes of wrangling, a multitude of lawyers, and compose controversies, lites, lustrales, et seculares, by some more compendious means. Whereas now for every toy and trifle they go to law, mugit litibus insanum forum, et saevit in vicem discordantium rabies. They are ready to pull out one another's throats, and for commodity to squeeze blood, saith Hierom, out of their brother's heart, defame, lie, disgrace, backbite, rail, bear false witness, swear, forswear, fight and wrangle, spend their goods, lives, fortunes, friends, undo one another, to enrich an harpy advocate that preys upon them both, and cries, Eia Socrates, Eia Xantipe, or some corrupt judge, that like the kite in Aesop, while the mouse and frog fought, carried both away. Generally they prey one upon another as so many ravenous birds, brute beasts, devouring fishes, no medium. Omnes hic aut captantur, aut captant, aut cadavera quae lacerantur, aut corvi qui lacerant. Either deceive or be deceived, tear others or be torn in pieces themselves. Like so many buckets in a well, as one riseth, another falleth. One's empty, another's full. His ruin is a ladder to the third. Such are our ordinary proceedings.
what's the market? A place, according to Anarchasis, wherein they cousin one another. A trap. Nay, what's the world itself? A vast chaos, a confusion of manners, as fickle as the air, domicilium insanorum, a turbulent troop full of impurities, a mart of walking spirits, goblins, the theatre of hypocrisy, a shop of knavery, flattery, a nursery of villainy, the scene of babbling, the school of giddiness, the academy of vice, a warfare, ubi velis nolis pugnandum, aut vincas, aut succumbas, in which kill or be killed, wherein every man is for himself, his private ends, and stands upon his guard. No charity, love, friendship, fear of God, alliance, affinity, consanguinity, Christianity, can contain them. But if they be in any ways offended, or that string of commodity be touched, they fall foul. Old friends become bitter enemies, on a sudden, for toys and small offences, and they that erst were willing to do all mutual offices of love and kindness, now revile and persecute one another to death, with more than Vatinian hatred, and will not be reconciled. So long as they are behoveful, they love, or may bestead each other, but when there is no more good to be expected, as they do by an old dog, hang him up and cashier him, which Cato counts a great indecorum, to use men like old shoes or broken glasses, which are flung to the dunghill. He could not find in his heart to sell an old ox, much less to turn away an old servant, but they, instead of recompense, revile him, and when they have made him an instrument of their villainy, as Bajazet, the second emperor of the Turks, did by Acomethes Bassa, make him away, or instead of reward, hate him to death, as Silius was served by Tiberius. In a word, every man for his own ends. Our summum bonum is commodity, and the goddess we adore, Dea Moneta, queen money, to whom we daily offer sacrifice, which steers our hearts, hands, affections, all. That most powerful goddess, by whom we are reared, depressed, elevated, esteemed the sole commandress of our actions, for which we pray, run, ride, go, come, labour, and contend as fishes do for a crumb that falleth into the water. It's not worth virtue, that's bonum theatrale, wisdom, valour, learning, honesty, religion, or any sufficiency for which we are respected, but money, greatness, office, honour, authority. Honesty is accounted folly, knavery, policy. Men admired out of opinion, not as they are, but as they seem to be. Such shifting, lying, cogging, plotting, counterplotting, temporising, nattering, cousining, dissembling, that of necessity one must highly offend God if he be conformable to the world. Cretizare cum crete or else live in contempt, disgrace, and misery. One takes upon him temperance, holiness, another austerity, a third an affected kind of simplicity, when, as indeed, he, and he, and he, and the rest, are hypocrites, ambidexters, outsides, so many turning pictures, a lion on the one side, a lamb on the other. How would Democritus have been affected to see these things? To see a man turn himself into all shapes, like a chameleon, or as Proteus, omnia transformans sese in miracula rerum, to act twenty parts and persons at once, for his advantage, to temporise and vary like Mercury the planet, good with good, bad with bad, having a several face, garb and character for every one he meets, of all religions, humours, inclinations, to fawn like a spaniel, mentitis et mimicis obsequis, rage like a lion, bark like a cur, fight like a dragon, sting like a serpent, as meek as a lamb, and yet again grin like a tiger, weep like a crocodile, insult over some, and yet others domineer over him, here command, there crouch, tyrannise in one place, be baffled in another, a wise man at home, a fool abroad to make others merry. To see so much difference betwixt words and deeds, 
so many parasangs betwixt tongue and heart, men like stage-players act variety of parts, give good precepts to others, soar aloft, whilst they themselves grovel on the ground. To see a man protest friendship, kiss his hand, quem malet truncatum videre, smile with an intent to do mischief, or cousin him who he salutes, magnify his friend unworthy with hyperbolical eulogiums, his enemy, albeit a good man, to vilify and disgrace him, yea, all his actions, with the utmost that liver and malice can invent. To see a servant able to buy out his master, him that carries the mace more worth than the magistrate, which Plato absolutely forbids, Epictetus abhors. A horse that tills the land fed with chaff, an idle jade have provender in abundance. Him that makes shoes go barefoot himself, him that sells meat almost pined, a toiling drudge starve, a drone flourish. To see men buy smoke for wares, castles built with fools' heads, men like apes follow the fashion in tires, gestures, actions, if the king laugh, all laugh. Rides, maiore cacino concutitor, flet si lacrimas conspexit amici. Alexander stooped, so did his courtiers. Alphonsus turned his head, and so did his parasites. Sabina Popia, Nero's wife, wore amber-coloured hair, so did all the Roman ladies in an instant. Her fashion was theirs. To see men wholly led by affection, admired and censured out of opinion without judgment, an inconsiderate multitude, like so many dogs in a village, if one bark, all bark, without cause. As fortune's fan turns, if a man be in favour, or commanded by some great one, all the world applauds him, if in disgrace, in an instant all hate him. And, as at the sun, when he is eclipsed, that erst took no notice, now gaze and stare upon him. To see a man wear his brains in his belly, his guts in his head, an hundred oaks on his back, to devour a hundred oxen at a meal, nay more, to devour houses and towns, or as those anthropophagi, to eat one another. To see a man roll himself up like a snowball, from base beggary to right worshipful and right honourable titles, unjustly to screw himself into honours and offices, another to starve his genius, damn his soul to gather wealth, which he shall not enjoy, which his prodigal son melts and consumes in an instant. To see the Kakodzelian of our times, a man bend all his forces, means, time, fortunes, to be a favourite's favourite's favourite, etc., a parasite's parasite's parasite, that may scorn the servile world as having enough already. To see an hirsute beggar's brat that lately fed on scraps, crept and whined, crying to all, and for an old jerkin ran of errands, now ruffle in silk and satin, bravely mounted, jovial and polite, now scorn his old friends and familiars, neglect his kindred, insult over his betters, domineer over all. To see a scholar crouch and creep to an illiterate peasant for a meal's meat, a scrivener better paid for an obligation, a falconer receive greater wages than a student, a lawyer get more in a day than a philosopher in a year, better reward for an hour than a scholar for a twelve-month study. Him that can paint tice, play on a fiddle, curl hair, etc., sooner get preferment than a philologer or a poet. To see a fond mother, like Aesop's ape, hug her child to death, a whittle wink at his wife's honesty, and too perspicuous in all other affairs. One stumble at a straw, and leap over a block, rob Peter, and pay Paul. Scrape unjust sums with one hand, purchase great manners by corruption, fraud, and cousinage, and liberally to distribute to the poor with the other, give a remnant to pious uses, etc. Penny wise, pound foolish. Blind men judge of colours, wise men silent. Fools talk, find fault with others, and do worse themselves. Denounce that in public which he doth in secret. And, which Aurelius Victor gives out of Augustus, severely censure that in a third, of which he is most guilty himself. 
to see a poor fellow or an hired servant venture his life for his new master that will scarce give him his wages at year's end a country colon toil and moil till and drudge for a prodigal idle drone that devours all the gain or lasciviously consumes with fantastical expenses a noble man in a bravado to encounter death and for a small flash of honour to cast away himself a worldling tremble at an executor and yet not fear hell fire to wish and hope for immortality desire to be happy and yet by all means avoid death a necessary passage to bring him to it to see a foolhardy fellow like those old danes qui decolari malunt quam verberari die rather than be punished in a sottish humour embrace death with alacrity yet scorn to lament his own sins and miseries or his clearest friends departures to see wise men degraded fools preferred one govern towns and cities and yet a silly woman overrules him at home command a province and yet his own servants or children prescribe laws to him as themistocles's son did in greece what I will, said he, my mother will, and what my mother will, my father doth. To see horses ride in a coach, men draw it. Dogs devour their masters, towers build masons, children rule, old men go to school, women wear the breeches, sheep demolish towns, devour men, etc. And in a word, the world turned upside downward. Oh, we wear at Democritus! To insist in every particular were one of Hercules's labours. There's so many ridiculous instances as motes in the sun. Quantum est in rebus inane. How much vanity there is in things. And who can speak of all? Crimine ab uno disque omnes. Take this for a taste. But these are obvious to sense, trivial and well known, easy to be discerned. How would Democritus have been moved, had he seen the secrets of their hearts? If every man had a window in his breast, which Momus would have had in Vulcan's man, or that which Tully so much wished it were written in every man's forehead, quid quisque de republica sentiret, what he thought, or that it could be effected in an instant, which Mercury did by Charon in Lucian, by touching of his eyes, to make him discern semel et simul rumores et susuros. Spes hominum caecas, morbos, votumque labores, et passim toto volitantes aethere curas. Blind hope and wishes, their thoughts and affairs, whispers and rumours, and those flying cares. That he could, cubiculorum obductas foras recludere, et secreta cordium penetrare, which Cyprian desired, open doors and locks, shoot bolts, as Lucian's Gallus did with a feather of his tail, or Gyges' invisible ring, or some rare perspective glass, or autacousticon, which would so multiply species, that a man might hear and see all at once, as Martianus Capella's Jupiter did in a spear which he held in his hand, which did present unto him all that was daily done upon the face of the earth. Observe cuckold's horns, forgeries of alchemists, the philosopher's stone, new projectors, etc., and all those works of darkness, foolish vows, hopes, fears, and wishes. What a deal of laughter would it have afforded! He should have seen windmills in one man's head, and hornet's nest in another. Or had he been present with Icaromenippus in Lucian, at Jupiter's whispering place, and heard one pray for rain, another for fair weather, one for his wife's, another for his father's death, etc., to ask that at God's hand, which they are abashed any man should hear. How would he have been confounded? Would he, think you, or any man else, say that these men were well in their wits? Haec sani esse hominis, quis sanus juret orestes? Can all the hellebore in the Antichiri cure these men? No, sure, an acre of hellebore will not do it. End of section 9
Section 10 of The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1, by Robert Burton. Section 10. Democritus, Junior to the Reader. Part 8. That which is more to be lamented, they are mad like Seneca's blind woman, and will not acknowledge or seek for any cure of it, for pauci vident morbum suum, omnes amant. If our leg or arm offend us, we covet by all means possible to redress it, and if we labour of a bodily disease, we send for a physician, but for the diseases of the mind we take no notice of them. Lust harrows us on the one side, envy, anger, ambition on the other. We are torn in pieces by our passions, as so many wild horses, one in disposition, another in habit, one is melancholy, another mad, and which of us all seeks for help, doth acknowledge his error, or knows he is sick. As that stupid fellow put out the candle, because the biting fleas should not find him, he shrouds himself in an unknown habit, borrowed titles, because nobody should discern him. Every man thinks with himself, Egomet videor mihi sanus, I am well, I am wise, and laughs at others. And tis a general fault amongst them all, that which our forefathers have approved, diet, apparel, opinions, humours, customs, manners, we deride and reject in our time as absurd. Old men account juniors all fools, when they are mere dizzards. And as to sailors, terraeque urbesque recedunt. They move, the land stands still. The world hath much more wit, they dote themselves. Turks deride us, we them. Italians, Frenchmen, accounting them light-headed fellows. The French scoff again at Italians, and at their several customs. Greeks have condemned all the world but themselves of barbarism. The world as much vilifies them now. We account Germans heavy, dull fellows, explode many of their fashions. They as contemptibly think of us. Spaniards laugh at all, and all again at them. So are we fools and ridiculous, absurd in our actions, carriages, diet, apparel, customs and consultations. We scoff and point one at another, when, as in conclusion, all are fools, and they the veriest asses that hide their ears most. A private man, if he be resolved with himself, or set on an opinion, accounts all idiots and asses that are not affected as he is. Nil rectum, nisi quod placuit sibi, ducit. That are not so minded, quodque volunt homines se bene velle putant, all fools that think not as he doth, he will not say with Atticus, Suam quisque sponsam, mihi meam, let every man enjoy his own spouse, but his alone is fair, suus amor, etc., and scorns all, in respect of himself will imitate none, hear none but himself, as Pliny said, a law and example to himself. And that which Hippocrates, in his epistle to Dionysius, reprehended of old, is verified in our times, quisque in alio superfluum esse censit, ipse quod non habet, nec curat, that which he hath not himself, or doth not esteem, he accounts superfluity, an idle quality, a mere foppery in another, like Aesop's fox, when he had lost his tail, would have all his fellow foxes cut off theirs. The Chinese say that we Europeans have one eye, they themselves two, all the world else is blind, though Scaliger accounts them brutes too, merum pecus. So thou and thy sectaries are only wise, others indifferent, the rest beside themselves mere idiots and asses. Thus, not acknowledging our own errors and imperfections, we securely deride others, as if we alone were free and spectators of the rest, accounting it an excellent thing, as indeed it is, aliena optimum frui insania, to make ourselves merry with other men's obliquities, 
when, as he himself is more faulty than the rest, mutato nomine, de te fabula narratur, he may take himself by the nose for a fool, and which one calls maximum stultitiae specimen, to be ridiculous to others, and not to perceive or take notice of it, as Marcius was, when he contended with Apollo, non intelligens se de ridiculo haberi, saith Apuleius, tis his own cause, he is a convicted madman, as Austin well infers, in the eyes of wise men and angels, he seems like one that to our thinking walks with his heels upwards. So thou laughest at me, and I at thee, both at a third, and he returns that of the poet upon us again. Hey mihi, insanire me aiunt, cum ipsi ultro insaniant. We accuse others of madness, of folly, and are the various dizards ourselves. For it is a great sign and property of a fool, which Ecclesiastes 10.3 points at, out of pride and self-conceit, to insult, vilify, condemn, censure, and call other men fools. Non videmus manticae quod a tergo est. To tax that in others, of which we are most faulty, teach that which we follow not ourselves. For an inconstant man to write of constancy, a profane liver prescribe rules of sanctity and piety, a desired himself make a treatise of wisdom, or, with sallust, to rail downright at spoilers of countries, and yet in office to be a most grievous poller himself. This argues weakness, and is an evident sign of such parties' indiscretion. Pecat uter nostrum cruce dignius, who is the fool now? Or else, peradventure, in some places we are all mad for company, and so tis not seen. Satietas erroris et dementiae, pariter absurditatem et admirationem tolit. Tis with us as it was of old, in Tully's censure at least, with Gaius Pimbria in Rome, a bold harebrain mad fellow, and so esteemed of all, such only excepted that were as mad as himself. Now in such a case there is no notice taken of it. Nimirum insanus paucis videatur, eo quod maxima pars hominum morbo jactatur eodem. When all are mad, we're all alike oppressed, who can discern one madman from the rest? But put case they do perceive it, and some one be manifestly convicted of madness. He now takes notice of his folly, be it in action, gesture, speech, a vain humour he hath in building, bragging, jangling, spending, gaming, courting, scribbling, prating, for which he is ridiculous to others, on which he dotes, he doth acknowledge as much. Yet with all the rhetoric thou hast, thou canst not so recall him, but to the contrary notwithstanding, he will persevere in his dotage. Tis amabilis insania, et mentis gratissimus error, so pleasing, so delicious, that he cannot leave it. He knows his error, but will not seek to decline it. Tell him what the event will be. Beggary, sorrow, sickness, disgrace, shame, loss, madness. Yet an angry man will prefer vengeance, a lascivious his whore, a thief his booty, a glutton his belly, before his welfare. Tell an epicure, a covetous man, an ambitious man, of his irregular course, wean him from it a little. Paul, me occhi distis amici, he cries anon. You have undone him, and as a dog to his vomit, he returns to it again. No persuasion will take place, no counsel, say what thou canst. Clames licet, et mare caelo, confundas, surdo naras. Demonstrate, as Ulysses did, to Elpino and Grillus, and the rest of his companions, those swinish men, he is irrefragable in his humour. He will be a hog still. Bray him in a mortar, he will be the same. If he be in an heresy, or some perverse opinion, settled as some of our ignorant papists are, convince his understanding, show him the several follies and absurd fopperies of that sect, force him to say, Veris vincor, 
make it as clear as the sun, he will err still, peevish and obstinate as he is. And, as he said, si in hoc ero, libenter ero, nec hunc errorem auferi mihi volo. I will do as I have done, as my predecessors have done, and as my friends now do, I will dote for company. Say now, are these men mad or no? Hus age responde, are they ridiculous? Cedo quem vis arbitrum. Are they sanae mentis, sober, wise, and discreet? Have they common sense? Uter est insanior horum. I am of Democritus's opinion. For my part, I hold them worthy to be laughed at, a company of brain-sick dizards, as mad as Orestes and Athamas, that they may go ride the ass, and all sail along to the Antichairai, in the ship of fools, for company together. I need not much labour to prove this which I say, otherwise than thus, make any solemn protestation, or swear, I think you will believe me without an oath. Say at a word, are they fools? I refer it to you, though you be likewise fools and madmen yourselves, and I as mad to ask the question. For what said our comical Mercury? Justum ab in justis petere incipentia est. I'll stand to your censure yet. What think you? But, forasmuch as I undertook at first that kingdoms, provinces, families, were melancholy as well as private men, I will examine them in particular, and that which I have hitherto dilated at random, in more general terms, I will particularly insist in, prove with more special and evident arguments, testimonies, illustrations, and that in brief. Nunc acipe quare decipiant omnes aeque ac tu. My first argument is borrowed from Solomon, an arrow drawn out of his sententious quiver. Proverbs 3, 7. Be not wise in thine own eyes. And 26, 12. Seest thou a man wise in his own conceit? More hope is of a fool than of him. Isaiah pronounceth a woe against such men, chapter 5, 21, that are wise in their own eyes, and prudent in their own sight. For hence we may gather that it is a great offence, and men are much deceived that think too well of themselves, an especial argument to convince them of folly. Many men, saith Seneca, had been without question wise, had they not an opinion that they had attained to perfection of knowledge already, even before they had gone half way, too forward, too ripe, pri properi. Too quick and ready, quito prudentes, quito pii, quito mariti, quito patres, quito sacerdotes, quito omnis officii capaces et curiosi. They had too good a conceit of themselves, and that marred all. Of their worth, valour, skill, art, learning, judgment, eloquence, their good parts. All their geese are swans, and that manifestly proves them to be no better than fools. In former times they had but seven wise men. Now you can scarce find so many fools. Thales sent the golden tripos, which the fisherman found, and the oracle commanded to be given to the wisest, to Bias, Bias to Solon, etc. If such a thing were now found, we should all fight for it as the three goddesses did for the golden apple. We are so wise. We have women politicians, children metaphysicians. Every silly fellow can square a circle, make perpetual motions, find the philosopher's stone, interpret apocalypses, make new theories, a new system of the world, new logic, new philosophy, etc. Nostra utique regio saith Petronius. Our country is so full of deified spirits, divine souls, that you may sooner find a god than a man amongst us. We think so well of ourselves, and that is an ample testimony of much folly. My second argument is grounded upon the like place of Scripture, which though before mentioned in effect, yet for some reasons is to be repeated, and by Plato's good leave I may do it. Dis tokalon rethen uden blapte. Fools, saith David, by reason of their transgressions, etc. Psalm 107, 17. 
Hence Musculus infers all transgressors must needs be fools. So we read Romans 2, Tribulation and anguish on the soul of every man that doeth evil, but all do evil. And Isaiah 65.14 My servant shall sing for joy, and ye shall cry for sorrow of heart and vexation of mind. Tis ratified by the common consent of all philosophers. Dishonesty, saith Cardan, is nothing else but folly and madness. Probus quis nobiscum vivit. Show me an honest man. Nemo malus qui non stultus. Tis Fabius's aphorism to the same end. If none honest, none wise, then all fools. And well may they be so accounted. For who will account him otherwise? Qui iter adornat in occidentem, cum properaret in orientem that goes backward all his life, westward when he is bound to the east. Or hold him a wise man, saith Musculus, that prefers momentary pleasures to eternity, that spends his master's goods in his absence, forthwith to be condemned for it. Ne quiquam sapit, qui sibi non sapit. Who will say that a sick man is wise, that eats and drinks to overthrow the temperature of his body? Can you account him wise or discreet, that would willingly have his health, and yet will do nothing that should procure or continue it? Theodoret, out of Plotinus, the Platonist, holds it a ridiculous thing for a man to live after his own laws, to do that which is offensive to God, and yet to hope that he should save him, and when he voluntarily neglects his own safety, and contemns the means, to think to be delivered by another. Who will say these men are wise? A third argument may be derived from the precedent. All men are carried away with passion, discontent, lust, pleasures, etc. They generally hate those virtues they should love, and love such vices they should hate. Therefore, more than melancholy, quite mad, brute beasts and void of reason, so Chrysostom contends or rather dead and buried alive, as Philo Judeus concludes it for a certainty, of all such that are carried away with passions, or labour of any disease of the mind. Where is fear and sorrow, there Lactantius stiffly maintains, wisdom cannot dwell. Qui cupiet metuet quoque poro, qui metuens vivit, liber mihi non erit unquam. Seneca and the rest of the Stoics are of opinion that where is any the least perturbation, wisdom may not be found. What more ridiculous, as Lactantius urges, than to hear how Xerxes whipped the Hellespont, threatened the mountain Athos, and the like, to speak ad rem, who is free from passion, mortalis nemo est, quem non attingat dolor morbusve, as Tully determines, out of an old poem. No mortal men can avoid sorrow and sickness, and sorrow is an inseparable companion from melancholy. Chrysostom pleads farther yet, that they are more than mad, very beasts, stupefied and void of common sense. For how, saith he, shall I know thee to be a man, when thou kickest like an ass, neighest like a horse after women, ravest in lust like a bull, ravenest like a bear, Stingest like a scorpion, rakest like a wolf, as subtle as a fox, as impudent as a dog. Shall I say thou art a man, that hast all the symptoms of a beast? How shall I know thee to be a man, by thy shape? That affrights me more, when I see a beast in likeness of a man. Seneca calls that of Epicurus, magnificam walkem, an heroical speech. A fool still begins to live, and accounts it a filthy lightness in men, every day to lay new foundations of their life. But who doth otherwise? One travels, another builds, one for this, another for that business, and old folks are as far out as the rest. O dementem senectutem, Tully exclaims. Therefore young, old, middle-aged, all are stupid and dote. Aeneas Silvius, amongst many other, sets down three special ways to find a fool by. He is a fool that seeks that he cannot find. He is a fool that seeks that which, being found, will do him more harm than good. He is a fool that, having variety of ways to bring him to his journey's end, takes that which is worst. 
If so, methinks most men are fools. Examine their courses, and you shall soon perceive what dizards and madmen the major part are. Beroaldus will have drunkards, afternoon men, and such as more than ordinarily delight in drink, to be mad. The first pot quencheth thirst, so Paniasis the poet determines in Athenaeus. Secunda gratiis, horis et Dionysio. The second makes merry, the third for pleasure. Quarta ad insaniam, the fourth makes them mad. If this position be true, what a catalogue of madmen shall we have? What shall they be that drink four times four? Non es supra omnem furorem? Supra omnem insaniam redunt insanissimos? I am of his opinion. They are more than mad, much worse than mad. The Abderites condemned Democritus for a madman, because he was sometimes sad, and sometimes again profusely merry. Hark patria, saith Hippocrates, obrisum furere et insanire dicunt. His countrymen hold him mad, because he laughs and therefore he desires him to advise all his friends at Rhodes, that they do not laugh too much, or be over-sad. Had those Abderites been conversant with us, and but seen what fleering and grinning there is in this age, they would certainly have concluded we had been all out of our wits. Aristotle, in his Ethics, holds, Felix idemque sapiens, to be wise and happy, are reciprocal terms. Bonus idemque sapiens honestus. Tis Tully's paradox. Wise men are free, but fools are slaves. Liberty is a power to live according to his own laws, as we will ourselves. Who hath this liberty? Who is free? Sapiens sibique imperiosus, quem neque pauperies, neque mors, neque vincula terent, Responsare cupidinibus contemnere honores, fortis et in seipso totus teres atque rotundus. He is wise that can command his own will, valiant and constant to himself still, whom poverty nor death nor bands can fright, checks his desires, scorns honours, just and right. End of section 10 Section 11 of The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1, by Robert Burton. Section 11. Democritus, Jr. to the Reader. Part 9. But where shall such a man be found? If nowhere, then, a diametro, we are all slaves, senseless or worse. Nemo malus felix, but no man is happy in this life, none good, therefore no man wise. Rari quipe boni, for one virtue you shall find ten vices in the same party. Pauci prometheii, multi epimetheii. We may peradventure usurp the name, or attribute it to others for favour, as Carolus Sapiens, Philippus Bonus, Lodovicus Pius, etc., and describe the properties of a wise man, as Tully doth an orator, Xenophon Cyrus, Castilio a courtier, Galen temperament, an aristocracy is described by politicians. But where shall such a man be found? Vir bonus et sapiens, qualem vix reperet unum, milibus e multis hominum, consultus Apollo. A wise, a good man in a million, Apollo consulted, could scarce find one. A man is a miracle of himself, but Trismegistus adds, maximum miraculum homo sapiens. A wise man is a wonder. Multi tirsigeri, pauci baci. Alexander, when he was presented with that rich and costly casket of King Darius, and every man advised him what to put in it, he reserved it to keep Homer's works, as the most precious jewel of human wit, 
and yet Scarliger upbraids Homer's muse, Nutricem insanae sapientiae, a nursery of madness, impudent as a court lady that blushes at nothing. Jacobus Mulculus, Gilbertus Cognatus, Erasmus, and almost all posterity admire Lucian's luxuriant wit, yet Scarliger rejects him in his censure, and calls him the Cerberus of the Muses. Socrates, whom all the world so much magnified, is by Lactantius and Theodoret condemned for a fool. Plutarch extols Seneca's wit beyond all the Greeks, nulli secundus, yet Seneca saith of himself, When I would solace myself with a fool, I reflect upon myself, and there I have him. Cardan, in his sixteenth book of subtleties, reckons up twelve super-eminent acute philosophers, for worth, subtlety, and wisdom. Archimedes, Galen, Vitruvius, Architas, Tarentinus, Euclid, Jeber, that first inventor of algebra, Alkindus, the mathematician, both Arabians, with others. But his triumviri terrarum, far beyond the rest, are Ptolemaeus, Plotinus, Hippocrates. Scaliger, Exercitationes, 224, scoffs at this censure of his, calls some of them carpenters and mechanicians. He makes Galen, Fimbriam Hippocrates, a skirt of Hippocrates, and the said Cardan himself elsewhere condemns both Galen and Hippocrates for tediousness, obscurity, confusion. Paracelsus will have them both mere idiots, infants in physic and philosophy. Scaliger and Cardan admire Suisse, the calculator, qui pene modum excessit humani ingenii and yet Lodovicus Vives calls them Nugas Suiceticas, and Cardan, opposite to himself in another place, condemns those ancients in respect of times present. Maiores que nostros ad presentes colatos, juste pueros appellari. In conclusion, the said Cardan and St. Bernard will admit none into this catalogue of wise men, but only prophets and apostles. How they esteem themselves, you have heard before. We are worldly wise, admire ourselves, and seek for applause. But here St. Bernard, Quanto magis foras es sapiens, tanto magis intus stultus efficeris, etc. In omnibus es prudens, circa te ipsum insipiens. The more wise thou art to others, the more fool to thyself. I may not deny but that there is some folly approved, a divine fury, a holy madness, even a spiritual drunkenness in the saints of God themselves. Sanctum insanium, Bernard calls it, though not as blaspheming Vorstius would infer it as a passion incident to God himself, but familiar to good men, as that of Paul, 2 Corinthians, he was a fool, etc., and Romans 9, he wisheth himself to be anathematized for them. Such is that drunkenness which Ficinus speaks of, when the soul is elevated and ravished with a divine taste of that heavenly nectar which poets deciphered by the sacrifice of Dionysius, and in this sense with the poet insanire lubet, as Austin exhorts us, ad ebrietatem se quisque parit, let's all be mad and drunk, but we commonly mistake and go beyond our commission. We reel to the opposite part. We are not capable of it. And, as he said of the Greeks, Vos Graeci semper pueri, Vos Britanni, Galli, Germani, Itali, etc. You are a company of fools. Proceed now a partibus ad totum, or from the whole to parts, and you shall find no other issue. The parts shall be sufficiently dilated in this following preface. The whole must needs follow by a sorites or induction. Every multitude is mad, bellua multorum capitum, a many-headed beast, precipitate and rash without judgment, stultum animal, a roaring rout. Roger Bacon proves it out of Aristotle, vulgus dividi in oppositum contra sapientes, quod vulgo videtur verum falsum est. 
that which the commonalty accounts true is most part false they are still opposite to wise men but all the world is of this humour vulgus and thou thyself art de vulgo one of the commonalty and he and he and so are all the rest and therefore as phocion concludes to be approved in naught you say or do mere idiots and asses begin then where you will go backward or forward choose out of the whole pack wink and choose you shall find them all alike never a barrel better herring copernicus atlas's successor is of opinion the earth is a planet moves and shines to others as the moon doth to us diggs gilbert keplerus origanus and others defend this hypothesis of his in sober sadness and that the moon is inhabited if it be so that the earth is a moon then are we also giddy vertiginous and lunatic within this sublunary maze i could produce such arguments till dark night if you should hear the rest ante diem clauso component vesper olimpo through such a train of words if i should run the day would sooner than the tale be done but according to my promise i will descend to particulars this melancholy extends itself not to men only but even to vegetals and sensibles i speak not of those creatures which are saturnine melancholy by nature as lead and such like minerals or those plants rue cypress etc and hellebore itself of which agrippa treats fishes birds and beasts hares conies dormice etc owls bats night birds but that artificial which is perceived in them all remove a plant it will pine away which is especially perceived in date trees as you may read at large in constantine's husbandry that antipathy betwixt the vine and the cabbage vine and oil put a bird in a cage he will die for sullenness or a beast in a pen or take his young ones or companions from him and see what effect it will cause but who perceives not these common passions of sensible creatures fear sorrow etc of all other dogs are most subject to this malady insomuch some hold they dream as men do and through violence of melancholy run mad i could relate many stories of dogs that have died for grief and pined away for loss of their masters but they are common in every author kingdoms provinces and politic bodies are likewise sensible and subject to this disease as poterus in his politics hath proved at large as in human bodies saith he there be diverse alterations proceeding from humours so be there many diseases in a commonwealth which do as diversely happen from several distempers as you may easily perceive by their particular symptoms for where you shall see the people civil obedient to god and princes judicious peaceable and quiet rich fortunate and flourish to live in peace in unity and concord a country well tilled many fair built and populous cities ubi inculae nitent as old cato said the people are neat polite and terse ubi bene beate quae vivunt which our politicians make the chief end of a commonwealth and which aristotle politics liber trace chapter four calls commune bonum polybius liber sex optabilem et selectum statum that country is free from melancholy as it was in italy in the time of augustus now in china now in many other flourishing kingdoms of europe but whereas you shall see many discontents common grievances complaints poverty barbarism beggary plagues wars rebellions seditions mutinies contentions idleness riot epicurism the land lie untilled waste full of bogs fens deserts etc cities decayed base and poor towns villages depopulated the people squalid ugly uncivil that kingdom that country must needs be discontent melancholy hath a sick body and had need to be reformed now that cannot well be effected till the causes of these maladies be first removed which commonly proceed from their own default or some accidental inconvenience as to be situated in a bad clime 
too far north, sterile, in a barren place, as the desert of Libya, deserts of Arabia, places void of waters, as those of Lop and Belgian in Asia, or in a bad air, as at Alexandretta, Bantam, Pisa, Durazzo, St. John de Uloa, etc., or in danger of the sea's continual inundations, as in many places of the low countries, and elsewhere, or near some bad neighbours, as Hungarians to Turks, Podolians to Tartars, or almost any bordering countries. They live in fear still, and by reason of hostile incursions are oftentimes left desolate. So are cities by reason of wars, fires, plagues, inundations, wild beasts, decay of trades, barred havens, the sea's violence, as Antwerp may witness of late, Syracuse of old, Brundusium in Italy, Rye and Dover with us, and many that at this day suspect the sea's fury and rage, and labour against it as the Venetians to their inestimable charge. But the most frequent maladies are such as proceed from themselves, as first when religion and God's service is neglected, innovated, or altered, where they do not fear God, obey their prince, where atheism, epicurism, sacrilege, simony, etc., and all such impieties are freely committed, that country cannot prosper. When Abraham came to Gerar, and saw a bad land, he said, Sure the fear of God was not in that place. Cyprian Echovius, a Spanish chorographer, above all other cities of Spain, commends Borthino, in which there was no beggar, no man poor, etc., but all rich and in good estate. And he gives the reason, because they were more religious than their neighbours. Why was Israel so often spoiled by their enemies, led into captivity, etc., but for their idolatry, neglect of God's word, for sacrilege, even for one Achan's fault? And what shall we, except that have such multitudes of Achans, church robbers, simoniacal patrons, etc., how can they hope to flourish that neglect divine duties, that live most part like epicures? Other grievances are generally noxious to a body politic, alteration of laws and customs, breaking privileges, general oppressions, seditions, etc., observed by Aristotle, Bodin, Boterus, Junius, Arniscus, etc. I will only point at some of the chiefest. Impotentia gubernandi, ataxia, confusion, ill-government, which proceeds from unskilful, slothful, griping, covetous, unjust, rash, or tyrannizing magistrates, when they are fools, idiots, children, proud, willful, partial, indiscreet, oppressors, giddy-heads, tyrants, not able or unfit to manage such offices. Many noble cities and flourishing kingdoms by that means are desolate. The whole body groans under such heads, and all the members must needs be disaffected, as at this day those goodly provinces in Asia Minor, etc., groan under the burthen of a Turkish government, and those vast kingdoms of Muscovia, Russia, under a tyrannizing duke. Who ever heard of more civil and rich populous countries than those of Greece, Asia Minor, abounding with all wealth, multitudes of inhabitants, force, power, splendour and magnificence, and that miracle of countries, the Holy Land, that in so small a compass of ground could maintain so many towns, cities, produce so many fighting men? Egypt, another paradise, now barbarous and desert, and almost waste by the despotical government of an imperious Turk. Intolerabili servitutis jugo premitur, one saith. Not only fire and water, goods or lands, sed ipses spiritus ab insolentissimi victoris pendet nutu. Such is their slavery, their lives and souls depend upon his insolent will and command. A tyrant that spoils all wheresoever he comes, insomuch that an historian complains, if an old inhabitant should now see them, he would not know them. If a traveller or stranger, it would grieve his heart to behold them. 
whereas Aristotle notes, novae exactiones, nova onera imposita, new burdens and exactions daily come upon them, like those of which Zosimus, liber duo, so grievous, ut viri uxores, patres filios prostituerent, ut exactoribus equestu, etc. They must needs be discontent. Hinc civitatum gemitus et ploratus, as Tully holds. Hence come those complaints and tears of cities, poor, miserable, rebellious, and desperate subjects, as Hippolytus adds. And, as a judicious countryman of ours observed not long since, in a survey of that great duchy of Tuscany, the people lived much grieved and discontent, as appeared by their manifold and manifest complainings in that kind that the state was like a sick body which had lately taken physic, whose humours are not yet well settled, and weakened so much by purging that nothing was left but melancholy. Whereas the princes and potentates are immoderate in lust, hypocrites, epicures, of no religion but in show, quid hypocrisy fragilius, what so brittle and unsure, what sooner subverts their estates than wandering and raging lusts, on their subjects' wives, daughters, to say no worse? They that should, facim praefere, lead the way to all virtuous actions, are the ringleaders oftentimes of all mischief and dissolute courses, and by that means their countries are plagued, and they themselves often ruined, banished, or murdered by conspiracy of their subjects as Sardanapalus was, Dionysius Junior, Heliogabalus, Periander, Pisistratus, Tarquinius, Timocrates, Kildericus, Appius Claudius, Andronicus, Galliarchius Sforza, Alexander Medices, etc. Whereas the princes or great men are malicious, envious, factious, ambitious, emulators, they tear a commonwealth asunder, as so many Guelphs and Ghibellines disturb the quietness of it, and with mutual murders let it bleed to death. Our histories are too full of such barbarous inhumanities, and the miseries that issue from them. Whereas they be like so many horse-leeches, hungry, griping, corrupt, covetous, awaritice mancipia, ravenous as wolves, for, as Tully writes, Qui praest prodest, et qui pecudibus praest, debet eorum utilitati inservire, or such as prefer their private, before the public good. For, as he said long since, res privatae publicis semper officere, or whereas they be illiterate, ignorant, empirics in policy, ubi deest facultas virtus, Aristotle Politics 5, chapter 8, et scientia, wise only by inheritance, and in authority by birthright, favour, or for their wealth and titles. There must needs be a fault, a great defect, because, as an old philosopher affirms, such men are not always fit. Of an infinite number, few alone are senators, and of those few, few are good, and of that small number of honest, good, and noble men, Few that are learned, wise, discreet, and sufficient, able to discharge such places. It must needs turn to the confusion of a state. For, as the princes are, so are the people, qualis rex, talis grex, and which Antigonus right well said of old, qui Macedoniae regem erudit, omnes etiam subditos erudit. He that teacheth the king of Macedon, teacheth all his subjects, is a true saying still. For princes are the glass, the school, the book, where subjects' eyes do learn, do read, do look. Where locius et citius nos, corrumpunt vitiorum exempla domestica, magnis cum subiant animos auctoribus. Their examples are soonest followed, vices entertained. If they be profane, irreligious, lascivious, riotous, epicures, factious, covetous, ambitious, illiterate, so will the commons most part be, idle unthrifts, prone to lust, drunkards, and therefore poor and needy. Her penia stasinem poie, 
kai katorgian, for poverty begets sedition and villainy. Upon all occasions, ready to mutiny and rebel, discontent still, complaining, murmuring, grudging, apt to all outrages, thefts, treasons, murders, innovations, in debt, shifters, cousiners, outlaws, profligati, farmai, ac vitae. It was an old politician's aphorism. They that are poor and bad, envy rich, hate good men, abhor the present government, wish for a new, and would have all turned topsy-turvy. When Catiline rebelled in Rome, he got a company of such debauched rogues together, they were his familiars and coadjutors, and such have been your rebels most part in all ages, Jack Cade, Tom Straw, Ket, and his companions. Where there be many discords, many laws, many lawsuits, many lawyers and many physicians, it is a manifest sign of a distempered, melancholy state, as Plato long since maintained. For where such kind of men swarm, they will make more work for themselves, and that body politic diseased, which was otherwise sound. A general mischief in these our times, an insensible plague, and never so many of them, which are now multiplied, saith Geraldus, a lawyer himself, as so many locusts, not the parents, but the plagues of the country, and for the most part a supercilious, bad, covetous, litigious generation of men, crumeni mulga natio, etc., a purse-milking nation, a clamorous company, gowned vultures, qui ex in uria we went, et sanguine civium, thieves and seminaries of discord, worse than any pollers by the highway side. Auri acipitres, auri exterebronides, pecuniarum hamiolae, quadruplatores, curiae harpagones, fori tintinabula, monstra hominum, mangones, etc., that take upon them to make peace, but are indeed the very disturbers of our peace, a company of irreligious harpies, scraping, griping catchpoles, I mean our common hungry pettifoggers, rabulas forenses, love and honour in the meantime all good laws and worthy lawyers, that are so many oracles and pilots of a well-governed commonwealth. Without art, without judgment, that do more harm, as Livy said, quam bella externa, fames, morbiwe, than sickness, wars, hunger, diseases, and cause a most incredible destruction of a commonwealth, saith Cecilius, a famous civilian sometime in Paris, as ivy doth by an oak, embrace it so long, until it hath got the heart out of it, so do they by such places they inhabit. No counsel at all, no justice, no speech to be had, nisi eum premulseris, he must be fed still, or else he is as mute as a fish. Better open an oyster without a knife. Experto crede, saith Salisburiensis, in manus eorum milies inquiri, et caronimitis qui nulli pepercit unquam his longe clementior est. I speak out of experience. I have been a thousand times amongst them, and Caron himself is more gentle than they. He is contented with his single pay, but they multiply still, they are never satisfied. Besides, they have damnificas linguas, as he terms it, nisi funibus argenteis vincias. They must be fed to say nothing, and get more to hold their peace than we can to say our best. They will speak their clients fair, and invite them to their tables, but, as he follows it, of all injustice there is none so pernicious as that of theirs, which, when they deceive most, will seem to be honest men. They take upon them to be peacemakers, et fowere causas humilium, to help them to their right, patrocinantur afflictis, but all is for their own good, ut loculos pleniorum exauriant. They plead for poor men gratis, but they are but as a stale to catch others. If there be no jar, they can make a jar. Out of the law itself find still some quirk or other to set them at odds, and continue causes so long, lustra aliquot, 
I know not how many years before the cause is heard, and when tis judged and determined by reason of some tricks and errors, it is as fresh to begin, after twice seven years sometimes, as it was at first. And so they prolong time, delay suits, till they have enriched themselves, and beggared their clients. And as Cato inveighed against Isocrates' scholars, we may justly tax our wrangling lawyers. They do consenescere in litibus, are so litigious and busy here on earth, that I think they will plead their clients' causes hereafter, some of them in hell. Similarus complains amongst the Swissers of the advocates in his time, that when they should make an end, they began controversies, and protract their causes many years, persuading them their title is good, till their patrimonies be consumed, and that they have spent more in seeking than the thing is worth, or they shall get by the recovery. So that he that goes to law, as the proverb is, holds a wolf by the ears, or as a sheep in a storm runs for shelter to a briar, if he prosecute his cause, he is consumed. If he surcease his suit, he loseth all. What difference! They had wont heretofore, saith Austin, to end matters per communes arbitros, and so in Switzerland, we are informed by Simlerus, they had some common arbitrators or daysmen in every town that made a friendly composition betwixt man and man, and he much wonders at their honest simplicity that could keep peace so well, and end such great causes by that means. At fairs in Africa, they have neither lawyers nor advocates, but if there be any controversies amongst them, both parties, plaintiff and defendant, come to their alfakins, or chief judge, and at once, without any farther appeals or pitiful delays, the cause is heard and ended. Our forefathers, as a worthy chorographer of ours observes, had want pauculi scrupulis aureis, with a few golden crosses and lines in verse, make all conveyances, assurances. And such was the candour and integrity of succeeding ages, that a deed, as I have oft seen, to convey a whole manner, was implicite contained in some twenty lines or thereabouts, like that scere or citara laconica, so much renowned of old in all contracts, which Tully so earnestly commends to Atticus, Plutarch in his Lysander, Aristotle politics, Thucydides, Liber Unus, Diodorus and Suidus, approve and magnify, for that laconic brevity in this kind. And well they might, for according to Tertullian, Certa sunt paucis, there is much more certainty in few words. And so was it of old throughout. But now many skins of parchment will scarce serve turn. He that buys and sells a house, must have a house full of writings, there be so many circumstances, so many words, such tautological repetitions of all particulars, to avoid cavillation, they say. But we find, by our woeful experience, that to subtle wits it is a cause of much more contention and variance, and scarce any conveyance so accurately penned by one, which another will not find a crack in, or cavil at or any one word be misplaced, any little error, all is disannulled. That which is a law to-day is none to-morrow, that which is sound in one man's opinion is most faulty to another, that in conclusion here is nothing amongst us but contention and confusion, we bandy one against another, and that which long since Plutarch complained of them in Asia may be verified in our times. These men here assembled come not to sacrifice to their gods, to offer Jupiter their first fruits, or merriments to Bacchus, but an yearly disease exasperating Asia hath brought them hither, to make an end of their controversies and lawsuits. Tis multitudo perdentium et periuntium, a destructive rout that seek one another's ruin. Such, most part, are our ordinary suitors, termers, clients, new stirs every day, mistakes, errors, cavils, and at this present, as I have heard in some one court, I know not how many thousand causes, 
no person free, no title almost good, with such bitterness in following, so many slights, procrastinations, delays, forgery, such cost, for infinite sums are inconsiderately spent, violence and malice. I know not by whose fault, lawyers, clients, laws, both or all. But, as Paul reprehended the Corinthians long since, I may more positively infer now, there is a fault amongst you, and I speak it to your shame. Is there not a wise man amongst you, to judge between his brethren? But that a brother goes to law with a brother, and Christ's counsel concerning lawsuits was never so fit to be inculcated as in this age. Agree with thine adversary quickly, etc. Matthew 5, 25 End of section 11section 12 of the anatomy of melancholy volume 1 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for further information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the anatomy of melancholy volume 1 by robert burton section 12 democritus junior to the reader part 10 I could repeat many such particular grievances, which must disturb a body politic. To shut up all in brief, where good government is, prudent and wise princes, there all things thrive and prosper, peace and happiness is in that land. Where it is otherwise, all things are ugly to behold, incult, barbarous, uncivil, a paradise is turned to a wilderness. This island, amongst the rest, our next neighbours, the French and Germans, may be a sufficient witness, that in a short time, by that prudent policy of the Romans, was brought from barbarism. See but what Caesar reports of us, and Tacitus, of those old Germans. They were once as uncivil as they in Virginia. Yet, by planting of colonies and good laws, they became, from barbarous outlaws, to be full of rich and populous cities, as now they are, and most flourishing kingdoms. Even so might Virginia and those wild Irish have been civilised long since, if that order had been heretofore taken, which now begins, of planting colonies, etc. I have read a discourse, printed anno 1612, discovering the true causes why Ireland was never entirely subdued, or brought under obedience to the crown of England, until the beginning of His Majesty's happy reign. Yet, if his reasons were thoroughly scanned by a judicious politician, I am afraid he would not altogether be approved, but that it would turn to the dishonour of our nation, to suffer it to lie so long waste. Yea, and if some travellers should see, to come nearer home, those rich united provinces of Holland, Zealand, etc., over against us, those neat cities and populous towns, full of most industrious artificers, so much land recovered from the sea, and so painfully preserved by those artificial inventions, so wonderfully approved as that of Bempster in Holland, ut nihil huic par aut simile invenias in toto orbe, saith Bertius the geographer, all the world cannot match it, so many navigable channels from place to place, made by men's hands, etc., and on the other side so many thousand acres of our fens lie drowned, our cities thin, and those vile, poor, and ugly to behold in respect of theirs. Our trades decayed, our still-running rivers stopped, and that beneficial use of transportation wholly neglected so many havens void of ships and towns, so many parks and forests for pleasure, barren heaths, so many villages depopulated, etc. I think sure he would find some fault. I may not deny, but that this our nation of ours, doth bene audire apud exteros, is a most noble, a most flourishing kingdom, by common consent of all geographers, historians, politicians, tis unica velut arx, 
and which Quintius in Livy said of the inhabitants of Peloponnesus, may be well applied to us. We are testudines testa sua inclusi, like so many tortoises in our shells, safely defended by an angry sea, as a wall on all sides. Our island hath many such honourable eulogiums, and as a learned countryman of ours right well hath it, ever since the Normans first coming into England, this country, both for military matters and all other of civility, hath been paralleled with the most flourishing kingdoms of Europe and our Christian world, a blessed, a rich country, and one of the fortunate isles and for some things preferred before other countries, for expert seamen, our laborious discoveries, art of navigation, true merchants, they carry the bell away from all other nations, even the Portugals and Hollanders themselves, without all fear, saith Boterus, furrowing the ocean winter and summer, and two of their captains, with no less valour than fortune, have sailed around the world, we have besides many particular blessings which our neighbours want, the gospel truly preached, church discipline established, long peace and quietness free from exactions, foreign fears, invasions, domestical seditions, well manured, fortified by art and nature, and now most happy in that fortunate union of England and Scotland, which our forefathers have laboured to effect and desired to see but in which we excel all others, a wise, learned, religious king, another Numa, a second Augustus, a true Josiah, most worthy senators, a learned clergy, an obedient commonalty, etc. Yet amongst many roses some thistles grow, some bad weeds and enormities, which much disturb the peace of this body politic, eclipse the honour and glory of it fit to be rooted out, and with all speed to be reformed. The first is idleness, by reason of which we have many swarms of rogues and beggars, thieves, drunkards, and discontented persons, whom Lycurgus in Plutarch calls morbos rei publicae, the boils of the commonwealth, many poor people in all our towns, civitates ignobiles, as Polydor calls them, base-built cities, inglorious, poor, small, rare in sight, ruinous, and thin of inhabitants. Our land is fertile, we may not deny, full of all good things, and why doth it not then abound with cities, as well as Italy, France, Germany, and low countries? Because their policy hath been otherwise, and we are not so thrifty, circumspect, industrious. Idleness is the malus genius of our nation. For, as Boterus justly argues, fertility of a country is not enough. Except art and industry be joined unto it, according to Aristotle, riches are either natural or artificial. Natural are good land, fair mines, etc. Artificial are manufactures, coins, etc. Many kingdoms are fertile, but thin of inhabitants, as that duchy of Piedmont in Italy, which Leander Albertus so much magnifies for corn, wine, fruits, etc., yet nothing near so populous as those which are more barren. England, saith he, London only excepted, hath never a populous city, and yet a fruitful country. I find forty-six cities and walled towns in Alsatia, a small province in Germany, fifty castles, an infinite number of villages, no ground idle, no, not rocky places or tops of hills are untilled, as Munster informeth us. In Greischgea, a small territory on the Necker, twenty-four Italian miles over, I read of twenty walled towns, innumerable villages, each one containing a hundred and fifty houses, most part, besides castles and noblemen's palaces. I observe in Thuringia, in Dutchland, twelve miles over by their scale, twelve counties, and in them one hundred and forty-four cities, two thousand villages, one hundred and forty-four towns, two hundred and fifty castles, in Bavaria thirty-four cities, forty-six towns, etc. Portugalia in Teramnis, a small plot of ground, hath one thousand four hundred and sixty parishes, one hundred and thirty monasteries, two hundred bridges. 
Malta, a barren island, yields twenty thousand inhabitants. But of all the rest, I admire Luis Guicciardine's relations of the low countries. Holland hath twenty-six cities, four hundred great villages, Zeeland ten cities, one hundred and two parishes, Brabant twenty-six cities, one hundred and two parishes, Flanders twenty-eight cities, ninety towns, one thousand one hundred and fifty-four villages, besides abbeys, castles, etc. The low countries generally have three cities at least for one of ours, and those far more populous and rich. And what is the cause but their industry and excellency in all manner of trades? Their commerce, which is maintained by a multitude of tradesmen, so many excellent channels made by art and opportune havens, to which they build their cities, all which we have in like measure, or at least may have, but their chiefest lodestone, which draws all manner of commerce and merchandise, which maintains their present estate, is not fertility of soil, but industry that enricheth them. The gold mines of Peru or Nova Hispania may not compare with them. They have neither gold nor silver of their own, wine nor oil, or scarce any corn growing in those united provinces, little or no wood, tin, lead, iron, silk, wool, any stuff almost, or metal. And yet Hungary, Transylvania, that brag of their mines, fertile England, cannot compare with them. I dare boldly say that neither France, Tarentum, Apulia, Lombardy, or any part of Italy, Valencia in Spain, or that pleasant Andalusia, with their excellent fruits, wine, and oil, no, not any part of Europe is so flourishing, so rich, so populous, so full of good ships, of well-built cities, so abounding with all things necessary for the use of man. Tis our Indies, an epitome of China, and all by reason of their industry, good policy, and commerce. Industry is a lodestone to draw all good things. That alone makes countries flourish, cities populous, and will enforce by reason of much manure, which necessarily follows, a barren soil to be fertile and good, as sheep, saith Dion, mend a bad pasture. Tell me, politicians, why is that fruitful Palestina, noble Greece, Egypt, Asia Minor, so much decayed, and mere carcasses now, fallen from what they were. The ground is the same, but the government is altered, the people are grown slothful, idle, their good husbandry, policy, and industry is decayed. Non fatigata aut effeta humus, as Columella well informs Silvinus, sed nostra fit inertia, etc. May a man believe that which Aristotle in his politics, Pausanias, Stephanus, Sophianus, Gerbelius, relate of old Greece? I find heretofore seventy cities in Epirus overthrown by Paulus Aemilius, a goodly province in times past, now left desolate of good towns and almost inhabitants. Sixty-two cities in Macedonia in Strabo's time. I find thirty in Laconia, but now scarce so many villages, saith Gerbelius. If any man from Mount Taegetus should view the country round about, and see, tot delicias, tot urbes per Peloponnesum dispersas, so many delicate and brave built cities, with such cost and exquisite cunning, so neatly set out in Peloponnesus, he should perceive them now ruinous and overthrown, burnt, waste, desolate, and laid level with the ground. Incredibile dictu, etc. And as he laments, Quis talia fando temperet a lacrimis, quis tam durus aut ferius, so he prosecutes it, who is he that can sufficiently condole and commiserate these ruins? Where are those four thousand cities of Egypt, those one hundred cities in Crete? Are they now come to two? What saith Pliny and Aelian of old Italy? There were in former ages one thousand one hundred and sixty-six cities. 
Blondus and Machiavel both grant them now nothing near so populous, and full of good towns as in the time of Augustus, for now Leander Albertus can find but three hundred at most, and if we may give credit to Livy, not then so strong and puissant as of old, they mustered seventy legions in former times, which now the known world will scarce yield. Alexander built seventy cities in a short space for his part. Our sultans and Turks demolish twice as many, and leave all desolate. Many will not believe that our island of Great Britain is now more populous than ever it was. Yet let them read Bede, Leland, and others. They shall find it most flourished in the Saxon heptarchy, and in the conqueror's time was far better inhabited than at this present. See that doomsday book, and show me those thousands of parishes which are now decayed, cities ruined, villages depopulated, etc. The lesser the territory is, commonly the richer it is. Parvus sed bene cultus ager. As those Athenian, Lacedaemonian, Arcadian, Aelian, Sicyonian, Messenian, etc., commonwealths of Greece, make ample proof as those imperial cities and free states of Germany may witness, those cantons of Switzers, Reti, Grisons, Walloons, territories of Tuscany, Luke and Senes of old, Piedmont, Mantua, Venice in Italy, Ragusa, etc. That prince, therefore, as Boterus adviseth, that will have a rich country and fair cities, let him get good trades, privileges, painful inhabitants, artificers, and suffer no rude matter unwrought, as tin, iron, wool, lead, etc., to be transported out of his country, a thing in part seriously attempted amongst us, but not effected. And because industry of men and multitude of trade so much avails to the ornament and enriching of a kingdom, those ancient Massilians would admit no man into their city that had not brought some trade. Selim, the first Turkish emperor, procured a thousand good artificers to be brought from Tauris to Constantinople. The Polanders, indented with Henry, Duke of Anjou, their new chosen king, to bring with him an hundred families of artificers into Poland. James I in Scotland, as Buchanan writes, sent for the best artificers he could get in Europe, and gave them great rewards to teach his subjects their several trades. Edward III, our most renowned king, to his eternal memory, brought clothing first into this island, transporting some families of artificers from Gaunt hither. How many goodly cities could I reckon up that thrive wholly by trade, where thousands of inhabitants live singular well by their fingers' ends, as Florence in Italy by making cloth of gold, Great Milan by silk, and all curious works, Arras in Artois by those fair hangings, many cities in Spain, many in France, Germany, have none other maintenance, especially those within the land. Mecca, in Arabia Petria, stands in a most unfruitful country, that wants water, amongst the rocks, as Vertomanus describes it, and yet it is a most elegant and pleasant city, by reason of the traffic of the east and west. Ormus, in Persia, is a most famous mart town, hath naught else but the opportunity of the haven to make it flourish. Corinth, a noble city, Lumen Graeciae, Tully calls it, the eye of Greece, by reason of Kenkrias and Lecheus, those excellent ports, drew all that traffic of the Ionian and Aegean seas to it. And yet the country about it was curva et superciliosa, as Strabo terms it, rugged and harsh. We may say the same of Athens, Actium, Thebes, Sparta, and most of those towns in Greece, Nuremberg in Germany is situated in a most barren soil, yet a noble imperial city. By the sole industry of artificers and cunning trades, they draw the riches of most countries to them, so expert in manufactures, that, as Sallust long since gave out of the like, sedem animae in extremis digitis habent, their soul or intellectus agens, was placed in their finger's end. 
and so we may say of Basil, Spire, Cambrai, Frankfurt, etc. It is almost incredible to speak what some write of Mexico and the cities adjoining it. No place in the world at their first discovery more populous. Riccius the Jesuit, and some others, relate of the industry of the Chinese, most populous countries, not a beggar or an idle person to be seen, and how by that means they prosper and flourish. We have the same means, able bodies, pliant wits, matter of all sorts, wool, flax, iron, tin, lead, wood, etc., many excellent subjects to work upon, only industry is wanting. We send our best commodities beyond the seas, which they make good use of to their necessities, set themselves a work about, and severally improve, sending the same to us back at dear rates, or else make toys and baubles of the tales of them, which they sell to us again, at as great a reckoning as the whole. In most of our cities, some few excepted, like Spanish loiterers, we live wholly by tippling inns and alehouses. Malting are their best ploughs, their greatest traffic to sell ale. Meteran and some others object to us that we are no whit so industrious as the Hollanders. Manual trades, saith he, which are more curious or troublesome, are wholly exercised by strangers. They dwell in a sea full of fish, but they are so idle they will not catch so much as shall serve their own turns, but buy it of their neighbours. Tush! Mare liberum! They fish under our noses, and sell it to us, when they have done, at their own prices. Pudet haec opprobria nobis, et dici potuisse, et non potuisse refelli. I am ashamed to hear this objected by strangers, and know not how to answer it. Amongst our towns there is only London that bears the face of a city, Epitome Britanniae, a famous emporium, second to none beyond seas, a noble mart, but sola crescit de crescentibus aliis, and yet, in my slender judgment, defective in many things. The rest some few excepted, are in mean estate, ruinous most part, poor and full of beggars, by reason of their decayed trades, neglected or bad policy, idleness of their inhabitants, riot, which hath rather beg or loiter, and be ready to starve than work. I cannot deny, but that something may be said in defence of our cities, that they are not so fair built, for the sole magnificence of this kingdom concerning buildings hath been of old in those Norman castles and religious houses, so rich, thick-sighted, populous, as in some other countries, besides the reason Cardin gives, de subtilitate rerum liber undecim. We want wine and oil, their two harvests. We dwell in a colder air, and for that cause we must a little more liberally feed of flesh, as all northern countries do. Our provisions will not therefore extend to the maintenance of so many. Yet, notwithstanding, we have matter of all sorts, an open sea for traffic, as well as the rest, goodly havens. And how can we excuse our negligence, our riot, drunkenness, etc., and such enormities that follow it? We have excellent laws enacted, you will say, severe statutes, houses of correction, etc., to small purpose, it seems. It is not houses will serve, but cities of correction. Our trades generally ought to be reformed, wants supplied. In other countries they have the same grievances, I confess, but that doth not excuse us. Wants, defects, enormities, idle drones, tumults, discords, contention, lawsuits, many laws made against them to repress those innumerable brawls and lawsuits, excess in apparel, diet, decay of tillage, depopulations, especially against rogues, beggars, Egyptian vagabonds, so termed at least, which have swarmed all over Germany, France, Italy, Poland, as you may read in Munster, Crantius, and Aventinus, as those Tartars and Arabians at this day do in eastern countries. Yet such has been the iniquity of all ages, as it seems to small purpose. 
Nemo in nostra civitate mendicus esto, saith Plato, he will have them purged from a commonwealth, as a bad humour from the body, that are like so many ulcers and boils, and must be cured before the melancholy body can be eased. What Carolus Magnus, the Chinese, the Spaniards, the Duke of Saxony, and many other states have decreed in this case, read Arniseus, Poterus, Osorius de Rubus. When a country is overstocked with people, as a pasture is oft overlaid with cattle, they had wont in former times to disburden themselves by sending out colonies, or by wars, as those old Romans, or by employing them at home about some public buildings, as bridges, roadways, for which those Romans were famous in this island. As Augustus Caesar did in Rome, the Spaniards in their Indian mines, as at Potosi in Peru, where some thirty thousand men are still at work, six thousand furnaces ever boiling, etc., aqueducts, bridges, havens, those stupend works of Trajan, Claudius, at Ostium, Diocletiani Terma, Fucinus Lacus, that Piraeum in Athens, made by Themistocles, amphitheatrums of curious marble, as at Verona, Civitas Philippi and Heraclea in Thrace, those Appian and Flaminian ways, prodigious works all may witness, and rather than they should be idle, as those Egyptian pharaohs Maris and Sisostris did, to task their subjects to build unnecessary pyramids, obelisks, labyrinths, channels, lakes, gigantic works all, to divert them from rebellion, riot, drunkenness. Quo scilicet alantur, et ne vagando laborare desuescant. End of section 12Section 13 of The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1, by Robert Burton. Section 13 Democritus, Jr. to the Reader Part 11. Another eye saw is that want of conduct and navigable rivers, a great blemish as Boterus, Hippolytus Archolibus, and other politicians hold, if it be neglected in a commonwealth. Admirable cost and charge is bestowed in the Low Countries on this behalf, in the Duchy of Milan, territory of Padua, in France, Italy, China, and so likewise about corrivations of water to moisten and refresh barren grounds, to drain fens, bogs, and moors. Massinissa made many inward parts of Barbary and Numidia in Africa, before his time incult and horrid, fruitful and bartable by this means. Great industry is generally used all over the eastern countries in this kind, especially in Egypt, about Babylon and Damascus, as Vertomanus and Gotardus Arthus relate, about Barcelona, Segovia, Murcia, and many other places of Spain, Milan in Italy, by reason of which their soil is much improved, and infinite commodities arise to the inhabitants. The Turks of late attempted to cut that isthmus betwixt Africa and Asia, which Sisostris and Darius and some pharaohs of Egypt had formerly undertaken, but with ill success, as Diodorus Siculus records, and Pliny, for that Red Sea, being three cubits higher than Egypt, would have drowned all the country. Caipto destiterant, they left off. Yet, as the same Diodorus writes, Ptolemy renewed the work many years after, and absolved in it a more opportune place. That isthmus of Corinth was likewise undertaken to be made navigable by Demetrius, by Julius Caesar, Nero, Domitian, Herodes Atticus, to make a speedy passage, and less dangerous, from the Ionian and Aegean seas. But because it could not be so well effected, 
the Peloponnesians built a wall like our Picts' wall above Skynute, where Neptune's temple stood, and in the shortest cut over the isthmus, of which Diodorus liber duo, Herodotus liber octo, our latter writers call it Hexamilium, which Amorat the Turk demolished. The Venetians, anno 1453, repaired in fifteen days with thirty thousand men. Some, saith Acosta, would have a passage cut from Panama to Nombre de Dios in America, but Tuanus and Ceres, the French historians, speak of a famous aqueduct in France, intended in Henry the Fourth's time, from the Loire to the Seine, and from Rodanus to the Loire, the like to which was formerly assayed by Domitian, the emperor, from Arar to Moselle, which Cornelius Tacitus speaks of in the thirteen of his annals, after by Charles the Great and others. Much cost hath in former times been bestowed in either new making or mending channels of rivers and their passages, as Aurelianus did by Tiber to make it navigable to Rome, to convey corn from Egypt to the city, Wadum alvei tumenti se fodit, saith Vopiscus, et Tiberis vipas extruxit, he cut fords, made banks, etc., decayed havens, which Claudius the emperor, with infinite pains and charges, attempted at Ostia, as I have said, the Venetians at this day, to preserve their city. Many excellent means to enrich their territories have been fostered, invented, in most provinces of Europe, as planting some Indian plants amongst us, silkworms, the very mulberry leaves in the plains of Granada yield thirty thousand crowns per annum to the king of Spain's coffers, besides those many trades and artificers that are busied about them in the kingdom of Granada, Mercia, and all over Spain. In France a great benefit is raised by salt, etc. Whether these things might not be as happily attempted with us, and with like success, it may be controverted. Silkworms, I mean, vines, fir-trees, etc. Cardan exhorts Edward the Sixth to plant olives, and is fully persuaded they would prosper in this island. With us, navigable rivers are most part neglected, our streams are not great, I confess, by reason of the narrowness of the island, yet they run smoothly and even, not headlong, swift, or amongst rocks and shelves, as foaming Rodanus and Loire in France, Tigris in Mesopotamia, violent Durius in Spain, with cataracts and whirlpools, as the Rhine, and Danubius about Schaffhausen, Lausenburg, Linz and Krem, to endanger navigators or broad shallow, as Neckar in the Palatinate, Tibris in Italy, but calm and fair as Arar in France, Hebrus in Macedonia, Eurotus in Laconia, they gently glide along, and might as well be repaired many of them, I mean why, Trent, Ouse, Tamasis at Oxford, the defect of which we feel in the meantime, as the river of Lee from Ware to London. Bishop Atwater of old, or, as some will, Henry I, made a channel from Trent to Lincoln navigable, which now, saith Mr. Camden, is decayed, and much mention is made of anchors and such like monuments found about old Verulamium. Good ships have formerly come to Exeter, and many such places whose channels, havens, ports are now barred and rejected. We contemn this benefit of carriage by waters, and are therefore compelled in the inner parts of this island, because portage is so dear, to eat up our commodities ourselves, and live like so many boars in a sty, for want of vent and utterance. We have many excellent havens, royal havens, Falmouth, Portsmouth, Milford, etc., equivalent, if not to be preferred, to that Indian Havana, Old Brundusium in Italy, Aulis in Greece, Ambracia in Acarnia, Suda in Crete, which have few ships in them, little or no traffic or trade, which have scarce a village on them, able to bear great cities, said viderent politici. I could here justly tax many other neglects, abuses, errors, defects, amongst us, and in other countries, depopulations, riot, drunkenness, etc., and many such, quae nunc in aurem susurare non libet. 
but I must take heed, ne quid gravius dicam, that I do not overshoot myself, sus minervam, I am forth of my element, as you peradventure suppose, and sometimes veritas odium parit, as he said, verjuice and oatmeal is good for a parrot. But as Lucian said of an historian, I say of a politician, he that will freely speak and write, must be for ever no subject, under no prince or law, but lay out the matter truly as it is, not caring what any can, will, like or dislike. We have good laws, I deny not, to rectify such enormities, and so in all other countries, but it seems not always to good purpose. We had need of some general visitor in our age, that should reform what is amiss, a just army of rosy cross men, for they will amend all matters, they say, religion, policy, manners, with arts, sciences, etc. Another Attila, Tamerlane, Hercules, to strive with Achelous, Augeae stabulum purgare, to subdue tyrants, as he did Diomedes and Busiris, to expel thieves, as he did Cacus and Lacinius, to vindicate poor captives, as he did Hesione, to pass the torrid zone, the deserts of Libya, and purge the world of monsters and centaurs or another Theban Crates, to reform our manners, to compose quarrels and controversies, as in his time he did, and was therefore adored for a god in Athens. As Hercules purged the world of monsters, and subdued them, so did he fight against envy, lust, anger, avarice, etc., and all those feral vices and monsters of the mind. It were to be wished we had some such visitor, or if wishing would serve, one had such a ring or rings, as Timoleos desired in Lucian, by virtue of which he should be as strong as ten thousand men, or an army of giants, go invisible, open gates and castle doors, have what treasure he would, transport himself in an instant to what place he desired, alter affections, cure all manner of diseases, that he might range over the world, and reform all distressed states and persons, as he would himself. He might reduce those wandering Tartars in order, that infest China on the one side, Muscovy, Poland on the other, and tame the vagabond Arabians that rob and spoil those eastern countries, that they should never use more caravans or janissaries to conduct them. He might root out barbarism out of America, and fully discover terra australis incognita, find out the north-east and north-west passages, drain those mighty Maeotian fens, cut down those vast Hyrcinian woods, irrigate those barren Arabian deserts, etc., curious of our epidemical diseases, scorbutum, plica, morbus neapolitanus, etc., end all our idle controversies, cut off our tumultuous desires, inordinate lusts, root out atheism, impiety, heresy, schism, and superstition, which now so crucify the world, catechise gross ignorance, purge Italy of luxury and riot, Spain of superstition and jealousy, Germany of drunkenness, all our northern country of gluttony and intemperance, Castigate our hard-hearted parents, masters, tutors, lash disobedient children, negligent servants, correct these spendthrifts and prodigal sons, enforce idle persons to work, drive drunkards off the alehouse, repress thieves, visit corrupt and tyrannizing magistrates, etc. But as Lucius Licinius taxed Timoleus, you may us. These are vain and absurd and ridiculous wishes not to be hoped. All must be as it is. Vocalinus may cite commonwealths to come before Apollo and seek to reform the world itself by commissioners. But there is no remedy. It may not be redressed. Desinent homines tum demum stultescere quando esse desinent. So long as they can wag their beards, they will play the knaves and fools. 
Because, therefore, it is a thing so difficult, impossible, and far beyond Hercules's labours to be performed, let them be rude, stupid, ignorant, incult, lapis super lapidem sedeat, and, as the apologist will, tussi et graviolentia laboret, mundus vitio, let them be barbarous as they are, let them tyrannize, epicurize, oppress, luxuriate, consume themselves with factions, superstitions, lawsuits, wars and contentions, live in riot, poverty, want, misery, rebel, wallow as so many swine in their own dung, with Ulysses's companions, stultos jubio esse libenter. I will yet, to satisfy and please myself, make a utopia of mine own, a new Atlantis, a poetical commonwealth of mine own, in which I will freely domineer, build cities, make laws, statutes, as I list myself. And why may I not? Pictoribus atque poetis, etc. You know what liberty poets ever had. And besides, my predecessor Democritus was a politician, a recorder of Abdera, a law-maker, as some say. And why may not I presume so much as he did? Howsoever, I will adventure. For the sight, if you will needs urge me to it, I am not fully resolved. It may be in terra australi incognita. There is room enough, for of my knowledge neither that hungry Spaniard nor Mercurius Britannicus have yet discovered half of it, or else one of these floating islands in Mar del Tour, which, like the Cyanian islands in the Euxine Sea, alter their place, and are accessible only at set times, and to some few persons, or one of the fortunate isles, for who knows yet where or which they are. There is room enough in the inner parts of America and northern coasts of Asia, but I will choose a site whose latitude shall be forty-five degrees, I respect not minutes, in the midst of the temperate zone, or perhaps under the equator, that paradise of the world, ubi semper virens laurus, etc., where there is perpetual spring. The longitude, for some reasons, I will conceal. Yet be it known to all men by these presents, that if any honest gentleman will send in so much money, as Cardin allows an astrologer for casting a nativity, he shall be a sharer. I will acquaint him with my project, or if any worthy man will stand for any temporal or spiritual office or dignity, for, as he said of his archbishopric of Utopia, tis sanctus ambitus, and not amiss to be sought after. It shall be freely given, without all intercessions, bribes, letters, etc. His own worth shall be the best spokesman. And because we shall admit of no deputies or advousands, if he be sufficiently qualified, and as able as willing, to execute the place himself, he shall have present possession. It shall be divided into twelve or thirteen provinces, and those by hills, rivers, roadways, or some more eminent limits, exactly bounded. Each province shall have a metropolis, which shall be so placed as a centre almost in a circumference, and the rest at equal distances, some twelve Italian miles asunder, or thereabout. And in them shall be sold all things necessary for the use of man, statis oris et diebus, no market towns, markets, or fairs, for they do but beggar cities. No village shall stand above six, seven, or eight miles from a city, except those emporiums which are by the seaside. General staples, marts, as Antwerp, Venice, Bergen of old, London, etc. Cities, most part, shall be situated upon navigable rivers, or lakes, creeks, havens, and for their form, regular, round, square, or long square, with fair, broad, and straight streets, houses uniform, built of brick and stone, like Bruges, Brussels, Regium Lepidi, Bern in Switzerland, Milan, Mantua, Crema, Cambalu in Tartary, described by Polus, or that Venetian Parma. I will admit very few or no suburbs, and those of baser building, Walls only to keep out man and horse, except it be in some frontier towns or by the seaside, and those to be fortified after the latest manner of fortification, 
and situated upon convenient havens or opportune places. In every so-built city I will have convenient churches and separate places to bury the dead in, not in churchyards, a citadella, in some, not all, to command it, prisons for offenders, opportune market-places of all sorts, for corn, meat, cattle, fuel, fish, commodious courts of justice, public halls for all societies, bourses, meeting-places, armories, in which shall be kept engines for quenching of fire, artillery gardens, public walks, theatres, and spacious fields allotted for all gymnastic sports and honest recreations, hospitals of all kinds, for children, orphans, old folks, sick men, madmen, soldiers, pest-houses, etc., not built precario, or by gouty benefactors, who, when by fraud and rapine they have extorted all their lives, oppressed whole provinces, societies, etc., give something to pious uses, build a satisfactory almshouse, school, or bridge, etc., at their last end, or before, perhaps, which is no otherwise than to steal a goose, and stick down a feather, rob a thousand to relieve ten. And those hospitals so built and maintained, not by collections, benevolences, donaries, for a set number, as in ours, just so many, and no more, at such a rate, but for all those who stand in need, be they more or less, and that ex publico aerario, and so still maintained, no nobis solum nati sumus, etc. I will have cundits of sweet and good water, aptly disposed in each town, common granaries, as at Desden, in Misnia, Stettin, in Pommeland, Nuremberg, etc., colleges of mathematicians, musicians, and actors, as of old at Labedum in Ionia, alchemists, physicians, artists, and philosophers, that all the arts and sciences may sooner be perfected and better learnt, and public historiographers, as amongst those ancient Persians, qui in commentarios referebant quae memoratu digna gerebantur, informed and appointed by the state to register all famous acts, and not by each insufficient scribbler, partial or parasitical pedant, as in our times. I will provide public schools of all kinds, singing, dancing, fencing, etc., especially of grammar and languages, not to be taught by those tedious precepts ordinarily used, but by use, example, conversation, as travellers learn abroad, and nurses teach their children. As I will have all such places, so will I ordain public governors, fit officers to each place, treasurers, ediles, quaestors, overseers of pupils, widows' goods, and all public houses, etc., and those once a year to make strict accounts of all receipts, expenses, to avoid confusion. Et sic fiet ut non absumant, as pliny to Trajan, quod pudiat dicere. They shall be subordinate to those higher officers and governors of each city, which shall not be poor tradesmen, and mean artificers, but noblemen and gentlemen, which shall be tied to residence in those towns they dwell next, at such set times and seasons. For I see no reason, which Hippolytus complains of, that it should be more dishonourable for noblemen to govern the city than the country, or unseemly to dwell there now, than of old. I will have no bogs, fens, marshes, vast woods, deserts, heaths, commons, but all enclosed, yet not depopulated, and therefore take heed, you mistake me not, for that which is common, and every man's, is no man's. The richest countries are still enclosed, as Essex, Kent, with us, etc., Spain, Italy, and where enclosures are least in quantity, they are best husbanded, as about Florence in Italy, Damascus in Syria, etc., which are liker gardens than fields. I will not have a barren acre in all my territories, not so much as the tops of mountains, where nature fails it shall be supplied by art, lakes and rivers shall not be left desolate, all common highways, bridges, banks, corrivations of waters, aqueducts, channels, public works, buildings, etc., out of a common stock, 
curiously maintained and kept in repair, no depopulations, engrossings, alterations of wood, arable, but by the consent of some supervisors that shall be appointed for that purpose, to see what reformation ought to be had in all places, what is amiss, how to help it, et quid quaeque ferat regio, et quid quaeque recuset, what ground is aptest for wood, what for corn, what for cattle, gardens, orchards, fish-ponds, etc., with a charitable division in every village, not one domineering house, greedily to swallow up all, which is too common with us. What for lords, what for tenants, and because they shall be better encouraged to improve such lands they hold, manure, plant trees, drain, fence, etc., they shall have long leases, a known rent, and known fine to free them from those intolerable exactions of tyrannising landlords. These supervisors shall likewise appoint what quantity of land in each manner is fit for the Lord's demeans, what for holding of tenants, how it ought to be husbanded, ut magnetis equis minii gens cognita remis, how to be manured, tilled, rectified, hic segetes veniunt, illic felicius uvae, arborei foitus alibi, atque inusa virescunt gramina and what proportion is fit for all callings? Because private professors are many times idiots, ill husbands, oppressors, covetous, and know not how to improve their own, or else respect their own, and not public good. Utopian parity is a kind of government to be wished for rather than effected. Res publica Christiano Politana, Campanella's City of the Sun, and that New Atlantis witty fictions, but mere chimeras, and Plato's community in many things is impious, absurd, and ridiculous. It takes away all splendour and magnificence. I will have several orders, degrees of nobility, and those hereditary, not rejecting younger brothers in the meantime, for they shall be sufficiently provided for by pensions, or so qualified, brought up in some honest calling, they shall be able to live of themselves. I will have such a proportion of ground belonging to every barony. He that buys the land shall buy the barony. He that by riot consumes his patrimony and ancient demeans shall forfeit his honours. As some dignities shall be hereditary, so some again by election or by gift. Besides free officers, pensions, annuities, like our bishoprics, brevens, the bassa's palaces in Turkey, the procurator's houses and offices in Venice, which, like the golden apple, shall be given to the worthiest and best deserving, both in war and peace, as a reward of their worth and good service, as so many goals for all to aim at, honos alit artes, and encouragements to others. For I hate these severe, unnatural, harsh, German, French, and Venetian decrees, which exclude plebeians from honours, be they never so wise, rich, virtuous, valiant, and well qualified, they must not be patricians, but keep their own rank. This is naturae bellum in fere, odious to God and men, I abhor it. My form of government shall be monarchical. Nunquam libertas gratio extat, quam sub rege pio, etc. Few laws, but those severely kept, plainly put down, and in the mother tongue, that every man may understand. Every city shall have a peculiar trade or privilege, by which it shall be chiefly maintained, and parents shall teach their children one of three at least, bring up and instruct them in the mysteries of their own trade. In each town these several tradesmen shall be so aptly disposed, as they shall free the rest from danger or offence. Fire trades, as smiths, forge men, brewers, bakers, metal men, etc., shall dwell apart by themselves. Dyers, tanners, fellmongers, and such as use water, in convenient places by themselves. Noisome or fulsome for bad smells, as butchers, slaughterhouses, chandlers, curriers, in remote places, and some back lanes. Fraternities and companies I approve of, as merchants, bourses, colleges of druggists, physicians, musicians, etc., 
but all trades to be rated in the sale of wares, as our clerks of the market do bakers and brewers. Corn itself, what scarcity soever shall come, not to extend such a price. Of such wares as are transported or brought in, if they be necessary, commodious, and such as nearly concern man's life, as corn, wood, coal, etc., and such provision we cannot want, I will have little or no custom paid, no taxes, but for such things as are for pleasure, delight, or ornament, as wine, spice, tobacco, silk, velvet, cloth of gold, lace, jewels, etc., a greater impost. I will have certain ships sent out for new discoveries every year, and some discreet men appointed to travel into all neighbouring kingdoms by land, which shall observe what artificial inventions and good laws are in other countries, customs, alterations, or alt else, concerning war or peace, which may tend to the common good. Ecclesiastical discipline, penes episcopos, subordinate as the other. No impropriations, no lay patrons of church livings, or one private man, but common societies, corporations, etc., and those rectors of benefices, to be chosen out of the universities, examined and approved, as the literati in China. No parish to contain above a thousand auditors. If it were possible, I would have such priest as should imitate Christ, Charitable lawyers should love their neighbours as themselves, temperate and modest physicians, politicians contemn the world, philosophers should know themselves, noblemen live honestly, tradesmen leave lying and cousining, magistrates corruption, etc. But this is impossible. I must get such as I may. I will therefore have of lawyers, judges, advocates, physicians, chirurgeons, etc., a set number, and every man, if it be possible, to plead his own cause, to tell that tale to the judge which he doth to his advocate, as at Fez in Africa, Bantam, Aleppo, Ragusa, suam quisque causam dicere tenetur. Those advocates, chirurgeons, and physicians, which are allowed to be maintained out of the common treasury, no fees to be given or taken upon pain of losing their places, or, if they do, very small fees, and when the cause is fully ended. He that sues any man shall put in a pledge, which, if it be proved he hath wrongfully sued his adversary, rashly or maliciously, he shall forfeit and lose. Or else, before any suit begin, the plaintiff shall have his complaint approved by a set delegacy to that purpose. If it be of moment, he shall be suffered as before to proceed. If otherwise, they shall determine it. All causes shall be pleaded suppresso nomine, the parties' names concealed, if some circumstances do not otherwise require. Judges and other officers shall be aptly disposed in each province, villages, cities, as common arbitrators, to hear causes, and end all controversies, and those not single, but three at least, on the bench at once, to determine or give sentence, and those again to sit by turns or lots, and not to continue still in the same office. No controversy to depend above a year, but without all delays and further appeals to be speedily dispatched, and finally concluded in that time allotted. These and all other inferior magistrates to be chosen as the literati in China, or by those exact suffrages of the Venetians, and such again not to be eligible, or capable of magistracies, honours, offices, except they be sufficiently qualified for learning, manners, and that by the strict approbation of deputed examiners. First scholars to take place, then soldiers, for I am of Vicatius's opinion, a scholar deserves better than a soldier, because unius aetatis sunt quae fortiter fiunt, quae vero pro utilitate rei publicae scribuntur, aeterna. A soldier's work lasts for an age, a scholar's for ever. 
If they misbehave themselves, they shall be deposed, and accordingly punished, and whether their offices be annual or otherwise, once a year they shall be called in question, and give an account. For men are partial and passionate, merciless, covetous, corrupt, subject to love, hate, fear, favour, etc., omne sub regno graviore regnum, like Solon's Areopagites, or those Roman censors, some shall visit others, and be visited en weekem themselves. They shall oversee that no prowling officer, under colour of authority, shall insult over his inferiors, as so many wild beasts, oppress, domineer, flee, grind, or trample on, be partial or corrupt, but that there be aequabile use, justice equally done, live as friends and brethren together, and which Cecilius would have, and so much desires in his kingdom of France, a diapason and sweet harmony of kings, princes, nobles, and plebeians, so mutually tied and involved in love, as well as laws and authority, that they never disagree, insult or encroach one upon another. If any man deserve well in his office, he shall be rewarded. Quis enim virtutem amplectitur ipsam, primia si tolas. He that invents anything for public good in any art or science, writes a treatise, or informs any noble exploit, at home or abroad, shall be accordingly enriched, honoured, and preferred. I say with Hannibal in Ennius, Hostem qui feriet erit mihi Carthaginensis. Let him be of what condition he will, in all offices, actions. He that deserves best shall have best. End of section 13Section 14 of The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1, by Robert Burton. Section 14 Democritus, Junior, to the Reader, Part 12 Tilianus in Philonius, out of a charitable mind, no doubt, wished all his books were gold and silver, jewels and precious stones, to redeem captives, set free prisoners, and relieve all poor distressed souls that wanted means. Religiously done I deny not, but to what purpose? Suppose this were so well done, within a little after, though a man had Croesus's wealth to bestow, there would be as many more. Wherefore I will suffer no beggars, rogues, vagabonds, or idle persons at all, that cannot give an account of their lives, how they maintain themselves. If they be impotent, lame, blind, and single, they shall be sufficiently maintained in several hospitals, built for that purpose. If married and infirm, past work, or by inevitable loss, or some such like misfortune cast behind, by distribution of corn, house rent free, annual pensions or money, they shall be relieved, and highly rewarded for their good service they have formerly done. If able, they shall be enforced to work. For I see no reason, as he said, why an epicure, or idle drone, a rich glutton, a usurer, should live at ease, and do nothing, live in honour, in all manner of pleasures, and oppress others, when, as in the meantime, a poor labourer, a smith, a carpenter, an husbandman, that hath spent his time in continual labour, as an ass to carry burdens, to do the commonwealth good, and without whom we cannot live, shall be left in his old age to beg or starve, and lead a miserable life, worse than a jument. As all conditions shall be tied to their task, so none shall be overtired, but have their set times of recreations and holidays, indulgere genio, feasts and merry meetings, even to the meanest artificer or basest servant, once a week to sing or dance, though not all at once. 
or do whatsoever he shall please. Like that Saccarum Festum amongst the Persians, those Saturnals in Rome, as well as his master. If any be drunk, he shall drink no more wine or strong drink in a twelve-month after. A bankrupt shall be catademiatus in amphitheatro, publicly shamed, and he that cannot pay his debts, if by riot or negligence he may have been impoverished, shall be for a twelve-month imprisoned. If in that space his creditors be not satisfied, he shall be hanged. He that commits sacrilege shall lose his hands. He that bears false witness, or is of perjury convicted, shall have his tongue cut out, except he redeem it with his head. Murder, adultery, shall be punished by death, but not theft except it be some more grievous offence, or notorious offenders. Otherwise they shall be condemned to the galleys, mines, be his slaves whom they have offended during their lives. I hate all hereditary slaves, and that duram persarum legem, as Brissonius calls it, or as Ammianus, impendio formidatas et abominandas leges, per quas ob noxam unius, Omnis propinquitas perit, hard life that wife and children, friends and allies, should suffer for the father's offence. No man shall marry until he be twenty-five, no woman till she be twenty. Missi alitur dispensatum fuerit. If one die, the other party shall not marry till six months after, and because many families are compelled to live niggardly, exhaust and undone by great dowers, none shall be given at all, or very little, and that by supervisors rated. They that are foul shall have a greater portion. If fair, none at all, or very little. Howsoever, not to exceed such a rate as those supervisors shall think fit. And when once they come to those years, poverty shall hinder no man from marriage, or any other respect, but all shall be rather enforced than hindered except they be dismembered, or grievously deformed, infirm, or visited with some enormous hereditary disease, in body or mind. In such cases, upon a great pain, or mulked, man or woman shall not marry. Other order shall be taken from them to their content. If people overabound, they shall be eased by colonies. No man shall wear weapons in any city. The same attire shall be kept, and that proper to several callings, by which they shall be distinguished. Luxus funerum shall be taken away, that intempestive expense moderated, and many others. Brokers, takers of pawns, biting usurers, I will not admit. Yet because, hic cum hominibus, non cum dii sagitur, we converse here with men, not with gods, and for the hardness of men's hearts, I will tolerate some kind of usury. If we were honest, I confess, si probi essemus, we should have no use of it, but being as it is, we must necessarily admit it. Howsoever, most divines contradict it. Dicimus in ficias, sed vox ea sola reperta est. It must be winked at by politicians. And yet some great doctors approve of it. Calvin, Bucer, Zancius, Petrus Marta, because by so many grand lawyers, decrees of emperors, princes' statutes, customs of commonwealths, churches' approbations, it is permitted, etc., I will therefore allow it, but to no private persons, nor to every man that will, to orphans only, maids, widows, or such as by reason of their age, sex, education, ignorance of trading, know not otherwise how to employ it and those so approved, not to let it out apart, but to bring their money to a common bank, which shall be allowed in every city, as in Genoa, Geneva, Nuremberg, Venice, at five, six, seven, not above eight per centum, as the supervisors, or irarii praefecti, shall think fit. And as it shall not be lawful for each man to be an usurer that will, so shall it not be lawful for all to take up money at use, not to prodigals and spendthrifts, but to merchants, young tradesmen, such as stand in need, or know honestly how to employ it, whose necessity, cause, and condition the said supervisors shall approve of. 
I will have no private monopolies to enrich one man and beggar a multitude, multiplicity of offices, of supplying by deputies, weights and measures the same throughout, and those rectified by the primum mobile and son's motion, three score miles to a degree according to observation, one thousand geometrical paces to a mile, five foot to a pace, twelve inches to a foot, etc., and from measures known, it is an easy matter to rectify weights, etc., to cast up all, and resolve bodies by algebra, stereometry. I hate wars if they be not ad populi salutem, upon urgent occasion, odimus accipitrim, quia semper vivit in armis. Offensive wars, except the cause be very just, I will not allow of. For I do highly magnify that saying of Hannibal to Scipio in Livy. It had been a blessed thing for you and us, if God had given that mind to our predecessors, that you had been content with Italy, we with Africa. For neither Sicily nor Sardinia are worth such costs and pains, so many fleets and armies, or so many famous captains' lives. Omnia prius tentanda. Fair means shall first be tried. Peragit tranquilla potestas, quod violenta nequit. I will have them proceed with all moderation. But hear you, Fabius, my general, not minutius, nam qui concilio nititur, plus hostibus nocet, quam qui sine animi ratione viribus. And in such wars to abstain as much as is possible from depopulations, burning of towns, massacring of infants, etc. For defensive wars I shall have forces still ready at a small warning, by land and sea, a prepared navy, soldiers in procinctu et quam bonfinius apud hungaro suos vult, virgam feriam, and money which is nerves belli, still in a readiness, and a sufficient revenue, a third part as in old Rome and Egypt, reserved for the commonwealth to avoid those heavy taxes and impositions, as well to defray this charge of wars, as also all other public defalcations, expenses, fees, pensions, reparations, chaste sports, feasts, donaries, rewards, and entertainments. All things in this nature especially I will have maturely done, and with great deliberation. Ne quid temere, ne quid remisse ac timide fiat, said quo feror hospes to prosecute the rest would require a volume manum de tabella i have been over tedious in this subject i could here have willingly ranged but these straits wherein i am included will not permit from commonwealths and cities i will descend to families which have as many corsives and molestations as frequent discontents as the rest Great affinity there is betwixt a political and economical body. They differ only in magnitude and proportion of business. So Scaliger writes, as they have both likely the same period, as Bodin and Pusa hold, out of Plato, six or seven hundred years. So many times they have the same means of their vexation and overthrows, as namely riot, a common ruin of both, riot in building, riot in profuse spending, riot in apparel, etc., be it in what kind soever, it produceth the same effects. A chorographer of ours, speaking obiter of ancient families, why they are so frequent in the north, continue so long, are so soon extinguished in the south, and so few, gives no other reason but this, luxus omnia dissipavit, riot hath consumed all. Fine clothes and curious buildings came into this island, as he notes in his annals, not so many years since, non sine dispendio hospitalitatis, to the decay of hospitality. Howbeit many times that word is mistaken, and under the name of bounty and hospitality is shrouded riot and prodigality, and that which is commendable in itself well used, hath been mistaken heretofore, is become by his abuse the bane and utter ruin of many a noble family. For some men live like the rich glutton, consuming themselves and their substance by continual feasting and invitations, with Axilon in Homer, 
keep open house for all comers, giving entertainment to such as visit them, keeping a table beyond their means, and a company of idle servants, though not so frequent as of old, are blown up on a sudden, and, as Actaeon was by his hounds, devoured by their kinsmen, friends, and a multitude of followers. It is a wonder that Paulus Jovius relates of our northern countries what an infinite deal of meat we consume on our tables. That, I may truly say, tis not bounty, not hospitality, as it is often abused, but riot and excess, gluttony and prodigality, a mere vice. It brings in debt, want and beggary, hereditary diseases, consumes their fortunes and overthrows the good temperature of their bodies. To this I might here well add their inordinate expense in building, those fantastical houses, turrets, walks, parks, etc., gaming, excess of pleasure, and that prodigious riot in apparel, by which means they are compelled to break up house and creep into holes. Cecilius, in his Commonwealth of France, gives three reasons why the French nobility were so frequently bankrupts. First, because they had so many lawsuits and contentions one upon another, which were tedious and costly, by which means it came to pass that commonly lawyers bought them out of their possessions. A second cause was their riot. They lived beyond their means, and were therefore swallowed up by merchants. La Nove, a French writer, yields five reasons of his countrymen's poverty to the same effect almost, and thinks verily if the gentry of France were divided into ten parts, eight of them would be found much impaired by sales, mortgages, and debts, or wholly sunk in their estates. The last was immoderate excess in apparel, which consumed their revenues. How this concerns and agrees with our present state, look you, but of this elsewhere. As it is in a man's body, if either head, heart, stomach, liver, spleen, or any one part be misaffected, all the rest suffer with it. So is it with this economical body. If the head be naught, a spendthrift, a drunkard, a whore-master, a gamester, how shall the family live at ease? Ipsa si cupiat salus servare, prosus non potest hanc familiam as Demea said in the comedy, safety herself cannot save it. A good, honest, painful man many times hath a shrew to his wife, a sickly, dishonest, slothful, foolish, careless woman to his mate, a proud, peevish flirt, a liquorish, prodigal queen, and by that means all goes to ruin. Or, if they differ in nature, he is thrifty, she spends all, he wise, she sottish and soft. What agreement can there be? What friendship? Like that of the thrush and swallow in Aesop. Instead of mutual love, kind compilations, whore and thief is heard. They fling stools at one another's heads. Quae intemperies vexat hanc familiam. All enforced marriages commonly produce such effects or if on their behalves it be well, as to live and agree lovingly together, they may have disobedient and unruly children, that take ill courses to disquiet them. Their son is a thief, a spendthrift, their daughter a whore, a stepmother or a daughter-in-law distempers all, or else for want of means many torturers arise, debts, dues, fees, dowries, jointures, legacies to be paid, annuities issuing out, by means of which they have not wherewithal to maintain themselves in that pomp as their predecessors have done, bring up or bestow their children to their callings, to their birth and quality, and will not descend to their present fortunes. Oftentimes, too, to aggravate the rest, concur many other inconveniences, unthankful friends, decayed friends, bad neighbours, negligent servants, servi furaces, versipeles, calidi, occlusa sibi mille clavibus reserant, furtimque, raptant, consumunt, liguriunt, casualties, taxes, mulcts, chargeable offices, vain expenses, entertainments, loss of stock, enmities, emulations, 
frequent invitations, losses, suretyship, sickness, death of friends, and that which is the gulf of all, improvidence, ill-husbandry, disorder and confusion, by which means they are drenched on a sudden in their estates, and at unawares precipitated insensibly into an inextricable labyrinth of debts, cares, woes, want, grief, discontent, and melancholy itself. I have done with families, and will now briefly run over some few sorts and conditions of men. The most secure, happy, jovial, and merry in the world's esteem are princes and great men, free from melancholy, but for their cares, miseries, suspicions, jealousies, discontents, folly, and madness. I refer you to Xenophon's Tyrannus, where King Hieron discourseth at large with Simonides the poet of this subject. Of all others they are most troubled with perpetual fears, anxieties, insomuch that, as he said in Valerius, if thou knewest with what cares and miseries this robe were stuffed, thou wouldst not stoop to take it up. Or, put case, they be secure and free from fears and discontents, yet they are void of reason too oft, and precipitate in their actions. Read all our histories, quos de stultis prodidere stulti, aeneides annales, and what is the subject? Stultorum regum et populorum continet aestus, the giddy tumults and the foolish rage of kings and people. How mad they are, how furious, and upon small occasions, rash and inconsiderate in their proceedings, how they dote, every page almost will witness. Delirant reges plectuntur aciwi, when doting monarchs urge, unsound resolves, their subjects feel the scourge. Next in place, next in miseries and discontents, in all manner of hair-brain actions, are great men. Procul a Iowe, procul a fulmine, the nearer the worse. If they live in court, they are up and down, ebb and flow with their prince's favours. Ingenium vultu statque caditque suo. Now aloft, tomorrow down, as Polybius describes them, like so many casting counters, now of gold, tomorrow of silver, that vary in worth as the competent will. Now they stand for units, tomorrow for thousands, now before all, and anon behind. Beside, they torment one another with mutual factions, emulations. One is ambitious, another enamoured, a third in debt, a prodigal, overruns his fortunes, a fourth solicitous with cares, gets nothing, etc. But for these men's discontents, anxieties, I refer you to Lucian's tract, De Mercede Conductis, Aeneas Silvius, Libidinis et Stultitiae Servos, he calls them, Agrippa, and many others. Of philosophers and scholars, Priscae Sapientiae Dictatores, I have already spoken in general terms, those superintendents of wit and learning, men above men, those refined men, minions of the muses, mentemque habere quaes bonam, et esse corculis datumst. These acute and subtle sophisters, so much honoured, have as much need of hellebore as others. O medici mediam pertundite venam! Read Lucian's Piscator, and tell how he esteemed them. Agrippa's tract of the vanity of sciences, nay, read their own works, their absurd tenets, prodigious paradoxes, et risum teniatis amici, you shall find that of Aristotle true, nullum magnum ingenium sine mixtura dementiae, they have a worm as well as others. You shall find a fantastical strain, a fustian, a bombast, a vainglorious humour, an affected style, etc., like a prominent thread in an uneven woven cloth, run parallel throughout their works. And they that teach wisdom, patience, meekness, are the veriest dizzards, harebrains, and most discontent. In the multitude of wisdom is grief, and he that increaseth wisdom increaseth sorrow. I need not quote mine author. 
They that laugh and contemn others, condemn the world of folly, deserve to be mocked, are as giddy-headed, and lie as open as any other. Democritus, that common flouter of folly, was ridiculous himself, barking Menippus, scoffing Lucian, satirical Lucilius, Petronius, Varro, Perseus, etc., may be censured with the rest. Loripedem rectus de rideat, aetiopem albus. Bale, Erasmus, Hospinian, Vives, Chemnisius, explode as a vast ocean of obs and souls. School divinity, a labyrinth of intricable questions, unprofitable contentions, incredibilem delirationem, one calls it. If school divinity be so censured, subtilis scotus lima veritatis, occam irrefragabilis, cuius ingenium vetera omnia ingenia subvertit, etc. Baconthrope, Dr. Resolutus, and Corculum Theologiae, Thomas himself, Dr. Seraphicus, qui dictavit angulus, etc. What shall become of humanity? Ask Stulta, what can she plead? What can her followers say for themselves? Much learning, cere diminuit brum, hath cracked their sconce, and taken such root, that tribus antiquiris caput insanabile, hellebore itself can do no good nor that renowned lantern of Epictetus, by which, if any man studied, he should be as wise as he was. But all will not serve. Rhetoricians in ostentationem loquacitatis multa agitant, out of their volubility of tongue, will talk much to no purpose. Orators can persuade other men what they will, quo volunt unde volunt, move, pacify, etc., but cannot settle their own brains. What saith Tully? Malo indisertam prudentiam, quam loquacem stultitiam. And as Seneca seconds him, a wise man's oration should not be polite or solicitous. Fabius esteems no better of most of them, either in speech, action, gesture, than as men beside themselves. Insanos declamatores, so doth Gregory, Non mihi sapit, qui sermone, sed qui factis sapit. Make the best of him, a good orator is a turncoat, an evil man. Bonus orator pessimus vir. His tongue is set to sail, he is a mere voice, as he said of a nightingale, dat sine mente sonum, an hyperbolical liar, a flatterer, a parasite, and, as Ammianus Marcellinus will, a corrupting cousiner, one that doth more mischief by his fair speeches than he that bribes by money. For a man may with more facility avoid him that circumvents by money than him that deceives with glozing terms, which made Socrates so much a bore and explode them. Fracastorius, a famous poet, freely grants all poets to be mad. So doth Scaliger. And who doth not? Out insanit homo, out versus facit. He's mad or making verses. Horis, saturae septem liber duo. Insanire lubet, versus componere. Virgil, third eclogue. So Servius interprets it. All poets are mad, a company of bitter satirists, detractors, or else parasitical applauders. And what is poetry itself, but, as Austin holds, Vinum erroris ab ebriis doctoribus propinatum? You may give that censure of them in general, which Sir Thomas More once did of Germanus Brixis's poems in particular. Vehuntur in rate stultitiae silvam habitant furiae. Budius, in an epistle of his to Lupsatus, will have civil law to be the tower of wisdom. Another honours physic, the quintessence of nature, a third tumbles them both down, and sets up the flag of his own peculiar science. Your supercilious critics, grammatical triflers, note-makers, curious antiquaries, find out all the ruins of wit, ineptiarum delicias, amongst the rubbish of old writers. Prostultis habent nisi aliquid sofficiant invenire, quod in aliorum scriptis vertant vitio. All fools with them that cannot find fault. 
they correct others and are hot in a cold cause puzzle themselves to find out how many streets in rome houses gates towers homer's country aeneas's mother niobe's daughters and sappho publica fuerit ovum prius extiterit angalina etc et alia quae de discenda essent scire si scires as seneca holds what clothes the senators did wear in rome what shoes how they sat where they went to the close stool how many dishes in a mess what sauce what for the present for an historian to relate according to lodovicus vives is very ridiculous is to them most precious elaborate stuff they admired for it and as proud as triumphant in the meantime for this discovery as if they had won a city or conquered a province as rich as if they had found a mine of gold ore quos vis auctores absurdis commentis suis percacant et stercorant one saith they bewray and daub a company of books and good authors with their absurd comments correctorum sterquilinea scaliger calls them and show their wit in censuring others a company of foolish note-makers humble bees daws or beetles inter stercora ut plurimum versantur they rake over all those rubbish and dunghills and prefer a manuscript many times before the gospel itself tesaurum criticum before any treasure and with their deliators alii legunt sic meus codex sic habet with their postremae editiones annotations castigations etc make books dear themselves ridiculous and do nobody good yet if any man dare oppose or contradict they are mad up in arms on a sudden how many sheets are written in defence how many bitter invectives what apologies epiphilides hae sunt ut merae nugae but i dare say no more of for with or against them because i am liable to their lash as well as others of these and the rest of our artists and philosophers i will generally conclude they are a kind of madmen as seneca esteems of them to make doubts and scruples how to read them truly to mend old authors but will not mend their own lives or teach us ingenia sanare memoriam officiorum ingerere ac fidem in rebus humanis retinere to keep our wits in order or rectify our manners num quid tibi demens vitator si istis operam impenderit is not he mad that draws lines with archimedes whilst his house is ransacked and his city besieged when the whole world is in combustion or we whilst our souls are in danger more sequitur vita fugit to spend our time in toys idle questions and things of no worth End of section fourteen Section fifteen of the Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume One, by Robert Burton. Section fifteen. Democritus, Jr., to the reader, Part thirteen. That lovers are mad, I think no man will deny. Amare simul et sapere, ipsi jovi non dator. Jupiter himself cannot intend both at once. Non bene conveniunt, nec in una sede morantor, majestas et amor. Tully, when he was invited to a second marriage, replied, he could not simul amare et sapere, be wise and love both together. Et orcus ille, vis est immedicabilis, est rabies insana love is madness a hell an incurable disease in potentem et insanem libidinem seneca calls it an impotent and raging lust i shall dilate this subject apart in the meantime let lovers sigh out the rest nevisanus the lawyer holds it for an axiom most women are fools consilium foeminis invalidum seneca 
men, be they young or old, who doubts it. Youth is mad, as Elias in Tully, stulti adolescentuli, old age little better, deleri senes, etc. Theophrastes, in the hundred and seventh year of his age, said he then began to be wise, turn sapere coepit, and therefore lamented his departure. If wisdom come so late, where shall we find a wise man? Our old ones dote at three score and ten. I would cite more proofs, and a better author, but for the present let one fool point at another. Nevisanus hath as hard an opinion of rich men. Wealth and wisdom cannot dwell together. Stultitiam patientur opes. And they do not commonly in fatuare co hominis, besot men. And as we see it, fools have fortune. Sapientia non invenitur in terra suaviter viventium. For besides a natural contempt of learning, which accompanies such kind of men, innate idleness, for they will take no pains, and, which Aristotle observes, ubi mens plurima, ibi minima fortuna, ubi plurima fortuna, ibi mens perexigua. Great wealth and little wit go commonly together. They have as much brains, some of them in their heads, as in their heels, besides this inbred neglect of liberal sciences and all arts, which should excolere mentum, polish the mind, they have most part some gullish humour or other by which they are led. One is an epicure, an atheist, a second a gamester, a third a whore-master. Fit subjects, all for a satirist to work upon. Hic nuptarum insanit amoribus, hic puerorum. One burns to madness for the wedded dame, and natural lusts another's heart in flame. One is mad of hawking, hunting, cocking, another of carousing, horse-riding, spending, a fourth of building, fighting, etc. In sanit vetere statuas, Damasippus emendo. Damasippus hath a humour of his own, to be talked of. Heliodorus the Carthaginian another. In a word, as Scaliger concludes over them all, they are statuae erectae stultitiae, the very statues or pillars of folly. Choose out of all stories him hath been most admired, you shall still find multa ad laudum, multa ad vituperationem magnifica, as Perosus of Semiramis, omnes mortales militia triumphis, divitiis, etc. Turn et luxo, caide, caeterisque, vitiis antecesit. As she had some good, so had she many bad parts. Alexander, a worthy man, but furious in his anger, overtaken in drink. Caesar and Scipio valiant and wise, but vainglorious, ambitious. Vespasian a worthy prince, but covetous. Hannibal, as he had mighty virtues, so had he many vices. Unam virtutem mille vitia comitantur, as Machiavel of Cosmo de' Medici. He had two distinct persons in him. I will determine of them all. They are like these double or turning pictures, stand before which you see a fair maid, on the one side an ape on the other an owl. Look upon them at the first sight, all is well. But farther examine, you shall find them wise on the one side, and fools on the other. In some few things praiseworthy, in the rest incomparably faulty. I will say nothing of their diseases, emulations, discontents, wants, and such miseries. Let poverty plead the rest in Aristophanes' Plutus. Covetous men, amongst others, are most mad. They have all the symptoms of melancholy, fear, sadness, suspicion, etc., as shall be proved in its proper place. Danda est hellebori multo pars maxima avaris. Misers make Antichira their own, its hellball reserved for them alone. And yet, methinks prodigals are much madder than they, be of what condition they will, they bear a public or private purse, as a Dutch writer censured Richard, the rich Duke of Cornwall, suing to be emperor for his profuse spending. Qui effudit pecuniam, ante pedes principium et lectorum sicut aquam. That scattered money like water, I do censor them. Stulta Anglia, saith he, quae, tot denariis sponte est privita, stultae principes alemaniae, qui nobile jus suum pro pecunia vendiderunt. Spendthrifts, bribers, and bribe-takers are fools, and so are all they that cannot keep, disperse, or spend their monies well. I might say the like of angry, peevish, envious, ambitious. Antichirus melior sorbere meracus. 
epicures, atheists, schismatics, heretics, hic omnis habent imagiationem lysum, saith Nimanus, and their madness shall be evident. Fabatus, an Italian, holds seafaring men all mad. The ship is mad, for it never stands still. The mariners are mad, to expose themselves to such imminent dangers. The waters are raging mad, in perpetual motion. The winds are as mad as the rest. They know not whence they come, whither they would go, and most men are maddest of all that go to sea. For one fool at home they find forty abroad. He was a madman that said it, and thou peradventure as mad to read it. Felix Platerus is of opinion all alchemists are mad, out of their wits. Athenius saith as much of figures, et musarum luscinius, musicians, omnes tibicines insaniunt, ubi semel efflant, avolat illico mens, in comes music at one ear, out goes wit at another. Proud and vainglorious persons are certainly mad, and so are lascivious. I can feel their pulses beat hither, horn mad some of them, to let others lie with their wives, and wink at it. To insist in all particulars were an Herculean task. To reckon up insanus substructiones, insanus labores, insanum luxum, mad labours, mad books, endeavours, carriages, gross ignorance, ridiculous actions, absurd gestures. Insanum gulam, insanium vilarum, insana jurgia, as Tully terms them. Madness of villages, stupend structures, as those Egyptian pyramids, labyrinths and sphinxes, with a company of crowned asses, ad ostentationem opum, vainly built, when neither the architect nor king that made them, or to what use and purpose are yet known, to insist in their hypocrisy, inconstancy, blindness, rashness, dementum temeritatum, fraud, cozenage, malice, anger, impudence, ingratitude, ambition, gross superstition, tempora infecta et adulatione sordida, as in Tiberius times, such base flattery, stupend, parasitical fawning and colloguing, etc., brawls, conflicts, desires, contentions. It would ask an expert Vesalius to anatomize every member. Shall I say, Jupiter himself, Apollo, Mars, etc., doted, and monster-conquering Hercules, that subdued the world and helped others, could not relieve himself in this, but mad he was at last. And where shall a man walk, converse with whom, in what province, city, and not meet with Signor Delirio, or Hercules Furens, Maenads and Corybantes? Their speeches say no less, a fungus nati homines, or else they fetch their pedigree from those that were struck by Samson with the jawbone of an ass, or from Deucalion and Pyrrhus stones, for Durum genus sumus, marmore sumus, we are stony-hearted, and savour too much of the stock, as if they had all heard that enchanted horn of Astolfo, that English duke in Ariosto, who never sounded but all his auditors were mad, and for fear ready to make away with themselves, or landed in the mad haven in the Euxine Sea of Daphnis Insana, which had a secret quality to dementate. They are company of giddy heads, afternoon men. It is midsummer moon still, and the dog days last all the year long. They are all mad. Whom then shall I accept? Ulricus Hutanus Nemo, nam Nemo omnibus horis sapit, Nemo nascitus sine vitiis, crimine Nemo caret, Nemo sorte sua vivit contentus, Nemo in amore sapit, Nemo bonus, Nemo sapiens, Nemo, est ex omni parti beatus, etc. And therefore, Nicholas Nemo or Monsieur Nobody shall go free. Quid valiat Nemo, Nemo refere potest, but whom shall I accept in the second place? Such as are silent, vir sapit, qui parca loquitur. No better way to avoid folly and madness than by taciturnity. Whom in a third? All senators, magistrates, for all fortunate men are wise, and conquerors valiant, and so are all great men. Non est bunum ludere cum diis. They are wise by authority, good by their office and place. His licit impune pessimus esse, some say. We must not speak of them, neither is it fit. Per me sint omnia proteus alba. I will not think amiss of them. Whom next? Stoics? Sapiens Stoicus. And he alone is subject to no perturbations, as Plutarch scoffs at him. He is not vexed with torments, or burnt with fire, foiled by his adversary, sold of his enemy, though he be wrinkled, sand-blind, toothless, and deformed. Yet he is most beautiful, 
and like a god, a king in conceit, though not worth a groat. He never dotes, never mad, never sad, drunk, because virtue cannot be taken away, as Zeno holds, by reason of strong apprehension. But he was mad to say so. Anticairai Cairo huix est opus ot dolabra. He had need to be bored, and so had all his fellows, as wise as they would seem to be. Chrysippus himself liberally grants them to be fools as well as others. At certain times, upon some occasions, amati virtutem aet per ebrietatem, aut atribilarium morbum. It may be lost by drunkenness or melancholy. He may be sometimes crazed as well as the rest. Ad summum sapiens nisi cum pituita molesta. I should here accept some cynics, Menippus, Diogenes, that Theban Crates, or, to descend to these times, that omniscious, only wise fraternity of the Rosicrucians, those great theologues, politicians, philosophers, physicians, philologers, artists, etc., of whom St. Bridget, Albus Joachimus, Lycanbergius, and such divine spirits have prophesied, and made promise to the world, if at least there be any such. Henricus Neuhusius makes a doubt of it. Valentinus Andreas and others, or an Elias Artifex, their Theophrastian master, whom, though Libavius and many deride in Carpat, yet some will have to be the renewer of all arts and sciences, reformer of the world, and now living. For so Johannes Montanus Strigoniensis, that great patron of Paracelsus, contends, and certainly avers a most divine man, and the quintessence of wisdom wheresoever he is. For he, his fraternity, friends, etc., are all betrothed to wisdom, if we may believe their disciples and followers. I must needs accept Lipsius and the Pope, and expunge their name out of the catalogue of fools. For besides that parasitical testimony of Darsa, A sole ex oriente meotidus usque paludes, nemo est qui justo se equipirare queat. Lipsius saith of himself, that he was humani generis quidum pedagogus, voce et stilo, a grand signor, a master, a tutor of us all, and for thirteen years he brags how he sold wisdom in the low countries, as Ammonius the philosopher sometimes did in Alexandria, cum humanitate literus et sapientiam cum prudentia, antistes sapientiae, he shall be sapientim octavus. The Pope is more than a man, as his parrots often make him, a demigod, and besides, his holiness cannot err, in cathedra belike, and yet some of them have been magicians, heretics, atheists, children, and as Platina saith of John 22, et si vir literatus, multa stoliditatum et levitatum praese ferentia egit, stolidi et succordis vir ingenii, a scholar sufficient, yet many things he did foolishly, lightly, I can say no more than in particular but in general terms to the rest. They are all mad, their wits are evaporated, and, as Ariosto feigns, Liber 34, kept in jars above the moon. Some lose their wits with love, some with ambition, some following lords and men of high condition, some in fair jewels rich and costly set, others in poetry their wits forget. Another thinks to be an alchemist, till all be spent, and that his numbers missed. Convicted fools they are, madmen upon record, and I am afraid past cure many of them. Crepant inguina, the symptoms are manifest. They are all of Gotham parish. Cum furo how dubious, cum sit manifesta frenesis. Since madness is indisputable, since frenzy is obvious. What remains then but to send for Lorarius? those officers to carry them all together for company to Bedlam, and set Rabelais to be their physician. If any man shall ask in the meantime, who I am that so boldly censure others, tu nullane habas vitia? Have I no faults? Yes, more than thou hast, whosoever thou art. Nos numerus sumus. I confess it again. I am as foolish, as mad as any one. Insanus vobis video. Non deprecor ipse, quo minus insanus. I do not deny it. Demens de populo demato. My comfort is, I have more fellows, and those of excellent note. And though I be not so right or so discreet as I should be, yet not so mad, so bad neither, as thou perhaps takest me to be. 
To conclude, this being granted, that all the world is melancholy or mad, dotes, and every member of it, I have ended my task, and sufficiently illustrated that which I took upon me to demonstrate at first. At this present I have no more to say. His sanum mentum democritus. I can but wish myself and them a good physician, and all of us a better mind. And although for the above-named reasons I had a just cause to undertake this subject, to point at these particular species of dotage, that so men might acknowledge their imperfections and seek to reform what is amiss, yet I have a more serious intent at this time, and to admit all impertinent digressions, to say no more of such as are improperly melancholy, or metaphorically mad, lightly mad, or in disposition, as stupid, angry, drunken, silly, sottish, sullen, proud, vainglorious, ridiculous, beastly, peevish, obstinate, impudent, extravagant, dry, doting, dull, desperate, hairbrain, etc., mad, frantic, foolish, heteroclites, which no new hospital can hold, no physic help. My purpose and endeavour is, in the following discourse, to anastomize this humour of melancholy, through all its parts and species, as it is an habit or an ordinary disease, and that philosophically, medicinally, to show the causes, symptoms, and several cures of it, that it may be the better avoided. Moved thereunto for the generality of it, and to do good, it being a disease so frequent, as Mercurialis observes, in these our days so often happening, saith Laurentius in our miserable times, as few there are that feel not the smart of it. Of the same mind is alien Montaltus, Belanxon and others, Julius Caesar Claudinus, calls it a fountain of all other diseases, and so common in this crazed age of ours, that scarce one of a thousand is free from it, and that splenetic hypochondriacal wind especially, which proceeds from the spleen and short ribs. Being then a disease so grievous, so common, I know not wherein to do a more general service, and spend my time better, than to prescribe means how to prevent and cure so universal a malady, an epidemical disease, that so often so much crucifies the body and mind. If I have overshot myself in this which hath been hitherto said, or that it is, which I am sure some will object, too fantastical, too light and comical for a divine, too satirical for one of my profession, I will presume to answer with Erasmus, in like case. Tis not I, but Democritus. Democritus dicks it. You must consider what it is to speak in one's own or another's person, an assumed habit and name, a difference betwixt him that affects or acts a prince's, a philosopher's, a magistrate's, a fool's part, and him that it is so indeed, and what liberty those old satirists have had, it is a cento collected from others, not I, but they that say it. Dixero si quid forte jacosius, hoc mihi juris cum venia dabis. Yet some indulgence I may justly claim, if I too familiar with another's fame. Take heed you mistake me not, if I do a little forget myself, I hope you will pardon it. And to say truth, why should any man be offended, or take exceptions at it? Licuit semperque licebit, parcere personis, dicere devitiis. It lawful was of old, and still will be, to speak of vice, but let the name go free. I hate their vices, not their persons. If any be displeased, or take aught unto himself, let him not expostulate or cavil with him that said it. So did Erasmus excuse himself to Dorpius, si parva licet componere magnis, and so do I, but let him be angry with himself, that so betrayed and opened his own faults in applying it to himself. If he be guilty and deserve it, let him amend, whoever he is, and not be angry, he that hateth correction is a fool. Proverbs 12, 1. If he be not guilty, it concerns him not. It is not my freeness of speech, but a guilty conscience, a galled back of his own that makes him wince. Suspicione si quis irabit sua, et rapiet ad se, quod erit commune omnium, stulte nudabit animi conscientiam. I deny not this which I have said savours a little of Democritus. Quam vis ridentem dicere verum quid velat. One may speak in jest, and yet speak truth. It is somewhat tart, I grant it. Acriora orexim excitant embamata, as he said. Sharp sources increase appetite. Nec cibus ipse juvat morsu for datus aceti. Object then, and cavil what thou wilt. 
I ward all with Democritus's buckler, his medicine shall solve it, strike where thou wilt, and when. Democritus dixit, Democritus will answer it. It was written by an idle fellow at idle times, about our Saturnalian or Dionysian feasts, when, as he said, Nullum libertati periculum est, servants in old Rome had liberty to say and do what them list. When our countrymen sacrificed to their goddess Vacuna, and sat tipping by their vacunal fires, I writ this, and published this hautus heligan. It is Neminis Nihil. The time, place, persons, and all circumstances apologize for me. And why may not I then be idle with others, speak my mind freely? If you deny me this liberty, upon these presumptions, I will take it. I say again, I will take it. Si quis est qui dictum in se inclementius, existimavit esse, sic existiment. If any man take exceptions, let him turn the buckle of his girdle. I care not. I owe thee nothing, reader. I look for no favour at thy hands. I am independent. I fear not. No, I recant. I will not. I care. I fear. I confess my fault. Acknowledge a great offence. Motus fais dat componere fluctus. Let's first assuage the troubled waves. I have overshot myself. I have spoken foolishly, rashly, unadvisedly, absurdly. I have anatomized mine own folly, and now, methinks, upon a sudden I am awaked, as it were out of a dream. I have had a raving fit, a fantastical fit, ranged up and down, in and out. I have insulted over the most kind of men, abused some, offended others, wronged myself. And now, being recovered and perceiving mine error, cry with Orlando, Solvete me, pardon, O Bonnie, that which is past, and I will make you amends in that which is to come. I promise you a more sober discourse in my following treaties. If through weakness, folly, passion, discontent, ignorance, I have said amiss, let it be forgotten and forgiven. I acknowledge that of Tacitus to be true. Asperae facetiae, ubi nimis ex vero traxere, aquam sue memoriam, relinquunt. A bitter jest leaves a sting behind it, and, as an honourable man observes, they fear a satirist's wit, he their memories. I may justly suspect the worst, and although I hope I have wronged no man, yet in Medea's words I will crave pardon. Illud jam quoque extrema peto, nisi quae nostra dubius effudit dolor, maniant in animal verbo, sed melior tibi memoria nostri subiat, haec irae data obliterentor. And in my last words this I do desire, that what in passion I have said or ire may be forgotten, and a better mind be had of us, hereafter as you find. I earnestly request every private man, as Scaliger did Cardan, not to take offence. I will conclude in his lines, Si me cognitum haberes, non solum donares nobis has facetias nostras, sed etiam indignum duceras, tam humanum animum, lene ingenium, vel minimam suspicionem deprecari opotere. If thou knewest my modesty and simplicity, thou wouldst easily pardon and forgive what is here amiss, or by thee misconceived. If hereafter anatomizing this surly humour, my hand slip, and as unskilful prentice I lance too deep, and cut through skin, and all at unawares make it smart, or cut awry, pardon a rude hand, an unskilful knife. Tis a most difficult thing to keep an even tone, a perpetual tenor, and not sometimes to lash out. Difficile est satiram non scribere. There be so many objects to divert, inward perturbations to molest, and the very best may sometimes err. Aliquando bonus dormitat Homerus. Sometimes that excellent Homer takes a nap. It is impossible not in so much to overshoot, opere in longo fas est obre pere summum. But what needs all this? I hope there will no such cause of offence be given, if there be, nemo aliquid recognoscat, nos mentimo omnia. I'll deny all my last refuge, recant all, renounce all I have said, if any man except 
and with as much facility excuse as he can accuse. But I presume of thy good favour and gracious acceptance, gentle reader. Out of an assured hope and confidence thereof, I will begin. To the reader at leisure. Whoever you may be, I caution you against rashly defaming the author of this work, or cavilling in jest against him. Nay, do not silently reproach him in consequence of others' censure, nor employ your wit in foolish disapproval or false accusation. For should Democritus Junior prove to be what he professes, even a kinsman of his elder namesake, or be ever so little of the same kidney, it is all over with you. He will become both accuser and judge of you in your spleen, will dissipate you in jests, pulverize you into salt, and sacrifice you, I can promise you, to the god of mirth. I further advise you not to asperse or calumniate or slander Democritus Junior, who possibly does not think ill of you, lest you may hear from some discreet friend the same remark the people of Abdera did from Hippocrates, of their meritorious and popular fellow-citizen, whom they had looked on as a madman. It is not that you, Democritus, that art wise, but that the people of Abdera are fools and madmen. You have yourself an Abderitian soul, and... Having just given you, gentle reader, these few words of admonition, farewell. Weep, O Heraclitus, it suits the age, unless you see nothing base, nothing sad. Laugh, O Democritus, as much as you please, unless you see nothing either vain or foolish. Let one rejoice in smiles, the other in tears. Let the same labour or pain be the office of both. Now, for, alas, how foolish the world has become! A thousand Heraclitus, a thousand Democritus are required. Now, so much does madness prevail, all the world must be sent to Antichyra to graze on Hellebore. End of section 15 Section 16 of The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1, by Robert Burton, Section 16. Partition 1, Section 1, Member 1, Subsection 1. Man's Excellency, Fall miseries, infirmities, the causes of them. Man's Excellency Man, the most excellent and noble creature of the world, the principal and mighty work of God, wonder of nature, as Zoroaster calls him, or Dacis Naturae Miraculum, the marvel of marvels, as Plato, the abridgment and epitome of the world, as Pliny, Microcosmos, a little world, a model of the world, Sovereign Lord of the Earth, Viceroy of the World, Sole Commander and Governor of all the creatures in it, to whose empire they are subject in particular, and yield obedience, far surpassing all the rest, not in body only, but in soul, Imaginis Imago, created to God's own image, to that immortal and incorporeal substance, with all the faculties and powers belonging unto it, was at first pure, divine, perfect, happy, created after God in true holiness and righteousness, deo congruence, free from all manner of infirmities, and put in paradise, to know God, to praise and glorify Him, to do His will, ut dies consimilis parturiat deos, as an old poet saith, to propagate the church. Man's fall and misery. But this most noble creature, Eutristis et lacrimosa commutatio, one exclaims, O pitiful change, is fallen from that he was, and forfeited his estate, become miserabilis homunculo, a castaway, a caitiff, one of the most miserable creatures of the world, if he be considered in his own nature, an unregenerate man, and so much obscured by his fall that, some few relics excepted, he is inferior to a beast. Man in honour that understandeth not, is like unto beasts that perish, so David esteems him, a monster by stupend metamorphosis, a fox, a dog, a hog, what not? Quantum mutatis ab illo, how much altered from that he was, before blessed and happy, now miserable and accursed, 
he must eat his meat in sorrow, subject to death and all manner of infirmities, all kind of calamities. A description of melancholy. Great travail is created for all men, and an heavy yoke on the sons of Adam, from the day that they go out of their mother's womb, unto that day they return to the mother of all things, namely their thoughts and fear of their hearts, and their imagination of things they wait for, and the day of death. From him that sitteth in the glorious throne, to him that sitteth beneath in the earth and ashes, from him that is clothed in blue silk and weareth a crown, to him that is clothed in simple linen. Wrath, envy, trouble and unquietness, and fear of death, and rigour and strife, and such things come to both man and beast, but sevenfold to the ungodly. All this befalls him in this life, and peradventure eternal misery in the life to come. Impulsive Cause of Man's Misery and Infirmities the impulsive cause of these miseries in man, this privation or destruction of God's image, the cause of death and diseases, of all temporal and eternal punishments, was the sin of our first parent Adam, in eating of the forbidden fruit, by the devil's instigation and allurement. His disobedience, pride, ambition, intemperance, incredulity, curiosity, from whence proceeded original sin, and that general corruption of mankind, as from a fountain, flowed all bad inclinations and actual transgressions which cause our several calamities inflicted upon us for our sins. And this, belike, is that which our fabulous poets have shadowed unto us in the tale of Pandora's box, which being opened through her curiosity, filled the world with all manner of diseases. It is not curiosity alone, but those other crying sins of ours, which pull these several plagues and miseries upon our heads. For, ubi peccatum, ibi procella, as Cressa Stone well observes. Fools, by reason of their transgression, and because of their iniquities, are afflicted. Fear cometh like sudden desolation, and destruction like a whirlwind, affliction and anguish, because they did not fear God. Are you shaken with wars? As Cyprian well urgeth to Demetrius. Are you molested with death and famine? Is your health crushed with raging diseases? Is mankind generally tormented with epidemical maladies? "'Tis all for your sins. Haggai 1, 9, 10. Amos 1, Jeremiah 7. God is angry, punisheth and threateneth, because of their obstinacy and stubbornness. They will not turn unto him. If the earth be barren then for want of rain, if dry and squalid, it yield no fruit. If your fountains be dried up, your wine, corn and oil blasted, if the air be corrupted and men troubled with diseases, "'Tis by reason of their sins, which, like the blood of Abel, cry loud to heaven for vengeance. Lamentations 5.15 That we have sinned. Therefore our hearts are heavy. Isaiah 59.11.12 We roar like bears, and mourn like doves, and want health, etc., for our sins and trespasses. But this we cannot endure to hear or to take notice of. Jeremiah 2.30 we are smitten in vain, and receive no correction. And, chapter 5, 3, Thou hast stricken them, but they have not sorrowed. They have refused to receive correction. They have not returned. Pestilence he hath sent, but they have not turned to him. Amos 4. Herod could not abide John Baptist, nor Domitian endure Apollonius to tell the causes of the plague at Ephesus his injustice, incest, adultery, and the like. To punish, therefore, this blindness and obstinacy of ours as a concomitant cause and principal agent is God's just judgment in bringing these calamities upon us, to chastise us, I say, for our sins, and to satisfy God's wrath. For the law requires obedience or punishment, as you may read at large, Deuteronomy 28.15. If they will not obey the Lord and keep his commandments and ordinances, then all these curses shall come upon them. Cursed in the town and in the field, etc. Cursed in the fruit of the body, etc. The Lord shall send thee trouble and shame because of thy wickedness. And a little after, the Lord shall smite thee with the botch of Egypt, and with emeralds, and scab, and itch, and thou canst not be healed, with madness, blindness, and astonishing of heart. This Paul seconds, Romans 2.9. 
tribulation and anguish on the soul of every man that doeth evil, or else these chastisements are inflicted upon us for our humiliation, to exercise and try our patience here in this life to bring us home, and make us to know God ourselves, to inform and teach us wisdom. Therefore is my people gone into captivity, because they had no knowledge. Therefore is the wrath of the Lord kindled against his people, and he hath stretched out his hand upon them. He is desirous of our salvation. Nostri salutis avidus, saith Lemnius, and for that cause pulls us by the ear many times, to put us in mind of our duties. That they which erred might have understanding, as Isaiah speaks, 29.24, and so to be reformed. I am afflicted, and at the point of death, so David confesseth of himself. Psalm 58, verse 15, verse 9. Mine eyes are sorrowful through mine affliction, and that made him turn unto God. Great Alexander, in the midst of all his prosperity, by a company of parasites deified, and now made a god, when he saw one of his wounds bleed, remembered that he was but a man, and remitted of his pride. In morbo recolligit se animus, as Pliny well perceived. In sickness the mind reflects upon itself, with judgment surveys itself and abhors its former courses, insomuch that he concludes to his friend Marius that it were the period of all philosophy if we could so continue sound or perform but a part of that which we promised to do, being sick. Whoso is wise, then, will consider these things, as David did. Psalms 144, verse last, and whatsoever fortune befall him, make use of it. If he be in sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity, seriously to recount with himself why this or that malady, misery, this or that incurable disease is inflicted upon him. It may be for his good, sick expedit, as Peter said of his daughter's ague. Bodily sickness is for his soul's health. Peri isit nisi peri isit. Had he not been visited, he had utterly perished. For the Lord correcteth him whom he loveth even as a father doth his child in whom he delighteth. If he be safe and sound on the other side, and free from all manner of infirmity, et cui, gratia, forma, valetudo contingat abunde, et mundus victus, non deficiente crumena. And that he have grace, beauty, favour, health, a cleanly diet, and abound in wealth. Yet, in the midst of his prosperity, let him remember that caveat of Moses, Beware that he do not forget the Lord his God, that he be not puffed up, but acknowledge them to be his good gifts and benefits, and the more he hath, to be more thankful, as Agapetianus adviseth, and use them aright. Instrumental Causes of Our Infirmities Now the instrumental causes of these our infirmities are as diverse as the infirmities themselves, stars, heavens, elements, etc., and all those creatures which God hath made are armed against sinners. They were indeed once good in themselves, and that they are now many of them pernicious unto us, is not in their nature, but our corruption, which hath caused it. For from the fall of our first parent Adam, they have been changed, the earth accursed, the influence of stars altered, the four elements, beasts, birds, plants, are now ready to offend us. The principal things for the use of man are water, fire, iron, salt, meal, wheat, honey, milk, oil, wine, clothing, good to the godly, to the sinners turned to evil. Ecclesiasticus 39.26 Fire and hail and famine and dearth, all these are created for vengeance. Ecclesiasticus 39.29 the heavens threaten us with their comets, stars, planets, with their great conjunctions, eclipses, oppositions, quartiles, and such unfriendly aspects. The air with his meteors, thunder and lightning, intemperate heat and cold, mighty winds, tempests, unseasonable weather, from which proceed dearth, famine, plague, and all sorts of epidemical diseases, consuming infinite myriads of men. At Cairo in Egypt every third year, as it is related by Botarus and others, three hundred thousand die of the plague, and two hundred thousand in Constantinople, every fifth or seventh at the utmost. 
How doth the earth terrify and oppress us with terrible earthquakes, which are most frequent in China, Japan, and those eastern climes, swallowing up sometimes six cities at once? How doth the water rage with its inundations, eruptions, flinging down towns, cities, villages, bridges, etc., besides shipwrecks? Whole islands are sometimes suddenly overwhelmed with all their inhabitants in Zealand, Holland, and many parts of the continent drowned, as the Lake Urn in Ireland. Nihil quae praetor archium cadavera patenti cernimus preto. In the fens of Friesland, 1230, by reason of tempests, the sea drowned multa hominum milia et jumenta sine numero, all the country almost, men and cattle in it. How doth the fire rage, that merciless element, consuming in an instant whole cities? What town of any antiquity or note hath not been once, again and again, by the fury of this merciless element, defaced, ruinated, and left desolate? In a word, ignis pepercit, unda mergit, eris vis pestilentis aequori ereptum necat, bello superstes, tabidus morbo perit, whom fire spares, sea doth drown, whom sea, pestilent air doth send to clay, whom war scapes, sickness takes away. To descend to more particulars, how many creatures are at deadly feud with men, lions, wolves, bears, etc., some with hooves, horns, tusks, teeth, nails, how many noxious serpents and venomous creatures ready to offend us with stings, breath, sight, or quite kill us, how many pernicious fishes, plants, gums, fruits, seeds, flowers, etc., could I reckon up on a sudden, which by their very smell many of them, touch, taste, cause some grievous malady, if not death itself? Some make mention of a thousand several poisons, but these are but trifles in respect. The greatest enemy to man is man, who by the devil's instigation is still ready to do mischief, his own executioner, a wolf, a devil to himself and others. We are all brethren in Christ, or at least should be, members of one body, servants of one Lord, and yet no fiend can so torment, insult over, tyrannize, vex, as one man doth another. Let me not fall, therefore, saith David, when wars, plague, famine were offered, into the hands of men, merciless and wicked men. Vix sunt homines hoc nomine digni, quanque lupi saevae pulus feritatis habent. We can most part foresee these epidemical diseases, and likely avoid them. Dearths, tempests, plagues, our astrologers foretell us. Earthquakes, inundations, ruins of houses, consuming fires, come by little and little, or make some noise beforehand. But the knaveries, impostures, injuries, and villainies of men no art can avoid. We can keep our professed armies from our cities by gates, walls, and towers, defend ourselves from thieves and robbers by watchfulness and weapons. But this malice of men, and their pernicious endeavours, no caution can divert, no vigilancy foresee. We have so many secret plots and devices to mischief one another. Sometimes by the devil's help as magicians, witches, sometimes by impostures, mixtures, poisons, stratagems, single combats, wars, we hack and hew as if we were at internecionem nati, like Cadmus's soldiers born to consume one another. Tis an ordinary thing to read of a hundred and two hundred thousand men slain in a battle. Besides all manner of torches, brazen bulls, racks, wheels, strapados, guns, engines, etc. Ad unum corpus humanum supplicia plura, quam membra. We have invented more torturing instruments than there be several members in a man's body, as Cyprian well observes. To come nearer yet, our own parents by their offences, indiscretion and intemperance, are our mortal enemies. The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. They cause our grief many times, and put upon us hereditary diseases, inevitable infirmities. They torment us, and we are ready to injure our posterity. Mogs datori progeniem vitiosiorum. And yet with crimes to us unknown, our sons shall mark the coming age their own. And the latter end of the world, as Paul foretold, is still like to be the worst. We are thus bad by nature, bad by kind, but far worse by art, every man the greatest enemy unto himself. 
we study many times to undo ourselves, abusing those good gifts which God hath bestowed upon us, health, wealth, strength, wit, learning, art, memory to our own destruction, perditio tua ex te. As Judas Maccabeus killed Apollonius with his own weapons, we arm ourselves to our own overthrows, and use reason, art, judgment, all that should help us as so many instruments to undo us. Hector gave Ajax a sword, which so long as he fought against enemies served for his help and defence, but after he began to hurt harmless creatures with it, turned to his own hurtless bowels. Those excellent means God hath bestowed on us, well employed, cannot but much avail us, but if otherwise perverted they ruin and confound us, and so by reason of our indiscretion and weakness they commonly do. We have too many instances. This St. Austin acknowledgeth of himself in his humble confessions, promptness of wit, memory, eloquence. They were God's good gifts, but he did not use them to his glory. If you will particularly know how and by what means, consult physicians and they will tell you that it is an offending in some of those six non-natural things of which I shall dilate more at large. They are the cause of our infirmities, our surfeiting and drunkenness, our immoderate insatiable lust and prodigious riot. Plures crapula, quam gladius, is a true saying. The board consumes more than the sword. Our intemperance it is, that pulls so many several incurable diseases upon our heads, that hastens old age, perverts our temperature, and brings upon us sudden death. And last of all, that which crucifies us most, is our own folly, madness, quos Jupiter perdit, dementat. By subtraction of his assisting grace, God permits it, weakness, want of government, our facility and proneness in yielding to several lusts, in giving way to every passion and perturbation of the mind, by which means we metamorphose ourselves and degenerate into beasts. All which that prince of poets observed of Agamemnon, that when he was well pleased and could moderate his passion, he was os oculosque jovi par, like Jupiter in feature, Mars in valour, Pallas in wisdom, another god, but when he became angry, he was a lion, a tiger, a dog, etc. There appeared no sign or likeness of Jupiter in him, so as long as we are ruled by reason, correct our inordinate appetite, and conform ourselves to God's word, are as so many saints. But if we give reins to lust, anger, ambition, pride, and follow our own ways, we degenerate into beasts, transform ourselves, overthrow our constitutions, provoke God to anger, and heap upon us this of melancholy, and all kinds of incurable diseases, as a just and deserved punishment of our sins. End of section 16 Section 17 of The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1 by Robert Burton, Section 17 Partition 1, Section 1, Member 1, Subsections 2 to 5 Subsection 2 the definition, number, division of diseases. What a disease is, almost every physician defines. Fernelius calleth it an affection of the body contrary to nature. Fucius and Crato, an hindrance, hurt, or alteration of any action of the body, or part of it. Tholosanus, a dissolution of that league which is between body and soul, and a perturbation of it, as health the perfection, and makes to the preservation of it. Labeo in Agellius, an ill habit of the body, opposite to nature, hindering the use of it, others otherwise, all to this effect. Number of diseases. How many diseases there are is a question not yet determined. Pliny reckons up three hundred from the crown of the head to the sole of the foot. Elsewhere he saith, Morborum infinita multitudo, their number is infinite. Howsoever it was in those times, it boots not. In our days I am sure the number is much augmented. Machies et nova febrium, terris incubit cohors. 
For besides many epidemical diseases, unheard of and altogether unknown to Galen and Hippocrates, as scorbutum, smallpox, plica, sweating sickness, morbus gallicus, etc., we have many proper and peculiar almost to every part. No man free from some disease or other. No man amongst us so sound, of so good a constitution, that hath not some impediment of body or mind. Quisque suos patimur manes. We have all our infirmities, first or last, more or less. There will be peradventure in an age, or one of a thousand, like Xenophilus, the musician in Pliny, that may happily live a hundred and five years without any manner of impediment, a polio Romulus, that can preserve himself with wine and oil, a man as fortunate as Cumatellus, of whom Valerius so much brags, a man as healthy as Otto Herwardus, a senator of Augsburg in Germany, whom Leovitius the astrologer brings in for an example and instance of certainty in his art, who because he had the significators in his geniture fortunate and free from the hostile aspects of Saturn and Mars, being a very cold man, could not remember that ever he was sick. Paracelsus may brag that he could make a man live four hundred years or more, if he might bring him up from his infancy, and diet him as he list, and some physicians hold that there is no certain period of man's life, but it may still, by temperance and physic, be prolonged. We find in the meantime, by common experience, that no man can escape, but that of Hesiod is true. Plain men ga gaia kakon, plain di thalassa nusoid anthropoi ein ef hemere, et epi nicti hautomatoi hoitosi. The earth's full of maladies, and full the sea, which set upon us both by night and day. Division of diseases. If you require a more exact division of these ordinary diseases which are incident to men, I refer you to physicians. They will tell you of acute and chronic, first and secondary, lethals, salutares, errant, fixed, simple, compound, connexed, or consequent, belonging to parts or the whole, in habit or in disposition, etc. My division at this time, as most befitting my purpose, shall be into those of the body and mind. For them of the body, a brief catalogue of which Fusius hath made, I refer you to the voluminous tomes of Galen, Aretas, Rasis, Avicenna, Alexander, Paulus Aetius, Gondonarius, and those exact Neoterics, Savonarola, Capivaccius, Donatus Altomarus, Hercules de Saxonia, Mercurialis, Victorius Faventinus, Becker, Piso, etc., that have methodically and elaborately written of them all. Those of the mind and head I will briefly handle, and apart. Subsection 3. Division of the Diseases of the Head These diseases of the mind, forasmuch as they have their chief seat and organs in the head, which are commonly repeated amongst the diseases of the head, which are diverse, and vary much according to their sight. For in the head, as there be several parts, so there be diverse grievances, which, according to that division of hernias, which he takes out of Arculanus, are inward or outward, to omit all others which pertain to eyes and ears, nostrils, gums, teeth, mouth, palate, tongue, weasel, chops, face, etc., belong properly to the brain, as baldness, falling of hair, furfur, lice, etc. Inward belonging to the skins next to the brain, called dura and pia mater, as all headaches, etc., or to the ventricles, corys, kells, tunicles, creeks, and parts of it, and their passions, as caro, vertigo, incubus, apoplexy, falling sickness. The diseases of the nerves, cramps, stupor, convulsion, tremor, palsy, or belonging to the excrements of the brain, catars, sneezing, rheums, distillations, or else those that pertain to the substance of the brain itself, in which are conceived frenzy, lethargy, melancholy, madness, weak memory, sopo, or coma vigilia et vigil coma. Out of these again I will single such as properly belong to the fantasy or imagination, or reason itself, which Laurentius calls the disease of the mind, and Hildesheim, morbos imaginationis, or rationis lysi, diseases of the imagination, or of injured reason, which are three or four in number, frenzy, madness, melancholy, dotage and their kinds, as hydrophobia, lycanthropia, chorus sancti viti, morbi demoniaci, 
St. Vitus's dance, Possession of Devils, which I will briefly touch and point at, insisting especially in this of melancholy, as more eminent than the rest, and that through all his kinds, causes, symptoms, prognostics, cures, as Lonicerus hath done, de apoplexia, and many other of such particular diseases. Not that I find fault with those which have written of this subject before, as Jason Pratensis, Laurentius, Montaltus, T. Bright, etc. They have done very well in their several kinds and methods, yet that which one omits, another may haply see, that which one contracts, another may enlarge. To conclude with Scribanius, that which they had neglected, or perfunctorily handled, we may more thoroughly examine. That which is obscurely delivered in them may be perspicuously dilated and amplified by us, and so made more familiar and easy for every man's capacity, and the common good, which is the chief end of my discourse. Subsection 4 Dotage, frenzy, madness, hydrophobia, lycanthropia, chorus sancti viti, ecstasis. Delirium, dotage. Dotage, fatuity or folly, is a common name to all the following species, as some will have it. Laurentius and Altomarus comprehended madness, melancholy, and the rest under this name, and called it the summum genus of them all. If it be distinguished from them, it is natural or ingenite, which comes by some defect of the organs and overmuch brain, as we see in our common fools, and is for the most part intended or remitted in particular men, and thereupon some are wiser than others, or else it is acquisite, an appendix or symptom of some other disease, which comes or goes, or if it continue, a sign of melancholy itself. Frenzy, phrenitis, which the Greeks derive from the word phren, is a disease of the mind with a continual madness or dotage, which hath an acute fever annexed, or else an inflammation of the brain, or the membranes or kells of it, with an acute fever, which causeth madness and dotage. It differs from melancholy and madness, because their dotage is without an ague. This continual, with waking or memory decayed, etc. Melancholy is most part silent, this clamorous, and many such like differences are assigned by physicians. Madness Madness, frenzy, and melancholy are confounded by Celsus and many writers. Others leave out frenzy and make madness and melancholy but one disease, which Jason Pratensis especially labours, and that they differ only secundum magus or minus in quantity alone, the one being a degree to the other, and both proceeding from one cause. They differ intenso et remisso gradu, says Gordonius, as the humour is intended or remitted. Of the same mind is Aretus, Alexander Tertullianus, Guianarius, Savanarola, Hernius, and Galen himself writes promiscuously of them, both by reason of their affinity. But most of our neoterics do handle them apart, whom I will follow in this treatise. Madness is therefore defined to be a vehement dotage, or raving without a fever, far more violent than melancholy, full of anger and clamour, horrible looks, actions, gestures, troubling the patients with far greater vehemency both of body and mind, without all fear and sorrow, with such impetuous force and boldness, that sometimes three or four men cannot hold them. Differing only in this from frenzy, that it is without a fever, and their memory is most part better. It hath the same causes as the other, as choler adust, and blood incensed, brains inflamed, etc. Fracastorius adds, a due time and full age to this definition, to distinguish it from children, and will have it confirmed impotency, to separate it from such as accidentally come and go again, as by taking henbane, nightshade, wine, etc. Of this fury there be diverse kinds. Ecstasy, which is familiar with some persons, as Cardan saith of himself, he could be in one when he list, in which the Indian priests deliver their oracles, and the witches in Lapland, as Olus Magnus writeth, Extasi omnia praedicere, answer all questions in an ecstasis you will ask, what your friends do, where they are, how they fare, etc. The other species of this fury are enthusiasms, revelations, and visions, so often mentioned by Gregory and Bede in their works, obsession or possession of devils, sibylline prophets, and poetical furies, 
such as come by eating noxious herbs, tarantulas, stinging, etc., which some reduce to this. The most known of these are lycanthropia, hydrophobia, chorus sancti vitae. Lycanthropia. Lycanthropia, which Avicenna calls cucubus, others lupinum insanium, or wolf madness, when men run howling about graves and fields in the night, and will not be persuaded but that they are wolves, or some such beasts. Aetius and Paulus call it a kind of melancholy, but I should rather refer it to madness, as most do. Some make a doubt of it whether there be any such disease. Donut ab Altomari saith, that he saw two of them in his time. Wierus tells a story of such a one at Padua, 1541, that would not believe to the contrary, but that he was a wolf. He hath another instance of a Spaniard, who thought himself a bear. Forestus confirms as much by many examples, one amongst the rest of which he was an eyewitness, at Alkmaar in Holland, a poor husbandman that still hunted about graves, and kept in churchyards, of a pale, black, ugly and fearful look. Such belike or little better were King Prytus' daughters, that thought themselves kind, and Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel, as some interpreters hold, was only troubled with this kind of madness. This disease perhaps gave occasion to that bold assertion of Pliny, some men were turned into wolves in his time, and from wolves to men again, and to that fable of Pausanias, of a man that was ten years a wolf, and afterwards turned to his former shape, to Ovid's tale of Lycaon, etc. He that is desirous to hear of this disease, or more examples, let him read Austin in his eighteenth book, De Civitate Dei, chapter 5. Miseldus, Schenkius, Hildesheim, Forestus, Book 10 of De Morbus Carebri, Olus Magnus, Vincentius Bellavicensis, Pierus, Bodin, Zwinger, Zilger, Puca, Wierus, Spranger, etc. This malady, saith Avicenna, troubleth men most in February, and is nowadays frequent in Bohemia and Hungary, according to Hernius. Sheretius will have it common in Livonia. They lie hid most part all day, and go abroad in the night, barking, howling at graves and deserts. They have usually hollow eyes, scabbed legs and thighs, very dry and pale, says Altomarus. He gives a reason there of all the symptoms, and sets down a brief cure of them. Hydrophobia is a kind of madness, well known in every village, which comes by the biting of a mad dog, or scratching, saith Aurelianus, touching or smelling alone sometimes, as Schenkius proves, and is instant to many other creatures as well as men, so called because the parties affected cannot endure the sight of water or any liquor, supposing still they see a mad dog in it, and which is more wonderful, though they be very dry, as in this malady they are, they will rather die than drink. De Venenis Caelus Aurelianus, an ancient writer, makes a doubt whether this hydrophobia be a passion of the body or the mind. The part affected is the brain, the cause, poison that comes from the mad dog, which is so hot and dry that it consumes all the moisture in the body. Hildesheim relates of some that died so mad, and being cut up had no water, scarce blood, or any moisture left in them. To such as are so affected, the fear of water begins at fourteen days after they are bitten, to some again not till forty or sixty days after. Commonly, saith Hernius, they begin to rave, fly water and glasses, to look red, and swell in the face, about twenty days after, if some remedy be not taken in the meantime, to lie awake, to be pensive, sad, to see strange visions, to bark and howl, to fall into a swoon, and sometimes fits of the falling sickness. Some say, little things like whelps will be seen in their urine. If any of these signs appear, they are past recovery. Many times these symptoms will not appear till six or seven months after, saith Codronchus, and sometimes not till seven or eight years, as Guianerius, twelve as Albertus, six or eight months after, as Galen holds. Baldus, the great lawyer, died of it, an Augustine friar and a woman in Delft, that were Forestus' patients, were miserably consumed with it. The common cure in the country, for such at least as well near the seaside, is to duck them over the head and ears in sea water. Some use charms. Every good wife can prescribe medicines. 
But the best cure to be had in such cases is from the most approved physicians. They that will read of them may consult with Dioscorides, Hernius, Hildesheim, Capivaccius, Forestus, Schenkius, and before all others, Codroncus, an Italian, who hath lately written two exquisite books on the subject. Chorus Sancti Vitae, or St. Vitus's Dance, the lascivious dance, as Paracelsus calls it, because they that are taken from it can do nothing but dance till they be dead or cured. It is so called, for that the parties so troubled were wont to go to St. Vitus for help, and after they had danced there a while, they were certainly freed. "'Tis strange to hear how long they will dance, and in what manner, over stools, forms, tables. Even great-bellied women sometimes, and yet never hurt their children, will dance so long that they can stir neither hand nor foot, but seem to be quite dead. One in red clothes they cannot abide. Music above all things they love, and therefore magistrates in Germany will hire musicians to play to them, and some lusty sturdy companions to dance with them. This disease hath been very common in Germany, as appears by those relations of Schenkius, and Paracelsus in his book of madness, who brags how many several persons he hath cured of it. Felix Platerus, De Mentis Alienationibus, Chapter 3, reports of a woman in Basel whom he saw, that danced a whole month together. The Arabians call it a kind of palsy. Bodine, in his fifth book, De Republica, Chapter 1, speaks of this infirmity. Monabius in his last epistle to Scoltisius, and in another to Dudithus, where you may read more of it. The last kind of madness or melancholy is that demoniacal, if I may so call it, obsession or possession of devils, which Platerus and others would have to be preternatural. Stupend things are said of them, their actions, gestures, contortions, fasting, prophesying, speaking languages they were never taught, etc. Many strange stories are related of them, which, because some will not allow, for Deacon and Dowell have written large volumes on this subject pro and con, I voluntarily omit. Fucius, Felix Plater, Laurentius, add to these another fury that proceeds from love, and another from study, another divine or religious fury, but these more properly belong to melancholy, all of which I will speak apart, intending to write a whole book of them. Subsection 5. Melancholy in Disposition, Improperly So Called, Equivocations. Melancholy, the subject of our present discourse, is either in disposition or habit. In disposition is that transitory melancholy, which goes and comes upon every small occasion of sorrow, need, sickness, trouble, fear, grief, passion, or perturbation of the mind. Any manner of care, discontent, or thought, which causeth anguish, dullness, heaviness, and vexation of spirit, any ways opposite to pleasure, mirth, joy, delight, causing forwardness in us, or a dislike, in which equivocal and improper sense we call him melancholy that is dull, sad, sore, lumpish, ill-disposed, solitary, any way moved or displeased. And from these melancholy dispositions no man living is free, no stoic, none so wise, none so happy, none so patient, so generous, so godly, so divine, that can vindicate himself. So well composed, but more or less, sometime other he feels the smart of it. Melancholy in this sense is the character of mortality. Man that is born of a woman is short of continuance, and full of trouble. Zeno, Cato, Socrates himself, whom Aelian so highly commends for a moderate temper, that nothing could disturb him, but going out and coming in, still Socrates kept the same serenity of countenance, what misery soever befell him, if we may believe Plato his disciple, was much tormented with it. Quintus Metellus, in whom Valerius gives instance of all happiness, the most fortunate man then living, born in that most flourishing city of Rome, of noble parentage, a proper man of person, well qualified, healthful, rich, honourable, a senator, a consul, happy in his wife, happy in his children, etc. Yet this man was not void of melancholy. He had his share of sorrow. Polycrates Samius, that flung his ring into the sea, because he would participate of discontent with others, and had it miraculously restored to him again shortly after, by a fish taken as he angled, was not free from melancholy dispositions. No man can cure himself. 
the very gods had bitter pangs and frequent passions, as their own poets put upon them. In general, as the heaven, so is our life, sometimes fair, sometimes overcast, tempestuous and serene, as in a rose, flowers and prickles, in the year itself a temperate summer sometimes, a hard winter, a drought, and then again pleasant showers, so is our life intermixed with joys, hopes, fears, sorrows, calumnies. In vicum cedunt dolla et voluptas, there is a succession of pleasure and pain. Medio de fonte leporum, surgit amari aliquid, in ipsis floribus angat. Even in the midst of laughing there is sorrow, as Solomon holds. Even in the midst of all our feasting and jollity, as Austin infers in his commentary on the 41st Psalm, there is grief and discontent. Inter delicia semper aliquid sebi nor strangulat. For a pint of honey, thou shalt here likely find a gallon of gall. For a dram of pleasure, a pound of pain. For an inch of mirth, an ell of moan, as ivy doth an oak. These miseries encompass our life. And it is most absurd and ridiculous for any mortal man to look for a perpetual tenure of happiness in his life. Nothing so prosperous and pleasant, but it hath some bitterness in it, some complaining, some grudging. It is all glicopicron, a mixed passion, and like a checker table black and white. Men, families, cities have their falls and wanes. Now trines, sextiles, then quartiles and oppositions. We are not here as those angels, celestial powers and bodies, sun and moon to finish our course without all offence, with such constancy, to continue for so many ages, but subject to infirmities, miseries, interrupted, tossed and tumbled up and down, carried about with every small blast, often molested and disquieted upon each slender occasion, uncertain, brittle, and so is all that we trust unto. And he that knows not this is not armed to endure it, is not fit to live in this world, as one condoles our time. He knows not the condition of it, where with a reciprocalty pleasure and pain are still united, and succeed one another in a ring. Exi e mundo. Get thee gone hence if thou canst not brook it. There is no way to avoid it, but to arm thyself with patience, with magnanimity, to oppose thyself unto it to suffer affliction as a good soldier of Christ, as Paul adviseth constantly to bear it. But forasmuch as so few can embrace this good counsel of his, or use it aright, but rather as so many brute beasts give away to their passion, voluntarily subject and precipitate themselves into a labyrinth of cares, woes, miseries, and suffer their souls to be overcome by them, cannot arm themselves with that patience as they ought to do. It falls out oftentimes that these dispositions become habits, and many affects contemned, as Seneca notes, make a disease. Even as one distillation, not yet grown to custom, makes a cough, but continual and inveterate causeth a consumption of the lungs, so do these our melancholy provocations. And according as the humour itself is intended or remitted in men, as their temperature of body or rational soul is better able to make resistance, so are they more or less affected. For that which is but a flea-biting to one, causeth insufferable torment to another, and which one by his singular moderation and well-composed courage can happily overcome, a second is no whit able to sustain, but upon every small occasion of misconceived abuse, injury, grief, disgrace, loss, cross, humour, etc., if solitary or idle, yields so far to passion that his complexion is altered, his digestion hindered, his sleep gone, his spirits obscured, and his heart heavy, his hypochondries misaffected, wind, crudity on a sudden overtake him, and he himself overcome with melancholy. As it is with a man imprisoned for debt, if once in the jail, every creditor will bring his action against him, and there likely hold him. If any discontent seize upon a patient, in an instant all other perturbations, for, quod data porta ruunt, will set upon him, and then, like a lame dog or broken-winged goose, he dropes and pines away, and is brought at last to that ill habit or malady of melancholy itself. So that as the philosophers make eight degrees of heat and cold, we may make eighty-eight of melancholy. As the parts affected are diversely seized with it, or have been plunged more or less into this infernal gulf, or waded deeper into it. But all these melancholy fits, however pleasing at first, 
or displeasing, violent, and tyrannizing over those whom they seize on for the time, yet these fits, I say, or men affected, are but improperly so called, because they continue not, but come and go, as by some objects they are moved. This melancholy of which we are to treat is a habit, mospus sonticus, or chronicus, a chronic or continuate disease, a settled humour, as Aurelianus and others call it, not errant, but fixed, and as it was long increasing, so now, being pleasant or painful, grown to an habit, it will hardly be removed. End of section 17 Section 18 of The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1, by Robert Burton. Section 18. Partition 1, Section 1, Member 2, Subsections 1 to 4. Subsection 1. Digression of Anatomy. Before I proceed to define the disease of melancholy, what it is, or to discourse farther of it, I hold it not impertinent to make a brief digression of the anatomy of the body and faculties of the soul, for the better understanding of that which is to follow, because many hard words will often occur, as mirac, hypochondries, emeralds, etc., Imagination, reason, humours, spirits, vital, natural, animal, nerves, veins, arteries, chylus, pituita, which by the vulgar will not so easily be perceived, what they are, how cited, and to what end they serve. And besides, it may peradventure give occasion to some men to examine more accurately, search further into this most excellent subject, and thereupon with that royal prophet to praise God, for a man is fearfully and wonderfully made and curiously wrought, that have time and leisure enough, and are sufficiently informed in all other worldly businesses as to make a good bargain, buy and sell, to keep and make choice of a fair hawk, hound, horse, etc. But for such matters as concern the knowledge of themselves, they are wholly ignorant and careless." They know not what this body and soul are, how combined, of what parts and faculties they consist, or how a man differs from a dog, and what can be more ignominious and filthy, as Melanchthon well inveighs, than for a man not to know the structure and composition of his own body, especially since the knowledge of it tends so much to the preservation of his health and information of his manners. To stir them up, therefore, to this study, to peruse those elaborate works of Galen, Bohines, Plater, Vesalius, Fallopius, Laurentius, Remelinus, etc., which have written copiously in Latin, or that which some of our industrious countrymen have done in our mother tongue, not long since, as that translation of Columbus and Microcosmographia in thirteen books, I have made this brief digression. Also because Wecker, Melanchthon, Fernelius, Fusius, and those tedious tracts De Anima, which have more compendiously handled and written of this matter, are not at all times ready to be had, to give them some small taste or notice of the rest. Let this epitome suffice. Subsection 2. Division of the Body, Humours, Spirits of the parts of the body there may be many divisions. The most approved is that of Laurentius, out of Hippocrates, which is into parts contained or containing. Contained are either humours or spirits. Humours. A humour is a liquid or fluent part of the body, comprehended in it for the preservation of it, and is either innate or born with us, or adventitious and acquisite. The radical or innate is daily supplied by nourishment, which some call cambium, and make those secondary humours of ros and gluten to maintain it, or acquisite 
To maintain these four first primary humours, coming and proceeding from the first concoction in the liver, by which means chylus is excluded. Some divide them into profitable and excrementitious. But Crato, out of Hippocrates, will have all four to be Jews, and not excrements, without which no living creature can be sustained. Which four, though they be comprehended in the mass of blood, yet they have their several affections, by which they are distinguished from one another, and from those adventitious, peccant, or diseased humours, as Melanchthon calls them. Blood. Blood is a hot, sweet, tempered, red humour, prepared in the mesaric veins, and made of the most tempered parts of the chylus in the liver, whose office is to nourish the whole body, to give it strength and colour, being dispersed by the veins through every part of it. And from it spirits are first begotten in the heart, which afterwards by the arteries are communicated to the other parts. Pituita, or phlegm, is a cold and moist humour, begotten of the colder part of the chylus, or white juice coming out of the meat digested in the stomach, in the liver. His office is to nourish and moisten the members of the body, which, as the tongue are moved, that they be not over-dry. Colour is hot and dry, bitter, begotten of the hotter parts of the chylus, and gathered to the gall. It helps the natural heat and senses, and serves to the expelling of excrements. Melancholy Melancholy, cold and dry, thick, black and sour, begotten of the more feculent part of the nourishment, and purged from the spleen, is a bridle to the other two hot humours, blood and colour, preserving them in the blood and nourishing the bones. These four humours have some analogy with the four elements, and to the four ages in man. Serum, sweat, tears. To these humours you may add serum, which is the matter of urine, and those excrementitious humours of the third concoction, sweat and tears. Spirits. Spirit is a most subtle vapour, which is expressed from the blood, and the instrument of the soul, to perform all his actions, a common tie or medium between the body and the soul, as some will have it, or, as Paracelsus, a fourth soul of itself. Melanchthon holds the fountain of those spirits to be the heart, begotten there, and afterward conveyed to the brain, they take another nature to them. Of these spirits there be three kinds, according to the three principal parts, brain, heart, liver, natural, vital, animal. The natural are begotten in the liver, and thence dispersed through the veins, to perform those natural actions. The vital spirits are made in the heart of the natural, which by the arteries are transported to all the other parts. If the spirits cease, then life ceaseth, as in a syncope or swooning. The animal spirits formed of the vital, brought up to the brain, and diffused by the nerves to the subordinate members, give sense and motion to them all. Subsection 3. Similar Parts Similar parts, containing parts, by reason of their more solid substance, are either homogeneal or heterogeneal, similar or dissimilar. So Aristotle divides them, Book 1, Chapter 1, De Historia Animalium, Laurentius, Chapter 20, Book 1. Similar or homogeneal are such as, if they be divided, are still severed into parts of the same nature, as water into water. Of these, some be spermatical, some fleshy or carnal. Spermatical are such as are immediately begotten of the seed, which are bones, gristles, ligaments, membranes, nerves, arteries, veins, skins, fibres or strings, fat. Bones the bones are dry and hard, begotten of the thickest of the seed, to strengthen and sustain other parts. Some say there be three hundred and four, some three hundred and seven, or three hundred and thirteen in man's body. They have no nerves in them, and are therefore without sense. A gristle is a substance softer than bone, and harder than the rest, flexible, and serves to maintain the parts of motion. Ligaments are they that tie the bones together, 
and other parts to the bones, with their subserving tendons. Membrane's office is to cover the rest. Nerves or sinews are membranes without and full of marrow within. They proceed from the brain and carry the animal spirits for sense and motion. Of these, some be harder, some softer. The softer serve the senses, and there be seven pair of them. The first be the optic nerves, by which we see. The second move the eyes. The third pair serve for the tongue to taste. The fourth pair for the taste in the palate. The fifth belong to the ears. The sixth pair is most ample, and runs almost over all the bowels. The seventh pair moves the tongue. The harder sinews serve for the motion of the inner parts, proceeding from the marrow in the back, of whom there be thirty combinations, seven of the neck, twelve of the breast, etc. Arteries Arteries are long and hollow, with a double skin to convey the vital spirit. To discern which the better, they say that Vesalius, the anatomist, was wont to cut up men alive. They arise on the left side of the heart, and are principally two, from which the rest are derived, aorta and venosa. Aorta is the root of all the other, which serve the whole body. The other goes to the lungs, to fetch air to refrigerate the heart. Veins Veins are hollow and round, like pipes, arising from the liver, carrying blood and natural spirits, they feed all the parts. Of these there be two chief, vena porta and vena cava, from which the rest are corrivated. That vena porta is a vein coming from the concave of the liver and receiving those mesaraical veins by whom he takes the chylus from the stomach and guts and conveys it to the liver. The other derives blood from the liver to nourish all the other dispersed members. The branches of that vena porta are the mesaraical and hemorrhoids. The branches of the cava are inward or outward. Inward, seminal or emulgent. Outward, in the head, arms, feet, etc., and have several names. Fibri, fat, flesh. Fibri are strings, white and solid, dispersed through the whole member, and right, oblique, transverse, all which have their several uses. Fat is a similar part, moist, without blood, composed of the most thick and unctuous matter of the blood. The skin covers the rest, and hath cuticulum, or a little skin tinderit. Flesh is soft and ruddy, composed of the congealing of blood, etc. Subsection 4. Dissimilar Parts Dissimilar parts are those which we call organical or instrumental, and they be inward or outward. The chiefest outward parts are situate forward or backward. Forward, the crown and foretop of the head, skull, face, forehead, temples, chin, eyes, ears, nose, etc., neck, breast, chest, upper and lower part of the belly, hypochondries, navel, groin, flank, etc., Backward, the hinder part of the head, back, shoulders, sides, loins, hip bones, os sacrum, buttocks, etc. Or joints, arms, hands, feet, legs, thighs, knees, etc. Or common to both, which because they are obvious and well known, I have carelessly repeated, Eaque principia et grandiora tantum, quod reliquum ex libris den anima qui volet accipiat. Inward organical parts, which cannot be seen, are diverse in number, and have several names, functions, and divisions. But that of Laurentius is most notable, into noble or ignoble parts. Of the noble there be three principal parts, to which all the rest belong, and whom they serve brain, heart, liver, according to whose sight three regions, or a three-volt division, is made of the whole body, as first of the head, in which the animal organs are contained, and brain itself, which by his nerves gives sense and motion to the rest, and is, as it were, a privy counsellor and chancellor to the heart. The second region is the chest, or middle belly, in which the heart, as king, keeps his court, and by his arteries communicates life to the whole body. The third region is the lower belly, in which the liver resides as a legat alater, with the rest of those natural organs, 
serving for concoction, nourishment, expelling of excrements. This lower region is distinguished from the upper by the midriff, or diaphragma, and is subdivided again by some into three concavities or regions, upper, middle, and lower. The upper of the hypochondries, in whose right side, is the liver, the left, the spleen, from which is denominated hypochondriacal melancholy. The second of the navel and flanks, divided from the first by the rim. The last of the water course, which is again subdivided into three other parts. The Arabians make two parts of this region, epigastrium and hypogastrium, upper or lower. Epigastrium they call merak, from whence comes merakialis melancholia, sometimes mentioned of them. Of these several regions I will treat in brief a part, and first of the third region, in which the natural organs are contained. The anima, the lower region, natural organs. But you that are readers in the meantime, suppose you were now brought into some sacred temple or majestical palace, as Melanchthon said, to behold not the matter only, but the singular art, workmanship, and counsel of this our great creator. And it is a pleasant and profitable speculation, if it be considered aright. The parts of this region, which present themselves to your consideration and view, are such as serve to nutrition or generation. Those of nutrition serve to the first or second concoction, as the esophagus or gullet, which brings meat and drink into the stomach. The ventricle or stomach, which is seated in the midst of that part of the belly beneath the midriff, the kitchen, as it were, of the first concoction, and which turns our meat into chylus. It hath two mouths, one above, another beneath. The upper is sometimes taken for the stomach itself. The lower and nether door, as Wecker calls it, is named pillarus. This stomach is sustained by a large kel or coal, called omentum, which some will have the same as peritoneum, or rim of the belly. From the stomach to the very fundament are produced the guts, or intestina, which serve a little to alter and distribute the chylus, and convey away the excrements. They are divided into small and great, by reason of their sight and substance, slender or thicker. The slender is duodenum, or whole gut, which is next to the stomach, some twelve inches long, said Fisius. Jejunum, or empty gut, continue it to the other, which hath many mesaraic veins annexed to it, which take part of the chylus to the liver from it. Ilion, the third, which consists of many crinkles, which serves with the rest to receive, keep, and distribute the chylus from the stomach. The thick guts are three, the blind gut, colon, and right gut. The blind is a thick and short gut, having one mouth, in which the ilium and colon meet. It receives the excrements, and conveys them to the colon. This colon hath many windings, that the excrements pass not away too fast. The right gut is straight, and conveys the excrements to the fundament, whose lower part is bound up with certain muscles called sphincters, that the excrements may be the better contained, until such time as a man be willing to go to the stool. In the midst of these guts is situated the mesenterium, or midriff, composed of many veins, arteries, and much fat, serving chiefly to sustain the guts. All these parts serve the first concoction. To the second, which is busied either in refining the good nourishment or expelling the bad, it chiefly belonging the liver, like in colour to congealed blood, the shop of blood, situated in the right hypochondry, in figure like to a half-moon, generosa membrum, Melanchthon styles it, a generous part. It serves to turn the chylus to blood for the nourishment of the body. The excrements of it are either choleric or watery, which the other subordinate parts convey. The gall, placed in the concave of the liver, extracts colour to it, the spleen, melancholy, which is situated on the left side, over against the liver, a spongy matter that draws this black colour to it by a secret virtue, and feeds upon it, conveying the rest to the bottom of the stomach, to stir up appetite, or else to the guts as an excrement. That watery matter the two kidneys expurgate by those emulgent veins and ureters. The emulgent draw this superfluous moisture from the blood, the two ureters convey it to the bladder, which, by reason of his sight in the lower belly, is apt to receive it, having two parts, neck and bottom, 
the bottom holds the water, the neck is constringed with a muscle which, as a porter, keeps the water from running out against our will. Members of generation are common to both sexes, or peculiar to one, which, because they are impertinent to my purpose, I do voluntarily omit. Middle region. Next in order is the middle region, or chest, which comprehends the vital faculties and parts, which, as I have said, is separated from the lower belly by the diaphragma, or midriff, which is a skin consisting of many nerves and membranes, and amongst other uses it hath, is the instrument of laughing. There is also a certain thin membrane, full of sinews, which covereth the whole chest within, and is called pleura, the seat of the disease called pleurisy, when it is inflamed. Some add a third skin, which is termed mediastinums, which divides the chest into two parts, right and left. Of this region the principal part is the heart, which is the seat and fountain of life, of heat, of spirits, of pulse and respiration, the sun of our body, the king and sole commander of it, the seat and organ of all passions and affections, primum vivens, ultimum moriens, it lives first, dies last, in all creatures, of a pyramidical form and not much unlike to a pineapple, a part worthy of admiration, that can yield such variety of affections, by whose motion it is dilated or contracted, to stir and command the humours in the body, as in sorrow, melancholy, in anger, choler, in joy, to send the blood outwardly, in sorrow, to call it in, moving the humours as horses do a chariot. This heart, though it be one sole member, yet it may be divided into two creeks, right and left. The right is like the moon increasing, bigger than the other part, and receives blood from vena cava, distributing some of it to the lungs to nourish them, the rest to the left side to engender spirits. The left creek hath the form of a cone, and is the seed of life, which, as a torch doth oil, draws blood unto it, begetting of it spirits and fire. And as fire in a torch, so are spirits in the blood, and by that great artery called aorta, it sends vital spirits over the body, and takes air from the lungs by that artery which is called venosa, so that both creeks have their vessels, the right two veins, the left two arteries, besides those two common and fractious ears which serve them both, the one to hold blood, the other air, for several uses. The lungs is a thin spongy part like an ox-hoof, saith Fernelius, the town clerk or crier, one terms it, the instrument of voice, as an orator to a king, an ex to the heart, to express their thoughts by voice. That is, the instrument of voice is manifest, in that no creature can speak or utter any voice which wanteth these lights. It is, besides, the instrument of respiration, or breathing, and its office is to cool the heart, by sending air unto it, by the venosal artery, which vein comes to the lungs by the aspa arteria, which consists of many gristles, membranes, nerves, taking in air at the nose and mouth, and by it likewise exhales the fumes of the heart. In the upper region, serving the animal faculties, the chief organ is the brain, which has a soft, marish, and white substance, engendered of the purest part of seed and spirits, included by many skins, and seated within the skull or brain pan, and it is the most noble organ under heaven the dwelling-house and seat of the soul, the habitation of wisdom, memory, judgment, reason, and in which man is most like unto God, and therefore nature hath covered it with a skull of hard bone and two skins or membranes, whereof the one is called dura mater, or meanings, the other pia mater. The dura mater is next to the skull, above the other, which includes and protects the brain. When this is taken away, the pia mater is to be seen, a thin membrane, the next and immediate cover of the brain, and not covering only, but entering into it. The brain itself is divided into two parts, the fore and hinder part. The fore part is much bigger than the other, which is called the little brain, in respect of it. This fore part hath many concavities, distinguished by certain ventricles, which are the receptacles of the spirits brought hither by the arteries from the heart, and are there refined to a more heavenly nature, to perform the actions of the soul. 
Of these ventricles there are three, right, left, and middle. The right and left answer to their sight, and beget animal spirits. If they be any way hurt, sense and motion ceaseth. These ventricles, moreover, are held to be the seat of the common sense. The middle ventricle is a common concourse and cavity of them both, and hath two passages, the one to receive pituita, and the other extends itself to the fourth creek. In this they place imagination and cogitation, and so the three ventricles of the fore part of the brain are used. The fourth creek behind the head is common to the cerebral, or little brain, and marrow of the backbone, the last and most solid of all the rest, which receives the animal spirits from the other ventricles, and conveys them to the marrow in the back, and is the place where they say the memory is seated. End of section 18、section、of the Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume、One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Margaret e s p a y a t The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume One by Robert Burton, Section Nineteen, Partition One, Section One, Member Two, Subsections Five through Eight, Subsection Five, Of the Soul and Her Faculties. According to Aristotle, the soul is defined to be entelecheia, perfectio et actus primus corporis organici vitam habentis in potentia. The perfection or first act of an organical body having power of life which most philosophers approve. But many doubts arise about the essence, subject, seat, distinction, and subordinate faculties of it. For the essence and particular knowledge of all other things it is most hard, be it of man or beast, to discern as Aristotle himself, Tully, Picus Mirandula, Tolle, and other neoteric philosophers confess. We can understand all things by her, but what she is we cannot apprehend. Some, therefore, make one soul, divided into three principal faculties, other three distinct souls. Which question of late hath been much controverted by Picolominius and Zarabel. Paracelsus will have four souls adding to the three grand faculties a spiritual soul, which opinion of his, Campanella, in his book De Censurerum, much labors to demonstrate and prove, because carcasses bleed at the sight of the murderer, with many such arguments. And some again, one soul of all creatures whatsoever, differing only in organs, and that beasts have reason as well as men, though for some defect of organs, not in such measure. Others make a doubt whether it be all in all, and all in every part, which is amply discussed in Zarabel amongst the rest. The common division of the soul is into three principal faculties, vegetal, sensitive, and rational, which make three distinct kinds of living creatures, vegetal plants, sensible beasts, rational men. How these three principal faculties are distinguished and connected, humano ingenio in accessum videtur, is beyond human capacity, as Taurellus, Philip, Flavens, and others suppose. The inferior may be alone, but the superior cannot subsist without the other, so sensible includes vegetal, rational both, which are contained in it, saith Aristotle, ut trigonus in tetragono, as a triangle in a quadrangle. Vegetal soul. Vegetal, the first of the three distinct faculties, is defined to be a substantial act of an organical body, by which it is nourished, augmented, and begets another like unto itself, in which definition three several operations are specified, altrix, octrix, procreatrix. The first is nutrition, whose object is nourishment, meat, drink, and the like, his organ the liver in sensible creatures, in plants the root or sap. His office is to turn the nutriment into the substance of the body nourished, which he performs by natural heat. This nutritive operation hath four other subordinate functions or powers belonging to it attraction, retention, digestion, expulsion. Attraction. 
Attraction is a ministering faculty which, as a lodestone doth iron, draws meat into the stomach, or as a lamp doth oil, and this attractive power is very necessary in plants which suck up moisture by the root, as another mouth into the sap as a like stomach. Retention Retention keeps it being attracted unto the stomach until such time it be concocted, for if it should pass away straight, the body could not be nourished. Digestion Digestion is performed by natural heat, for as the flame of a torch consumes oil, wax, tallow, so doth it alter and digest the nutritive matter. Indigestion is opposite unto it for want of natural heat. Of this digestion there be three differences, maturation, exhalation, assation. Maturation. Maturation is especially observed in the fruits of trees, which are then said to be ripe when the seeds are fit to be sown again. Crudity is opposed to it, which gluttons, epicures, and idle persons are most subject unto, that use no exercise to stir natural heat, or else choke it as too much wood puts out a fire. Exhalation Exhalation is the seething of meat in the stomach by the said natural heat, as meat is boiled in a pot, to which corruption or putrefaction is opposite. Assation Assation is a concoction of the inward moisture by heat. His opposite is semiustulation. Order of Concoction Fourfold Besides these several operations of digestion, there is a fourfold order of concoction. Mastication, or chewing in the mouth. Chilification of this so chewed meat in the stomach. The third is in the liver, to turn this chylus into blood, called sanguification. The last is assimilation, which is in every part. Expulsion Expulsion is a power of nutrition by which it expels all superfluous excrements and relics of meat and drink by the guts, bladder, pores, as by purging, vomiting, spitting, sweating, urine, hairs, nails, etc. Augmentation as this nutritive faculty serves to nourish the body, so doth the augmenting faculty, the second operation or power of the vegetal faculty, to the increasing of it in quantity, according to all dimensions, long, broad, thick, and to make it grow till it come to his due proportion and perfect shape, which hath his period of augmentation as of consumption, and that most certain as the poet observes, Statsua cuique dies, breve et irreparabile tempus, omnibus est vitae. A term of life is set to every man, which is but short, and pass it no one can. Generation. The last of these vegetal faculties is generation, which begets another by means of seed, like unto itself, to the perpetual preservation of the species. To this faculty they ascribe three subordinate operations, the first to turn nourishment into seed, etc. Life and death, concomitants of the vegetal faculties. Necessary concomitants or affections of this vegetal faculty are life and his privation, death. To the preservation of life the natural heat is most requisite, through siccity and humidity, and those first qualities be not excluded. This heat is likewise in plants, as appears by their increasing, fructifying, etc., though not so easily perceived. In all bodies it must have radical moisture to preserve it, that it be not consumed, to which preservation our clime, country, temperature, and the good or bad use of those six non-natural things avail much. For as this natural heat and moisture decays, so doth our life itself, and if not prevented before some violent accident or interrupted through our own default, is in the end dried up by old age and extinguished by death for want of matter, as a lamp for defective oil to maintain it. Subsection 6 Of the Sensible Soul 
Next in order is the sensible faculty, which is as far beyond the other in dignity as a beast is preferred to a plant, having those vegetal powers included in it. "'Tis defined an act of an organical body by which it lives, hath sense, appetite, judgment, breath, and motion. His object in general is a sensible or passable quality, because the sense is affected with it. The general organ is the brain, from which principally the sensible operations are derived. This sensible soul is divided into two parts, apprehending or moving." By the apprehensive power we perceive the species of sensible things present or absent, and retain them as wax doth the print of a seal. By the moving the body is outwardly carried from one place to another, or inwardly moved by spirits and pulse. The apprehensive faculty is subdivided into two parts, inward or outward. Outward as the five senses of touching, hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting, to which you may add Scaliger's sixth sense of titillation as you please, or that of speech, which is the sixth external sense, according to Lullius. Inward are three, common sense, fantasy, memory. Those five outward senses have their object in outward things only, and such as are present, as the eye sees no color except it be at hand, the ear sound. Three of these senses are of commodity, hearing, sight, and smell, two of necessity, touch and taste, without which we cannot live. Besides, the sensitive power is active or passive. Active in sight, the eye sees the color, passive when it is hurt by his object, as the eye by the sunbeams. According to that axiom, visibili forte destruit sensum, or if the object be not pleasing, as a bad sound to the ear, a stinking smell to the nose, etc. Sight. Of these five senses, sight is held to be most precious and the best, and that by reason of his object it sees the whole body at once. By it we learn and discern all things, a sense most excellent for use. To the sight three things are required, the object, the organ, and the medium. The object in general is visible, or that which is to be seen, as colors and all shining bodies. The medium is the illumination of the air which comes from light, commonly called diaphanum, for in dark we cannot see. The organ is the eye, and chiefly the apple of it, by which those optic nerves, concurring both in one, conveys the sight to the common sense. Between the organ and the object a true distance is required, that it be not too near or too far off. Many excellent questions appertain to this sense, discussed by philosophers, as whether this sight be caused intramitendo, vel extramitendo, etc., by receiving in the visible species, or sending of them out, which Plato, Plutarch, Macrobius, Lactantius, and others dispute. And, besides, it is the subject of the perspectives, of which Alhazen the Arabian, Vitellio, Roger Bacon, Baptista Porta, Guidas Ubaldus, Aquilonius, etc., have written whole volumes. Hearing a most excellent outward sense, by which we learn and get knowledge. His object is sound, or that which is heard, the medium air, organ the ear. To the sound which is a collision of the air three things are required, a body to strike, as the hand of a musician, the body struck, which must be solid and able to resist, as a bell, lute string, not wool or sponge, the medium, the air, which is inward or outward, the outward being struck or collided by a solid body, till strikes the next air, until it come to that inward natural air, which, as an exquisite organ, is contained in a little skin formed like a drumhead, and struck upon by certain small instruments like drumsticks, conveys the sound by a pair of nerves appropriate to that use, to the common sense, as to a judge of sounds. There is great variety and much delight in them, for the knowledge of which consult with Bothius and other musicians. Smelling 
Smelling is an outward sense which apprehends by the nostrils drawing in air, and of all the rest it is the weakest sense in men. The organ is the nose, or two small hollow pieces of flesh a little above it. The medium, the air to men, as water to fish. The object, smell, arising from a mixed body resolved, which, whether it be a quality, fume, vapor, or exhalation, I will not now dispute, or of their differences and how they are caused. This sense is an organ of health, as sight and hearing, saith Agellius, are of discipline and that by avoiding bad smells, as by choosing good, which do as much alter and affect the body many times, as diet itself. Taste. Taste, a necessary sense, which perceives all savors by the tongue and palate, and that by means of a thin spittle or watery juice. His organ is the tongue with his tasting nerves, the medium a watery juice, the object, taste, or savor, which is a quality in the juice, arising from the mixture of things tasted. Some make eight species or kinds of savor, bitter, sweet, sharp, salt, etc., all which sick men, as in an ague, cannot discern by reason of their organs misaffected. TOUCHING Touch, the last of the senses, and most ignoble, yet of as great necessity as the other, and of as much pleasure. This sense is exquisite in men, and by his nerves dispersed all over the body, perceives any tactile quality. His organ the nerves, his object those first qualities, hot, dry, moist, cold, and those that follow them, hard, soft, thick, thin, etc. Many delightsome questions are moved by philosophers about these five senses, their organs, objects, mediums, for which brevity I omit. Subsection 7. Of the Inward Senses. Common Sense. Inner senses are three in number, so called because they be within the brain pan as common sense, fantasy, memory. Their objects are not only things present, but they perceive the sensible species of things to come, past, absent, such as were there before in the sense. This common sense is the judge or moderator of the rest, by whom we discern all differences of objects. For by mine eye I do not know that I see, or by mine ear that I hear, but by my common sense, who judgeth of sounds and colors. They are but the organs to bring the species to be censured so that all their objects are his, and all their offices are his. The fore part of the brain is his organ or seat. Fantasy Fantasy, or imagination, which some call estimative or cogitative, confirmed, saith Fernelius, by frequent meditation, is an inner sense which doth more fully examine the species perceived by common sense, of things present or absent, and keeps them longer, recalling them to mind again, or making new of his own. In time of sleep this faculty is free, and many times conceives strange, stupend, absurd shapes, as in sick men we commonly observe. His organ is the middle cell of the brain, his objects, all the species, communicated to him by the common sense, by comparison of which he feigns infinite other unto himself. In melancholy men this faculty is most powerful and strong, and often hurts, producing many monstrous and prodigious things, especially if it be stirred up by some terrible object, presented to it from common sense or memory. In poets and painters, imagination forcibly works, as appears by their several fictions, antics, images, as Ovid's House of Sleep, Psyche's Palace in Apuleius, etc. In men it is subject and governed by reason, or at least should be, but in brutes it hath no superior, and is ratio brutorum, in all the reason they have. Memory Memory lays up all the species which the senses have brought in, and records them as a good register, that they may be forthcoming when they are called for by fantasy and reason. 
His object is the same with fantasy, his seat and organ the back part of the brain. Affections of the senses, sleep and waking. The affections of these senses are sleep and waking, common to all sensible creatures. Sleep is a rest or binding of the outward senses, and of the common sense, for the preservation of body and soul, as Scaliger defines it. For when the common sense resteth, the outward senses rest also. The fantasy alone is free, and his commander reason, as appears by those imaginary dreams which are of diverse kinds, natural, divine, demoniacal, etc., which vary according to the humors, diet, actions, objects, etc., of which Artemidorus, Cardinus, and Sambacus, with their several interpretators, have written great volumes. This litigation of senses proceeds from an inhibition of spirits, the way being stopped by which they should come. This stopping is caused of vapors arising out of the stomach, filling the nerves, by which the spirits should be conveyed. When these vapors are spent, the passage is open, and the spirits perform their accustomed duties, so that waking is the action and motion of the senses, which the spirits dispersed over all parts cause. Subsection 8 Of the Moving Faculty Appetite this moving faculty is the other power of the sensitive soul, which causeth all those inward and outward animal motions in the body. It is divided into two faculties, the power of appetite and of moving from place to place. This of appetite is threefold, so some will have it, natural as it signifies any such inclination, as of a stone to fall downward and such actions as retention, expulsion, which depend not on sense, but are vegetal, as the appetite of meat and drink, hunger and thirst. Sensitive is common to men and brutes. Voluntary the third, or intellective, which commands the other two in men, and is a curb unto them, or at least should be, but for the most part is captivated and overruled by them, and men are led like beasts by sense, giving reins to their concupiscence and several lusts. For by this appetite the soul is led or inclined to follow that good which the senses shall approve, or avoid that which they hold evil. His object being good or evil, the one he embraceth, the other he rejecteth, according to that aphorism, omnia appetunt bonum, all things seek their own good or at least seeming good. This power is inseparable from sense, for where sense is, there are likewise pleasure and pain. His organ is the same with common sense, and is divided into two powers or inclinations, concupiscible or irascible, or, as one translates it, coveting, anger invading, or impugning. Concupiscible covets always pleasant and delightsome things, and abhors that which is distasteful, harsh, and unpleasant. Irascible, quasi aversans per irem et odium, as avoiding it with anger or indignation. All affections and perturbations arise out of these two fountains, which, although the Stoics make light of, we hold natural and not to be resisted. The good affections are caused by some object of the same nature, and, if present, they procure joy, which dilates the heart and preserves the body. If absent, they cause hope, love, desire, and concupiscence. The bad are simple or mixed. Simple for some bad object present, as sorrow, which contracts the heart, macerates the soul, subverts the good estate of the body, hindering all the operations of it causing melancholy, and many times death itself, or future as fear. Out of these two arise those mixed affections and passions of anger, which is a desire of revenge, hatred, which is inveterate anger, zeal, which is offended with him who hurts that he loves, and epikairekakia, a compound affection of joy and hate, when we rejoice at other men's mischief 
and are grieved at their prosperity. Pride, self-love, emulation, envy, shame, etc., of which elsewhere. Moving from place to place is a faculty necessarily following the other, for in vain were it otherwise to desire and to abhor, if we had not likewise power to prosecute or eschew by moving the body from place to place. By this faculty thereof we locally move the body, or any part of it, to go from one place to another. To the better performance of which three things are requisite, that which moves, by what it moves, that which is moved. That which moves is either the efficient cause or end. The end is the object which is desired or eschewed, as in a dog to catch a hare, etc. The admirable league of nature, and by meditation of the spirit, commands the organ by which it moves, and that consists of nerves, muscles, cords, dispersed through the whole body, contracted and relaxed as the spirit's will, which move the muscles or nerves in the midst of them, and draw the cord, and so per consequence the joint, to the place intended. That which is moved is the body or some member apt to move. The motion of the body is diverse, as going, running, leaping, dancing, sitting, and such like, referred to the predicament of situs. Worms creep, birds fly, fishes swim, and so of parts, the chief of which is respiration or breathing, and is thus performed. The outward air is drawn in by the vocal artery, and sent by mediation of the midriff to the lungs, which, dilating themselves as a pair of bellows, reciprocally fetch it in, and send it out to the heart to cool it, from thence now being hot, convey it again, still taking in fresh. Such a like motion is that of the pulse, of which, because many have written whole books, I will say nothing. End of section 19 Section 20 of The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1, by Robert Burton. Section 20. Partition 1, Section 1, Member 2, Subsections 9 to 11. Subsection 11. Of the Rational Soul. In the precedent subsections, I have anatomized those inferior faculties of the soul. The rational remaineth, a pleasant but a doubtful subject, as one terms it, and with the like brevity to be discussed. Many erroneous opinions are about the essence and original of it, whether it be fire, as Zeno held, harmony, as Aristoxenus, number as Xenocrates, whether it be organical or inorganical, seated in the brain, heart, or blood, mortal or immortal, how it comes into the body. Some hold that it is ex traduce, as Tertullian, Lactantius, De Opificium Dei, chapter 9, Hugo, Liber de Spiritu et Anima, Vincentius Bellavacensis, Speculum Naturale, book 23, chapters 2 and 11, Hippocrates, Avicenna, and many late writers, that one man begets another, body and soul, or as a candle from a candle, to be produced from the seed. Otherwise, say they, a man begets but half a man, and is worse than a beast that begets both matter and form. And besides, the three faculties of the soul must be together infused, which is most absurd, as they hold, because in beasts they are begot, the two inferior. I mean and may not well be separated in men. Gallen supposeth the soul crassin esse to be the temperature itself. Trismegistus, Musaeus, Orpheus, Homer, Pindarus, Pharisides, Ceres, Epictetus, with the Chaldees and the Egyptians, affirmed the soul to be immortal, as did those British druids of old. The Pythagoreans defend metempsychosis and palingonasia that souls go from one body to another. Epota prius lethes unda, as men into wolves, bears, dogs, hogs, as they were inclined in their lives, or participated in conditions. 
inque ferinas, possumus ire domus, pecudumque incorpora condi. Lucian's cock was first Euphorbus, a captain. Ile ego, nam memeni, Trojani tempore belli, Panthoides Euphorbus eram, a horse, a man, a sponge. Julian the Apostate thought Alexander's soul was descended into his body, Plato in Timaeo, and in his, Phaedon, for aught I can perceive, differs not much from this opinion, that it was from God at first, and knew all, but being enclosed in the body it forgets, and learns anew, which he calls reminiscentia, or recalling, and that it was put into the body for a punishment, and thence it goes into a beast's, or man's, as appears by his pleasant fiction De Sortitione Animarum, Book Ten, and after ten thousand years is to return into the former body again. Post varios annos per mille figuras, rursus ad humane fertur primordia vita. Others deny the immortality of it, which Pomponatus of Padua decided out of Aristotle not long since. Plinius Avunculus, Chapter One, Book Two and Book Seven, Chapter Fifty Five. Seneca, Book Seven, Epistula ad Lucilium, Epistula Fifty Five. Dicearchus in Tuli Tusculanus Disputationibus, Epicurus, Aratus, Hippocrates, Galen, Lucretius, Book One. Preteria gigni pariter cum corpore, et una crescere sentimus pariterque senesera mentem. Averroes, and I know not how many Neoterics. This question of the immortality of the soul is diversely and wonderfully impugned and disputed, especially among the Italians of late, saith Johannes Colerus, Liber de Immortalite Anime, Chapter 1. The popes themselves have doubted of it. Leo Decimus, that Epicurean pope, as some record of him, caused this question to be discussed pro and con before him, and concluded at last, as a profane and atheistical moderator, with that verse of Cornelius Gallus, et redit in nilium quod fuit ante nihil. It began of nothing, and in nothing it ends. Zeno and his Stoics, as Austin quotes him, supposed the soul so long to continue till the body was fully putrefied, and resolved into materia prima. But after that, in fumos evanescere, to be extinguished and vanished, and in the meantime, whilst the body was consuming, it wandered all abroad, et e longinquo multa annunciare, and, as that Clasomenian Hermitimus averred, saw pretty visions, and suffered I know not what. Errant exangue sine corpore et ossibus umbre. Others grant the immortality thereof, but they make many fabulous fictions in the meantime of it, after the departure from the body, like Plato's Elysian field and that turkey paradise. The souls of good men they deified, the bad, saith Austin, became devils, as they supposed, with many such absurd tenets which he hath confuted. Hirome, Austin, and other fathers of the church hold that the soul is immortal, created of nothing, and so infused into the child or embryo in his mother's womb six months after the conception, not as those of brutes which are ex traduce, and dying with them vanish into nothing to whose divine treatises and to the scriptures themselves I rejourn all such atheistical spirits as Tully did Atticus, doubting of this point to Plato's Phaedon. Or if they desire philosophical proofs and demonstrations, I refer them to Niphus, Faventinus's tracts of this subject, to Francis and John Picus in Digress, De Anima, Tholosanus, Eugubinus, Soto, Canus, Thomas, Parisius, Dandinus, Colerus, to that elaborate tract in Zanchius, to Tolet's sixty reasons, and Lessius's twenty-two arguments, to prove the immortality of the soul. Campanella, book De Sensu Rerum, is large in the same discourse. Albertinus the schoolman, Jacobus Nectantus, tome two, handleth it in four questions. Antony Brunus, Aeonius Pelarius, Marinus Marcenus, with many others. This reasonable soul, which Austin calls a spiritual substance moving itself, is defined by philosophers to be the first substantial act of a natural, humane, organical body, by which a man lives, perceives, and understands, freely doing all things, and with election. 
out of which definition we may gather that this rational soul includes the powers and performs the duties of the other two, which are contained in it, and all three faculties make one soul, which is inorganical of itself, although it be in all parts, and incorporeal, using their organs and working by them. It is divided into two chief parts, differing in office only, not in essence. The understanding, which is the rational power apprehending, the will, which is the rational power moving, to which two all the other rational powers are subject and reduced. Subsection 10 Of the Understanding Understanding is a power of the soul by which we perceive, know, remember, and judge as well singulars as universals, having certain innate notices or beginnings of arts, a reflecting action by which it judges of its own doings, and examines them. Out of this definition, besides his chief office, which is to apprehend, judge all that he performs without the help of any instruments or organs, three differences appear betwixt a man and a beast. As first, the sense only comprehends singularities, the understanding, universalities. Secondly, the sense hath no innate notions. Thirdly, brutes cannot reflect upon themselves. Bees, indeed, make neat and curious works, and many other creatures besides, but when they have done, they cannot judge of them. His object is God, hence, all nature, and whatever is to be understood, which successively it apprehends. The object first moving the understanding is some sensible thing. After, by discoursing, the mind finds out the corporeal substance, and from thence the spiritual. His actions, some say, are apprehension, composition, division, discoursing, reasoning, memory, which some include in invention, and judgment. The common divisions are of the understanding, agent and patient, speculative and practical, in habit or in act, simple or compound. The agent is that which is called the wit of man, acumen or subtlety, sharpness of invention, when he doth invent of himself without a teacher, or learns anew, which abstracts those intelligible species from the fantasy, and transfers them to the passive understanding because there is nothing in the understanding which was not first in the sense. That which the imagination hath taken from the sense, this agent judgeth of, whether it be true or false, and being so judged, he commits it to the passable to be kept. The agent is a doctor or teacher, the passive a scholar, and his office is to keep and further judge of such things as are committed to his charge, as a bare and raised table at first, capable of all forms and notions, now these notions are twofold, actions or habits, actions by which we take notions of and perceive things, habits which are durable lights and notions which we may use when we will. Some reckon up eight kinds of them, sense, experience, intelligence, faith, suspicion, error, opinion, science, to which are added art, prudency, wisdom, as also synteresis, dictamen rationis, conscience, so that in all there be fourteen species of the understanding, of which some are innate, as the three last mentioned, the other are gotten by doctrine, learning, and use. Plato will have all to be innate. Aristotle reckons up but five intellectual habits, two practical as prudency, whose end is to practice, to fabricate, wisdom to comprehend the use and experiments of all notions and habits whatsoever. Which division of Aristotle, if it be considered aright, is all one with the precedent? For three being innate and five acquisite, the rest are improper, imperfect, and in a more strict examination, excluded. Of all these I should more amply dilate, but my subject will not permit. Three of them I will only point at, as more necessary to my following discourse. Synteresis, or the purer part of the conscience, is an innate habit, and doth signify a conversation of the knowledge of the law of God in nature, to know good or evil and, as our divines hold, it is rather in the understanding than in the will. This makes the major proposition in a practical syllogism. The dictamen rationis is that which doth admonish us to do good or evil, and is the minor in the syllogism. The conscience is that which approves good or evil, justifying or condemning our actions, and is the conclusion of the syllogism, as in that familiar example of Regulus the Roman, taken prisoner by the Carthaginians, and suffered to go to Rome, on that condition he should return again, or pay so much for his ransom. 
the Sinteresis proposeth the question. His word, oath, promise is to be religiously kept, although to his enemy, and that by the law of nature. Do not that to another which thou wouldst not have done to thyself. Dictamen applies it to him, and dictates this or the like. Regulus, thou wouldst not another man should falsify his oath or break promise with thee. Conscience concludes, therefore, Regulus, thou dost well to perform thy promise, and oughtest to keep thine oath. More of this in religious melancholy. Subsection 11. Of the Will. Will is the other power of the rational soul, which covets or avoids such things as have been before judged and apprehended by the understanding. If good, it approves. If evil, it abhors it. So that his object is either good or evil. Aristotle calls this our rational appetite. For as in the sensitive, we are moved to good or bad by our appetite, ruled and directed by sense. So in this we are carried by reason. Besides, the sensitive appetite hath a particular object, good or bad. This an universal immaterial. That respects only things delectable and pleasant. This honest. Again, they differ in liberty. The sensual appetite seeing an object, if it be a convenient good, cannot but desire it. If evil, avoid it. But this is free in his essence, much now depraved, obscured, and fallen from his first perfection. Yet in some of his operations still free as to go, walk, move at his pleasure, and to choose whether it will do or not do, steal or not steal. Otherwise, in vain were laws, deliberations, exhortations, counsels, precepts, rewards, promises, threats, and punishments. And God should be the author of sin. But in spiritual things we will no good, prone to evil, except we be regenerate and led by the Spirit. We are egged on by our natural concupiscence, and there is an ataxia, ataraxia, a confusion in our powers. Our whole will is averse from God and his law, not in natural things only, as to eat and drink, lust, to which we are led headlong by our temperature and inordinate appetite. Nec nos obniti contra, nec tendere tantum sificimus. We cannot resist. Our concupiscence is originally bad, our heart evil. The seat of our affections captivates and enforceth our will. So that in voluntary things we are averse from God and goodness, bad by nature, by ignorance worse, by art, discipline, custom, we get many bad habits, suffering them to domineer and tyrannize over us. And the devil is still ready at hand with his evil suggestions to tempt our depraved will to some ill-disposed action, to precipitate us to destruction, except our will be swayed and counterpoised again with some divine precepts and good motions of the spirit which many times restrain, hinder, and check us, when we are in the full career of our dissolute courses. So David corrected himself when he had Saul at advantage. Revenge and malice were as two violent appuners on the one side, but honesty, religion, fear of God withheld him on the other. The actions of the will are vele and nole, to will and nil, which two words comprehend all, and they are good or bad accordingly as they are directed and some of them freely performed by himself. Although the Stoics absolutely deny it, and will have all things inevitably done by destiny, imposing a fatal necessity upon us, which we may not resist, yet we say that our will is free in respect of us, and things contingent, howsoever in respect of God's determinate counsel, they are inevitable and necessary. Some other actions of the will are performed by the inferior powers, which obey him as the sensitive and moving appetite, as to open our eyes, to go hither and thither, not to touch a book, to speak fair or foul. But this appetite is many times rebellious in us, and will not be contained within the lists of sobriety and temperance. It was, as I said, once well agreeing with reason, and there was an excellent consent and harmony between them. But that is now dissolved. They often jar. Reason is overborne by passion. Fertur equis origa, nec audit curus habinas. As so many wild horses run away with a chariot and will not be curbed. We know many times what is good, but will not do it. As she said, Trahit in vitum nova vis, aliud que cupido, mens aliud suadit. Lust counsels one thing, reason another. There is a new reluctancy in men. Odi nec possum cupiens non esse, quod odi. We cannot resist, but as Phaedra confessed to her nurse, que locuris vera sunt, sed furu sugerit sequi pejora. She said well and true, she did acknowledge it, 
but headstrong passion and fury made her to do that which was opposite. So David knew the filthiness of his fact, what a loathsome, foul, crying sin adultery was, yet notwithstanding he would commit murder and take away another man's wife, enforced against reason, religion, to follow his appetite. Those natural and vegetal powers are not commanded by will at all, for who can add one cubit to his stature? These other may, but are not. And thence come all those headstrong passions, violent perturbations of the mind, and many times vicious habits, customs, feral diseases, because we give so much way to our appetite and follow our inclination, like so many beasts. The principal habits are two in number, virtue and vice, whose peculiar definitions, descriptions, differences, and kinds are handled at large in the ethics, and are indeed the subject of moral philosophy. End of section 20《ヴォリューム1ヴォリューム1ヴォリューム1ヴォリューム1ヴォリューム1ヴォリューム1ヴォリューム1ヴォリューム1ヴォリューム1ヴォリューム1ヴォリューム1ヴォリューム1ヴォリューム1ヴォリューム1ヴォリューム1ヴォリューム1ヴォリューム1ヴォリューム1ヴォリューム1ヴォリューム1ヴォリューム1ヴォリューム1ヴォリューム1ヴォリューム1ヴォリューム1ヴォリューム1ヴォリューム1ヴォ Difference. Having thus briefly anatomized the body and soul of man as a preparative to the rest, I may now freely proceed to treat of my intended object, to most men's capacity, and after many ambages, perspicuously define what this melancholy is, show his name and differences. The name is imposed from the matter, and disease denominated from the material cause, as Brule observes. Melancholia, melancholia, Quasi melina coli, melina cole, from black cola, and whether it be a cause or an effect, a disease or symptom, let Donatus Altomarus and Salvianus decide, I will not contend about it. It hath several descriptions, notations, and definitions. Fracastorius, in his second book of intellect, calls those melancholy, whom abundance of that same depraved humour of black colour hath so misaffected, that they become mad thence, and dote in most things, or in all belong to election, will, or other manifest operations of the understanding. Melanelius out of Galen, Rufus, Aetus, describe it to be a bad and peevish disease, which makes men degenerate into beasts. Galen, a privation or infection of the middle cell of the head, etc., defining it from the part affected, which Hercules de Saxonia approves, Book 1, Chapter 16, calling it a deprivation of the principal function. Fuchsius, Book 1, Chapter 23, Arnoldus Breviar, Book 1, Chapter 18, Guianarius and others. By reason of black collar, Paulus Hyliabas simply calls it a commotion of the mind. Arateus, a perpetual anguish of the soul, fastened on one thing, without an ague, which definition of his, Mercurialis de Affectionibus, Book 1, Chapter 10, taxeth, but Aelianus Montaltus defends. Liber de Morbis, Chapter 1, for sufficient and good. The common sort define it to be a kind of dotage without a fever, having for his ordinary companions fear and sadness, without any apparent occasion. So doth Laurentius, chapter 4, Piso, book 1, chapter 43, Donatus Altomarus, Jacinus, Racis ad Almansor, Valesius, Fucius, etc., which common definition, howsoever approved by most, Hercules de Saxonia will not allow of, nor David Crucius. He holds it insufficient, as rather showing what it is not than what it is, as omitting the specific difference, the fantasy and brain. But I descend to particulars. The summum genus is dotage, or anguish of the mind, saith Arateus, of the principal parts, Hercules de Saxonia adds, to distinguish it from cramp and palsy, and such diseases as belong to the outward sense and motions, depraved, to distinguish it from folly and madness, which Montaltus makes angle animi, to separate, in which those functions are not depraved, but rather abolished, without an ague, is added by all, to sever it from frenzy and that melancholy which is in a pestilent fever. Fear and sorrow make it differ from madness. 
without a cause is lastly inserted to specify it from all other ordinary passions of fear and sorrow. We properly call that dotage, as Laurentius interprets it, when some one principal faculty of the mind, as imagination or reason is corrupted, as all melancholy persons have. It is without a fever, because the humour is most part cold and dry, contrary to putrefaction. Fear and sorrow are the true characters and inseparable companions of most melancholy, not all, as Hercules de Saxonia, Tractatus de Postumo de Melancholia, chapter 2, well accepts, for to some it is most pleasant, as to such as laugh most part. Some are bold again, and free from all manner of fear and grief, as hereafter shall be declared. Subsection 2. Of the part affected. Affection. Parties affected. Some difference I find amongst writers about the principal part affected in this disease, whether it be the brain or heart or some other member. Most are of the opinion that it is the brain, for being a kind of dotage, it cannot otherwise be but that the brain must be affected, as a similar part, be it by consent or essence, not in his ventricles, or any obstructions in them, for then it would be an apoplexy or epilepsy, as Laurentius well observes, but in a cold, dry, distemperature of it in its substance, which is corrupt, and become too cold, or too dry, or else too hot, as in madmen, and such as are inclined to it. And this Hippocrates confirms, Galen, the Arabians, and most of our new writers. Marcus de Odis, in a consultation of his, quoted by Hildesheim, and five others there cited, are of the contrary part, because fear and sorrow, which are passions, be seated in the heart. But this objection is sufficiently answered by Montaltus, who doth not deny that the heart is affected, as Melanelius proves out of Galen, by reason of his vicinity, and so is the midriff and many other parts. They do comparti, and have a fellow feeling by the law of nature. But forasmuch as this malady is caused by precedent imagination, with the appetite, to whom spirits obey, and are subject to those principal parts, the brain must needs primarily be misaffected, as the seat of reason, and then the heart, as the seat of affection. Capivaccius and Mercurialis have copiously discussed this question, and both conclude the subject is the inner brain, and from thence it is communicated to the heart and other inferior parts, which sympathize and are much troubled, especially when it comes by consent, and is caused by reason of the stomach, or mirach, as the Arabians term it, whole body, liver or spleen, which are seldom free, pylorus, mesariac veins, etc. For our body is like a clock, if one wheel be amiss, all the rest are disordered, the whole fabric suffers, with such admirable art and harmony is a man composed, such excellent proportion, as Ludovicus Vives in his fable of man hath elegantly declared. As many doubts almost arise about the affection, whether it be imagination or reason alone, or both, Hercules de Saxonia proves it out of Galen, Aetius and Altomarus, that the sole fault is in imagination. Bruel is of the same mind. Montaltus, in his second chapter of Melancholy, confutes this tenet of theirs, and illustrates the contrary by many examples. As of him that thought himself a shellfish, of a nun, and of a desperate monk that would not be persuaded but that he was damned. Reason was in fault as well as imagination, which did not correct this error. They make away themselves oftentimes, and suppose many absurd and ridiculous things. Why doth not reason detect the fallacy, settle and persuade, if she be free? Avicenna therefore holds both corrupt, to whom most Arabians subscribe. The same is maintained by Aretas, Gorgonius, Guianarius, etc. To end the controversy, no man doubts of imagination, but that it is hurt and misaffected here. For the other I determine with Albertinus Botonus, a doctor of Padua, that it is first in imagination, and afterwards in reason if the disease be inveterate, or as it is more or less of continuance, but by accident, as Hercules de Saxonia adds, faith, opinion, discourse, ratiocination, are all accidentally depraved by the default of the imagination. Parties affected To the part affected, I may here add the parties, which shall be more opportunely spoken of elsewhere, now only signified. Such as have the moon, Saturn, Mercury, 
misaffected in their genitures, such as live in over-cold or over-hot climes, such as are born of melancholy parents, as offend in those six non-natural things, are black, or of a high sanguine complexion, that have little heads, that have a hot heart, moist brain, hot liver and cold stomach, have been long sick, such as are solitary by nature, great students, given to much contemplation, lead a life out of action, are most subject to melancholy. Of sexes both, but men more often, yet women misaffected are far more violent and grievously troubled. Of seasons of the year, the autumn is most melancholy, of peculiar times, old age, from which natural melancholy is almost an inseparable accident. But this artificial malady is more frequent in such as are of a middle age. Some assign forty years, Gario Pontus thirty. Dubertus accepts neither young nor old from this adventitious. Daniel Sinertus involves all of all sorts, out of common experience, in omnibus omnino corporibus, cujus cunque constitutionis dominator. Aetius and Aretius ascribe into the number not only discontented, passionate and miserable persons, swarthy, black, but such as are most merry and pleasant, scoffers and high-coloured. Generally, saith Rhesus, the finest wits and most generous spirits are before other obnoxious to it. I cannot accept any complexion, any condition, sex or age, but fools and stoics which, according to Synesius, are never troubled with any manner of passion. But, as Anacreon cicada, sine sanguine et dolore, similes fere diis sunt. Erasmus vindicates fools from this melancholy catalogue, because they have most part moist brains and light hearts. They are free from ambition, envy, shame and fear. They are neither troubled in conscience, nor macerated with cares, to which our whole life is most subject. Subsection 3. Of the Matter of Melancholy of the matter of melancholy there is much question betwixt Avicen and Galen, as you may read in Cardan's Contradictions, Valesius Controversies, Montanus, Prosper Calenus, Capivaccius, Bright, Ficinus, that have written either whole tracts or copiously of it, in their several treatises of this subject. What this humour is, or whence it proceeds, how it is engendered in the body, neither Galen nor any old writer hath sufficiently discussed, as Jacinus thinks. The Neoterics cannot agree. Montanus, in his consultations, holds melancholy to be material or immaterial, and so doth Arculanus. The material is one of the four humours before mentioned, and natural. The immaterial or adventitious, acquisite, redundant, unnatural, artificial, which Hercules de Saxonia will have reside in the spirits alone, and to proceed from a hot, cold, dry, moist distemperature, which, without matter, alter the brain and functions of it. Paracelsus wholly rejects and derides this division of four humours and complexions, but our Galenists generally approve of it, subscribing to this opinion of Montanus. This material melancholy is either simple or mixed, offending in quantity or quality, varying according to his place, where it settleth, as in brain, spleen, mesoraic veins, heart, womb, and stomach, or differing according to the mixture of those natural humours amongst themselves, or four unnatural adust humours, as they are diversely tempered and mingled. If natural melancholy abound in the body, which is cold and dry, so that it be more than the body is well able to bear, it must needs be distempered, saith Paventius, and diseased, and so the other, if it be depraved, whether it arise from that other melancholy, of colour a dust, or from blood, produceth the like effects, and is, as Montatus contends, if it come by a dustion of humours, most part hot and dry. Some difference I find, whether this melancholy matter be engendered of all four humours, about the colour and temper of it. Galen holds it may be engendered of three alone, excluding phlegm or pituita, whose true assertion Valesius and Menardus stiffly maintain, and so doth Fucius, Montaltus, Montanus. How, say they, can white become black? But Hercules de Saxonia and Cardan are of the opposite part. It may be engendered of phlegm, 
et si raro contingat, though it seldom come to pass. So is Guianerius and Laurentius, with Melanctius in his book De Anima, and chapter of humours, he calls it asininum, dull, swinish melancholy, and saith that he was an eyewitness of it. So is Wecker. From melancholy a dust ariseth one kind, from choler another, which is most brutish, another from phlegm, which is dull, and the last from blood, which is best. Of these some are cold and dry, others hot and dry, varying according to their mixtures, as they are intended and remitted. And indeed, as Rodericus Afonseca determines, eichors and those serious matters being thickened become phlegm, and phlegm degenerates into choler. Choler a dust becomes eruginosa melancholia, as vinegar out of purest wine putrefied, or by exhalation of pure spirits, is so made, and becomes sour and sharp, and from the sharpness of this humour proceeds much waking, troublesome thoughts and dreams, etc., so that I conclude as before. If the humour be cold, it is, saith Paventinus, a cause of dotage, and produceth milder symptoms. If hot, they are rash, raving mad, or inclining to it. If the brain be hot, the animal spirits are hot. Much madness follows with violent actions. If cold, fatuity and sottishness. Capivatius. The colour of this mixture varies likewise according to the mixture, be it hot or cold. Tis sometimes black, sometimes not. Altomarus. The same Melanalius proves out of Galen, and Hippocrates in his book of melancholy, if at least it be his, giving instance of a burning coal which, when it is hot, shines, when it is cold, looks black, and so doth the humour. This diversity of melancholy matter produceth diversity of effects. If it be within the body and not putrefied, it causeth black jaundice, if putrefied, a quartan ague. If it breaks out to the skin, leprosy. If to parts, several maladies, as scurvy, etc. If it trouble the mind, as it is diversely mixed, it produceth several kinds of madness and dotage, of which in their place. Subsection 4. Of the species or kinds of melancholy. When the matter is diverse and confused, how should it otherwise be, but that the species should be diverse and confused? Many new and old writers have spoken confusedly of it, confounding melancholy and madness, as Hernius, Guianerius, Gordonius, Salustius, Salvianus, Jason Fratensis, Savanarola, that will have madness no other than melancholy in extent, differing, as I have said, in degrees. Some make two distinct species, as Rufus Ephesius, an old writer, Constantinus Africanus, Arateus, Aurelianus, Paulus Aegineta otherwise acknowledge a multitude of kinds, and leave them indefinite, as Aetius in his Tretra Biblios, Avicenna, Arculanus, Montanus. If natural melancholy be a dust, it maketh one kind, if blood another, if choler a third, differing from the first, and so many several opinions there are about the kinds, as there be men themselves. Hercules de Saxonia sets down two kinds, material and immaterial one from spirits alone, the other from humours and spirits. Savanarola, de egritudinibus capitis, will have the kinds to be infinite, one from the mirac, called miracialis of the Arabians, another stomachalis, from the stomach, another from the liver, heart, womb, haemorrhoids, one beginning, another consummate. Melanchthon seconds him, as the humour is diversely a dust and mixed, so are the species diverse. But what these men speak of species I think ought to be understood of symptoms, and so doth Arculanus interpret himself. Infinite species id est symptoms, and in that sense, as Gorius acknowledgeth in his medical definitions, the species are infinite, but they may be reduced to three kinds by reason of their seat, head, body, and hypochondries. This threefold division is approved by Hippocrates in his book of Melancholy, if it be his which some suspect, by Galen, book 3, De Locus Affectis, chapter 6, by Alexander, book 1, chapter 16, Rasis, Avicenna, and most of our new writers. Thomas Erastus makes two kinds, one perpetual, which is head melancholy, the other interrupt, which comes and goes by fits, which he subdivides into the other two kinds, so that all comes to the same pass. 
Some again make four or five kinds, with Rodericus a Castro, de Morbus Mulierum, Book 2, Chapter 3, and Lodovicus Mercatus, who will have that melancholy of nuns, widows, and more ancient maids, to be a peculiar species of melancholy differing from the rest. Some will reduce enthusiasts, ecstatical and demoniacal persons to this rank, adding love melancholy to the first, and lycanthropia. The most received division is into three kinds. The first proceeds from the sole fault of the brain and is called head melancholy. The second sympathetically proceeds from the whole body, when the whole temperature is melancholy. The third ariseth from the bowels, liver, spleen, or membrane, called mesenterium, named hypochondriacal or windy melancholy, which Laurentius subdivides into three parts, from those three members, hepatic, splenatic, mesoraic. Love melancholy, which Avicenna calls elishi, and lycanthropia, which he calls cucubuse, are commonly included in head melancholy. But of this last, which Gerardus de Solo calls amoreus, and most night melancholy, with that of religious melancholy, virginum et viduarum, maintained by Rodericus Acasto and Mercatus, and other kinds of love melancholy, I will speak of apart by themselves in my third partition. The three precedent species are the subject of my present discourse, which I will anatomize and treat of through all their causes, symptoms, cures, together and apart, that every man that is in any measure affected with this malady may know how to examine it in himself and apply remedies unto it. It is a hard matter, I confess, to distinguish these three species one from the other, to express their several causes, symptoms, cures, being that they are so often confounded amongst themselves, having such affinity that they can scarce be discerned by the most accurate physicians, and so often intermixed with other diseases, that the best experienced have been plunged. Montanus names a patient that had this disease of melancholy and caninus appetitus both together, and with vertigo. Julius Caesar Claudinus with stone, gout, jaundice. Trincavellius with an ague, jaundice, caninus appetitus, etc. Paulus Regoline, a great doctor in his time, consulted in this case, was so confounded with a confusion of symptoms that he knew not to what kind of melancholy to refer it. Trincavellius, Fallopius, and Francanthanus, famous doctors in Italy, all three conferred with about one party at the same time, gave three different opinions. And in another place, Trincavellius being demanded what he thought of a melancholy young man to whom he was sent for, ingeniously confessed that he was indeed melancholy, but he knew not what kind to reduce it. In his seventeenth consultation, there is the like disagreement about a melancholy monk. Those symptoms which others ascribe to misaffected parts and humours, Hercules de Saxonia attributes wholly to distempered spirits, and those immaterial, as I have said. Sometimes they cannot well discern this disease from others. In Renarius Solenander's counsels, he and Dr. Brander both agreed that the patient's disease was hypochondriacal melancholy. Dr. Mertholdus said it was asthma, and nothing else. Solenander and Gravionius, lately sent for to the melancholy Duke of Cleve, with others, could not define what species it was or agree amongst themselves. The species are so confounded, as in Caesar Claudinus, his forty-fourth consultation for a Polonian count, in his judgment he laboured of head melancholy, and that which proceeds from the whole temperature both at once. I could give instance of some that have had all three kinds, semel et simul, and some successively, so that I conclude of our melancholy species, as many politicians do of their pure forms of commonwealths, monarchies, aristocracies, democracies, are most famous in contemplation, but in practice they are temperate and usually mixed. So Polybius informeth us, as the Lacedaemonian, the Roman of old, German now, and many others. What physicians say of distinct species in their books, it much matters not, since that in their patients' bodies they are commonly mixed. In such obscurity, therefore, variety and confused mixture of symptoms causes... How difficult a thing is it to treat of several kinds apart, to make any certainty or distinction among so many casualties, distractions, when seldom two men shall be like affected per omnia. Tis hard, I confess, 
yet nevertheless I will adventure through the midst of these perplexities, and, led by the clue or thread of the best writers, extricate myself out of a labyrinth of doubts and errors, and so proceed to the causes. End of section 21 Section 22 of The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1, by Robert Burton, Section 22. Partition 1, Section 2. Member 1, Subsections 1 and 2, Part 1. Subsection 1. Causes of Melancholy. God. A Cause. It is vain to speak of cures, or think of remedies, until such time as we have considered of the causes. So Galen prescribes Glauco, and the common experience of others confirms that those cures must be imperfect, lame, and to no purpose, wherein the causes have not first been searched, as Prosper Calenius well observes in his tract, De Atra Vile, to Cardinal Casius. Insomuch that Fernelius puts a kind of necessity in the knowledge of the causes, and without which it is impossible to cure or prevent any manner of disease. Empirics may ease, and sometimes help, but not thoroughly root out. Sublata causa tolito effectus, as the saying is. If the cause be removed, the effect is likewise vanquished. It is a most difficult thing, I confess, to be able to discern these causes whence they are, and in such variety to say what the beginning was. He is happy that can perform it aright. I will adventure to guess as near as I can, and rip them all up, from the first to the last, general and particular, to every species, that so they may the better be described. General causes are either supernatural or natural. Supernatural are from God and his angels, or by God's permission from the devil and his ministers. That God himself is a cause for the punishment of sin, and satisfaction of his justice, many examples and testimonies of holy scriptures make evident unto us. Psalm 108, 17 Foolish men are plagued for their offence, and by reason of their wickedness. Gehazi was stricken with leprosy, 2 Kings, verse 27. Jehoram with dysentery and flux, and great diseases of the bowels. 2 Chronicles 21.15 David plagued for numbering his people. 1 Chronicles 21 Sodom and Gomorrah swallowed up. And this disease is peculiarly specified. Psalm 127.12 He brought down their heart through heaviness. Deuteronomy 28.28 28. He struck them with madness, blindness, and astonishment of heart. An evil spirit was sent by the Lord upon Saul to vex him. Nebuchadnezzar did eat grass like an ox, and his heart was made like the beasts of the field. Heathen stories are full of such punishments. Lycurgus, because he cut down the vines in the country, was by Bacchus driven to madness. So was Pentheus and his mother Agave for neglecting their sacrifice. Censor Fulvius ran mad for untiling Juno's temple to cover a new one of his own, which he had dedicated to fortune, and was confounded to death with grief and sorrow of heart. When Xerxes would have spoiled Apollo's temple at Delphos of those infinite riches it possessed, a terrible thunder came from heaven and struck four thousand men dead. The rest ran mad. A little after, the like happened to Brennus. Lightning, thunder, earthquakes, upon such a sacrilegious occasion. If we may believe our pontifical writers, they will relate unto us many strange and prodigious punishments in this kind, inflicted by their saints. How Clodoveus, sometime king of France, the son of Dagobert, lost his wits for uncovering the body of Saint-Denis, and how a sacrilegious Frenchman, that would have stolen a silver image of St. John, at Burgburger, became frantic on a sudden, raging and tyrannizing over his own flesh. Of a lord of Radnor, that coming from hunting late at night, put his dogs into St. Alvin's church, Flan Alvin, as they called it, and rising betimes next morning, as hunters used to do, found all his dogs mad, 
himself being suddenly stricken blind. Of Tiridates, an Armenian king, for violating some holy nuns, that was punished in like sort, with loss of his wits. But poets and papists may go together for fabulous tales. Let them free their own credits, howsoever they feign of their nemesis, and of their saints, or by the devil's means may be deluded, we find it true that ulto artergo deus, he is God the avenger, as David styles him, and that it is our crying sins that pull this and many other maladies on our own heads, that he can by his angels, which are his ministers, strike and heal, saith Dionysius, whom he will, that he can plague us by his creatures, sun, moon, and stars, which he useth as his instruments. As a husbandman, says Zanchius, doth a hatchet, hail, snow, winds, etc. Et conjurati veniat in classica venti, as in Joshua's time, as in Pharaoh's reign in Egypt. They are but as so many executioners of his justice. He can make the proudest spirit stoop, and cry out with Julian the apostate, Vicisti Galilei, or with Apollo's priests in Chrysostom, O Coelum, O Terra, unde hostus hic? What an enemy is this? And pray with David, acknowledging his power. I am weakened and sore broken. I roar for the grief of mine heart. Mine heart panteth, etc. Psalm 38, 8 O Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chastise me in thy wrath. Psalm 38, 1 Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Psalm 51, 8 and verse 12 Restore to me the joy of thy salvation, and stabilize me with thy free spirit. For these causes, belike Hippocrates would have a physician take special notice whether the disease come not from a divine supernatural cause, or whether it follow the course of nature. But this is farther discussed by Franciscus Valesius, De Sacra Philosophia, chapter 8, Fernelius and Julius Caesar Claudinus, to whom I refer you, how this place of Hippocrates is to be understood. Paracelsus is of opinion that such spiritual diseases, for so he calls them, are spiritually to be cured and not otherwise. Ordinary means in such cases will not avail. Non est reluctandum cum Deo. We must not struggle with God. When that monster-taming Hercules overcame all in the Olympics, Jupiter at last in an unknown shape wrestled with him. The victory was uncertain, till at length Jupiter described himself and Hercules yielded. No striving with supreme powers. Nil juvat immensos quatro promiteri montes. Physicians and physic can do no good. We must submit ourselves unto the mighty hand of God, acknowledge our offences, call to him for mercy. If he strike us una idemque manus vulnus opernque ferret, as it is with him that are wounded with the spear of Achilles, he alone must help. Otherwise our diseases are incurable, and we not to be relieved. Subsection 2, Part 1 A digression of the nature of spirits, bad angels or devils, and how they cause melancholy. How far the power of spirits and devils doth extend, and whether they can cause this or any other disease, is a serious question, and worthy to be considered. For the better understanding of which, I will make a brief digression of the nature of spirits. And although the question be very obscure, according to Postellus, full of controversy and ambiguity, beyond the reach of human capacity, fatior excedere vires intentionis mei, saith Austin, I confess I am not able to understand it. Finitum de infinito non potes statuere, we can sooner determine with Tully, de natura deorum, Quid non sint, quam quid sint. Our subtle schoolmen, cardans, scaligers, profound thomists, fracasoriana and ferneliana acies, are weak, dry, obscure, defective in these mysteries, and all our quickest wits, as an owl's eyes at the sun's light, wax dull, and are not sufficient to apprehend them. Yet, as in the rest, I will adventure to say something to this point. In former times, as we read, Acts 23, the Sadducees denied that there were any such spirits, 
devils or angels. So did Galen the physician, the peripatetics, even Aristotle himself, as Pomponatius stoutly maintains, and Scaliger in some sort grants. Though Dandinus the Jesuit, commentary on book two of De Anima, stiffly denies it, substantiae separatiae and intelligences are the same which Christians call angels and Platonists devils, for they name all the spirits, daemones, be they good or bad angels, as Julius Pollux Onomasticon, book one, chapter one, observes. Epicures and atheists are of the same mind in general, because they never saw them. Plato, Plotinus, Porphyrius, Jamblicus, Proclus, insisting in the steps of Trismegistus, Pythagoras and Socrates make no doubt of it, nor Stoics, but that there are such spirits, though much erring from the truth. Concerning the first beginning of them, the Talmudists say that Adam had a wife called Lilis before he married Eve, and of her he begat nothing but devils. The Turks' Al-Quran is altogether as absurd and ridiculous in this point, but the scripture informs us Christians how Lucifer, the chief of them, with his associates, fell from heaven for his pride and ambition, created of God, placed in heaven, and sometimes an angel of light, now cast down into the lower aerial sublunary parts, or into hell, and delivered into chains of darkness, 2 Peter 2.4 to be kept unto damnation. Nature of Devils There is a foolish opinion which some hold, that they are the souls of men departed, good and more noble were deified, the baser groveled on the ground, or in the lower parts, and were devils. The which with Tertullian, Porphyrius the philosopher, M. Tyrius, maintains. These spirits, he saith, which we call angels and devils, are naught but souls of men departed, which either through love and pity of their friends yet living, help and assist them, or else persecute their enemies whom they hated, as Dido threatens to persecute Aeneas. Omnibus umbra locus adero, dabis improbe poenus. My angry ghost arising from the deep, shall haunt thee waking, and disturb thy sleep. At least my shade thy punishment shall know, and fame shall spread the pleasing news below. They are, as others suppose, appointed by those higher powers to keep men from their nativity, and to protect or punish them as they see cause, and are called boni et mali genii by the Romans, heroes, lares if good, lemures or lave if bad, by the Stoics, governors of countries, men, cities, saith Apuleius, Deus appellant qui ex hominum numero juste ac prudenta vitae curriculo gubernato, pro numine, Postea ab omnibus praediti fanis et ceremoniis vulgo admituntur, ut in Egypto Osiris, etc. Praestites, Capella calls them, which protected particular men as well as princes. Socrates had his daemonium Saturninum et Igneum, which of all spirits is best, ad sublimes cogitationes animum erigentem, as the Platonists supposed. Plotinus his, and we Christians are assisting angel, as Andreas Victorellus, a copious writer of the subject. Lodovicus de la Curda, the Jesuit, in his voluminous tract De Angelo Custode, Zanchius, and some divines think. But this absurd tenet of Tereus, Proclus confutes at large in his book De Anima et Daemone. Psellus, a Christian, and sometimes tutor, saith Cuspinian, to Michael Parapinatius, Emperor of Greece, a great observer of the nature of devils, holds they are corporeal, and have aerial bodies, that they are mortal, live and die, which Martianus Capella likewise maintains, but our Christian philosophers explode, that they are nourished and have excrements, they feel pain if they be hurt, which Cardan confirms, and Scaliger justly laughs him to scorn for. Si pascanto ere, cur non pugnant opuriorum era etc., or stroken, and if their bodies be cut, with admirable celerity they come together again. Austin approves as much. Mutata casu corpora in deteriorum qualitatum eris spicioris. So doth Hierome, commentarium in Epistula ad Ephesios, chapter 3, Oregon, Tertullian, Lactantius, and many ancient fathers of the Church. 
that in their fall their bodies were changed into a more aerial and gross substance. Bodin, Book 4, Theatri Naturae, and David Crucius, Hermeticae Philosophiae, Book 1, Chapter 4, by several arguments, proves angels and spirits to be corporeal. Quicquid continento in loco corporeum est, at spiritus continento in loco. Ergo, si spiritus sunt quanti, erunt corporei, at sunt quanti, ergo sunt finiti, ergo quanti, etc. Bodine goes farther yet, and will have these animae separati genii, spirits, angels, devils, and so likewise souls of men departed, if corporeal, which he most eagerly contends, to be of some shape, and that absolutely round, like sun and moon, because that is the most perfect form. Quae nihil habit asperitatis, nihil angulis in caesum, nihil anfractibus in volutum, nihil eminens, sed inter corpora perfecta est perfectissimum. Therefore, all spirits are corporeal, he concludes, and in their proper shapes round. That they can assume other aerial bodies, all manner of shapes at their pleasures, appear in what likeness they will themselves, that they are most swift in motion, can pass many miles in an instant, and so likewise transform bodies of others into what shape they please, and with admirable celerity remove them from place to place, as the angel did Habakkuk to Daniel, and as Philip the deacon was carried away by the spirit when he had baptized the eunuch. So did Pythagoras and Apollonius remove themselves and others with many such feats, that they can represent castles in the air, palaces, armies, spectrums, prodigies, and such strange objects to mortal men's eyes, cause smells, savours, etc., deceive all the senses most writers of this subject credibly believe, and that they can foretell future events, and do many strange miracles. Juno's image spake to Camillus, and Fortune's statue to the Roman matrons, with many such. Zancius, Bodine, Spondanus, and others are of opinion that they cause a true metamorphosis, as Nebuchadnezzar was really translated into a beast, Lot's wife into a pillar of salt, Ulysses' companions into hogs and dogs by Kirke's charms, turn themselves and others as they do witches into cats, dogs, hares, crows, etc. Strozius Cicogna hath many examples which he there confutes, as Austin likewise doth. De Civitate Dei, Book 28 that they can be seen when and in what shape, and to whom they will, saith Sellus, Tametsi nil tale viderim, nec optem videri, though he himself never saw them, nor desired it, and sometimes carnal copulation, as elsewhere I shall prove more at large, with women and men. Many will not believe they can be seen, and if any man shall say, swear and stiffly maintain, Though he be discreet and wise, judicious and learned, that he hath seen them, they account him a timorous fool, a melancholy dizzard, a weak fellow, a dreamer, a sick or a madman. They contemn him, laugh him to scorn, and yet Marcus of his credit told Sellus that he had often seen them. And Leo Suavius, a Frenchman, chapter 8, in Commentari Libri Primi Paracelsi de Vita Longa, out of some Platonists, will have the air to be as full of them as snow falling in the skies, and that they may be seen, and withal sets down the means how men may see them. Si irreverberatus oculi sole splendente, versus caelum continuaverint obtutus, etc., and saith moreover he tried it, premisorum feci experimentum, and it was true that the Platonists said, Paracelsus confesseth that he saw them diverse times, and conferred with them, and so doth Alexander ab Alexandro, that he so found it by experience, when as before he doubted of it. Many deny it, saith Levata, De Spectris, part 1, chapter 2, and part 2, chapter 11, because they never saw them themselves. But as he reports at large all over his book, especially chapter 19, part 1, they are often seen and heard and familiarly converse with men, as Ludovicus Vives assureth us, innumerable records, histories and testimonies evince in all ages, times, places, and all travellers besides, in the West Indies and our northern climes. 
Nihil familiarius quam in agris et urbibus, spiritus videre, audire qui vetent, jubiant, etc. Hieronymus Vita Pauli, Basil, Nicephorus, Eusebius, Socrates, Sosomenus, Jacobus Boisadus in his tract De Spiritum Apparitionibus, Petrus Loyus Liber De Spectris, Rerus Liber I, have infinite variety of such examples of apparitions of spirits for him to read that further doubts to his ample satisfaction. One alone I will briefly insert. A nobleman in Germany was sent ambassador to the King of Sweden. For his name, the time, and such circumstances, I refer you to Boisardus, mine author. After he had done his business, he sailed to Livonia, on set purpose to see those familiar spirits, which are there said to be conversant with men, and do their drudgery works. Amongst other matters, one of them told him where his wife was, in what room, in what clothes, what doing, and brought him a ring from her, which at his return, non sine omnium admiratione, he found to be true, and so believed that ever after, which before he doubted of. Cardan relates of his father, Facius Cardan, that after the accustomed solemnities, anno 1491, 13th of August, he conjured up seven devils in Greek apparel, about forty years of age, some ruddy of complexion and some pale. As he thought, he asked them many questions, and they made ready answer, that they were aerial devils, that they lived and died as men did, save that they were far longer lived, seven hundred or eight hundred years. They did as much excel men in dignity as we do jumants, and were as far excelled again of those that were above them. Our governors and keepers are they, moreover, which Plato and Critias delivered of old, and subordinate to one another, ut enim homo homini, sic daemonum daemoni dominator. They rule themselves as well as us, and the spirits of the meaner sort had commonly such offices, as we make horse-keepers. Neat herds, and the basest of us, overseers of our cattle, and that we can no more apprehend their natures and functions than a horse a man's. They knew all things, but might not reveal them to men, and ruled and domineered over us, as we do over our horses. The best kings among us, and the most generous spirits, were not comparable to the basest of them. Sometimes they did instruct men, and communicate their skill, reward, and cherish, and sometimes, again, terrify and punish to keep them in awe as they thought fit. Nihil magus cupientis, saith Lysias, quam adorationum hominum. The same author, Cardan, in his Hypercon, out of the doctrine of Stoics, will have some of these genii, for so he calls them, to be desirous of men's company, very affable and familiar with them as dogs are, others again to abhor as serpents and care not for them. The same belike Tritemius calls Ignios et sublunares, qui nunquam demurgunt ad inferiora, ad vix ulum habent interis commercium. Generally, they far excel men in worth, as man the meanest worm, though some of them are inferior to those of their own rank in worth, as the blackguard in a prince's court, and to men again, as some degenerate, base, rational creatures, are excelled of brute beasts. That they are mortal, besides these testimonies of Cardan, Martianus, etc., many other divines and philosophers hold. Post prolixum tempus moriuntur omnes. The Platonists and some rabbins, Porphyrius and Plutarch, as appears by that relation of Thomas, the great god Pan is dead, Apollo Pythias seized, and so the rest. St. Jerome, in the life of Paul the Hermit, tells a story how one of them appeared to St. Anthony in the wilderness, and told him as much. Paracelsus of our late writers stiffly maintains that they are mortal, live and die as other creatures do. Zosimus, book two, farther adds that religion and policy dies and alters with them. The Gentiles' gods, he says, were expelled by Constantine, and together with them. Imperii Romani Magistus, et fortuna interiit et profligata est. The fortune and majesty of the Roman Empire decayed and vanished, as that heathen in Minutius formerly bragged, when the Jews were overcome by the Romans, the Jews' God was likewise captivated by that of Rome, and Rabsaka to the Israelites, 
no god should deliver them out of the hands of the Assyrians. But these paradoxes of their power, corporeity, mortality, taking of shapes, transposing bodies, and carnal copulations, are sufficiently confuted by Pererius in his comment, and Tostata's questions on the sixth of Genesis. Thomas Aquinas, St. Austin, Wierus, Thomas Erastus, Del Rio, Sebastian Michaelis, Chapter 2, Dispiritibus, Reynolds. They may deceive the eyes of men, yet not take true bodies, or make a real metamorphosis. But, as Cicognia proves at large, they are illusoriae et prestigiatrices transformationes, mere illusions and cosnings, like that tale of Pasetis Obulus in Suidus, or that of Autolycus, Mercury's son, that dwelt in Parnassus, who got so much treasure by cosnage and stealth. His father Mercury, because he could leave him no wealth, taught him many fine tricks to get means, for he could drive away men's cattle, and if any pursued him, turn them into what shapes he would, and so did mightily enrich himself. Hoc astu maximum praedum est ad secutus. This, no doubt, is as true as the rest, yet thus much in general, Thomas, Durand, and others grant that they have understanding far beyond men, can probably conjecture and foretell many things. They can cause and cure most diseases, deceive our senses. They have excellent skill in all arts and sciences, and that the most illiterate devil is quovis homini scientor, more knowing than any man, as Cicogna maintains out of others. They know the virtues of herbs, plants, stones, minerals, etc., of all creatures, birds, beasts, the four elements, stars, planets, can aptly apply and make use of them as they see good, perceiving the causes of all meteors, and the like. Dant se coloribus, as Austin hath it, accommodant se figuris, adherent sonis, subjecunt se odoribus, infundunt se saporibus, omnes sensus etiam, ipsam intelligentiam, demones fallunt. They deceive all our senses, even our understanding itself at once. They can produce miraculous alterations in the air, and most wonderful effects, conquer armies, give victories, help, further, hurt, cross, and alter human attempts and projects, Dei Permisu, as they see good themselves. When Charles the Great intended to make a channel betwixt the Rhine and the Danube, look what his workmen did in the day, these spirits flung down in the night, Ut cunatu rex desisteret, per vicere. Such feats can they do. But that which Bodine, Book 4, Theatrum Naturae, thinks, following Tyrius belike and the Platonists, they can tell the secrets of a man's heart. Aut cogitationes hominum is most false. His reasons are weak and sufficiently confuted by Zanchius, Book 4, Chapter 9, Hieromi, Book 2, Commentatiorium in Evangelium Matthai, Chapter 15, Athanasius, Quaestio 27 ad Antiochum Principem, and others. End of section 22. Section 23 of The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1, by Robert Burton, Section 23. Partition 1, Section 2. Member 1, Subsection 2, Part 2. A digression of the nature of spirits, bad angels, or devils, and how they cause melancholy. Continued. Orders. As for those orders of good and bad devils, which the Platonists hold, is altogether erroneous, and those ethics boni et mali genii are to be exploded. These heathen writers agree not in this point among themselves, as Dandinus notes, and sint mali non conveniunt. Some will have all spirits good or bad to us by a mistake, as if an ox or horse could discourse. He would say the butcher was his enemy because he killed him. The grazier his friend because he fed him. A hunter preserves and yet kills his game, and is hated nevertheless of his game. 
nec piscatorum piscis amare potest, etc. But Jamblicus, Sallus, Plutarch, and most Platonists acknowledge bad, et ab eorum maleficiis cavendum, and we should beware of their wickedness, for they are enemies of mankind. And this Plato learned in Egypt, that they quarrelled with Jupiter and were driven by him down to hell. That which Apuleius, Xenophon, and Plato contend of Socrates' demonium is most absurd. That which Plotinus of his, that he had likewise deum pro demonio, and that which Porphyry concludes of them all in general, if they be neglected in their sacrifice, they are angry. Nay more, as Cardan in his Hippercon will, they feed on men's souls. Elementa sunt plantis elementum, animalibus plantae, hominis animalia, errant et homines aliis, non autem diis, nimis enim remota est, eorum natura a nostra, qua propter demonibus. And so belike that we have so many battles fought in all ages, countries, is to make them a feast, and their sole delight. But to return to that I said before, if displeased they fret and chafe, for they feed belike on the souls of beasts, as we do on their bodies, and send many plagues amongst us, but pleased, then they do much good, is as vain as the rest, and confuted by Augustine, Book 9, Chapter 8, De Civitate Dei, Eusebius, Book 4, Preparatio Evangelica, Chapter 6, and others. Yet this much I find, that our schoolmen and other divines make nine kinds of bad spirits, as Dionysius hath done of angels. In the first rank are those false gods of the Gentiles, which were adored heretofore in several idols, and gave oracles at Delphos, and elsewhere, whose prince is Baal-Zebub. The second rank is of liars and equivocators, as Apollo, Pythias, and the like. The third are those vessels of anger, inventors of all mischief, as that Theutus in Plato, Ise calls them vessels of fury. Their prince is Belial. The fourth are malicious revenging devils, and their prince is Asmodeus. The fifth kind are cosmers, such as belong to magicians and witches. Their prince is Satan. The sixth are those aerial devils that corrupt the air and cause plagues, thunders, fires, etc., spoken of in the Apocalypse, and Paul to the Ephesians names them the princes of the air. Meresin is their prince. The seventh is a destroyer, captain of the Furies, causing wars, tumults, combustions, uproars, mentioned in the Apocalypse, and called Abaddon. The eighth is that accusing or calumniating devil, whom the Greeks call Diabolos, Diabolus, that drives men to despair. The ninth are those tempters in several kinds, and their prince is Mammon. Celus makes six kinds, yet none above the moon. Wierus, in his Pseudo Monarchia Daemonis, out of an old book, makes many more divisions and subordinations with their several names, numbers, offices, etc. But Gazaeus, cited by Lipsius, will have all places full of angels, spirits, and devils, above and beneath the moon, ethereal and aerial, which Augustine cites out of Varro, Book 7, De Civitate Dei, Chapter 6. The celestial devils above, and aerial beneath, or as some will, gods above, semi-dei, or half-gods beneath, lares, heroes, genii, which climb higher if they lived well, as the Stoics held, but grovel on the ground as they were baser in their lives, nearer to the earth, and are manes, lemures, lamiae, etc. They will have no place but all full of spirits, devils, or some other inhabitants, plenum caelum, air, aqua, terra et omnia sub terra, saith Gazaeus, though Antony Rusca in his book De Inferno, book 5, chapter 7, would confine them to the middle region, yet they will have them everywhere. Not so much as a hair's breadth, empty in heaven, earth or waters, above or under the earth. The air is not so full of flies in summer, as it is at all times of invisible devils, this Paracelsus stiffly maintains, and that they have every one their several chaos, Others will have infinite worlds, and each world his peculiar spirits, gods, angels, and devils, to govern and punish it. Singular nonuli credunt quoque sidera posse dici orbes, teramque appellant sidus opacum, qui minimus divum praesit. 
Some persons believe each star to be a world, and this earth an opaque star, over which the least of the gods presides. Gregorius Tholsanus makes seven kinds of ethereal spirits or angels, according to the number of the seven planets. Saturnine, jovial, martial, of which Cardin discourseth Book 20, De Subtilitate Rerum, he calls them Stabtantius Primus, Olympicus Demones Tritemius, Qui Prisant Zodiaco, etc., and will have them to be good angels above, devils beneath the moon. Their several names and offices he there sets down, and which Dionysius of angels will have several spirits for several countries, men, offices, etc., which live about them, and as so many assisting powers cause their operations will have in a word innumerable, as many of them as there be stars in the skies. Marcilius Ficinus seems to second this opinion, out of Plato or for himself I know not, still ruling their inferiors, as they do those under them again, all subordinate, and the nearest to the earth rule us, whom we subdivide into good and bad angels, call gods or devils, as they help or hurt us, and so adore, love, or hate. But it is most likely from Plato, for he, relying wholly on Socrates, quem mori potius quam mentiri voluisse scribit, whom he says would rather die than tell a falsehood, out of Socrates' authority alone, made nine kinds of them, which opinion belike Socrates took from Pythagoras, and he from Trismegistus, he from Zoroastus, first god, second idea, three intelligences, four archangels, five angels, six devils, seven heroes, eight principalities, nine princes, of which some were absolutely good, as gods, some bad, some indifferent, into Deus et homines, as heroes and demons, which ruled men, and were called genii. Or as Proclus and Jamblicus will, the middle betwixt God and men. Principalities and princes, which commanded and swayed kings and countries, and had several places in the spheres perhaps, for as every sphere is higher, so hath it more excellent inhabitants, which belike is that Galileus a Galileo and Kepler aims at in his nuncio Siderio, when he will have Saturnine and jovial inhabitants, and which Tycho Brahe doth in some sort touch or insinuate in one of his epistles. But these things Zanchius justly explodes, chapter 3, book 4. So that according to these men the number of ethereal spirits must needs be infinite, for if it be true that some of our mathematicians say, if a stone could fall from the starry heaven, or eighth sphere, and should pass every hour an hundred miles, it would be sixty-five years or more before it would come to ground, by reason of the great distance of heaven from earth, which contains, as some say, a hundred and seventy millions eight hundred miles, besides those other heavens, whether they be crystalline or watery, which Magnus adds, which peradventure holds as much more. How many such spirits may it contain? And yet for all this, Thomas Albertus, and most, hold that there be far more angels than devils. Sublunary Devils and Their Kinds But be they more or less, quod supra nos nihil ad nos, what is beyond our comprehension does not concern us. However, as Martianus foolishly supposeth, Aetherie demones non curant res humanus, they care not for us, do not attend our actions, or look for us. Those ethereal spirits have other words to reign in belike, or business to follow. We are only now to speak in brief of these sublunary spirits or devils. For the rest our divines determine that the devil had no power over stars or heavens. Carminibus crelo possunt deducere lunam, etc. By their charms, verses, they can seduce the moon from the heavens. Those are poetical fictions, and that they can sistere aquam fluviis, et vertere sidero retro, etc., stop rivers and turn the stars backward in their courses, as Canadia in Horace, tis all false. They are confined until the day of judgment to this sublunary world, and can work no farther than the four elements, and as God permits them. Wherefore, of these sublunary devils, though others divide them otherwise according to their several places and offices, Cellus makes six kinds, fiery, aerial, terrestrial, watery, and subterranean devils, besides those fairies, satyrs, nymphs, etc. 
Fiery spirits or devils are such as commonly work by blazing stars, fire drakes, or ignes fatui, which lead men often in flumina od precipita, saith Bodine, Book 2, Theatrum Naturae, Folium 221. Quos inquit arceri si volunt viatores, clara voce deum appellare, aut pronam facie terram contingente adorare or potet, et hoc amuletum marjoribus nostris acceptum fere debemus, etc., whom if travellers wish to keep off, they must pronounce the name of God with a clear voice, or adore him with their faces in contact with the ground, etc. Likewise they counterfeit suns and moons, stars oftentimes, and sit on ship masts. In navigiorum summitatibus visuntur, and are called dioscuri, as Eusebius Liber Contra Philosophos, chapter 48 informeth us, out of the authority of Xenophanes, or little clouds, ad mortem nescio quem volantes, which never appear, saith Cardan, but they signify some mischief or other to come unto men, though some again will have them to pretend good, and victory to that side they come towards in sea fights. St. Elmo's fires, they commonly call them, and they do likely appear after a sea storm. Radzivilius, the Polonian duke, calls this apparition Sancti Germani Sidus, and saith moreover that he saw the same after in a storm as he was sailing, 1582, from Alexandria to Rhodes. Our stories are full of such apparitions in all kinds. Some think they keep their residence in that Hecla, a mountain in Iceland, Etna in Sicily, Lipari, Vesuvius, etc. These devils were worshipped heretofore by that superstitious Pyromantea and the like. Aerial spirits or devils are such as keep quarter most part in the air, cause many tempests, thunders and lightnings, tear oaks, fire steeples, houses, strike men and beasts, make it rain stones, as in Livy's time, wool, frogs, etc., counterfeit armies in the air, strange noises, swords, etc., as at Vienna before the coming of the Turks, and many times in Rome, as Scheretzius, Lavata, Julius Obsequens, an old Roman, in his Book of Prodigies, Ab Urbe Condita, 505. Machiavel hath illustrated by many examples, and Josephus, in his book, De Bello Judaico, before the destruction of Jerusalem. All which Postellus, in his first book, chapter 7, De Orbis Concordia, useth as an infectual argument, as indeed it is, to persuade them that will not believe there be spirits or devils. They cause whirlwinds on a sudden, and tempestuous storms, which, though our meteorologists generally refer to natural causes, yet I am of Bodine's mind, Theatrum Naturae, Book 2. They are more often caused by those aerial devils, in their several quarters. For tempestatibus si ingurent, saith Richard Argentine, as when a desperate man makes away with himself, which by hanging or drowning they frequently do, as Comanus observes, tripudium agentes, dancing and rejoicing at the death of a sinner. These can corrupt the air and cause plagues, sickness, storms, shipwrecks, fires, inundations. At Mons Draconis in Italy, there is a most memorable example in Jovianus Pontanus, and nothing so familiar, if we may believe those relations of Saxo Grammaticus, Olus Magnus, Damianus I. Goes, as for witches and sorcerers, in Lapland, Lithuania, and all over Scandia, to sell winds to mariners and cause tempests, which Marcus Paulus the Venetian relates likewise of the Tartars. These kind of devils are much delighted in sacrifices, saith Porphyry, held all the world in awe, and had several names, idols, sacrifices, in Rome, Greece, Egypt, and at this day tyrannies over and deceive those ethnics and Indians being adored and worshipped for gods. For the Gentiles' gods were devils, as Trismegistus confesseth in his Asclepius, and he himself could make them come to their images by magic spells, and are now as much respected by our papists, saith Pictorius, under the name of saints. These are they which Corden thinks desires so much carnal copulation with witches, incubi and succubi, transform bodies, and are so very cold if they be touched, and that serve magicians. His father had one of them, as he is not ashamed to relate, an aerial devil, bound to him for twenty and eight years. 
as Agrippa's dog had a devil tied to his collar, some think that Paracelsus, or else Erastus belies him, had one confined to his sword pummel. Others wear them in rings, etc. Janus and Jambres did many things of old by their help. Simon Magus, Kinops, Apollonius Tyanius, Jamblicus, and Tritemius of late, that showed Maximilian the emperor his wife after she was dead. Et berucum in colo aegis, saith Godolman, so much as the wart in her neck. Del Rio, book two, hath diverse examples of their feats. Cicogna, book three, chapter three, and Wierus in his book De Prestigius Demonum, Boisardus de Magus et Beneficus. Water devils are those naiads or water nymphs which have been heretofore conversant about waters and rivers. The water, as Paracelsus thinks, is their chaos, wherein they live. Some call them fairies, and say that Habundia is their queen. These cause inundations, many times shipwrecks, and deceive men diverse ways, as succuba or otherwise, appearing most part, saith Tritemius, in women's shapes. Paracelsus hath several stories of them that have lived and been married to mortal men, and so continued for certain years with them, and after, upon some dislike, have forsaken them. Such a one as Ageria, with whom Numa was so familiar, Diana, Ceres, etc. Olaus Magnus hath a long narration of one Hotharus, a king of Sweden, that having lost his company, as he was hunting one day, met with these water nymphs or fairies, and was feasted by them. And Hector Boethius, or Macbeth, and Banquo, two Scottish lords, that as they were wandering in the woods, had their fortunes told them by three strange women. To these, heretofore, they did use to sacrifice, by that Udromantea, Hydromantea, or divination by waters. Terrestrial devils are those Lares, Genii, Fauns, Satyrs, Wood Nymphs, Foliots, Fairies, Robin Goodfellows, Trulli, etc., which, as they are most conversant with men, so they do them most harm. Some think it was they alone that kept the heathen people in awe of old, and had so many idols and temples erected to them. Of this range was Dagon amongst the Philistines, Bel amongst the Babylonians, Astartes amongst the Sidonians, Baal amongst the Samaritans, Isis and Osiris amongst the Egyptians, etc. Some put our fairies into this rank, which have been in former times adored with much superstition, with sweeping their houses, and setting of a pail of clean water, good victuals, and the like, and then they should not be pinched, but find money in their shoes, and be fortunate in their enterprises. These are they that dance on heaths and greens, as Levata thinks with Tritemius, and as Olus Magnus adds, leave that green circle which was commonly found in plain fields, which others hold to proceed from a meteor falling, or some accidental rankness of the ground, so nature sports herself. They are sometimes seen by old women and children. Hieron Pauli, in his description of the city of Berkino in Spain, relates how they have been familiarly seen near that town, about fountains and hills. Nonunquam, saith Tritemius, in sua latibula montium simpliciores, homines ducant, stupenda mirantibus ostentes miracula, nolarum sonitus, spectacula, etc. Giraldus Cambrensis gives instance in a monk of Wales that was so deluded. Paracelsus reckons up many places in Germany, where they do usually walk in little coats, some two feet long. A bigger kind there is of them called with us hobgoblins, and robin goodfellows, that would in those superstitious times grind corn for a mess of milk, cut wood, or do any manner of drudgery work. They would mend old irons in those Aeolian islands of Lipari in former ages, and have been often seen and heard. Tholosanus calls them Trullos, and Getulos, and saith, that in his days they were common in many places of France. Dithmarus Blaskenius, in his description of Iceland, reports for a certainty that almost in every family they have yet some such familiar spirits and Felix Maliolus, in his book De Credulitate Demonibus Ad Hibenda, affirms as much, that these trolli or telkines are very common in Norway, and seem to do drudgery work, to draw water, saith Wierus, book 1, chapter 22, dress meat, or any such thing. Another sort of these there are, which frequent forlorn houses, 
which the Italians call foliots, most part innoxious, Cardan holds. They will make strange noises in the night, howl sometimes pitifully, and then laugh again, cause great flame and sudden lights, fling stones, rattle chains, shave men, open doors and shut them, fling down platters, stools, chests, sometimes appear in the likeness of hares, crows, black dogs, etc., of which read Petrus Thyreus the Jesuit, in his tract, De Locus Infestis, part 1, chapter 4, who will have them to be devils, or the souls of damned men that seek revenge, or else souls out of purgatory that seek ease. For such examples, peruse Sigismundus Scheretzius, Liber de Spectris, part 1, chapter 1, which he says he took out of Luther most part. There be many instances. Plinius Secundus remembers such a house at Athens, which Athenodorus the philosopher hired, which no man durst inhabit for fear of devils. Augustine, De Civitati Dei, Book 22, Chapter 1, relates as much of Hesperius, the tribune's house, at Zubenda, near their city of Hippos, vexed with evil spirits, to his great hindrance. Cum afflictione animalium et servorum suorum. Many such instances are to be read in Nidarius Formica, Book 5, Chapter 12, 3, etc., whether I may call these Zim and Ochim, which Isaiah, Chapter 13, 21, speaks of, I make a doubt. See more of these in the said Scheretius, Liber de Spectris, Book 1, Chapter 4. He is full of examples. These kinds of devils many times appear to men, and affright them out of their wits, sometimes walking at noonday, sometimes at nights, counterfeiting dead men's ghosts, as that of Caligula, which, saith Suetonius, was seen to walk in Lavinia's garden, where his body was buried, spirits haunted, and the house where he died, nulla nox sine terrora transacta, donec incendio consumpta. Every night this happened, there was no quietness till the house was burned. About Hecla in Iceland, ghosts commonly walk, animas mortuorum simulantes, saith Johannes Ananias, Book 3, De Natura Daemonium, Olaus, Book 2, Chapter 2, Natal, Liber de Apparitionibus Spirituum, Con manus de miraculis mortuorum, part 1, chapter 44. Such sights are frequently seen circa sepulchre et monasteria, saith Lavata, book 1, chapter 19, in monasteries and about churchyards. Loca paludinosa, ampla edificia, solitaria, et caide hominum notata, etc. Marshes, great buildings, solitary places, or remarkable as the scene of some murder. Thyreus adds, Ubi gravius peccatum est commissum, impii, pauperum, oppressores et nequito insignes habitant. Where some very heinous crime was committed, there the impious and infamous generally dwell. These spirits often foretell men's death by several signs, as knockings, groanings, etc. Though Richard Argentine, chapter 18, De Prestigiis Daemonum, will ascribe these predictions to good angels, out of the authority of Ficinus and others, Prodigia in obitu principum cypus contingunt, etc. Prodigies frequently occur at the deaths of illustrious men, as in the Lateran Church in Rome, the Pope's death are foretold by Sylvester's tomb. Near Rupes Nova in Finland, in the kingdom of Sweden, there is a lake in which, before the governor of the castle dies, a spectrum, in the habit of Arion with his harp, appears and makes excellent music. Like those blocks in Cheshire, which they say, presage death to the master of the family, or that oak in Nanthadron Park in Cornwall, which foreshows as much. Many families in Europe are so put in mind of their last by such predictions, and many men are forewarned, if we may believe Paracelsus, by familiar spirits in diverse shapes, as cocks, crows, owls, which often hover about sick men's chambers. Velquia morientium forditatum sentient, as Baracellus conjectures et idio supertectum infirmorum crocitant, because they smell a coarse, or for that, as Bernardinus de Bustis thinketh, God permits the devil to appear in the form of crows, and such like creatures, to scare such as live wickedly here on earth. A little before Tully's death, saith Plutarch, the crows made a mighty noise about him, tumultuose per strepentes, they pulled the pillow from under his head, Robertus Gagrinus, Historia Francorum, Book 8, 
telleth such another wonderful story at the death of Johannes de Monteforte, a French lord, anno 1345. Tanta corvorum multitudo edibus morientis insedit, quantum esse in Gallia nemo judicaset. A multitude of crows alighted on the house of the dying man, such as no one imagined existed in France. Such prodigies are very frequent in authors. See more of these in the said Lavater, the Reus de Locus Infestus, Part 3, Chapter 58, Pictorius del Rio, Cicognia, Book 3, Chapter 9. Necromancers take upon them to raise and lay them at their pleasures, and so likewise those which Miseldus calls ambulones, that walk about midnight on great heaths and desert places, which, saith Lavater, draw men out of the way, and lead them all night a byway, or quite bar them out of their way. These have several names in several places. We commonly call them pucks. In the deserts of Lop, in Asia, such illusions of walking spirits are often perceived, as you may read in M. Paulus, the Venetian, his travels. If one lose his company by chance, these devils will call him by his name, and counterfeit voices of his companions to seduce him. Hieronymus Pauli, in his book of the hills of Spain, relates of a great mount in Cantabria, where such spectrums are to be seen. Lavata and Cicogna have variety of examples of spirits, and walking devils in this kind. Sometimes they sit by the highway side to give men falls, and make their horses stumble and start as they ride, if you will believe the relation of that holy man Catellus in Nubrigensis, that had an especial grace to see devils. Gratiam divinitus collatum, and talk with them, et impervidius cum spiritibus sermonem miscere, without offence, and if a man curse or spur his horse for stumbling, they do heartily rejoice at it, with many such pretty feats. Subterranean devils are as common as the rest, and do as much harm. Olaus Magnus, Book 6, Chapter 19, makes six kinds of them, some bigger, some less. These, saith Munster, are commonly seen about mines of metals, and are some of them noxious, some again do no harm. The metal men in many places account it good luck, a sign of treasure and rich ore when they see them. Georgius Agricola, in his book De Subterraneus Aminantibus, chapter 37, reckons two more notable kinds of them, which he calls Getuli and Cobali. Both are clothed after the manner of metal men, and will many times imitate their works. Their office, as Pictorius and Paracelsus think, is to keep treasure in the earth, that it be not all at once revealed. And besides, Cicogna avers that they are the frequent causes of those horrible earthquakes which often swallow up not only houses, but whole islands and cities. In his third book, chapter 11, he gives many instances. The last are conversant about the centre of the earth to torture the souls of damned men to the day of judgment. Their egress and regress some suppose to be about Etna, Lipari, Mons Hecla in Iceland, Vesuvius, Terra del Fuego, etc., because many shrieks and fearful cries are continually heard thereabouts, and familiar apparitions of dead men, ghosts and goblins. End of section 23《Section 24 of the Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1 by Robert Burton, Section 24. Partition 1, Section 2. Member 1, Subsection 2, Part 3. Subsection 3. Subsection 2, Part 3 A Digression of the Nature of Spirits, Bad Angels or Devils, and How They Cause Melancholy Continued Their Offices, Operations, Study Thus the devil reigns, and in a thousand several shapes, as a roaring lion still seeks whom he may devour. 1 Peter 5 By sea, land, air, as yet unconfined, though some will have his proper place in the air. 
all that space between us and the moon for them that transgressed least, and hell for the wickedest of them. Hic velat in carcere ad finem munde, tunc in locum funestiorum trudendi, as Augustine holds, de civitate Dei, chapter 22, book 14, chapters 3 and 23. But be where he will, he rageth while he may to comfort himself, as Lactantius thinks, with other men's faults. He labours all he can to bring them into the same pit of perdition with him. For men's miseries, calamities, and ruins are the devil's banqueting dishes. By many temptations and several engines he seeks to captivate our souls. The Lord of Lies, saith Augustine, as he was deceived himself, he seeks to deceive others. The ringleader to all naughtiness, as he did by Eve and Cain, Sodom and Gomorrah, so would he do by all the world. Sometimes he tempts by covetousness, drunkenness, pleasure, pride, etc., airs, dejects, saves, kills, protects, and rides some men, as they do their horses. He studies our overthrow, and generally seeks our destruction. And although he pretend many times human good, and vindicate himself for a god by curing of several diseases, agris sanitatum et caecus luminis usum restituendo, as Augustine declares, Book 10, De Civitate Dei, Chapter 6, as Apollo, Aesculapius, Isis of old have done, divert plagues, assist them in wars, pretend their happiness, yet, nihil his impurius, scelestius, nihil humano generi infestius. Nothing so impure, nothing so pernicious, as may well appear by their tyrannical and bloody sacrifices of men to Saturn and Moloch, which are still in use among those barbarous Indians, their several deceits and cozenings to keep men in obedience, their false oracles, sacrifices, their superstitious impositions of fasts, penury, etc., heresies, superstitious observations of meats, times, etc., by which they crucify the souls of mortal men, as shall be showed in our treatise of religious melancholy, modico ad hoc tempore, senato malignari, as Bernard expresseth it, by God's permission he rageth a while, hereafter to be confined to hell and darkness, which is prepared for him and his angels. Matthew 25 How far their power doth extend, it is hard to determine. What the ancients held of their effects, force, and operations, I will briefly show you. Plato in Critias, and after him his followers, gave out that these spirits or devils were men's governors and keepers, our lords and masters, as we are of our cattle. They govern provinces and kingdoms by oracles, auguries, dreams, rewards and punishments, prophecies, inspirations, sacrifices and religious superstitions, varied in as many forms as there be diversity of spirits. They send wars, plagues, peace, sickness, health, death, plenty. Ad stantes hic jam nobis, spectantes et arbitrantes, etc., as appears by those histories of Thucydides, Livius, Dionysius Halicarnassus, with many others that are full of their wonderful stratagems, and were therefore by those Roman and Greek commonwealths adored and worshipped for gods with prayers and sacrifices, etc. In a word, nihil magus querent quam metum et admirationem hominum, and as another hath it, dici non potest quam impotenti ardore in hominis dominum, et divinus cultus maligni spiritus affectent. Tritemius, in his book De Septum Secundis, assigns names to such angels as are governors of particular provinces, by what authority I know not, and gives them several jurisdictions. Asclepiades a Grecian, Rabbi Akiba the Jew, Abraham Avenezra and Rabbi Azariel, Arabians, as I find them cited by Cicogna, farther add, that they are not our governors only, set ex eorum concordium et discordia, boni et mali affectus promanant. But, as they agree, so do we and our princes, or disagree, stand or fall. Juno was a bitter enemy to Troy, Apollo a good friend, Jupiter indifferent, aqua venus teucris, palus iniquia fuit, some are for us still, some against us, prementi deo, that deus alter opum, Religion, policy, public and private quarrels, wars are procured by them, and they are delighted perhaps to see men fight, as men are with cocks, bulls, and dogs, bears, etc. 
plagues, deaths depend on them, or bene and male esse, and almost all our other peculiar actions. For as Antony Rusea contends, Book 5, Chapter 18, every man hath a good and a bad angel attending on him in particular, all his life long, which Jamblicus calls daemonum, preferments, losses, weddings, deaths, rewards, and punishments, and as Proclus will, all offices whatsoever, alii genetricem, alii opificem, potestatem habent, etc., and several names they will give them according to their offices, as lares, indegites, phaestites, etc. When the Arcades in that battle at Cheronae, which was fought against King Philip for the liberty of Greece, had deceitfully carried themselves, long after, in the very same place, Deus Greciae ultoribus, saith mine author, they were miserably slain by Metellus the Roman. So likewise in smaller matters they will have things fall out, as these boni and mali genii favour or dislike us. Saturni non conveniunt jovialibus, etc. He that is Saturninus shall never likely be preferred. That base fellows are often advanced, undeserving gnathos and vicious parasites, whereas discreet, wise, virtuous, and worthy men are neglected and unrewarded, they refer to those domineering spirits, or subordinate genii, as they are inclined, or favour men, so they thrive, are ruled and overcome. For as Libanius supposeth in our ordinary conflicts and contentions, genius genio cedit et obtemperat, one genius yields and is overcome by another. All particular events almost they refer to these private spirits, and, as Paracelsus adds, they direct, teach, inspire, and instruct men. Never was any man extraordinary famous in any art, action, or great commander that had not familiarum demonum to inform him, as Numa, Socrates, and many such, as Cardan illustrates, chapter 128, Arcanis prudentiae civilis, speciali siquidem, Gratia. Se a Deo donari asserunt magi, a geniis calestibus instui, ab iis doceri. But these are most erroneous paradoxes, inepti et fabulosi nugae, rejected by our divines and Christian churches. Tis true they have by God's permission power over us, and we find by experience that they can hurt not our fields only, cattle, goods, but our bodies and minds. At Hamel in Saxony, anno 1484, 20 Junii, the devil, in likeness of a pied piper, carried away a 130 children that were never after seen. Many times men are affrighted out of their wits, carried away quite, as Scheretzius illustrates, Book 1, Chapter 4, and severally molested by his means. Plotinus the Platonist, Book 14, laughs them to scorn, that hold the devil or spirits can cause any such diseases. Many think he can work upon the body, but not upon the mind. But experience pronounceth otherwise, that he can work both upon body and mind. Tertullian is of this opinion, that he can cause both sickness and health, and that secretly. Torellus adds by clancular poisons he can affect the bodies, and hinder the operations of the bowels, though we perceive it not, closely creeping into them, saith Lipsius, and so crucify our souls. Et nociva melancholia furiosos efficit. For being a spiritual body, he struggles with our spirits, saith Rogers, and suggests, according to Cardan, verba sina voce, spicies sine visu, envy, lust, anger, etc., as he sees men inclined. The manner how he performs it, the Armanus in his oration against Bodine, sufficiently declares. He begins first with the fantasy, and moves that so strongly that no reason is able to resist. Now the fantasy he moves by mediation of humours, although many physicians are of opinion that the devil can alter the mind and produce this disease of himself. Quibus dum medicorum visum, saith Avicenna, quod melancholia contingat a demonio. Of the same mind is Celus and Rhesus the Arab. That this disease proceeds especially from the devil, and from him alone. Arculanus, Elanius Montaltus, Daniel Senertus confirm as much, that the devil can cause this disease, by reason many times that the parties affected prophecy, speak strange language, 
but non sine interventu humoris, not without the humour, as he interprets himself. No more doth avicenna, si contingat er demonio, sufficit nobis ut convertat complexionum ad coloram nigram, et sid causa edius propinqua cholera nigra. The immediate cause is cholera a dust, which Pomponatius likewise labours to make good. Galgalandus of Mantua, the famous physician, so cured a demoniacal woman in his time, that spake all languages, by purging black collar, and thereupon belike this humour of melancholy is called Balneum Diaboli, the devil's bath. The devil, spying his opportunity of such humours, drives them many times to despair, fury, rage, etc., mingling himself among these humours. This is that which Tertullian averse. Corporibus impligunt acerbos casus, animaque repentinos, membra distorquent, occulte repentes, etc., and which Lemnius goes about to prove. Imiscant se mali genii pravis humoribus, atque atre bili, etc., and Jason pretensus that the devil, being a slender incomprehensible spirit, can easily insinuate and wind himself into human bodies, and cunningly couched in our bowels, vitiate our healths, terrify our souls with fearful dreams, and shake our minds with furies. And in another place, these unclean spirits settled in our bodies, and now, mixed with our melancholy humours, do triumph, as it were, and sport themselves as in another heaven. Thus he argues, and that they go in and out of our bodies, as bees do in a hive, and so provoke and tempt us as they perceive our temperature inclined of itself, and most apt to be deluded. Agrippa and Lavater are persuaded that this humour invites the devil to it, wheresoever it is in extremity, and of all other, melancholy persons are most subject to diabolical temptations and illusions, and most apt to entertain them, and the devil best able to work upon them. But whether by obsession, or possession, or otherwise, I will not determine. Tis a difficult question. Del Rio the Jesuit, Springer and his colleague, Malleus Maleficarum, Petrus the Reus the Jesuit, Liba de Demoniacis, De Locus Infestis, De Terrificationibus Nocturnis, Hieronymus Mengus Flagellus Demonium, and others of that rank of pontifical writers, it seems by their exorcisms and conjurations approve of it, having forged many stories to that purpose. A nun did eat lettuce without grace, or signing it with the sign of the cross, and was instantly possessed. Durandus, Book 6, Rationali Divinorum Officiorum, Chapter 86, Number 8, relates that he saw a wench possessed in Bononia with two devils, by eating an unhallowed pomegranate as she did afterwards confess when she was cured by exorcisms. And therefore our papists do sign themselves so often with the sign of the cross, ni demon engredi osit, and exorcise all manner of meats, as being unclean or accursed otherwise, as Bellarmini defends. Many such stories I find amongst pontifical writers, to prove their assertions, let them free their own credits. Some few I will recite in this kind out of most approved physicians. Cornelius Gemma, Book 2, De Naturae Divinis Characterismis, Chapter 4, relates of a young maid called Catherine Gualter, a cooper's daughter, anno 1571, that had such strange passions and convulsions. Three men could not sometimes hold her. She purged a live eel, which he saw, a foot and a half long, and touched it himself but the eel afterwards vanished. She vomited some twenty-four pounds of fulsome stuff of all colours twice a day for fourteen days, and after that she voided great balls of hair, pieces of wood, pigeon's dung, parchment, goose dung, coals, and after them two pounds of pure blood, and then again coals and stones, of which some had inscriptions bigger than a walnut, some of them pieces of glass, brass, etc., besides paroxysms of laughing, weeping, and ecstasies, etc. Et hoc inquit cum horore vidi. This I saw with horror. They could do no good on her by physic, but left her to the clergy. Marcellus Donatus, Book 2, Chapter 1, Medica Historia Mirabilis, hath such another story of a country fellow, that had four knives in his belly, insta serre dentatus, indented like a saw, every one a span long, 
and a wreath of hair like a globe, with much baggage of like sort, wonderful to behold. How it should come into his guts, he concluded, Certe non alio quam demonis astutia et dolo, could assuredly only have been through the artifice of the devil. Langius has many relations to this effect, and so hath Christophorus of Vega, Rierus, Scencius, Scribanius. All agree that they are done by the subtlety and delusion of the devil. If you shall ask a reason of this, tis to exercise our patience, for as Tertullian holds, virtus non es virtus, Nisi comparum habet aliquem, in quo superando vim suam ostendat. Tis to try us and our faith. Tis for our offences and for the punishment of our sins. By God's permission they do it. Carnifices vindictae justi dei, as Tolosan styles them. Executioners of his will. Or rather, as David, Psalm 78, verse 49. He cast upon them the fierceness of his anger, indication, wrath, and vexation by sending out of evil angels. So did he afflict Job, Saul, the lunatics and demoniacal persons whom Christ cured. Matthew 4, 8, Luke 4, 11, Luke 13, Mark 9, etc. This, I say, happeneth for a punishment of sin, for their want of faith, incredulity, weakness, distrust, etc. Subsection 3 of witches and magicians, how they cause melancholy. You have heard what the devil can do of himself, now you shall hear what he can perform by his instruments, who are many times worse, if it be possible, than he himself, and to satisfy their revenge and lust cause more mischief. Multa enim mala non egiset daemon, nisi provocatus asagis, as Erastus thinks. Much harm had never been done, had he not been provoked by witches to it. He had not appeared in Samuel's shape, if the witch of Endor had let him alone, or represented those serpents in Pharaoh's presence, had not the magicians urged him unto it. Nec morbos vel hominibus vel brutis in fligeret, Erastus maintains, si sagai quiescerent. Men and cattle might go free, if the witches would let him alone. Many deny witches at all, or if there be any, they can do no harm. Of this opinion is Wierus, Book 3, Chapter 53, De Prestigius Daemonum et Incantationibus ac Beneficiis. Austin Lerkimer, a Dutch writer, Biarmanus, Ewickius, Uwaldus, our countryman Scott, with him in Horace. Somnia terrores magicos, miracula sagas, nocturnas lemores, portentaque thersala risu, excipiunt. Say, can you laugh indignant at the schemes of magic terrors, visionary dreams, portentous wonders, witching imps of hell, the nightly goblin and enchanting spell? They laugh at all such stories, but on the contrary are most lawyers, divines, physicians, philosophers, Austin, Hemingius, Danaeus, Citraeus, Zanchius, Aretius, etc., Del Rio, Springer, Nidarius, Quiatius, Bartolus, Bordine, Godelman, Damhorderius, etc., Paracelsus, Erastus, Scribanius, Camerarius, etc. The parties by whom the devil deals may be reduced to these two, such as command him, in show at least, as conjurers and magicians, whose detestable and horrid mysteries are contained in their book called Arbatel, Demonis enim advocati presto sunt, seque exorcismis, et conjurationibus quasi cogi pationtor, ut miserum magorum genus, in impietate detineant, or such as are commanded, as witches, that deal ex parte implicite, or explicite, as the king hath well defined. Many subdivisions there are, and many several species of sorcerers, witches, enchanters, charmers, etc. They have been tolerated heretofore, some of them, and magic hath been publicly professed in former times, in Salamanca, Quaco, and other places, though after censured by several universities, and now generally contradicted, though practised by some still, maintained and excused. Tanquam res sequita quae non nisi viris magnis, et peculiari beneficio de coelo instructis communicator. I use Bursatus his words, 
and so far approved by some princes, ut nihil ausi agredi in politicis, in sacris, in conciliis, sine eorum arbitrio. They consult still with them, and dare indeed do nothing without their advice. Nero and Hirelio Gabalus, Maxentius, and Julianus Apostata, were never so much addicted to magic of old as some of our modern princes and popes themselves are nowadays. Ericus, king of Sweden, had an enchanted cap, by virtue of which, and some magical murmur or whispering terms, he could command spirits, trouble the air, and make the wind stand which way he could, insomuch that when there was any great wind or storm, the common people were wont to say, the king now had on his conjuring cap, but such examples are infinite. That which they can do is as much almost as the devil himself, who is still ready to satisfy their desires, to oblige them the more unto him. They can cause tempests, storms, which is familiarly practised by witches in Norway, Iceland, as I have proved. They can make friends enemies, and enemies friends by filters. Turpes amores conciliare, enforce love, tell any man where his friends are, about what employed, though in the most remote places, and if they will, bring their sweethearts to them by night, upon a goat's back flying in the air. Sigismund Scheretzius, part 1, chapter 9, De Spectris, reports confidently that he conferred with sundry such, that have been so carried many miles, and that he heard witches themselves confess as much, hurt and infect men and beasts, vines, corn, cattle, plants, make women abortive, not to conceive, barren, men and women unapt and unable, married and unmarried, fifty several ways, saith Bodine, book two, chapter two, fly in the air, meet when and where they will, as Kikogna proves, and Lavata, De Spectris, part two, chapter seventeen, steal young children out of their cradles, ministerio demonum, and put deformed in their rooms, which we call changelings, saith Scheretius, part one, chapter six. Make men victorious, fortunate, eloquent, and therefore in those ancient monomachies and combats they were searched of old, they had no magical charms. They can make stick freeze, such as shall endure a rapier's point, musket shot, and never be wounded. Of which read more in Boisardus, chapter 6, De Magia, the manner of the adjuration, and by whom tis made, where and how to be used, in expeditionibus bellicis, praelius, duellius, etc., with many peculiar instances and examples. They can walk in fiery furnaces, make men feel no pain on the rack, aut alias tortua sentire. They can stanch blood, represent dead men's shapes, alter and turn themselves and others into several forms at their pleasures. Agaberta, a famous witch in Lapland, would do as much publicly to all spectators. Modo Priscilla, Modo Anus, Modo procura ut quercus, modo vaca, avis, colibur, etc. Now young, now old, high, low, like a cow, like a bird, a snake, and what not. She could represent to others what forms they most desired to see, show them friends absent, reveal secrets, maxima omnium admiratione, etc. And yet, for all this subtlety of theirs, as Lipsius well observes, De Physiologica Stoicorum, Book 1, Chapter 17, Neither these magicians nor devils themselves can take away gold or letters out of mine or Crassus' chest, et clientelis suis largiri, for they are base, poor, contemptible fellows most part, as Bodine notes. They can do nothing in judicum decreta aut poenus, in regnum concilia vel arcana, nihil in nem numarium aut thesaurus. They cannot give money to their clients, alter judges' decrees, or counsels of kings. These minuti genii cannot do it. Altiores genii ox tibi ad servirant. The higher powers reserve these things to themselves. Now and then, peradventure, there may be some more famous magicians, like Simon Magus, Apollonius Tineus, Pasetes, Jamblicus, Odo de Stellis, that for a time can build castles in the air, represent armies, etc., as they are said to have done, command wealth and treasure, feed thousands with all variety of meats upon a sudden, protect themselves and their followers from all princes' persecutions by removing from place to place in an instant, reveal secrets, future events, 
tell what is done in far countries, make them appear that died long since, and do many such miracles to the world's terror, admiration, and opinion of deity to themselves. Yet the devil forsakes them at last, they come to wicked ends, and, raro aut nunquam, such impostors are to be found. The vulgar sort of them can work no such feats, but to my purpose they can, last of all, cure and cause most diseases to such as they love or hate, and of this melancholy amongst the rest. Paracelsus, Tom four de morbis arnentium, in express words affirms, Multi fascinanter in melancholium, many are bewitched into melancholy, out of his experience. The same saith Danaeus, book three, de sortiariis vidi, inquit, qui melancholicos morbos gravissimus induxerunt. I have seen those that have caused melancholy in the most grievous manner, dried up women's paps, cured gout, palsy, this and apoplexy, falling sickness, which no physic could help, solo tactu, by touch alone. Ruland in his third Centuria Curationum Empiricarum 91 gives an instance of one David Helder, a young man, who by eating cakes which a witch gave him, mox delirare coepit, began to dote on a sudden, and was instantly mad. F. H. D. in Hildesheim, consulted about a melancholy man, thought his disease was partly magical, and partly natural, because he vomited pieces of iron and lead, and spake such languages as he had never been taught. But such examples are common in Scribanius, Hercules de Saxonia, and others. The means by which they work are usually charms, images, as that in Hector Boethius of King Dufa, characters stamped of sundry metals, and at such and such constellations, knots, amulets, words, filters, etc., which generally make the parties affected, melancholy, as Monavius discourseth at large in an epistle of his to Acolsius, giving instance in a Bohemian baron that was so troubled by a filter taken. Not that there is any power at all in those spells, charms, characters, and barbarous words, but that the devil doth use such means to delude them. Ut fideles inde magus, saith Libanius, in officio retiniat, tum in consortium malefactorum vocet. End of section 24《Section 25 of the Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chris Curran. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1, by Robert Burton. Section 25. Partition 1, Section 2, Member 1, Subsections 4 through 6. Subsection 4. Stars, a cause. Signs from physiognomy, metoposcopy, chiromancy. Natural causes are either primary and universal, or secondary, and more particular. Primary causes are the heavens, planets, stars, etc., by their influence, as our astrologers hold. Producing this and such like effects, I will not here stand to discuss obiter, whether stars be causes or signs, or to apologize for judical astrology. If either Sextus Empiricus, Picus Mirandula, Sextus Ab Herminga, Pererius, Erastus, Chambers, etc., have so far prevailed with any man that he will attribute no virtue at all to the heavens, or to sun or moon more than he doth to their signs at an innkeeper's post, or tradesmen's shop, or generally condemn all such astrological aphorisms approved by experience. I refer him to Bellantus Paravanus, Mariscalarus Goclinius, Sir Christopher Hayden, etc. If thou shalt ask me what I think, I must answer. Nam et doctis hisce erubilus versatus sum, for I am conversant with these learned errors. They do incline, but not compel, so no necessity at all. Agunt non cogunt, and so gently incline, 
that a wise man may resist them. Sapiens dominabitur astris, they rule us, but God rules them. All this, methinks, Johannes de Indagine hath comprised in brief, quarius in me a quantum, and they do but incline, and that so gently, that if we will be ruled by reason, they have no power over us, but if we follow our own nature, and be led by sense, they do as much in us as in brute beasts, and we are no better, so that I hope I may justly conclude with Kajtan, Colium est vehiculum divinae virtutis, etc., that the heaven is God's instrument by meditation of which he governs and disposeth these elementary bodies, or a great book, whose letters are the stars, as one calls it, wherein are written many strange things for such as can read, or an excellent harp made by an eminent workman, on which he sat, he that can but play, will make most admirable music, but to the purpose. Paracelsus is of opinion that a physician, without the knowledge of stars, can neither understand the cause or cure of any disease, either of this or gout not so much as toothache, except he see the peculiar geniture and scheme of the party affected. And for this proper malady, he will have the principal and primary cause of it proceeded from the heaven, ascribed more to the stars than humors, and that the constellation alone many times produceth melancholy all other causes set apart. He gives instance in lunatic persons that are deprived of their wits by the moon's motion, and in another place refers all to the ascendant, and will have the true and chief cause of it to be sought from the stars. Neither is it his opinion only, but of many Galenists and philosophers, though they do not so peremptorily maintain as much. This variety of melancholy symptoms proceeds from the stars, saith Melanchion, the most generous melancholy, as that of Augustus, comes from the conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter in Libra, the bad as that of Calentines, from the meeting of Saturn and the moon in Scorpio, Jovianus Pontanus, in his tenth book and thirteenth chapter de rebus coelestibus discourseth to this purpose at large ex altra bile vari genuantur morbi etc many diseases proceed from black choler as it shall be hot or cold and through it be cold in its own nature yet it is apt to be heated as water may be made to boil and burn as bad as fire or made cold as ice and thence proceed such variety of symptoms, some mad, some solitary, some laugh, some rage, etc. The cause of all which intemperance he will have chiefly and primarily proceed from the heavens from the position of Mars, Saturn, and Mercury. His aphorisms be these Mercury in any genitor, if he shall be found in Virgo or Pisces, his opposite sign, and that in the horoscope Irritated by those quartile aspects of Saturn or Mars, the child shall be mad or melancholy. Again, he that shall have Saturn and Mars, the one culminating, the other in the fourth house, and when he shall be born, shall be melancholy, of which he shall be cured in time. If Mercury behold them, if the moon be in conjunction or opposition at the birth time with the sun, Saturn or Mars, or in a quartile aspect with them, E malo coeli loco, Leo Vitius adds, Many diseases are signified, especially the head and brain is like to be misaffected with pernicious humors, to be malacally lunatic or mad. Cardin adds, Quarta luna natus eclipses, earthquakes. Garceus and Leo Vitius will have the chief judgment to be taken from the lord of the geniture, or where there is an aspect between the moon and mercury and neither behold the horoscope, or Saturn and Mars shall be lord of the present conjunction, or opposition in Sagittarius or Pisces, of the sun or moon. Such persons are commonly epileptic, dote, demonical, melancholy, but see more of these aphorisms in the above-named Pontanus, Garceus, Shoner, which he hath gathered out of Polotomy, Abobiter, 
and some other Arabians, Junctine, Raz Voyus, and therefore partial judges. Then hear the testimony of physicians, Galenists themselves, Carto confesseth the influence of stars to have a great hand to this peculiar disease. So doth Jason Pratensis, Lucinserius, Prefantium, the universal cause, the particular from parents, and the use of the six non-natural examples, to evince the truth of those aphorisms, are common amongst those astrologian treatises. Cardin, in his thirty-seventh geniture, gives instance in Matthews, Bolognius, Daniel Gare, and others, but see Garceus, Lucas, Garichus, etc. The time of this melancholy is when the significators of any geniture are directed according to art, as the whore, moon, hylec, etc., to the hostile beams or terms of Saturn and Mars, especially, or any fixed star of their nature, or if Saturn, by his revolution or transidus, shall offend any of those radical promissors in the geniture. Other signs there are taken from physiognomy, metaposcopy, chiromancy, which be because Johannes de Indagine and Rotman and Landgrave of Hesse, his mathematician, not long since his chiromancy, Baptista Porta, in his celestial physiognomy, have proved to hold great affinity with astrology to satisfy the curious. I am more willing to insert. The general notions the physiognomers give be these. Black color argues natural melancholy, so doth leanness, hair stutinous, broad veins, much hair on the brows, said Gratanarulus, cap seven, and a little head out of Aristotle, high sanguine, red color, shows head melancholy. They that stutter and are bald will be soonest melancholy, as Avincia supposeth, by reason of the dryness of their brains. But he that will know more of the several signs of humor and wits out of physiognomy, let him consult with old Adamantus and Polymus, that comment, or rather paraphrase, upon Aristotle's physiognomy, Baptista Porta's four pleasant books, Michael Scott, De Secretus Naturae, John D. Adagine, Montaltus, Antony Zara, Anatomia, Ingeniorum, Section 1, Member 13, and Book 4. Caromancy hath these aphorism to, to foretell melancholy. Hasnir, Book 5, Chapter 2, who hath comprehended the sum of John D. Adagine, Tricassus, Corvinus, and others in the book. Thus hath it, the Saturnine line going from the Rescheta through the hand to Saturn's mount, and there intersected by certain little lines, argues melancholy. So if the vital and natural make an acute angle aphorism 100, the Saturnine hepatic and natural lines making a gross triangle in the hand, argue as much, which Gauclenius, chapter 5, Chiroscopia repeats verbatim out of him. In general, they conclude all, that if Saturn's mount be full of many small lines and intersections, such men are most part melancholy, miserable and full of disquietness, care and trouble, continually vexed with anxious and bitter thoughts, always sorrowful, fearful, suspicious. They delight in husbandry, buildings, pools, marshes, springs, woods, walks, etc. Thaddeus Hagesius in his Metaposcopia hath certain aphorisms derived from Saturn's lines in the forehead, by which he collects a melancholy disposition, and Baptiza Porta makes observations from those other parts of the body, as if a spot be over the spleen, or in the nails, if it appear black, the signifieth much care, grief, contention, and melancholy, the reason he prefers to the humors, and gives instance in himself that for seven years' space he had such black spots in his nails, and all that while was in perpetual lawsuits, controversies for his inheritance, fear, loss of honor, banishment, grief, care, etc., and when his miseries ended, the black spots vanished. Cardin, in his book De Libris Proprius, tells such a story of his own person, that a little before his son's death he had a black spot which appeared in one of his nails, and dilated itself, 
as he came nearer to his end. But I am over tedious in these toys, which, howsoever, in some men's to severe censures, they may be held absurd and ridiculous. I am the border to insert as not borrowed from circumforanian rogues and gypsies, but out of the writings of worthy philosophers and physicians, yet living some of them, and religious professors in famous universities who are able to patronize that which they have said, and vindicate themselves from all cavaliers and ignorant persons. Subsection 5. Old Age, a Cause. Secondary, peculiar causes efficient, so called in respect of the other precedent, are either congenite, interne, inate, as they term them, inward, innate, inbred, or else outward and adventitious, which happen to us after we are born. Congenite, or born with us, are either natural as old age, or preter naturam, as Fernelius calls it, that distemperature which we have from our parents' need, in being a herit it being a hereditary disease, the first of these, which is natural to all, and which no man living can avoid, is old age, which being cold and dry, and of the same quality as melancholy is, much needs cause it, by dim diminution of spirits and substance, and increasing of adust humors. Therefore, Melanchthon avers out of Aristotle, and in undoubted truth, Sinus plerunque dolorase in senecta, that old men familiarly dote ob atrambilem for black choler, which is then superabundant in them, and Rasis, that Arabian physician in his Contenius Liber, 1, chapter 9, calls it a necessary and inseparable accident to all old and disreset persons after seventy years, as the palmist saith, all is trouble and sorrow, and common experience confirms the truth of it in weak and old persons, especially such as have lived in action all their lives, had great employment, much business, much command, and many servants to oversee and leave off ex abrupto, as Charles V did to King Philip, resign up all on a sudden, they are overcome with melancholy in an instant, or if they do continue in such courses they dote at last, senex bis pure, and are not able to manage their estates through common infirmities incident in their age, full of ache, sorrow, and grief, children again, dizzards, they carl many times as they sit, and talk to themselves, they are angry, washbish, displeased with everything, suspicious of all, wayward, convictuous, hard, saith tolly, self-willed, superstitious, self-conceited, braggers and admirers of themselves, as Balthazar Castillo hath truly noted of them. This natural infirmity is most eminent in old women, and such as are poor, solitary, live in most base esteem and beggary, or such as are witches, insomuch that virus baptissa, portra, auricus, molitor, edwicus, do refer all that witches are said to do, to imagination alone, and this humor of melancholy, and whereas it is controverted, whether they can be witch cattle to death, ride in the air upon a cowl staff out of a chimney top, transform themselves into cats, dogs, etc., translate bodies from place to place, meet in companies and dance as they do, or have carnal copulation with the devil. They ascribe all to this redundant melancholy which domineers in them, to somniferous potions and natural causes the devil's policy. Non landed omnio, sath virus, at quid miriam faciunt. De la mis, Book 3, Chapter 36. Uts putatur, salam vitiatam, habient fatasium. They do no such wonders at all, only their brains are crazed. They think they are witches and can do hurt, but do not. But this opinion, Bodine Erastus Danaeus Scribanius, Sebastian Michaelis, Campanella, De Sensu Rerum, Book 4, Chapter 9, Dandinus, the Jesuit, Book 2, De Anime Explode, Sicagna, Confutes at large, that witches are melancholy, they deny not, but not out of corrupt fantasy alone, so do delude themselves and others, 
or to produce such effects. Subsection 6. Parents, a cause by propagation. That other inward inbred cause of melancholy is our temperature, in whole or part, which we receive from our parents, which Fernelius calls predator neritum, or unnatural, it being a hereditary disease, for as he justifies quale parentum, maxime patris semen, obtirigret, tales evandut, similares spermagetaque paris, quinconque etiam morbo patre, quum generat tenitur cum semen transfert in prolem, such as the temperature of the father is, such as the son's, and look what disease the father had when he begot him, his son will have after him, and is as well inheritor of his infirmities as of his lands, and where the complexion and, and constitution of the father is corrupt, there, saith Roger Bacon, Bacon, the complexion and constitution of the son must needs be corrupt, and so the corruption is derived from the father to the son. Now this doth not so much appear in the composition of the body according to that of Hippocrates, in habit, proportion, scars, and other lineaments, but in manners and conditions of the mind, et patrum in natus abanut, cum simin morus, salutus, had an anchor on his thigh, so had his posterity, as Tragus records, Book 15, Lepidus in Pliny, Book 7, Chapter 17, was pure blind, so was his son. That famous family Aeneobarbi were known of old, and so sure named from their red beards. The Australian lip and those Indian flat noses are propagated. The Bavarian chin and goggle eyes amongst the Jews, as Buxorifus observes, their voice, pace, gesture, looks are likewise derived with all the rest of their conditions and infirmities. Such a mother, such a daughter, their very effectuous lemnus, contends to follow their seed, and the malice and bad conditions of children are many times wholly to be imputed to their parents. I need not, therefore, make any doubt of melancholy, but that is an inheritary disease. Paracelsius, in express words, affirms it. Liberi de morbis, amentium, tome 4, tract 1. So doth Creto in an epistle of his Monveus, Monavius. So doth Bruno Sidelius in his book, De Morbo Incurabile. Montaltus proves, chapter 11, out of Hippocrates and Plutarch, that such hereditary dispositions are frequent. At hanc inquit, ferry, roar, ob participatam, melancholicam, in temporaritum, Speaking of a patient, I think he became so by participation of melancholy. Daniel Sinaritus, Book 1, Part 2, Chapter 9, will have his melancholy constitution derived not only from the father to the son, but to the whole family sometimes. Quando que totus familius hereditativum forestus in his medicinal observations illustrates this point with an example of a merchant his patient that had this infirmity by inheritance, so doth Rodericus a Fonseca, tome 1, consultation 69, by an instance of a young man that was so affected, ex matre melancholica, had a melancholy mother, et vectu melancholico, and bad diet together. Ludovicus Mersatus, a Spanish physician in that excellent tract, which he hath likely written of hereditary diseases, tome 2, book 5, reckons up leprosy as those galbots in Gascony, hereditary lepers, pox, stone, gout, epilepsy, etc. Among the rest, this and madness are a set time comes to many, which he calls a miraculous thing in nature, and sticks forever to them as an incurable habit, and that which is more to be wondered at, it skips in some families the father, and goes to the son, or takes every other, and sometimes every third in a lineal descent, and doth not always produce the same, but some like, and a symbolizing disease, these secondary causes, hence derived, and commonly so powerful, that, as Wolfus holds, sepe, mutant, discretus, sidrum, they do often alter the 
primary causes and decrees of the heavens. For these reasons, be like the hereditary diseases, forbidding such marriages as are any whit allied, and as Mercatus adviseth all families to take such, si firie posit quae maxime, distant natura, and to make choice of those that are most differing in complexion from them, if they love their own, and respect the common good, and sure, I think, it hath been ordered by God's especial providence that all in ages there should be, as usually there is, once in six hundred years, a transmigration of nations to amend and purify their blood as we alter seed upon our land, and that there should be, as it were, inundation of those northern Goths and Vandals, and many such like people which came out of that continent of Scandia and Sarmatia, as some suppose, and overran as a deluge most part of Europe and Africa to alter for our good our complexions, which were much defaced with hereditary infirmities, which by our lust and intemperance we had contracted. A sound generation of strong and able men were sent among us, as those northern men usually are, innocuous, free from riot, and free from diseases, to qualify, and make us as those poor naked Indians are generally at this day, and those about Brazil, as the late writer observes, in the Isle of Maragnan, free thorn, all hereditary diseases, or other contagion, whereas without help of physic they live commonly a hundred twenty years or more, as in the Arachidus and many other places. Such are the common effects of temperance, and the intemperance but I will descend to particular, and show by what means and by whom especially his infirmity is derived unto us. Philae ex senibus nati raro sunt firmi temperamenti. Old men's children are seldom of a good temperament, as Galtzius supposeth, and therefore must apt to this disease, and as Livinus Lemnius father adds, old men beget most part wayward, peevish, sad, melancholy sons, and seldom marry. He that begets a child on a full stomach will either have a sick child or crazed son, as Cardin thinks. Or if the parents be sick, or have any great pain of the head, or medrum, headache, Hieronymus Wolfius doth instance in the child of Sebastian Castalius. If a drunken man get a child, it will never likely have a good brain. As Julius argues, Book 12, Chapter 1, Ebri Gignut, Ebrius, one drunkard, begets another, saith Plutarch, whose sentence Lemnius approves, Asarius, Crutius, Macrobius, Avicenna, and Aristotle himself, foolish, drunken, or harebrained woman, most part being forth children like unto themselves, morosos et langudius, and so likewise he that lies with a menstruous woman, intemperantia, veneris, quam in nautis praesertium, insectator, lemnius, qui exoris, inut nulla menstrui decarusus, ratoin habita nect observato, interlunio precipua causa es noxia pernitosia concubitum hunc exitalem idio ido et pesterfrium vocat roderocus a castro lucanatus detestant ur ad unum omnes medici tum et quarta luna concepti infelices plumque et amites delere stolidi morbosi impuri invalidi tetra lu sordidi miname vitale omnibus bonis corporis atque animi destituti ad laborum nate se senioris inquit estutatius et hercules et alae Jude maxime insectantur fodum hunc et immunandum apud christianas concebitum ut elictium abhorrent et apud suos prohibient et quod christiani totis leprosi alemtes 
tot morbili impedidinis alfi pesore cutis et facii decolorationis tam multi morbi epidemici as serbi et venes gnosi sint in hunc emidium concubitum regicunt et crudelis in pignora vocant qui quarta luna profluente hac mensium ilvue concubitum hunc non prehorescunt damnavit olem divina lex et morte maltavit Punjamoli homnis Leviticus eighteen twenty et inde nati sicque deformis at multe pater dilapaditus quod non quaternerit ab immunda mulere Gregorius Magnus patenti Augustu nundred apud Britianos ujus mori concambutium tolerarit severer prohibit virus sus to mexere fominas in consutis sus menstruus etc i spare to english this which i have said another cause some give inordinate diet as if a man eat garlic onions fat overmuch study too hard be over sorrowful dull heavy dejected in mind perplexed in his thoughts fearful etc their children saith cardan de subtiliante rerum Book 18. Will be much subject to madness and melancholy, for if the spirits of the brain be fuzzled or misaffected by such means at such a time, their children will be fuzzled in the brain, they will be dull, heavy, timorous, contented, all their lives, some are of opinion, and maintain that of paradox or problem, that wise men beget commonly fools, Sudius gives instance in Aristarchus, the grammarian, Doas reliquit filius aristarchum et aristatorum ambos stultos, and which Erasmus ergeth in his moria. Fools beget wise men. Cardin de subtilante, rerum book twelve, gives this cause. Quonium spiritus stadium resolvantur et in cerebrum ventur accorde because their natural spirits are resolved by study and turned into animal drawn from the heart and those other parts of the brain lemnius subscribes to that of cardan and assigns this reason quod persolvant diabitum languide et obscentantir unde fotus apparentum generositate des decisit they pay their debt as paul calls it to their wives remissly, by which means their children are weakings, and many idiots and fools. Some other causes are given, which properly pertain, and do proceed from the mother, if she be over dull, heavy, angry, peevish, discontented, and melancholy, not only at the same time of conception, but even all the while she carries the child in her womb, saith Fernelius, her son will be so likewise affected, and worse, as Lemnius adds, Book Four, Chapter Seven, if she grieve overmuch, be disquieted, or by any casualty be affrighted and terrified by some fearful object, heard or seen, she endangers her child and spoils the temperature of it, for the strange imagination of a woman works effectually upon her infant, that as Baptist supports approves, Sisiognagmone. Celestius, Book Five, Chapter Two. She leaves a mark upon it, which is most especially seen in such as prodigiously long for such and such meats. The child will love those meats, saith Fernelius, and be addicted to like humours. If a great-bellied woman see a hare, her child will often have a hare lip, as we call it. Garcaeus did Judicius Geniturum, Chapter Thirty Three hath a memorable example of one Thomas Nicol, born in the city of Bradburg, 1551, that went reeling and staggering all the days of his life, as if he would fall to the ground, because his mother, being great with child, saw a drunken man reeling in the street. Such another I find in Martin, when Ricius, 
Commentarius de Ortu Monstrorum, Chapter 17. I saw, saith he, at Wittenberg in Germany, a citizen that looked like a carcass. I asked him the chance, he replied. His mother, when she bore him in her womb, saw a carcass by chance, and was so sore affrighted with it, that ex eo fotus e assimilatus from a ghastly impression the child was like it. So many, several ways, are we plagued and punished for our father's defaults, insomuch that as Fernelius truly saith, it is the greatest part of our felicity to be well born, and it were happy for humankind if only such parents as are sound of body and mind should be suffered to marry. An husbandman will sow none but the best and choicest seed upon his land. He will not rear a bull or a horse, except he be right shapen in all parts, or permit him to cover a mare, except he be well assured of his breed. We make choice of the best rams for our sheep, rear the nightest keen, and keep the best dogs. Quanto id diligentius in procrandis liberis observandum? And how careful, then, should we be in beginning of our children? In former times some countries have been so chary in this behalf, so stern, that if a child were crooked or deformed in body or mind, they made him away. So did the Indians of old, by a relation of Certius, and many other well-governed commonwealths, according to the discipline of those times. Heretofore in Scotland, said Roethius, if any were visited with the falling sickness, madness gout leprosy or any such dangerous disease which was likely to be propagated from the father to the son he was instantly guided a woman kept from all company of men and if by chance having some such disease he were found to be with child she be with her brood were buried alive and this was done for the common good lest the whole nation should be injured or corrupted a severe doom you will say and not to be used amongst christians yet more to be looked into than it is. For now, by our too much facility in this kind, in giving way for all to marry that will, too much liberty and indulgence in tolerating all sorts, there is a vast confusion of hereditary diseases, no family secure, no man almost free from some grievous infirmity or other, when no choice is had, but still the eldest must marry, as so many stallions of the race, or if rich, be they fools or dizzards, lame or maimed, unable, intemperate, dissolute, exhaust through riot, as he said, jura hereditario, saphir jobentur, they must be wise and able by inheritance. It comes to pass that our generation is corrupt. We have many weak persons, both in body and mind, many feral diseases raging among us, crazed families, parentis peremptoris, our fathers bad and we are like to be worse. End of section 25 Recording by Chris Caron, Ham Lake, Minnesota Section 26 of The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1, by Robert Burton, Section 26. Partition 1, Section 2. Member 2, Subsection 1. Bad Diet a Cause. Substance, Quality of Meats. According to my proposed method, Having opened hitherto these secondary causes, which are inbred with us, I must now proceed to the outward and adventitious, which happen unto us after we are born. And those are either evident, remote, or inward, antecedent, and the nearest. Continent causes, some call them. These outward, remote, precedent causes are subdivided again into necessary and not necessary. Necessary because we cannot avoid them, but they will alter us as they are used or abused, are those six non-natural things so much spoken of amongst physicians which are principal causes of this disease. 
for almost in every consultation, whereas they shall come to speak of the causes, the fault is found, and this most part objected to the patient. Pecavit Kirka, res sex non naturales. He hath still offended in one of those six. Montanus, consulted about a melancholy Jew, gives that sentence. So did Frisa Melica in the same place, and in his 244th counsel, censoring a melancholy soldier, assigns that reason of his malady. He offended in all those six non-natural things, which were the outward causes, from which came those inward obstructions, and so in the rest. These six non-natural things are diet, retention and evacuation, which are more material than the other because they make new matter, or else are conversant in keeping or expelling it. The other four are air, exercise, sleeping, waking, and perturbations of the mind, which only alter the matter. The first of these is diet, which consists in meat and drink, and causeth melancholy, as it offends in substance or accidents, that is, quantity, quality, or the like. And well it may be called a material cause, since that, as Fernelius holds, it hath such a power in begetting of diseases, and yields the matter and sustenance of them, for neither air, nor perturbations, nor any of those other evident causes take place, or work this effect, except the constitution of body, and preparation of humours, do concur. That a man may say, this diet is the mother of diseases, let the father be what he will, and from this alone melancholy and frequent other maladies arise. Many physicians, I confess, have written copious volumes of this one subject, of the nature and qualities of all manner of meats, as, namely, Galen, Isaac the Jew, Haliabas, Avicenna, Mesue, also four Arabians, Gordonius, Villanovanus, Wecker, Johannes Bruerinus, Citologia de Esculentis et Poculentis, Michael Savanarola, Antony Fumanellus, Liber de Regimen Senum, Curio in his comment on Scola Salerna, Godefridus Stechius, Marsilius Cognatus, Ficinus, Ransovius, Fonseca, Lessius, Magninus, Fritagius, Hugo Fridevalius, etc., besides many other in English, and almost every peculiar physician discourses at large of all peculiar meats in his chapter of melancholy. Yet because these books are not at hand to every man, I will briefly touch what kind of meats engender this humour, through their several species, and which are to be avoided. How they alter and change the matter, spirits first, and after humours, by which we are preserved, and the constitution of our body, Fernelius and others will show you. I hasten to the thing itself, and first of such diet as offends in substance. Beef Beef, a strong and hearty meat, cold in the first degree, dry in the second, saith Galen, Book 3, Chapter 1, De Alimentorum Facultatibus, is condemned by him and all succeeding authors to breed gross melancholy blood. Good for such as are sound and of a strong constitution, for labouring men if ordered aright, corned, young, of an ox, for all gelded meats in every species are held best. Or if old, such as have been tired out with labour are preferred. Orbanus and Sabellicus commend Portugal beef to be the most savoury, best and easiest of digestion. We commend ours, but all is rejected, and unfit for such as lead a resty life, any ways inclined to melancholy or dry of complexion. Talis, Galen thinks, De facile melancholicis aegritudinibus capiuntur. Pork. Pork, of all meats, is most nutritive in its own nature, but altogether unfit for such as live at ease, are any ways unsound of body or mind, too moist, full of humours, and therefore noxia delicatis, saith Savanarola, ex eorum usu ut dubitetur, and febris quartana generetur. Nought for queasy stomachs, insomuch that frequent use of it may breed a quartan ague. Goat. Savonarola discommends goat's flesh, and so doth Bruerinus, Book 13, Chapter 19, calling it a filthy beast and ramish, and therefore supposeth it will breed rank and filthy substance. Yet kid, such as are young and tender, Isaac accepts. 
Verinus and Galen, Book 1, Chapter 1, De Alimentorum Facultatibus. Heart. Heart and red deer hath an evil name. It yields gross nutriment, a strong and great-grained meat next unto a horse, which altogether some countries eat, as Tartars, and they of China, yet Galen condemns. Young foals are as commonly eaten in Spain as red deer, and to furnish their navies, about Malaga especially, often used. But such meats ask for long baking or seething to qualify them, and yet all will not serve. Venison, fallow deer. All venison is melancholy and begets bad blood. A pleasant meat, in great esteem with us, for we have more parks in England than there are in all Europe besides, in our solemn feasts. "'Tis somewhat better hunted than otherwise, and well prepared by cookery, "'but generally bad and seldom to be used. "'Hare. Hare, a black meat, melancholy, and hard of digestion. "'It breeds incubus, often eaten, and causeth fearful dreams. "'So doth all venison, and is condemned by a jury of physicians. "'Misaldus and some others say that hare is a merry meat, and that it will make one fair.' as Marshall's epigram testifies to Gelia. But this is per accidens, because of the good sport it makes, merry company and good discourse that is commonly at the eating of it, and not otherwise to be understood. Conies Conies are of the nature of hares. Magninus compares them to beef, pig, and goat, yet young rabbits by all men are approved to be good. Generally all such meats as are hard of digestion breed melancholy, Aratius, Book 7, Chapter 5, reckons up heads and feet, bowels, brains, entrails, marrow, fat, blood, skins, and those inward parts, as hearts, lungs, liver, spleen, etc. They are rejected by Isaac, Book 2, Part 3, Magninus, Part 3, Chapter 17, Brurinus, Book 12, Savanarola. Milk Milk and all that comes of milk, as butter and cheese, curds, etc., Increase melancholy, whey only excepted, which is most wholesome, some except ass's milk. The rest, to such as are sound, is nutritive and good, especially for young children, but because soon turn to corruption, not good for those that have unclean stomachs, are subject to headache, or have green wounds, stone, etc. Of all cheeses, I take that kind which we call Banbury cheese to be the best, ex vetustis pessimus. The older, stronger, and harder, the worst, as Langius discourseth in his epistle to Melanchthon, cited by Misaldus, Isaac, Galen three, De Cibis Boni Suci, etc. Fowl. Amongst fowl, peacocks, and pigeons, all fenny fowl are forbidden, as ducks, geese, swans, herons, cranes, coots, didappers, water hens, with all those teals, curs, sheldrakes, and peckled fowls that come hither in winter out of Scandia. Muscovy, Greenland, Friesland, which half the year are covered all over with snow and frozen up. Though these be fair in feathers, pleasant in taste, and have a good outside, like hypocrites, white in plumes and soft, their flesh is hard, black, unwholesome, dangerous, melancholy meat. Gravant et putrefaciant stomachum, saith Isaac. Their young ones are more tolerable, but young pigeons he quite disapproves. Fishes Rassus and Magninus discommend all fish, and say they breed viscosities, slimy nutriment, little and humorous nourishment. Savonarola adds, cold, moist, and phlegmatic, Isaac, and therefore unwholesome for all cold and melancholy complexions. Others making a difference, rejecting only amongst freshwater fish, eel, tench, lamprey, crawfish, which Bright approves, chapter 6, and such as are bred in muddy and standing waters, and have a taste of mud as Franciscus Bonsuretus poetically defines, Liber de Aquatilibus. Nam pisces omnes, qui stagna, lacusque frequentant, semper plus succi deterioris habent. All fish that standing pools and lakes frequent do ever yield bad juice and nourishment. Lampreys, Paulus Jovius, chapter 34. De piscibus fluvialibus, highly magnifies and saith, none speak against them, but inepte et scrupulosi, some scrupulous persons, but eels, chapter 33, he abhorreth in all places, at all times, all physicians detest them, especially about the solstice. 
Gomesius, Book 1, Chapter 22, De Sale, doth immoderately extol sea fish, which others as much vilify, and above the rest, dried, soused, indurate fish, as ling, fumadas, red herrings, sprats, stockfish, haberdeen, poor john, or shellfish. Timothy Bright accepts lobster and crab. Messarius commends salmon, which Bruerinus contradicts, Book 22, Chapter 17. Magninus rejects conger, sturgeon, turbot, mackerel, skate. Carp is a fish of which I know not what to determine. Franciscus Bonsuetus accounts it a muddy fish. Hippolytus Salvianus, in his book De Piscium Natura et Preparatione, which was printed at Rome in folio 1554, with most elegant pictures, esteems carp no better than a slimy, watery meat. Paulus Jovius, on the other side, disallowing tench, approves of it. So doth Dubravius in his books of fish ponds. Fritagius extols it for an excellent wholesome meat, and puts it among the fishes of the best rank, and so do most of our country gentlemen, that store their ponds almost with no other fish. But this controversy is easily decided in my judgment by Brewerinus, Book 22, Chapter 13. The difference riseth from the sight and nature of pools, sometimes muddy, sometimes sweet. They are in taste as the places from whence they be taken. In like manner, almost, we may conclude of other fresh fish. But see more in Rondoletius, Bellonius, Oribasius, Book 7, Chapter 22, Isaac, Book 1, especially Hippolytus Salvianus, who is instar omnium solus, etc., Howsoever they may be wholesome and approved, much use of them is not good. Forestus, in his medicinal observations, relates that Carthusian friars, whose living is most part fish, are more subject to melancholy than any other order, and that he found by experience, being sometimes their physician ordinary at Delft in Holland. He exemplifies it with an instance of one Buscotnese, a Carthusian of a ruddy colour, and well liking, that by solitary living and fish-eating, became so misaffected. Herbs. Among herbs to be eaten, I find gourds, cucumbers, colworts, melons disallowed, but especially cabbage. It causeth troublesome dreams, and sends up black vapours to the brain. Galen de locus affectis, book 3, chapter 6. Of all herbs condemns cabbage, and Isaac, book 2, chapter 1, animae gravitatum facit, it brings heaviness to the soul. Some are of the opinion that all raw herbs and salads breed melancholy blood, except bugloss and lettuce. Crato speaks against all herbs and worts, except borage, bugloss, fennel, parsley, dill, balm, succory. Magninus, omnes herbi simpliciter malae via kibi, all herbs are simply evil to feed on, as he thinks. So did that scoffing cook in Plautus hold. Non ego conum condio ut alii coqui solent, qui mihi condita prata in pratinus proferunt, boves qui convivas faciunt, herbasque agarunt. Like other cooks, I do not suffer dress that put whole meadows into a platter, and make no better of their guests than beeves, with herbs and grass to feed them fatter. Our Italians and Spaniards do make a whole dinner of herbs and salads, which our said Plautus calls Coenus terrestris, Horus, Coenus sine sanguine, by which means, as he follows it, Hic homines tam brevum vitam colent, qui herbus hujus modi in alvum sum congerent, formidolosum dictu, non esum modo, quas herbus pecodes non edunt, homines edunt. Their lives that eat such herbs must needs be short, and tis a fearful thing for to report, that men should feed on such a kind of meat, which very juments would refuse to eat. They are windy, and not fit therefore to be eaten of all men raw, though qualified with oil, but in broths or otherwise. See more of these in every husbandman and herbalist. Roots Roots et si curandum gentium ope sint, saith Bruerinus. The wealth of some countries and sole food are windy and bad, or troublesome to the head, as onions, garlic, scallions, turnip, carrots, radishes, parsnips. Crato disallows all roots, though some approve of parsnips and potatoes. Bagninus is of Crato's opinion. 
They trouble the mind, sending gross fumes to the brain, make men mad, especially garlic, onions, if a man liberally feed on them a year together. Guianerius complains of all manner of roots, and so doth Bruerinus, even parsnips themselves, which are the best. Book 9, Chapter 14 Fruits Pastinacarum usa succus gignit improbos. Crato utterly forbids all manner of fruits, as pears, apples, plums, cherries, strawberries, nuts, medlars, serves, etc. Sanguinum inficiunt, saith Villanovanus. They infect the blood and putrefy it, Magninus holds, and must not therefore be taken, via cibi, aut quantitate magna, not to make a meal of, or in any great quantity. Cardan makes that a cause of their continual sickness at Fessa in Africa, because they live so much on fruits, eating them thrice a day. Laurentius approves of many fruits, in his tract of melancholy, which others disallow, and amongst the rest apples, which some likewise commend, sweetings, pearmains, pippins, as good against melancholy. But to him that is any way inclined to, or touched with this malady, Nicholas Piso in his practics forbids all fruits as windy, or to be sparingly eaten at least, and not raw. Amongst other fruits, Bruerinus out of Galen, excepts grapes and figs, but I find them likewise rejected. Pulse. All pulse are not, beans, peas, vetches, etc. They fill the brain, saith Isaac, with gross fumes, breed black thick blood, and cause troublesome dreams. And therefore, that which Pythagoras said to his scholars of old, may be for ever applied to melancholy men. A fabis abstinete. Eat no peas nor beans, yet to such as will needs eat them. I would give this counsel, to prepare them according to those rules that Arnoldus Villanovanus and Freytagius prescribe, for eating and dressing, fruits, herbs, roots, pulse, etc. Spices. Spices cause hot and head melancholy, and are for that cause forbidden by our physicians to such men as are inclined to this malady as pepper, ginger, cinnamon, cloves, mace, dates, etc., honey and sugar. Some except honey. To those that are cold it may be tolerable, but dulcia se in bilum vertent, sweets turn into bile. They are obstructive. Crato therefore forbids all spice in a consultation of his, for a melancholy schoolmaster. Omnia aromatica et quidquid sanguinem adurit. So doth Fernelius, Guianerius, Mercurialis. To these I may add all sharp and sour things, luscious and oversweet, or fat, as oil, vinegar, verjuice, mustard, salt. As sweet things are obstructive, so these are corrosive. Gomesius in his books De Sale, Book 1, Chapter 21, highly commends salt. So doth Codroncus in his tract De Sale Absinthii. Lemnius, Book 3, Chapter 9, De Occultis Naturae Miraculis, yet common experience finds salt and salt meats to be great procurers of this disease, and for that cause be like those Egyptian priests abstained from salt, even so much as in their bread. Ut sine perturbatione anima esset, saith mine author, that their souls might be free from perturbations. Bread Bread that is made of baser grain, as peas, beans, oats, rye, or over-hard baked, crusty and black, is often spoken against, as causing melancholy juice and wind. Joel Mayer, in the first book of his History of Scotland, contends much for the wholesomeness of oat and bread. It was objected to him then living in Paris in France that his countrymen fed on oats and base grain, as a disgrace. But he doth ingeniously confess... Scotland, Wales, and a third part of England did most part use that kind of bread, that it was as wholesome as any grain, and yielded as good nourishment. And yet Wecker out of Galen calls it horse meat, and fitter for Jumans than men to feed on. But read Galen himself, Book 1 de Cibis Boni et Mali Suki, more largely discoursing of corn and bread. Wine. All black wines, over hot, compound, strong, thick drinks, as muscadine, malmsey, alicant, rumney, brown bastard, mesoglen, and the like, of which they have thirty several kinds in Muscovy, all such made drinks are hurtful in this case, to such as are hot, or of a sanguine, choleric complexion, young, or inclined to head melancholy. For many times the drinking of wine alone causeth it. Arculanus, chapter 16, in 9 Rasis, puts in wine for a great cause, 
especially if it be immoderately used. Guianerius tells a story of two Dutchmen, to whom he gave entertainment in his house, that in one month's space were both melancholy by drinking of wine. One did naught but sing, the other sigh. Galen, De Causis Morborum, Chapter 3, Matthiolus on Dioscorides, and above all, other Andreas Bacchius, Book 3, 18, 19, 20, have reckoned upon those inconveniences that come by wine, yet notwithstanding all this, to such as are cold or sluggish melancholy, a cup of wine is good physic, and so doth Mercurialis grant, in that case, if the temperature be cold, as to most melancholy men it is, wine is much commended, if it be moderately used. Cider, Perry. Cider and Perry are both cold and windy drinks, and for that cause to be neglected, and so are all those hot-spiced strong drinks. Beer. Beer, if it be over-new or over-stale, over-strong or not sodden, smell of the cask, sharp or sour, is most unwholesome, frets and galls, etc. Henricus Irerus, in a consultation of his, for one that laboured of hypochondriacal melancholy, discommends beer. So doth Crato in that excellent counsel of his, as too windy, because of the hop. But he means belike that thick black bohemian beer used in some other parts of Germany. Nil specius illa, dum bibitur, nil clarius est dum mingitur, unde constat, quod multas facus in corpore linquat. Nothing comes in so thick, nothing goes out so thin, it must needs follow then, the dregs are left within. As that old poet scoffed, calling it Stygii monstrum conforme paludi, a monstrous drink, like the river Styx. But let them say as they list, to such as are accustomed unto it, tis a most wholesome, so Polydore Virgil calleth it, and a pleasant drink. It is more subtle and better, for the hop that rarefies it, hath an especial virtue against melancholy, as our herbalists confess, Fusius approves, and many others. Waters Standing waters, thick and ill-coloured, such as come forth of pools and moats, where hemp hath been steeped, or slimy fishes live, are most unwholesome, putrefied, and full of mites, creepers, slimy, muddy, unclean, corrupt, impure, by reason of the sun's heat, and still standing. They cause foul distemperatures in the body and mind of man, are unfit to make drink of, to dress meat with, or to be used about men inwardly or outwardly. They are good for many domestic uses, to wash horses, water cattle, etc., or in time of necessity, but not otherwise. Some are of the opinion that such fat standing waters make the best beer, and that seething doth defecate it, as Cardan holds, Book 13, De Subtilitate Rerum. It mends the substance and savour of it, but it is a paradox. Such beer may be stronger, but not so wholesome as the other, as Gilbertus truly justifieth out of Galen, that the seething of such impure waters doth not purge or purify them. Pliny, Book 31, Chapter 3, is of the same tenet, and Petrus Crescentius, the Omnibus Agriculturae Partibus, Book 1 and Book 4, Chapter 11 and Chapter 45. Pamphilius Herilacus, such waters are not, not to be used, and by the testimony of Galen, breed agues, dropsies, pleurisies, splenetic and melancholy passions, hurt the eyes, cause a bad temperature, and ill disposition the whole body, with bad colour. This Gilbertus stiffly maintains, that it causeth blear eyes, bad colour, and many loathsome diseases to such as use it. This which they say, stands with good reason, for as geographers relate, the water of Astrakhan breeds worms in such as drink it. Axius, or as now called Verduri, the fairest river in Macedonia, makes all cattle black that taste of it. Aliakman, now Peleca, another stream in Thessaly, turns cattle most part white. See Polui Ducas. L. Urbanus Rohemus refers that struma or poke of the Bavarians and Styrians to the nature of their waters, as Munster doth that of Valesians in the Alps, and Bodine supposeth the stuttering of some families in Aquitania about Labden to proceed from the same cause, and that the filth is derived from the water to their bodies, so that they that use filthy, standing, ill-coloured, thick, muddy water must needs have muddy, ill-coloured, 
impure and infirm bodies, and because the body works upon the mind, they shall have grosser understandings, dull, foggy, melancholy spirits, and be really subject to all manner of infirmities. To these noxious simples we may reduce an infinite number of compound, artificial, made dishes, of which our cooks afford us a great variety, as tailors do fashions in our apparel. Such are puddings stuffed with blood, or otherwise composed, baked meats, soused endured meats, fried and broiled buttered meats, condit, powdered and over-dried, all cakes, simnels, buns, cracknels made with butter, spice, etc., fritters, pancakes, pies, sausages, and those several sauces, sharp or over-sweet, of which scientia popinae, as Seneca calls it, hath served those apician tricks, and perfumed dishes, which Adrian the sixth pope so much admired in the accounts of his predecessor Leo Decimus, and which prodigious riot and prodigality have invented in this age. These do generally engender gross humours, fill the stomach with crudities, and all those inward parts with obstructions. Montanus gives instance, in a melancholy Jew, that by eating such tart sauces, made dishes, and salt meats, with which he was overmuch delighted, became melancholy, and was evil affected. Such examples are familiar and common. End of section 26 Section 27 of The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1 by Robert Burton, Section 27 Partition 1, Section 2, Member 2, Subsection 2 Quantity of diet a cause. There is not so much harm proceeding from the substance itself of meat and quality of it, in ill dressing and preparing, as there is from the quantity, disorder of time and place, unseasonable use of it, intemperance, overmuch or over little taking of it. A true saying is, plures crapula quam gladius. This gluttony kills more than the sword the omnivorantia et homicidia gula, this all-devouring and murdering gut. And that of Pliny is truer. Simple diet is the best. Heaping up of several meats is pernicious, and sauce is worse. Many dishes bring many diseases. Avican cries out, that nothing is worse than to feed on many dishes, or to protract the time of meats longer than ordinary. From thence proceed our infirmities, and tis the fountain of all diseases, which arise out of the repugnancy of gross humours. Thence, saith Fernelius, come crudities, wind, opilations, cacochymia, plethora, cachexia, bradiopepsia, hinc subitae, mortes, atque intestata senectus, sudden death, etc., and what not. As a lamp is choked with a multitude of oil, or a little fire with overmuch wood quite extinguished, so is the natural heat with the moderate eating strangled in the body. Pernitiosa sentina est abdomen insaturabili, one saith. An insatiable paunch is a pernicious sink, and the fountain of all diseases, both of body and mind. Mercurialis will have it a peculiar cause of this private disease. Solenander illustrates this of Mercurialis, with an example of one so melancholy. Ab in tempestivis, commissationibus, unseasonable feasting. Crato confirms as much, in that often cited counsel, 21, book 2, putting superfluous eating for a main cause. But what need I seek farther for proofs? Here Hippocrates himself, book 2, aphorism 10. Impure bodies, the more they are nourished, the more they are hurt, for the nourishment is putrefied with vicious humours. And yet for all this harm, which apparently follows surfeiting and drunkenness, see how we luxuriate and rage in this kind. Read what Johannes Stuckius hath written lately of this subject, in his great volume, De Antiquorum Convivius, and of our present age, Quam Portentosae Coenae, Prodigious Suppers, 
quidam invitant ad coenum efferunt ad sepulchrum. What phagos, epicures, apatios, heliogables our times afford. Lucullus's ghost walks still, and every man desires to sup in Apollo. Aesop's costly dish is ordinarily served up. Magis illa juvant, quae pluris ementor. The dearest cakes are best, and tis an ordinary thing to bestow twenty or thirty pounds on a dish, some thousand crowns upon a dinner. Muli Hamet, king of Fez and Morocco, spent three pounds on the sauce of a capon. It is nothing in our times. We scorn all that is cheap. We loathe the very light, some of us, as Seneca notes, because it comes free, and we are offended with the sun's heat, and those cool blasts, because we buy them not. This air we breathe is so common we care not for it. Nothing pleaseth but what is dear. And if we be witty in anything, it is ad gulam. If we study at all, it is erudito luxu, to please the palate, and to satisfy the gut. A cook of old was a base knave, as Livy complains, but now a great man in request. Cookery is become an art, a noble science. Cooks are gentlemen, venter deus. They wear their brains in their bellies, and their guts in their heads, as Agrippa taxed some parasites of his time, rushing on their own destruction, as if a man should run upon the point of a sword, usque dum rupanto comedunt. They eat till they burst. All day, all night, let the physician say what he will, imminent danger and feral diseases are now ready to seize upon them. That will eat till they vomit. Edunt ut vomant, vomit ut edunt saith Seneca, which Dion relates of Vitellius. Solo transitu ciborum nutriri judicatus. His meat did pass through and away, or till they burst again. Strage animantium ventrum honorant, and rake over all the world as so many slaves, belly gods, and land serpents. Et totus orbis ventri nimis angustus. The whole world cannot satisfy their appetite. Sea, land, rivers, lakes, etc., may not give content to their raging guts. To make up the mess, what immoderate drinking in every place! Senum potum pota trahebut anus! How they flock to the tavern, as if they were fruges consumere natae, born to no other end but to eat and drink, like Ophelius Bibulus, that famous Roman parasite! Quidum vixit, aut bibit, aut minxit! as so many casks to hold wine, yea, worse than a cask, that mars wine, and itself is not marred by it. Yet these are brave men, Selenus Ebrius was no braver. Et quae furant vitia, more sunt. Tis now the fashion of our times, an honour. Nunc vero res ista eo rediit, as Chrysostomo, Sermo, 30, in, in 5 Ephesios comments. Ut effeminatae, ridendaequae, Ignaviae loco habiato, nolle inebriari. Tis now come to pass that he is no gentleman, a very milksop, a clown of no bringing up, that will not drink. Fit for no company, he is your only gallant that plays it off finest. No disparagement now to stagger in the streets, reel, rave, etc., but much to his fame and renown. As in like case Epidicus told Thesprio his fellow servant, in the poet, Aedipol facinus improbum. One urged, the other replied, At jam alii vacere idem, erit illi illa res honori. Tis now no fault. There be so many brave examples to bear one out. Tis a credit to have a strong brain, and carry his liquor well, the sole contention who can drink most, and fox his fellow the soonest. Tis the summum bonum of our tradesmen, their felicity, life, and soul. Tanta dulcedine affectant, saith Pliny. Book 14, Chapter 12. Ut magna pars non aliud vitae premium intelligat. Their chief comfort, to be merry together in an alehouse or tavern, as our modern Muscovites do in their mead inns, and Turks in their coffee houses, which much resemble our taverns. They will labour hard all day long to be drunk at night, and spend totius ani labores, as St. Ambrose adds, in a tippling feast, convert day into night, as Seneca taxes some in his times, pervertunt officia an noctis et lucis, when we rise, they commonly go to bed, like our antipodes. Nosque ubi primus equis oriens afflavit anhelis, 
Illis Sera Rubens ascendit Lumina Vesper. So did Petronius in Tacitus, Heliogabalus in Lampridius. Noctes vigilibat ad ipsum, Mane diem totem stertebat. He drank the night away till rising dawn, then snored out all the day. Snimdiris the Sybarite never saw the sun rise or set so much as once in twenty years. Verus, against whom Tully so much inveighs, in winter he never was extra tectum vix extra lectum, never almost out of bed, still wenching and drinking, so did he spend his time, and so do myriads in our days. They have gymnasia bibonum, schools and rendezvous. These centres and lapithi toss pots and bowls as so many balls, invent new tricks, as sausages, anchovies, tobacco, caviar, pickled oysters, herrings, fumados, etc., innumerable salt meats to increase their appetite, and study how to hurt themselves by taking antidotes to carry their drink the better. And when naught else serves, they will go forth, or be conveyed out, to empty their gorge, that they may return to drink afresh. They make laws, in sanas leges, contra bibende fallacias, and brag of it when they have done, crowning that man that is soonest gone, as their drunken predecessors have done, quid ego video, thus cum corona pseudolum, ebrium tuum, and when they are dead, will have a can of wine with Maron's old woman to be engraven on their tombs, so they triumph in villainy, and justify their wickedness. With Rabelai, that French Lucian, drunkenness is better for the body than physic, because there be more old drunkards than old physicians. Many such frothy arguments they have, inviting and encouraging others to do as they do, and love them dearly for it. No glue like to that of good fellowship. So did Alcibiades in Greece, Nero, Bonosus, Heliogabalus in Rome, or Allegabalus rather, as he was styled of old, as Ignatius proves out of some old coins. So do many great men still. As Herasbachius observes, when a prince drinks till his eyes stare, like Bitius in the poet, Ille impiger hausit, Sprumantum vino paterum, a thirsty soul, he took challenge and embraced the bowl, with pleasure swilled the gold, nor ceased to draw till he the bottom of the brimmer saw. And comes off clearly, sound trumpets, fife and drums, the spectators will applaud him, the bishop himself, if he belie them not, with his chaplain will stand by and do as much. O dignum principe haustum, t'was done like a prince. Our Dutchmen invite all comers with a pail and a dish. Valet infundibula integras obas exhoriant, et in monstrosis poculis, ipsi monstrosi monstrosius epotant, making barrels of their bellies, incredibly dictu, as one of their own countrymen complains, quantum licoris immodestissima gens capiat, etc. How they love a man that will be drunk, crown him and honour him for it, hate him that will not pledge him, stab him, kill him, a most intolerable offence, and not be forgiven. He is a mortal enemy that will not drink with him, as Munster relates of the Saxons. So in Poland he is the best servitor, and the honestest fellow, as Alexander Gaguinus, that drinketh most health to the honour of his master, he shall be rewarded as a good servant, and held the bravest fellow that carries his liquor best, when a brewer's horse will bear much more than any sturdy drinker, Yet for his noble exploits in this kind he shall be accounted a most valiant man. For, tam inter epilas fortis vir esse potest ac in bello. As much valour is to be found in feasting as in fighting, and some of our city captains and carpet knights will make this good and prove it. Thus they many times willfully pervert the good temperature of their bodies, stifle their wits, strangle nature, and degenerate into beasts. Some again are in the other extreme, and draw this mischief on their heads by too ceremonious and strict diet, being over-precise, cockney-like, and curious in their observation of meats, times, as that Medicina Statica prescribes, just so many ounces at dinner, which Lessius enjoins, so much at supper, not a little more, nor a little less, of such meat, and at such hours, a diet drink in the morning, cock-broth, china-broth at dinner, plum-broth, a chicken, a rabbit, rib of a rack of mutton, wing of a capon, the merry thought of a hen, etc., to sounder bodies this is too nice and most absurd. Others offend in overmuch fasting, pining a days, says Guianerius, and waking a nights, 
as many Moors and Turks in these our times do. Anchorites, monks, and the rest of that superstitious rank, as the same Guianarius witnesseth, that he hath often seen to have happened in his time, through immoderate fasting, have been frequently mad. Of such men belike Hippocrates speaks, when, as he saith, they more offend into sparing diet, and are worse damnified than they that feed liberally and are ready to surfeit. End of section 27 Section 28 of The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Morgan Scorpion The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1 by Robert Burton, Section 28 Partition 1, Section 2 Member 2, Subsections 3 and 4 Subsection 3 Custom of diet, delight, appetite, necessity, how they cause or hinder. No rule is so general which admits not some exception. To this, therefore, which hath been hitherto said, for I shall otherwise put most men out of commons, and those inconveniences which proceed from the substance of meats, an intemperate or unseasonable use of them, custom somewhat detracts and qualifies, according to that of Hippocrates too, Aphorisms 50. Such things as we have been long accustomed to, though they be evil in their own nature, yet they are less offensive. Otherwise it might well be objected that it were a mere tyranny to live after those strict rules of physic, for custom doth alter nature itself, and to such as are used to them it makes bad meats wholesome, and unseasonable times to cause no disorder. Cider and perry are windy drinks, so are all fruits windy in themselves, cold most part, yet in some shires of England, Normandy in France, Ripuscoa in Spain, tis their common drink, and they are no whit offended with it. In Spain, Italy and Africa, they live most on roots, raw herbs, camel's milk, and it agrees well with them, which to a stranger will cause much grievance. In Wales, Lacticinius Vescuntur, as Humphrey Lloyd confesseth, a Cambro Briton himself, in his elegant epistle to Abraham Ortelius, they live most on white meats, in Holland on fish, roots, butter, and so at this day in Greece, as Bolognius observes, they had much rather feed on fish than flesh. With us, Maxima pars victus in carne consistit, we feed on flesh most part saith Polydor Virgil, as all northern countries do, and it would be very offensive to us to live after their diet, or they to live after ours. We drink beer, they wine, they use oil, we butter. We in the north are great eaters, they most sparing in those hotter countries, and yet they and we, following our own customs, are well pleased. An Ethiopian of old, seeing an European eat bread, wondered, Promodus de Colibus Vescentes Viverimus, how we could eat such kind of meats. So much differed his countrymen from ours in diet, that, as mine author infers, si quis illorum victum apud nos eonulari velet. If any man should so feed with us, it would be all one to nourish, as Sicuta, Aconitum, or Hellebore itself. At this day in China, the common people live in a manner altogether on roots and herbs, and to the wealthiest, horse, ass, mule, dogs, cat flesh, is as delightsome as the rest. So Matthias Riccius, the Jesuit, relates, who lived many years amongst them. The Tartars eat raw meat, and most commonly horse flesh, drink milk and blood, as the nomades of old, et lac concretum cum sanguine potat equino. They scoff at our Europeans for eating bread, which they call tops of weeds, and horse meat not fit for men. And yet Scalinger accounts them a sound and witty nation. Living a hundred years, even in the civilest country of them they do thus, as Benedict the Jesuit observed in his travels, from the great mogul's court by land to Peking, which Riccius contends to be the same with Cambalu in Cataya. In Scandia their bread is usually dried fish, and so likewise in the Shetland Isles, and their other fare, as in Iceland, saith Dithmarus Bleskenius, 
butter, cheese, and fish, their drink, water, their lodging on the ground. In America, in many places, their bread is roots, their meat, palmettos, peanuts, potatoes, etc., and such fruits. There be of them, too, that familiarly drink salt sea water all their lives, eat raw meat, grass, and that with delight. With some, fish, serpents, spiders, and in divers places they eat man's flesh, raw and roasted, even the Emperor Montezuma himself. In some coasts, again, one tree yields them coconuts, meat and drink, fire, fuel, apparel, with his leaves, oil, vinegar, cover for houses, etc., and yet these men going naked, feeding coarse, live commonly a hundred years, are seldom or never sick, all which diet our physicians forbid. In Westphalia they feed most part on fat meats and worts, knuckle deep, and call it cerebrum jovis. In the low countries with roots, in Italy frogs and snails are used. The Turks, saith Busbequius, delight most in fried meats. In Muscovy, garlic and onions are ordinary meat and sauce, which would be pernicious to such as are unaccustomed to them, delightsome to others, and all is because they have been brought up unto it. Husbandmen, and such as labour, can eat fat bacon, salt gross meat, hard cheese, etc., o dura mesorum illa, coarse bread at all times, go to bed and labour upon a full stomach, which to some idle persons would be present death and is against the rules of physic, so that custom is all in all. Our travellers find this by common experience when they come in far countries and use their diet. They are suddenly offended, as are Hollanders and Englishmen, when they touch upon the coasts of Africa. Those Indian capes and islands are commonly molested with calentures, fluxes, and much distempered by reason of their fruits. Peregrina, esti suavia solent, Vescentibus perturbationis insignes at fere. Strange meats, though pleasant, cause notable alterations and distempers. On the other side, use or custom mitigates or makes all good again. Mithridates, by often use, which Pliny wonders at, was able to drink poison, and a maid, as Curtius records, sent to Alexander from King Porus, was brought up with poison from her infancy. The Turks, saith Bolognius, Book 3, Chapter 15, eat opium familiarly, a dram at once, which we dare not take in grains. Garcias ab Horto writes of one whom he saw at Goa in the East Indies, that took ten drams of opium in three days, and yet, consulto loquebato, spake understandingly, so much custom can do. Theophrastus speaks of a shepherd that could eat hellebore in substance, and therefore Cardan concludes out of Galen, Consuetudinem ut cunque ferendam, nisi valde malum. Custom is, however, to be kept, except it be extremely bad. He adviseth all men to keep their old customs, and that by the authority of Hippocrates himself. Dandum aliquid tempori, etati regione, consuetudini, and therefore to continue as they began, be it diet, bath, exercise, etc., or whatsoever else. Another exception is delight or appetite to such and such meats, though they be hard of digestion, melancholy, yet as Fuchsius accepts, the stomach doth readily digest and willingly entertain such meats we love most, and are pleasing to us. Abhors on the other side such as we distaste, which Hippocrates confirms, Aphorisms 2.38. Some cannot endure cheese out of a secret antipathy, or to see a roasted duck, which to others is a delightsome meat. The last exception is necessity, poverty, want, hunger, which drives men many times to do that which otherwise they are loath, cannot endure, and thankfully to accept of it, as beverage in ships and in sieges of great cities, to feed on dogs, cats, rats, and men themselves. Three outlaws in Hector Boethius, being driven to their shifts, did eat raw flesh, and flesh of such fowl as they could catch, in one of the Hebrides for some few months. These things do mitigate or disannul that which hath been said of melancholy meats, and make it more tolerable, but to such as are wealthy, live plenteously, at ease, may take their choice, and refrain if they will. These viands are to be forborne, 
if they be inclined to, or suspect melancholy, as they tender their healths. Otherwise, if they be intemperate or disordered in their diet, at their peril be it, qui monet amat ave et cave. He who advises is your friend. Farewell, and to your health attend. Subsection 4 Retention and Evacuation, a Cause and How Of retention and evacuation there be diverse kinds, which are either concomitant, assisting, or sole causes many times of melancholy. Galen reduceth defect and abundance to this head, others, all that is separated or remains. Costiveness In the first rank of these I may well reckon up costiveness, and keeping in of our ordinary excrements, which as it often causeth other diseases, so this of melancholy in particular. Celsus Book 1, Chapter 3 saith, It produceth inflammation of the head, dullness, cloudiness, headache, etc. Prosper calenus, liber de atra bile, will have it distemper not the organ only, but the mind itself by troubling of it and sometimes it is a sole cause of madness, as you may read in the first book of Skenkius's Medicinal Observations. A young merchant going to Nordling Fair in Germany, for ten days' space never went to stool. At his return he was grievously melancholy, thinking that he was robbed, and would not be persuaded but that all his money was gone. His friends thought he had some philtrum given him, but Knellinus, a physician, being sent for, found his costiveness alone to be the cause, and thereupon gave him a clister, by which he was speedily recovered. Trincavelius saith as much of a melancholy lawyer, to whom he administered physic, and Rodericus, a Fonseca, of a patient of his, that for eight days was bound, and therefore melancholy affected. Other retentions and evacuations there are, not simply necessary, but at some times, as Fernelius accounts them, as suppression of haemorrhoids, monthly issue in women, bleeding at nose, immoderate or no use at all of venous or any other ordinary issues. Detention of haemorrhoids or monthly issues. Villanovanus, Arculanus, chapter 16 in 9. Rassis, Vittorius Faventinus, Bruel, etc., put for ordinary causes. Fuchsius, book 2, section 5, chapter 30, goes farther and saith, that many men unseasonably cured of the haemorrhoids have been corrupted with melancholy. Seeking to avoid Scylla, they fall into Charybdis. Galen illustrates this by example of Lucius Martius, whom he cured of madness, contracted by this means. And Skenkius hath two other instances of two melancholy and mad women, so caused from the suppression of their months. The same may be said of bleeding at the nose, if it be suddenly stopped, and have been formerly used, as Villanovanus urgeth, and Fuchsius, Book 2, Section 5, Chapter 33, stiffly maintains that without great danger such an issue may not be stayed. Venus omitted produceth like effects. Mathulius avoucheth of his knowledge that some through bashfulness abstained from venery, and thereupon became very heavy and dull, and some others that were very timorous melancholy, and beyond all measure sad. Oribasius speaks of some, that if they do not use carnal copulation, are continually troubled with heaviness and headache, and some in the same case by intermission of it. Not use of it hurts many, Arculanus, chapter 6, in 9, Rasis, et Magninus, part 3, chapter 5, think, because it sends up poisoned vapours to the brain and heart and so doth Galen himself hold. That if this natural seed be overlong kept in some parties, it turns to poison. Hieronymus Mercurialis, in his chapter of melancholy, cites it for an especial cause of this malady, priapismus, satyriasis, etc. Haliabus reckons up this and many other diseases. Villanovanus saith, he knew many monks and widows grievously troubled with melancholy, and that from this sole cause. Ludovicus Mercatus, Book 2, De Mulierum Affectionibus, Chapter 4, and Rodericus Acastro, De Morbus Mulierum, Book 2, Chapter 3, treat largely of this subject, and will have it produce a peculiar kind of melancholy in stale maids, nuns, and widows. 
ob suppressionum mensium et venerium omrisum, timidae, moestae anxiae, vericundae, suspiciosae, languentes, consilii inopes, cum summa vitae et rerum meliorum desperatione, etc. They are melancholy in the highest degree, and all for want of husbands. Elianus Montaltus, cap. 37 de melancholy, confirms as much out of Galen, so doth Vierus. Christophorus a Vega de Art, med. lib. 3, c. 14, relates many such examples of men and women that he had seen so melancholy. Felix Plater, in the first book of his observations, tells a story of an ancient gentleman in Alsatia that married a young wife and was not able to pay his debts in that kind for a long time together, by reason of his several infirmities. But she, because of this inhibition of Venus, fell into a horrible fury, and desired every one that came to see her, by words, looks, and gestures, to have to do with her, etc. Bernardus Paternus, a physician, said, he knew a good, honest, godly priest, that because he would neither willingly marry, nor make use of the stews, fell into grievous melancholy fits. Hildesheim hath such another example of an Italian melancholy priest, in a consultation had anno 1580. Jason Pratensis gives instance in a married man, that from his wife's death abstaining, after marriage, became exceedingly melancholy. Rodericus a Fonseca in a young man so misaffected. To these you may add, if you please, that conceited tale of a Jew, so visited in like sort, and so cured, out of Poggius Florentinus. Intemperate Venus is all but as bad in the other extreme. Galen reckons up melancholy amongst those diseases which are exasperated by venery. So doth Avicenna, 2, 3, chapter 11. Oribasius, Quoted by Ficinus, Book 2, De Sanitate Tuenda, Marsilius Cognatus, Montaltus, Chapter 27, Guianerius Magninus, Chapter 5, Part 3, gives the reason, because it infrigidates and dries up the body, consumes the spirits, and would therefore have all such as are cold and dry to take heed of it and to avoid it as a mortal enemy. Jacinus in Nine Rasses, Chapter 15, ascribes the same cause, and instanceth in a patient of his, that married a young wife in a hot summer, and so dried himself with chamber-work, that he became in short space from melancholy mad. He cured him by a moistening remedies. The like example I find in Laelius a Fonte Eugubinus, of a gentleman of Venice, that upon the same occasion was first melancholy, afterwards mad. Read in him the story at large. Any other evacuation stopped will cause it, as well as these above named, be it bile, ulcer, issue, etc. Hercules de Saxonia, Book 1, Chapter 16, and Gordonius verify this out of their experience. They saw one wounded in the head, who as long as the sore was open, lucida habuit mentis intervala, was well, but when it was stopped, rediat melancholia, his melancholy fit seized on him again. Artificial evacuations are much like in effect, as hot houses, baths, bloodletting, purging, unseasonably and immoderately used. Baths dry too much, if used in excess, be they natural or artificial, and offend extreme hot or cold. One dries, the other refrigerates overmuch. Montana saith they overheat the liver. Johannes Struthius contends that if one stay longer than ordinary at the bath, go in too oft or at unseasonable times, he putrefies the humours in his body. To this purpose writes Magninus, Book 3, Chapter 5. Guianerius, Tract 15, Chapter 21, utterly disallows all hot baths in melancholy a dust. I saw, saith he, a man that laboured of the gout, who to be freed of this malady came to the bath, and was instantly cured of his disease, but got another worse, and that was madness. But this judgment varies as the humour doth, in hot or cold. Baths may be good for one melancholy man, bad for another. That which will cure it in this party may cause it in a second. Phlebotomy Phlebotomy, many times neglected, may do much harm to the body, when there is a manifest redundance of bad humours and melancholy blood, and when these humours heat and boil, if this be not used in time, the parties affected, so inflamed, are in great danger to be mad. 
but if it be unadvisedly, importunely, immoderately used, it doth as much harm by refrigerating the body, dulling the spirits, and consuming them. As Johannes Curio in his tenth chapter well reprehends, such kind of letting blood doth more hurt than good. The humours rage much more when they did before, and is so far from avoiding melancholy, that it increaseth it, and weakeneth the sight. Prosper Calenus observes as much of all phlebotomy, except they keep a very good diet after it. Yea, and as Leonatus Jacinus speaks out of his own experience, the blood is much blacker to many men after their letting of blood than it was at first. For this cause belike Celestius Salvinianus, Book 2, Chapter 1, will admit or hear of no blood letting at all in this disease, except it be manifest it proceed from blood. He was, it appears, by his own words in that place, master of an hospital of madmen, and found by long experience that this kind of evacuation, either in head, arm, or any other part, did more harm than good. To this opinion of his, Felix Plater is quite opposite, though some wink at, disallow, and quite contradict all phlebotomy in melancholy, yet by long experience I have found innumerable so saved, after they had been twenty, nay sixty times let blood, and to live happily after it. It was an ordinary thing of old, in Galen's time, to take at once from such men six pounds of blood, which now we dare scarce take in ounces. Said Viderint Medici, great books are written of this subject. Purging upward and downward, in abundance of bad humours omitted, may be for the worst. So likewise as in the precedent, if overmuch, too frequent or violent, it weakeneth their strength, saith Futius, or if they be strong or able to endure physic, yet it brings them to an ill habit. They make their bodies no better than apothecaries' shops. This, and such like infirmities, must needs follow. End of section 28